Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped, and yet things every bit as real as we but don't see. This is Dreamland. Good evening. It's Sunday evening, and this is another Dreamland program. I'm Art Bell. We are blessed this week with a full visit from Linda Moulton Howe. Linda Howe has been our reporter on the Dreamland program since its inception and way back uh, to the previous program we did called Area 2000. And I think you're really going to enjoy her. I would like to um, announce the addition of a couple of new affiliates this week, too, as a matter of fact. K-M-M-S-A-M, Bozeman, Montana. Welcome. That would be um, uh, George Carter, the individual responsible for getting us on there in Bozeman. Thank you, George. And W-B-K-V-A-M in West Bend, Wisconsin. And again, the uh, responsible individual, Bob Bonifant. I hope I've got that correct, Bob. Uh, thank you very much. Good to be on the air up in West Bend as well. So, uh, with a couple of brand new affiliates, uh, mentioning that we have a regular reporter will not be a familiar thing to you. And I guess the, um, the first thing we ought to do is at least get a brief sketch of Linda Moulton Howe. Linda, hi. Uh, are you there? Hello. Hi, Linda. Um, we do have a couple of new affiliates uh, this week, so they won't know you. Uh, this will be the uh, first time they heard your voice, so right. I suppose we ought to begin by telling them a little bit about you. Okay. No, I'm, I'm going to request you to do that. Oh. <laughs> okay. Tell us uh, who you are and why you're doing this. All right. Well, my, uh, I guess my journey into all of these uh, unexplained phenomena began uh, back in 1979. Uh, I was director of special projects at the CBS affiliate in Denver, had been a television producer for 10 years by then, uh, having graduated from Stanford University with a master's degree in communications in which I did my master's uh, film on uh, both science and medical projects at Stanford University and went on in my television career to do live studio programs, documentaries, and news reports about science, medicine, and the environment. And that's what led me in the fall of 1979 to start investigating the strange bloodless deaths of animals, especially cattle, throughout the United States, Canada, and other parts of the world, all found with essentially the same parts taken, an ear missing, an eye taken, the jawbone stripped, sometimes the teeth and jawbone move, removed in very uh, smooth oval cuts, uh, the genitals removed in male or female almost 100 percent of the time and the rectums poured out and sometimes even the tails of these animals removed in a vertical smooth cut uh, at the base of the spine and in many of the cases um, probably another majority uh, excision was the removal of tongues in a very smooth vertical cut deep within the throat of an animal something that predators do not do and all of this added up together to a mystery that seemed to have something to do with uh, a contamination perhaps in the environment. And I began the investigation trying to find out if there was some government research project that was examining tissue from uh, animals spread out throughout the United States. But nine months later, after talking with literally hundreds of people, ranging from law enforcement to ranchers to fellow journalists, all I heard were stories about encounters with football field-sized orange glowing discs or beams of light or all kinds of anomalous things. And that led to my first documentary, A Strange Harvest, that was broadcast in May of 1980. Um, that was a prime time arbitrary and Nielsen rating that week, and the program got a 19 rating and a 37 share in the Colorado, Nebraska, Wyoming area. 
which said that more people wanted to watch a program that was exploring the animal mutilation mystery than made for television new movies that week. And that also said something uh, to me about how many people had knowledge about this mystery but were not talking. And sure. that became very clear when literally hundreds of phone calls and letters started pouring into the station with people telling me about their own encounters, experiences, mutilations, encounters with lights, circles in their pastures, and on and on. And now, it's 1994, uh, some 14 years later, I have done productions uh, on child survival efforts for UNICEF. I have done science uh, program uh, story for McNeil Lair. I have worked on an environmental series for uh, Earthbeat in Atlanta, uh, the Turner Station. I have done other productions having to do with um, all sorts of other subjects. But throughout the last 14 years, it has been a constant challenge to me to try to keep up with what appears to be an expanding and complex series of phenomena that now range from the crop circles, the animal mutilations, the human abductions, issues about mind control, uh, the increasing number of uh, Marian apparitions, apparitions of the Virgin Mary around the world, um, and the whole big question, what does the government of the United States and other governments know, and why have they chosen a policy of silence, basically, about all these unexplained and unidentified phenomena, while people in the grassroots, uh, and I know many of our Dreamland listeners fall in that category, are having encounters, whether it was yesterday or last week or last month. I know from the letters that I receive and that other investors receive that people are having personal experiences and encounters, and I know from the physical traces that we are all investigating, whether it's crop circles or the mutilations or some other phenomenon, that these mysteries uh, continue to date in the United States and other parts of the world and be in dreamland and in my work as a television producer and a writer I am trying as best I can to bring to focus the best hard physical evidence the best first-hand eyewitnesses because I think that is the part that is not being addressed in the mainstream media that we do have many people many events many experiences that are unexplained but the world in general is not aware that even 10 miles in the next town that uh, several of these uh, events could be happening on one night and nobody uh, hears about it unless we report it on Dreamland or programs like this. Well, um, with all of that uh, conventional background and then sort of a plunge into uh, the strange harvest, if you will, um, that's, that's quite a change, Linda, and I'm kind of wondering what your colleagues, as you began to explore these other possibilities, began to say, you'd been very conventional, did they start kind of chuckling behind your back, or what's the reaction? Well, I think I had won too many Emmys, uh, had participated in a national uh, Peabody, Station Peabody Award, um, had received uh, the highest honors in the journalism, uh, Sigma Chi. Uh, I had just won too many journalism awards in the 10 years prior to when I did A Strange Harvest. It was very difficult for people to basically to attack me or my work. Fortunately, I had 10 years under my belt by the time I started on A Strange Harvest. I do remember one day on the sidewalk going to lunch that a reporter from a newspaper in Denver that I knew came up to me and said, I hear that you're looking into these animal mutilations. And I said, that's right. And he said, why are you doing that? He said, all you're going to end up doing is hurting your credibility. Don't you know that this is just all foolish? There's nothing to it but predator. And that reaction 
I've always been surprised by because it doesn't take very much hard investigative research into the animal mutilation phenomenon to find out that there are many cases going back before 1979 and certainly since 1979 that never could have been explained by predator. So to find my colleagues dismissing the subject because it was socially the more correct position rather than looking at the facts, that bothered me. And I think that's bothered me over the last 14 years. And I think it's part of the reason why I tried very hard to bring to bear uh, what I consider to be hard professional journalistic ethics to pursuing these stories and trying to bring uh, to the public's attention in documentaries and books uh, the hard facts. And in my newest documentary that has just been released, um, it is Strange Harvest 1993, and it focuses on uh, the events in Alabama and other parts of the United States and the world just last year, just in the year 1993. And the feedback that I have gotten from people now, uh, ranging from some major uh, uh, network uh, broadcast people to others is they are astonished because they know that there is nothing in that film but hard fact firsthand testimony and for the most part people were not aware that as many events were happening at the same time in Alabama and other states and other countries during that period of time in 1993 and I think that's one of the great values that a journalist can bring to bear on some of these stories because part of my work and my goal is to synthesize events so that people can see what was happening in a period of time. All right, good, Linda. Hold on just a moment. We'll be right back to Linda Howell. How many of these uh, mutilations or incidents uh, do you think can be attributed to either predators or Satanists or in other words some something external to what you believe may be involved well I can give you a summary from my first book an alien harvest in which I did an interview with the head of the Colorado Bureau of Investigation which would be comparable to the state's FBI or CIA sure. and he had several large cartons uh, cartons with full of file folders on the floor of his office. Every one of them was a mutilation report. They, out of all of those reports, they had only tried to get tissue from 19 animals. There were hundreds of files. 19 animals to uh, the Colorado State University uh, pathology lab up there for uh, any kind of uh, necropsy or tissue analysis. And out of those 19, uh, I believe over half were the official word on the report was cut with a sharp instrument. There was no other delineation on those reports back then. That was in the 70s. All right. Well, that certainly leaves out a predator. How do you rule out a Satanist? I think that you have to then come up further into the 80s, into the work that Dr. Alchula, the pathologist and hematologist in Denver, that he and I have been doing, in which we now have, uh, it may be 45 or close to 50 case studies where the tissue from some of these animals under a microscope shows that the hemoglobin has been cooked, literally subjected to something hot enough to uh, cook the blood. That eliminates not only predator, but from most uh, law enforcement research, uh, satanic cults also. And it was about four or five years ago that I got a call from a detective down in Southern California. He said, we're having a lot of problems here with satanic cults. And he said, I'd like to have a meeting with you and with uh, a sheriff from the county in which I'm working. And he said, I want, I'd like you to bring your best cases, we'll bring ours, and let's compare notes and see if we have overlap. So we had a meeting. And the first thing that the sheriff did was look through my book, An Alien Harvest, which has a lot of photographs in it of uh, the uh, animal mutilations and other assorted aspects around sure, them, including sure. finding tripod marks and all kinds of things. And as the sheriff looked through my book, 
He finally stopped, looked up at me, and he said, Miss Howe, this is not what I'm dealing with, the satanic cult. And then they laid out for me their evidence. And it is astonishing, astonishingly horrible, nothing I would describe over radio, television, or any other way. And one of the primary uh, aspects of a lot of what they showed me was the presence of an enormous amount of blood in, in a variety of situations, even if they involved animals. In the mystery that I've tried to investigate for the last 14 years, the one major characteristic right from the beginning that uh, was always uh, puzzling to law enforcement and ranchers is they would get to some of these animals warm to touch, which from a pathology point of view means that they can't be dead longer than 10, 12, 14 hours, depending on the, and if it's winter, it's even less. And yet there would be excisions in which the ear was gone, the eye was gone, the tongue was removed deep in the throat, a uh, large udder, 18-inch uh, by 22-inch ovals in the belly of the animal would be gone, the rectum and the vaginal tracts would be removed, and yet there would not only not be any blood, there would be no fluid. And the lack of fluid at excisions in an animal that is warm to touch, that is not normal. And, uh, in fact, what I'd like right now to do, Art, is to play for you uh, an excerpt from an interview, if I can. If, unless, you tell me if we have a commercial problem, but I have an excerpt. How long is it, Linda? Um, maybe three minutes. And it is an interview, and if you want to do it after the break, but this is an Yeah, why don't we do it after the break? It's going to be a little close. Right, and just to let people know, this is an interview with a rancher who last Sunday, this is only one week ago, found his 11th animal mutilation cattle, essentially, on his ranch east of Taos, New Mexico, the 11th since 1993. And he describes on this tape uh, how he compares all 11 and his own uh, comments on a similar question. Why do you think that many people argue it's only predator? And he gives his own comments as a rancher who has been dealing with this phenomenon now uh, by almost a dozen cases in 18 months. So many of these uh, have come to the fore. Linda, has anybody ever been caught? Uh, any anybody or anything uh, caught doing these? Since 1967, in the first reported mutilation of a horse in southern Colorado, there has never, to date, been an arrest and arraignment of an individual anywhere in the world hmm. concerning animal mutilation. Well, that's really weird. Yes. That's really weird. So whoever is doing it is doing it very well. And worldwide, bloodlessly, over and over, taking the same tissue, and in many cases not even leaving tracks anywhere around an animal that's on wet ground. After all of this investigation, Linda, um, who do you think is doing it? In other words, uh, do you think that it is uh, some sort of eat? presence? Do you think that it is the government? Who do you think is responsible? Do you have any guesses? Well, as people know who have uh, read my books and seen my documentaries, uh, going back all the way actually to 1980 and the Strange Harvest, uh, what astonished me was my own discovery of the circumstantial link between what people were reporting, uh, huge 300-foot diameter orange glowing fluorescent discs over pastures lighting up uh, a barley field, for example, light enough uh, that the farmer said I could read a newspaper on my tractor by that light uh, by an object that completely overwhelmed the sky above him. And uh, at the same time, he had uh, two animal mutilations on a nearby ridge. Uh, other people, uh, sheriffs that I knew and uh, told me this confidentially would never go on the record. That's the problem. People are afraid to tell of course, uh, yeah. some of the more bizarre parts of the story. Said that he and his own son watched a beam of light come down in a pasture where they were in a stakeout because of all the animal mutilations. He said that beam of light came down, lighted up an entire pasture, and they could not hear 
any noise. They could not see any running light. They could see no object, just a gigantic beam of light lighting up an entire pasture from something in the sky that was completely silent. Those are the eerie uh, marks of this phenomenon, which has been frustrating ranchers and law enforcement now for uh, 67 to 94, uh, and probably earlier, at least 30-some years. And that's what I'm trying to find out. And when we come back from the commercial break, I will play the comments of this rancher. And uh, we can also discuss more uh, the circumstantial and hard eyewitness and physical evidence that seems to link something out there that is not understood at all, perhaps, to these mutilations. All right. Linda Howe, uh, our guest for the full Dreamland program this week. We'll be talking about this and a lot more. Actually, uh, her knowledge is very wide-ranging, and so stay tuned. There's a lot more to come. You're listening to Dreamland on the CBC Radio Network. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, well, we must have now over 40-some animals that Dr. Altshuler has analyzed the tissue, and they've ranged from a deer to rabbits to a cat uh, to uh, cows, cat, uh, horses. And when he sees that darkened edge on the tissue, he also feels pretty confident that he's going to see under the microscope that the hemoglobin has been cooked. So you would think that that fact alone would uh, have some uh, impact on people constantly trying to blame this on predators. Well, you know, uh, I've had friends that had it 20 years ago, and, and they raised quite a stink about it, and the state hired some investigator, and, and after all this, he, that's what they came up with, is that it wasn't predators, but... Why do you think that that is the conclusion, when clearly they, that's not what is responsible? I don't know, it almost seems like they're trying to not to get the truth. <laughs> that's what it feels like to me. I mean, somebody... Somebody in our government somewhere knows what's going on. I mean, there, there's been too much of it. It's been too long a time, and somebody knows what's going on, and they just keep kind of brushing it off or trying not to throw the public uh, opinion up or whatever. But, you know, I don't say that I know what it is, but I damn sure know it's not a predator. <laughs> you know, it's very obvious that somebody or something is working on this animals and I, I really feel like they're doing it somewhere else because it's just so so clean of a deal if you find one right away like the m next morning before the cabinet stuff stomp around it there's never no tracks the animals are clean it's just it's almost like they work on them somewhere else and just drop them back in the pasture right and what's puzzling also is why does anyone or anything bother to return the animals that's right and these birds, like these birds down here on this one, they're sitting on him, and just, but they haven't worked on this animal at all. They just sit there and walk around on it, get on the ground and look at it and stuff, but they don't really. A natural death, we, we had a lightning killed one here a couple of days ago, and shoot, the bears and birds already eat him up. Right. In other words, they're much more aggressive. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there's even unusual predator reaction to this uh, mutilation today. Yeah. Like the first one I had last year, the very first one I found, the bones and hide are still just, you know, it just kind of decayed and mummified. The predators never did do nothing with it. So that's firsthand from a rancher who has dealt with 11 of these, has been ranching for over 30 years, and you heard him say, I know at least damn well on this one it's not Predator. Sure. And I've heard that hundreds of times from ranchers who actually get angry when somebody from law enforcement sticks their toe on one of these animals and says, well, probably coyotes or dogs did this, and the rancher uh, has said with great frustration that is not peace marks. So that's one of the things that is important about continuing to report the facts on these and uh, to encourage anyone listening, if they hear about anything like this in their area, please get in touch with me. I'm working with Dr. Altshuler on a grant this year in which we're trying to work with more veterinarians and medical people uh, on the animal mutilation mystery with the idea that if we can at least continue to uh, corroborate some of the findings that we already have and add any new information that we're building case files of hard data that certainly cannot be dismissed as predator and the issue of satanic cults even from law enforcement's point of view uh, their, their case files don't match what I have investigated. Linda, I don't know a lot about animal uh, habits um, you, you, but uh, you have said that after these mutilations other predators will not touch what remains of the carcass. Now, would it be normal that if an animal uh, were, were killed by another animal, other animals then would not follow up and finish off whatever was left, or is that abnormal? Remember what he just said there at the end, that one of his animals, that same week that he found the mutilation, had died of a lightning strike, a very natural event among mm. cattle. Yes. And that animal was completely consumed by birds and other predators within a day of its death. So that would be the norm. That's the norm. But in the animal mutilations, not every one, that's another strange thing about this phenomenon, as soon as you say, well, everyone
everyone does this or does that, there will be a next mutilation that, that, that predators will eat it. But many, many cases have been written about and people have noticed that there was no predation, uh, that the bones and the hide would lie there for months. Nothing would touch it, and that has been one of the mysteries. Isn't that something, uh, I, I guess animals have senses and so forth that we, we're not sure about, but wouldn't there be some way of identifying what it is that is keeping those other animals away? It must be some scent. It must be something that science could identify. Maybe, uh, I, and if there is any scientist listening to our program who has any ideas about how we could further uh, investigate some aspects like this one, why would predators not touch an animal, I am certainly happy to hear from anyone because that's what we're trying to do. We've had resistance in the past to any kind of scientific investigation because professionals did not want to get involved, afraid that their reputations would be damaged. Now, I think there's too much history on on this and there are too many files and there's too much evidence and I am beginning to see more and more interest by professionals so anyone listening who has any idea how, what more we can do please get in touch with me and this might be a good point Art uh, to uh, give my uh, address All right. and um, and when I give this address I'm going to also follow up with an extraordinarily interesting excerpt from one of our Dreamland listeners to give people an idea about what the community out there of people listening have experienced in their own lives. First, I'll start with, uh, it's Linda Howe at Post Office Box 538 in Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania, spelled H-U-N-T, I-N-G, G is in dog, O-N, Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is 19006. And before I read this extraordinary excerpt, I also want to make an announcement that is very gratifying to me, Art, um, and that is that the Barnes and Noble bookstores uh, will now be carrying my new book, Glimpses of Other Realities, throughout oh, the United States. Wonderful. Oh, yeah, and that agreement was made Friday, and so all of our Dreamland listeners can see glimpses on the Barnes and Noble bookshelves in a few days. And for listeners in Denver, Colorado, the large and very wonderful Tattered Cover Bookstore has been carrying all of my books and videos, including this newest documentary, Strange Harvest 1993, and so has Alexandria Two Bookstore in Pasadena, these being just two of the largest independents. Other bookstores around the country do, but I thought it would be uh, definitely uh, appropriate to thank these two bookstores because they have been long uh, carriers of uh, this, doing these kinds of books, like Glimpses of Other Realities, uh, that has 300 images in it, of which most is our color, is a very difficult project to do. And the fact that more and more bookstores around the country are responding to people's phone calls uh, and they're getting in more and more of these books and videos is, I think, is a step uh, in the right direction. And I encourage all our listeners to call up the Barnes & Noble bookstores in their area or any other large bookstore Great. and put in their request because the more demand there is, the more some of us will be able to continue our investigations and research reports about this difficult and controversial phenomena of the uh, unexplained that sometimes the so-called more major publishers in New York don't want to spend money on photographs and drawings. Uh, they may do an all-print book, but for those uh, who have seen uh, glimpses of other reality, I think they would agree that the photographs and the drawings are equally as important as the text. Absolutely. So with that, uh, hopefully this means a uh, another step forward for toward reaching the general public with this information. And now I would like to share an excerpt from one of our Dreamland uh, listeners, and he is speaking uh, about experiences from 1989 to 1993. And this is an excerpt from this man's letter. 
I work as a security police officer at AF Plant 42 in Palmdale, California, and in July of 1989, during the time of the B-2 bomber rollout, we were visited by UFOs on many occasions on different days. They were basically of the surveillance type, the white bent horseshoe type with its intermittent bronze flashes that hover at extremely high altitude and come in fast enough to glow bright red when first observed. Now, what's interesting is that he uses that term horseshoe type. That was essentially the drawing that was done uh, by Kenneth Arnold in association with a newspaper uh, reporter back in 1947 of the alleged discs, only not discs. They were drawn as looking like uh, more like a horseshoe uh, or like a boomerang flying over the Cascade Mountains. And I thought that was interesting that this security officer is saying that he has seen something similar out over the Palmdale area. And he uh, goes on to say they, they hover at extremely high altitude and they, they come in fast, glowing red, and then they wobble at a high altitude. And on one occasion, in broad daylight, three spherical craft in a V-shaped formation just appeared in the sky and then disappeared after a short run across the airfield. The round disks, when first observed, had bright red leading edges, which indicated that they had arrived, he thought, in the atmosphere at a high rate of speed, but they might have been some light configuration. They appeared to disappear just as quickly as they came, but actually accelerated from a slow speed like a forward or faster. Uh, A fighter pilot encountering such sophisticated craft as these round objects would report that, quote, they just see them disappear before their eyes and off their radar, unquote. From June 8, 1993 to the end of October 1993, I watched a mysterious round craft that came and went over the Antelope Valley above the Mojave Desert. I observed this craft in the daytime when clear and partly cloudy and became very familiar, very familiar with what it could do in the sense of aeronautics. It hovered at very high altitude most of the time between 1130 to 1300 hours. It wobbled away on one occasion, drifted on others, and on numerous occasions would accelerate to the speed of something like a shooting star and actually would reverse direction at that speed from a forward motion to reverse. Mind-boggling to say the least. During my numerous observations of this unusual craft, I always knew and had a sense that it knew I was watching it. It was a feeling that I received. It was as if something was intelligent, extremely conscious of my watching it, but I had the feeling that one gets when looking into the eyes of a wild tabby cat that whatever it was was neither friendly or hostile, just indifferent to my being there. Yes. On two occasions, I caught this round object without lights on. And when that happened, this craft looked like a round or egg-shaped object. It had a burnt copper, it was burnt copper in color, with a portion of the craft having shiny, triangular-shaped surfaces like facets on a jewel. And this is a portion of a very long letter from a man most of these people don't want to be identified on the air, and I find it's fine, and I respect that. I think it is appropriate to report some of these excerpts from people of their own, what they are claiming are their eyewitness accounts. Someday, maybe some of these people will feel comfortable uh, to be public, and uh, we might do some on-air interviews. But I, he wanted to stress, he said, Linda, you and others have talked about the interdimensional aspects of this phenomenon, mm. and he basically was saying, I want you to know that there's a big physical aspect to it because I've seen this myself. Wow. Um, I don't know what you say about that. It's another very, very good sighting report. And there have been so many, Linda. It astounds me to this day that there can be so many reports, so many people can see so many things. Right. And yet... Still, as it says, you know, as it says in the beginning of the program, we can't put this in a box. Right. When is the day going to come, and how's it going to happen that we'll finally be able to identify what's going on here? Oh, I wish I. 
I do and uh, wish that it would happen sooner or later because I really do feel that we are on the brink of a revolution, as we've discussed sometimes in the past on Dreamland, that the revolution involves simply accepting uh, the fact that we're not alone in the universe. And believe it or not, even though the listeners to Dreamland may not feel that that is a major step forward, the truth is that over 90% of the planet is really not paying attention to much of this. That's right. And the, there may be philosophical subsects in various countries that do accept the fact that we're not alone in the universe, but the majority of people on the world still live in that socially accepted, politically accepted, economically accepted paradigm that we are still alone. Now, once that shifts, and that's, you're asking, that's the fundamental question, what is it going to take to make that revolutionary shift so that the entire planet understands, sees, uh, and totally uh, agrees that we're not alone in the universe? It may be that governments feel they're over such a barrel. They may be so afraid that the status quo, the economic system, the political system will be in some sort of jeopardy depending upon what is out there and its motives, that they would rather just keep everything under wraps, just let everything keep going forward the way it is because it makes life easier than announce something that may not necessarily be a problem. It may not be that there's something inimical bad to all of this, it may simply be it's just too much of a problem to handle and that they're waiting for generations to keep passing um, uh, passing on and the next generation comes, more young people are accepting the fact that there is some other life in the universe and that by some point in the future there will be a, enough people who are never going to be troubled by the idea of some kind of a craft or even reports that may be some kind of humanoid uh, extraterrestrials were involved with the genetic manipulation of this planet in the distant past. All of those, I think, are issues the government is, is very afraid to deal with. And so when we say, what will it take, that, I think, isn't just a simple answer. I don't even think if a silver disc landed on the White House lawn, the way things are currently from the government's point of view. All right, we've got to break away. Here, okay. but, uh, stay right there. We'll be right back. This is the CBC Radio Network. From the Kingdom of Nine, you're hearing Dreamland with Art Bell. It's important. Finally, at the White House the other day, made an appearance. Neil Armstrong said the following at the White House: "Quote: There are ideas." undiscovered breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. There are places to go beyond belief. End quote. That's Neil Armstrong. One more time. Listen to this quote. There are great ideas undiscovered. Breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. There are places to go beyond belief. End quote. Linda, are you there? Yeah. I found that to be uh, more than just a little intriguing. Uh, the man seems to be suggesting there is something for us to know if we just dig. Right. Well, the only... I guess it, it's sort of third-hand removed. But when I was working on UFO report sightings in Los Angeles in 1991, I interviewed by phone and then eventually uh, on for the uh, hour special several of the astronauts. And in the research that I was doing with the astronauts, one of them told me something interesting. Said that. He understood that one of the reasons that Neil Armstrong had not done anything publicly was that he was personally, Armstrong was upset because they had seen something on the moon, but it was silver and round, and that he and other astronauts, although they, they remain nameless, uh, have been upset that there has been some kind of a 
Well, it's a kitchen around word, cover up. Sure. You could use a less conspiratorial sounding word and say simply, a policy decision was made that anything truly anomalous was not to be reported. Again, coming back where we left off before the break, to the idea that the status quo may be what uh, the government or governments uh, and various administrations have been fighting to keep in place for a long time. And even the announcement that there was a silver disk on the moon might have been considered too revolutionary for uh, the Cold War at the time or a number of events. So now, the fact that Neil Armstrong would say something that is at least provocative, that is a provocative sentence coming from the first man to step on the moon. Yes. Um, the fact that he would be saying that now may be an indication that what this other astronaut told me may have been pointing in the correct direction, that Armstrong does know much more than he's ever reported, and that one of the reasons for his own silence over these many years has been that uh, some uh, people have chosen simply not to say anything because they didn't want to have to mislead. Well, I've seen a lot of interviews with the astronauts on television, Linda, and inevitably the interviewer will get around to a question, well, did you see any flying disc with a little chuckle or yeah. uh, anything strange up there? And if you watch them carefully, inevitably they're very, very uncomfortable with that kind of a question. That's right. They are. And the very fact that the, uh, we, I call it the mainstream media, not that it is more important or less important, but it is that there are the networks and CNN and others, and if they take a position of sort of implying with a smile or a smirk that even the discussion of some unidentified object in the sky is worthy of some kind of ridicule, it makes it impossible for legitimate scientists and astronauts and other people to feel comfortable in any discussion, even if they themselves know for a fact that there is some kind of humanoid intelligence out there that sends gray androids here and that there is something going on of vast proportions and uh, somebody has a policy decision that we're not supposed to know about it. All right, how about a few phone calls? Yeah. Yeah, love it. All right, let's do it. On the wild card line, you are call toll free 1 800 618 8255. Denise, I'm going to um, uh, take that out, and we're going to we're, we're going to try and start all over again here. What we don't do is give first names on the air. So let's just say it's Denise in San Diego. How's that? Okay, that's great. All right, good. Go ahead. You're on the air. Hi, Linda. Yeah. Um, I wanted to call up and say hi, and I had written you about a UFO sighting in Arizona. Yes, I remember, and I think you're going to try to get me some photos. Yes, and um, they should be back Tuesday, and then they'll be out to you and to Mr. Bell. Wonderful. Well, that's great, and is this a story that, depending upon uh, how everything looks in a further discussion, we might be able to uh, report some excerpts from it on the air later? That will be fine. Okay. Okay, and I just want to say it's great listening to your show tonight. Great. And thanks a lot for having Linda back on. You bet. Thank you. And we'll do that, of course, from time to time. Uh, Linda, while we're on the subject of photos, I received uh, one last week, and I've never in my life seen anything like it. Um, and I don't know that it directs, uh, directly relates, but I want you to listen to this letter that I got. Dear Art... First, let me thank you for the Daily Show and for the Dreamland program. It is fantastic radio. A week or so ago, I heard you talking about the Halloween show with a listener. I missed most of it, but if you're interested in ghosts, here's a photograph that may be one. A friend of mine, who was a stone mason, was working on an old home in Los Angeles on finishing the wine cellar in the old existing basement. He photographed his work for his scrapbook. When he developed the pictures, this is what showed up on one picture. He did not see anything when the photo was taken. However, on questioning, the architect uh, was told that three crews, carpenters and so forth, walked off the project. It seems they felt very cold air, and some were pushed down the stairs by an unseen force. Since these photos were taken, 
I talked to the architect and was told the home is about 100 years old, was listed for sale after the man who lived there died. The architect also told me that a Chinese man was interested in buying the home. But when they brought their priests to okay the home and bless it, they left in a hurry, screaming. Evidently, the new owner, who's having it completely renovated, knows about the ghost, but does not know what has happened to the workmen. Nor have they seen this photo. The friend of mine who took the photograph is a Muslim. A very religious man does not have any interest or belief in ghosts. Just thought you'd like to see it now. He also has the negative. And what this photograph is, is a picture of some stone work that he apparently did in this home. And lo and behold, taking up about a third of the picture, and it's a high quality 35 millimeter photograph, is, I would say, a partially formed entity, clearly with a head, a torso, arm, leg, and it's, um, it's, it's almost, uh, it almost looks like smoke, but it obviously is not. You're able to actually look through most of it and see the stonework in the background. Um, so that if you can imagine a kind of a very smoky, almost solid look in a couple of places, but half formed, that's what I've got. I've got this photograph, Linda. It is astounding. Well, I'd sure like to see it, and I wonder, Art, when you say entity, is it humanoid shape? Yes. So it's definitely humanoid shape, and does it seem to have a human-sized head? Yes. Uh, it would be uh, proportionally, yes, would be a head. All right. Yeah, uh, maybe there is uh, some way that you could get a copy of this and send it to me. I'm, I'm already arranging it, Linda. Great. Uh, because there is a, a scientist I know, and we've spoken together in conferences, who studies ghosts. He's been on Unsolved Mysteries. Um, and what I could do is also discuss this with him, do an interview for Dreamland in the future. I would love Love it. All I right. would love it. All right. Uh, we'll do it. All right. Uh, first time caller line. You're on the air with Linda Howe. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I've witnessed a couple of uh, UFOs, but I wondered, uh, well, about three different times in my life. I reported every one of them. Uh, one of them actually uh, turned off my uh, my car coming up the uh, coast of Ventura. It was kind of a white phosphorus wedge that came flying at me at a very high rate of speed, except the car that it turned off had what they call a perfection engine, a $2,500 dragster-type engine. Mm. And I will make a very long story short. We tore the engine apart and found out that the, the uh, distributor shaft, which uh, has absolutely no friction on it, none whatsoever, um, was just, it looked like it was cut by a, by a hot knife. No, no twisting, no torquing, no burn marks, just like it was cut. But all it does is turn a little plastic rotor. Mm. Uh, and then uh, it hovered out there, and I made some very detailed notes on the uh, on a little vest pocket uh, tape recorder that I had. I was recording some notes for business when it happened. I got out of the car, uh, recorded the uh, uh, kind of what I felt was like a low resonance sound. I wouldn't even describe it as a hum. It was more of a vibration that you felt rather than you saw. And then it uh, just uh, disappeared in the, uh, in the other direction. Now, that was the uh, third time I witnessed a, uh, a UFO. I've, uh, but aside from the UFO topic, I wondered if Linda had any information on the black helicopters. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Linda, what do you know about black helicopters? Well, it is just an enormous subject, and the black helicopters have been associated with the animal mutilations going all the way back to the 60s, coming through every year and every decade. Um, in my first documentary, A Strange Harvest, I interviewed the uh, then head of the animal mutilation investigation in the district attorney's office in Trinidad, Colorado, a man named Lou Giroto, who is now sheriff of Los Angeles County. And when my camera was running across the desk from him, uh, not only did he surprise me in his answer to my question, who or what do you think is involved with these animal mutilations, and he said, 
he and other investigators had come to the conclusion that it was creatures not from this planet, gave his own experiences of, of uh, encountering big orange lights that split in two and were tracked on radar and mm. went down into the ground, came back up out of the ground, all sorts of weird things. But he said he'd also come to the conclusion with other investigators that many of the silent helicopters that were seen above pastures, even in pastures in a few cases, uh, in and around the events of animal mutilations were, this was his word, camouflage of some kind of advanced technology of whatever this intelligence was that was you know, interacting with our planet and involved with mutilations. Did he actually write that in the report? That's, no, it was in my, the interview, and it's in my my documentary. In other words, he oh, I on the film, and it's in the documentary. He's on camera saying this. And uh, it was very important because I had heard things similar to this from other law enforcement, but Lou Girota was the first law enforcement guy to go on the record. It's in the documentary. He's never changed his tune. If you would talk with him uh, to date, he would say the same thing, that if, uh, if this is an advanced intelligence and they have work to do on this planet, that it made sense to him that they would camouflage their operations so that we wouldn't pay any attention to what they were doing, just like, as he said, a good undercover police officer uses camouflage. And uh, that was the, uh, his official point of view. Hmm, all right. Uh, wild Card Line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hi. Yes, I was trying to ask her why. Why is it only small groups of people, maybe one or two or three, ever see UFOs? All right, where, where are you calling from, sir? Green River. Green River, Wyoming. Wyoming. All right. Why do small, just small groups of people uh, seem to see them? It's a good point, uh, Linda. Why not an entire city? Okay. Yeah, the... The idea that only small groups of people see uh, something in the sky that's round is not always true. There have been mass sightings in Japan, uh, and uh, there have been beach scenes where people have seen something round. Um, it is not just the one, two, three uh, people. Uh, for example, uh, if you go, you could say that five or six people is still a small group of people, but that's getting up into quite a few uh, multiple eyewitnesses, and there are many cases now in the abduction literature where groups of people in five, six, seven, eight have uh, not only seen something that they described as not being from anything they recognize on this planet, round and glowing and hovering in the air, but appear to be involved in uh, where one or more of the people from the group have missing time, and then you get into the abduction syndrome. Um, in New York City, Bud Hopkins has many cases of people seeing some kind of an object outside of apartment buildings and so forth in that very crowded city. Um, I've talked with a woman who lived on the 21st floor of a building that was not too far from the UN, and she said that one night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, she was waked up. She did not know why she woke up, uh, as many of the tall buildings in New York do. People don't have shades or draperies. They just have their glass window up when they're up on 21st and 22nd floors unless there's a building close by. And she went into the living room and she said to her complete astonishment outside the window was something she couldn't see the end of it. It was round and it was glowing red and it had a, a, a to her a spherical shape. And she said, I wondered how many people on the street might have seen it. The problem is, there may have been dozens of people down in the street who also saw it, but everyone is so afraid to report. All right, the caller, um, anything else? Yeah, and the other thing, uh, 25 million people have seen UFOs, roughly, something like that. Oh, from the, uh, like the Roper Pole and so forth? Uh, something like that. Why is it, uh, how many of those do you believe are true, and how many do you think speculation? I'll take my answer off it. All right, thank you. Um, well, <laughs> very... It's just that gets into the land of speculation, yeah, because sure does. none of us know how to answer a question like that with any firm validity. Uh, all I can say is that if you and listeners went through the research files, let's say, of an engineer like Dick Haynes in California, 
California with a mass and enormous amount of data on reports from airline pilots, military pilots, mm -hmm. uh, people who are highly professional to be handling such responsible jobs as being military pilots and airline pilots, who have encountered objects in the sky, either placing their airliner or their jet or their helicopter or, or some other uh, military vehicle and have made such reports and many of them are so anomalous and I think that uh, one of our big problems here is getting to the general public enough of the hard data of which there's a lot that exists but it is a, it's difficult getting it all put together in such a way that uh, it can get out there in a credible context. And this will also sound strange Linda but the fact of the matter is a lot of people don't look at the sky. That's true Art. I mean, they just don't look at the sky, and what you don't look at, you don't see. That's right. And I'll tell you another thing. I have had some communication with someone who claims they are reporting to me from inside government knowledge. Now, I can't prove that yet, and may never be able to prove it, but they said something extremely interesting the other day. They said you, that they know that we're dealing with a technology that has the ability to deflect photons. If it deflects photons, it means that you could have an object, it could be a mile wide, it could be sitting up in the sky, if it deflects the photons that are radiating from it, there's nothing on the ground, there's no eyes, no animals, no anything. at that level, the retinas are not going to see it. Hmm. Now, that is, gets into the uh, DA and sheriff speculation about the helicopters also being camouflaged. We could be dealing with a, an intelligence that has such sophisticated abilities to uh, camouflage, deceive us, uh, i.e. to work a, around us and among us in such a way that for the most part we don't even know it's there. And then you get down to the question, why does it reveal it? in these odd ways uh, ever. All right, Linda Howe, hold it right there. We're at the bottom of the hour. We'll be right back with more calls. My guest, Linda Howe, you're listening to Dreamland. Oh, 
Oh, yes, Linda. Uh, there were a number of reports that the SETI program has yielded some number, I don't know about a confirmed intelligence, but that they have uh, apparently some signals that they consider not at all to be random. Had you heard anything about that? Yes. Uh, in my uh, book, Glimpses of Other Realities, at the beginning of Chapter 4, which I was going to right now, it's Time Magazine, June 21st, 1993, about a little over a year ago, page 19. Quote, after a year of the most intensive search ever mounted to detect radio signals from extraterrestrial civilizations, astronomers from the University of California, Berkeley, have picked up 164 signals out of 30 trillion recorded that, quote, bear further investigation, unquote. This does not mean that ETs have been found, only that these anomalies have not yet been otherwise explained, unquote. That was in uh, June of 1993. By the fall of 1993, just within a very short period of time, literally weeks of this announcement, Congress had cut the appropriations for that particular study program. Right. Right. Um, all right. And, and then this, Linda. Um, dear Linda and Art, love your show. Listen to it every week. My question. I heard that prior to the nuclear test ban treaty, a great deal of plutonium, which is extremely poisonous to life, was released into the atmosphere. I also heard the real reason that ETs were sampling the livestock population was to monitor the plutonium level on the planet. The idea is the plutonium falls out of the atmosphere, onto the land, is taken up uh, into the grass, which is eaten by the cattle. The plutonium is thus concentrated into certain organs of the animals naturally. Now, what about that, Linda? There have been variations on that theme coming through both the abduction syndrome uh, and even people who say that they have worked in government programs having to do with uh, mutilations related partly to uh, tracing something related to um, matter, uh, atomic density, uh, some kind of contamination in the environment. And the problem is that after 14 years of my investigation, I have yet to see a single piece of hard evidence that anyone has ever provided, and that has included people who say that they are working from inside the government, who show me that they have any hard uh, information about why the mutilations are happening. Still, wouldn't it be strange, Linda, if in the end all of this circled back to your original concerns and that uh, the ETs have concerns that were very similar to yours? Right. It would be very ironic if in the end the all of this program was an has been pre-recorded for broadcast story this time. of concern both by ETs <laughs> and humans. <laughs> yes, it would be. All right. First time caller line. You're on the air with Linda Howe. Hi. Where are you calling from, please? Illinois. Okay. I can't hear you here, but someone called and asked me to please call because we found something very bizarre we can't get an answer to and hopefully one of you do. Um, it was a folded metal container, Army Green. On it is printed Ward Container, U.S. Army, M-U-S-T Project, Office of the Surgeon General. This thing is huge, and it was buried in the grass near a forest preserve, and we're wondering what in the world is this. Oh, my God. I, it, yeah, this is a farm area? Yeah, farming and woods, lots of woods, near forest preserve, and it's M period, U period, S period, T period. It says U.S. Army Must Project, Office of the Surgeon General. What does the Surgeon General have to do with the U.S. Army, and what are these containers for? Well, uh, that is a good question, and I might be able to find some answers. Could you give me the approximate size? Yeah, they're about eight feet high. If you stand it up the way the printing reads, it would be about eight feet high, about, uh, eight feet one direction, about four feet the other. But they're folded and they're laying in the grass. They're not arrested yet. How many of them are there? Um, they're at almost all of the entrances to this forest preserve. Four 
Forest Preserve. Forest Preserve, acres and acres and acres of land. So do you feel like there's a possibility they may have something to do with the structure of a gate or something that has to be? That's, that's one of the possibilities because I suppose if you put them end to end instead of making a box out of them, they could be a gate. But nearby where this place is, there was a crash of one of those mysterious little black helicopters, and the local papers ran a story on it because some passers-by came upon this thing. The Army was all over the place, but the pilot, they got there first, and the pilot was thrown from it. He was Asian. He had on a black jumpsuit with a white triangle in the upper left-hand corner. A white triangle? A white triangle. He spoke no English, but he had U.N. papers, and they were from a company in Germany, and I can spell it for you. It's called B-E-E-S-T-H, and the second word is M-E-R-K-A-T-O-R, and these were his papers, and they, they got the papers, okay, and it's the most... a local news story? Yeah, they tried to run it in the local paper, and mysteriously, nobody got their paper that night. It's been a real to-do out here. Well, you but, know what I think? I think uh, we better give you Linda Howe's uh, number. And yeah, okay. I got a whole book. Yeah, I was down for you. All right, ma'am, 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 ma'am. Ma 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 uh, okay. Do you have a pencil? You bet. All right, write down this number then. Okay to give it out, Linda? Yes, please. Area code 215-491-9840. Read it back. Okay, 215-491-9840. Yes. Uh, okay, now also there is, a, I don't know if you know about this group, but there's a group in Montana that's collecting all of these reports nationwide. And they might be, have an awful lot of information for you and well, certainly anybody that would have information. It's right. in well, Montana. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, since I'm on the air tonight, in the morning, if you could give me a call, let's talk about this some more. You bet. And okay. I can give you the number now if you guys want it for listeners that have information. No, that's all right. We'd, we would have to check that out. If, okay. If go ahead and call Linda in the morning, would you please? I will do that. Thank you. All right, okay. thank you. Wow, Linda. Yeah, it's a very strange series of things, especially this story about the black helicopter crash, if this is something that checks out, it is another indication of stories that stay bottled up in a local area. This was Illinois. I certainly have not heard about this. All right. Well, we'll sure find out about it. Right. Uh, on the wild card line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hello. Yes. Uh, this is Phoenix. Phoenix. Yes, yes, sir. I have two questions. Um, have either of you seen uh, the movie Overlords of the UFO? No. No. Okay. I'll, or I might send that to you. And the second question is, what, do you, what is your opinion? I've been hearing more like Bible preachers saying that these things are real. There's no doubt about it, but it's like uh, some Satan's. Yeah, they're devils, right. Okay, sir. Uh, Linda, it's yeah. not just the religious angle, but since we don't know what these things are, I... we imagine them to be everything in the world. The religious people give a religious explanation. No surprise there. And, and uh, other people... People talk about other dimensions or physical visits, and uh, other people are talking about uh, psychic uh, avenues uh, to find out what this is all about. Until we know, we're going to continue to hear just about everything, aren't we? Yes, and I could recommend that people who are re very serious about trying to understand this issue of could we possibly be dealing with something out there, not the whole story, but something that is, to use a quote from a communication to me, is neither neutral nor benign. Now, there is a book called Messengers of Deception that was written by Jacques Vallée approximately 1980 period. Right. Right. It is a book that I would recommend many people to reread. I think that we are dealing with at least one aspect of the phenomenon that is using deceit and manipulation of the human population as to further its goal, whatever its goal is. Now, if if a communication is pointing in a direction suggesting that part of the phenomena is neither neutral or benign, that's kind of a nice way of saying 
that whatever its goal is may not be in the interest of humans. Mm. The, the problem all of us have is that no one is providing hard proof of information from inside the government that says this is what we're dealing with, this is what it wants, this is why it's here. Nothing is that clear, and that's what we would all like. It is also part of the same kind of communication. It is said that there are other intelligences that are benevolent, that are in this mix, and so again, if there was one predominant theme that I think comes up over and over and over again, it is that we're not dealing with one motive or one intelligence, but we're dealing with more than one. There may be a conflict out there between something and something in which we, us, plants, animals, and humans on this earth are some issue in all this. And that's why I think it is so important for all of us to keep paying a great deal of attention to whatever physical evidence and eyewitness testimony we can get, because this may be the only way we get any clue into whether or not we are dealing with a conflict. And if there's a conflict, what is it about, and what are the implications for us, the human race, in the future? All right, good. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hi. Hi, Art. This is, excuse me, this is Martin up in Anchorage, Alaska. Hi, Martin. We've talked lots of times. Uh, uh, I'm a, also a researcher in this subject, uh, Linda, and I'm writing a book on uh, extraterrestrial life, UFOs uh, from a theological perspective. Right. So uh, it's, uh, I guess, kind of ironic I got on at this time right after that. But uh, you, you have a huge bit to chew when it comes to the theological background and the connection to this phenomenon. Absolutely. Absolutely, and, and I find it really uh, fascinating, exciting, challenging, and all of those things. I've studied theology, uh, uh, being one of the original hippies that got converted to a Jesus person and, and uh, was what a lot of people considered a fanatic. I do believe in Jesus Christ, and I think that it's all tied in. I believe that the book of Revelations uh, is... Uh, being revealed to us now, and as it said that it would be in the last days, I think this is all part of it. I would like to discuss this with you off the air sometime. I'll uh, right. give you a call. But yeah, I've, it, I've yeah, done a lot of call me or, yeah, call me or write me, and I'll make a point here because Art and Dreamland listeners know that I played an interview uh, excerpt, uh, I think it was in April, in fact, I know it was April, uh, from a conversation that I did with Robert Emenager, who was the author of UFOs, Past, Present, and Future in yes. 1974, and was involved with that documentary documentary production with Alan Sandler, and in April, he did not qualify any. He said that our government, or representatives from our government, met with uh, beings that had very large noses, vertical pupil eyes, meaning like a cat, with a ropey headdress rising above a domed head, holding a rod in the left hand with a coil around it, uh, very much like our Caduceus symbol in medicine. And that they, basically, it boiled down to Linda, the Sumerian gods of old came back, but they're not gods, they're extraterrestrial humanoids from some place else in the universe, and that they've had involvement with our planet for eons. Well, that is a startling piece of information, and if it's true, then our entire recorded history may eventually have to be redesigned, defined, and reconstituted in the light of the fact that there may be something else in the universe that comes and goes on this planet and has had some direct and intimate involvement with the evolution of the Mesopotamian area, which is now Iran, Iraq, and the Middle East, and maybe the rest of this planet. And if you start going back that far, and if the alleged Sumerian gods were not gods, but were some humanoid ET, then, and if they've met with uh, representatives of our government, for heaven's sake, uh, that alone might be a reason why the government throws up their hands and says, oh my God, how would we tell the world this? That's right. But well, I, we, should, we should be seeking the truth, 
something I think so. as religious people. I mean, if, if our religion is not the truth, we certainly shouldn't pursue it. We should pursue the truth above all things, and that's my religion. I do believe that Jesus Christ came directly from the Supreme Being, and somehow that's all going to come together. All right, Sarah, thank you. And we know this is one of the more difficult areas because everybody has personal opinions when it comes to the isms of the world. Mm -hmm. But I want to stress that truth is truth. No matter how long we humans cling on to we're alone in the universe or uh, the, the mythology of gods have to be something supernatural rather than extraterrestrial, that is just simply going to keep this generation uh, in, I think, blinders. Uh, it is that next step that when we finally get to we're not alone in the universe, it will not be so upsetting to consider the possibility that an advanced intelligence interacted with our planet and then we may finally get on to getting to what real truths are. All right, uh, onward. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hi. Yes, Art and Linda. This is Sunshine Art. Uh, yes. And uh, I had an uh, idea on about the birds or, you know, the other form of eating on the uh, dead animal. Right. And I, I think it has everything to do probably with no flow of blood because, you know, they know that it's not a natural death without blood. It's not a natural thing. Yeah, that, that's a good point, uh, Linda. Had you considered that? Well, I, yes, uh, there's been a lot of discussions uh, between ranchers and law enforcement and me on this issue, and most of the people who deal with animals, they, they seem to say that it really has more to do with scents and smells. At least that's their best educated guess. Animals are very dependent on their scent, and if something that has either an unnatural scent or the scent that they would expect to be there is not there. For example, there are many cases where mutilations don't even have maggots on them after five, six, seven, eight days. Hmm. Something has happened to preserve animals. Not in all cases, but in some. That must alert right there. There must be a difference in the smell of uh, such an animal compared to what uh, a coyote or pet birds would be used to uh, setting on or eating. And so I would think it's in that area as much as anything. The smell is probably different and it upsets the animal. All right. Well, on the toll free line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Good evening. <clears throat> yeah, Artemis. How are you doing? This is Tim from uh, KST, St. Louis. I uh, wanted to uh, ask your um, your guest, Linda, I called you a few times ago about uh, I was the one that uh, witnessed the cattle mutilations where the flies were stuck to the tree. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wanting to know, I, I called Sally Rail and she never returned any messages, so I'm basically still here in limbo trying to find out what uh, if she has any explanation for this uh, weird thing that I witnessed. <laughs> Well, uh, there were cases in, reported in Arkansas and I think one other southern state in the 70s concerning blowflies being found uh, on a tree near a mutilation and then in another case the blowflies were dead on the animal. Mm -hmm. uh, blowflies don't exist in the Rocky Mountain states and above certain altitudes. You have blowflies really only in the uh, more southern and and lower altitude climbs. So where that was reported, uh, there was never any, to my knowledge, if there was an analysis that the government went there and, and secretly did something, it has not been made public. Well, this was about 12 years ago up in Ellsbury, Missouri, and I still have a branch of the flies because I broke one off and kept Right. It. Well, if you've got something that we could get to an entomologist, uh, if it was not too old and too dry, it's amazing what they can find on uh, out of dead insects. Well, I'd certainly be happy to help get that transported to some place. Well, I'd love to do that because, like I say, one fly is like still has its wings extended as if it was it was it was flying at one time. Well, why don't you uh, call me uh, tomorrow and we'll talk about this and see what more we can do. Well, I had another UFO guy tell me that the the, the fact that the, the spaceships before they open up they basically do this to all the insects. All right, sir. Again, we're 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 out of time here, sir. Okay. So why don't you call her as she requests? Will do. All right, thank you. And uh, let me give out that number again. It is area code 215 491 9840. 
Once again, area code 215-411-9840. Also a good number, by the way, to order Linda Howe's documentary uh, at $35 or A Strange Harvest, 1993. Actually, that is the documentary. Glimpses of Other Realities at $45. Linda Moulton Howe, our guest, back right after the top of the hour. A, a, um, kind of a slam at you. Okay. Are you willing to hear it? Sure. All right. Hey, Art. I'm sorry I've got to be so cynical. However, I really get sick and tired of hearing someone on a show like this present these bizarre events, and most of what I hear is an endless litany of their qualifications. I think your guest's ego is so big that her perception of reality is distorted. If she has some real evidence, let's hear it. The evidence should stand on its own with her uh, list of so-called, uh, without her list of so-called accomplishments. I'm also tired of hearing nothing but a bunch of hearsay evidence from a bunch of people who want desperately to believe in any kind of conspiracy that can be imagined. We live in a society where people butcher their own kids to the tune of 1.6 million every year. It comes as no surprise to me that there are some sick people out there who get off on butchering animals. Scott, K-O-H, Reno. Linda? Well, either this man was not listening in the first part of the program. I mean, we did hear directly from a rancher who has had 11 mutilated animals uh, describing his own uh, reaction to them from the standpoint that uh, they were not predator. So we've eliminated that. And the idea that we would have uh, now almost 45-some cases, that's hard evidence, it's not circumstantial, it's not speculative, of working with pathologists on uh, tissue examination where we have confirmed the tissue has been cut with high heat, that's a hard medical science, that's not speculation. That's right. Uh, that um, is, the, uh, is not the work of somebody just going out in a prairie, uh, being able to take down an animal and do this. And the caller is not addressing at all the history of phenomena that have been reported now for 30-some years worldwide. The photographs and the bodies and the medical evidence, the necropsies, necropsies in which it's on, fat, on record. Uh, this man is apparently uh, not uh, reading my books or looking at the documentaries or studying the research, uh, seems to be more interested in uh, making some kind of a sweeping statement about egos, which he doesn't know anything about, because anybody who would have walked in my shoes for the last 14 years would know how difficult this is. It is, yeah, it is just overwhelming to constantly be trying to yeah. uh, deal with facts and present them to the public. Linda, I've been doing this now for years. Right. And uh, it strikes me that this man is one of those who responds to this kind of material, no matter what kind of careful presentation is made, with anger. Right. And there are a certain number of people who absolutely get red-faced angry angry about this kind of thing, and I'm not sure if it's a religious response or it's a fear-based response. I'm not certain, but I, I know a lot of people like this, Linda. Yes, and there was a rancher that I interviewed in my new film, A Strange Harvest 93, and she said it about as well as anybody I've ever heard. She said, people are in denial. She said it's a coping mechanism. If they deny it, it doesn't exist. It goes away, and they don't have to deal with it, think about it, or handle the implications. I think this caller falls in that kind of a category because when you do deal with the facts, and I am one of the few who's trying very hard to work with scientists and medical people, and you do find that there are physical traces and measurable differences, whether you're dealing with animals or the crop circles, we haven't even talked about the crop circles, uh, That's right. uh, or the physical uh, impacts in some of the abduction cases, not all, uh, physical traces in backyards as well as serial crop fields. There's much that is measured 
it is analyzed, can be picked up and, and handled in a lab, and that's what I and a few others have been trying to do. So when people get so enraged when we are talking about evidence, it suggests to me that when you're actually facing harder facts and not speculation, that some people become more upset because it's harder to deny. Yeah, it also seems to me that to complain about uh, uh, res re reciting uh, one's qualifications, uh, why if uh, you had come on here without qualifications, right. uh, he'd have been the first to raise hell about that. Why are you putting somebody on who uh, has no qualifications? So it's a, kind of an odd complaint. On the, right. on the wild card line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. How, this how is Fritz from Phoenix calling. First of all, Linda, just disregard this man's facts. This person is still asleep and he has to yet to be awakened. <laughs> Anyhow, Linda, a couple of weeks ago, you brought up the Ed Walters new photos. Right. And it's my conclusion that Ed honestly has been chosen by the Greys to be their photographic agent in North America. Why doesn't Ed go a little further and get some information what their next movies, I'm talking about the Greys, and maybe what's geologically in with planet Earth? Well, right. I, I, I know Ed well enough to know that he himself does not understand what's going on. He is the first to say, I don't know why uh, this object showed up uh, when my, I have my camera. He, he is not claiming to have any inside knowledge, really, uh, about whether it is gray or humanoid or anything else. Um, but Ed does seem to have a, a timing ability to uh, be in the right place at the right time to photograph some of these things. That's peculiar. Some people do. Um, I don't think that any of us could say that there's an intelligence that, or that we have proof that an intelligence is picking out a particular person for, let's say, photographing. Uh, I don't think Ed would say that, but he and others have gotten some good photographs that at least Bruce McAfee, uh, the uh, physicist at the Department of uh, the Navy in Washington. How have his he latest photographs been received? He feels that there's not a single question. They couldn't have been hoaxed, that the object was, um, I believe, 60 some feet in diameter, uh, that it actually obscured uh, one of the uh, jets in the air, uh, that uh, from Bruce's point of view, Ed got two photos of some kind of an anomalous silver object at least 60 some feet in diameter in the air at the same place as a jet seemed to be uh, scrambled around whatever this object was. And that, uh, from Bruce's point of view, that begins to be hard evidence. Other people could argue, well, this kind of stuff can be made on a computer. But he had 35 millimeter negative film that he was shooting on. Right. All right, uh, back to the phones, and on the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Where are you calling from, please? I'm calling from Bellevue, KVI. My yes, name is Martha. Hi, Martha. Hi. I have been trying to call about crop circles. I understand that there was a sighting in Chehalis, and I'd like to go see it on July 12th and wanted to know if she knew anything about it. And I'd also like to ask her if uh, she thinks there's any connection with the crop circles and UFOs. All right, thank you. Uh, crop circles and UFOs, I guess the answer is a general yes. What about the Chehalis uh, circles, Linda? Well, yeah, I'll come back to that. Uh, the general yes, it's a very complicated answer uh, about the, the link. But uh, Chehalis, I've had phone calls now from three different people who have called to tell me that the Chehalis formation was definitely hoaxed. One person said that they uh, knew who had done it. It's very controversial. Um, I was uh, who is with North American Cross Circle Study there. She, she likes, uh, as she says, she likes the formation. So right now the Chehalis has a big question mark around it. But uh, just recently there was another 150-foot uh, long formation up in Windsor, uh, Ontario, Canada. And I've seen uh, drawings and I'm getting videotape of that. And it appears to be more of the circle, corridor, overlapping arc. Mm -hmm. bars that we've seen in England and other countries for the last few years and 
that while this is happening in the United States and Canada, over in England, I got a call this morning from a friend of mine, Lisa Rome, about uh, an airplane ride that she took just this past week over wheat fields in England, in which she said there are about a dozen crop formations that resemble scorpions, beetle insects, a large eye. It's becoming increasingly bizarre over there. And uh, even though people will argue, well, maybe they're all hoaxes, we know that uh, in the past, and even this year from Canada and the United States, that uh, Eleven Good has already found the same uh, growth node enlargement, growth node orientation, uh, the splitting of the growth nodes in a formation from Michigan, uh, in uh, a, uh, another formation uh, that came from Oregon. And so he's waiting to get plants from some of these formations. You know what would be an interesting control check, Linda? To take uh, some samples from something that had been obviously hoaxed. He's done that many times. And then and then apply the same uh, testing regime. Yeah, he, he has done that many times. And in the hoax plants, the known hoax plants, there is none of the growth node swelling, growth node reorientation, changes in seeds, burst nodes. It doesn't exist in the hoaxes. All right, good enough. I'm glad and, I am. And one other just further point. There is, to date, when it was about uh, July, it was the MUFON conference, and I did that interview with George Wingfield, who described having uh, talked with people off the record about seeing a silver disc over a uh, wheat field in which a circle formed before their eyes, and it looked uh, like a fan opening up for right. those who heard that show. Uh, the problem is George has never been able to get those people on the record, and so it remains as a speculative or at least a circumstantial report. Uh, Colin Andrews uh, reported in, uh, I think it was around uh, 90, 91, that there was um, a crew from, I think it was Canada, and they were flying over a formation near, uh, Sil I think it was uh, Silbury Hill, and there were something like 11 circles in a wheat field and that night somewhere around midnight the farmer saw a huge orange glowing light moving down into the wheat field uh, could see the tree line in between him and the orange light so that the trees were silhouetted against the enormous orange light um, it scared him and he didn't go into the field until the next morning after the sun was up and there was a 12th I believe it was circle now again he didn't see the orange light make the circle the circumstantial link is there was this strange thing in the wheat field that scared the farmer who found the circle the next morning mm -hmm. and unfortunately the link between the alleged UFO phenomena and the crop circle has been that kind of not really direct eyewitness as much as circumstantial. All right. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hello. Yeah, uh, Mike from San Diego. Hi, Mike. Yeah, I'd like to know if uh, they had any measurable uh, electromagnetic or radiation effects uh, that, from the cattle that are similar to uh, the crop circles that I've heard about. Oh, that is a good question, actually. All right, Linda. Well, let me see. I think I understand that what you mean is with the energy, whatever it is, that's interacting with the plants and causing the changes uh, in the cell water of the plants possibly be the same uh, as with the animals. That's right. Um, it's a very interesting question, and I know that Dr. Levengood and I have talked about this uh, concerning this Garnett, Kansas case that I discussed a couple of weeks ago. Here we've got an oval in a wheat field. It's about one-sixth of a mile from where a heifer was found also in a kind of down uh, circle of grass. And when Dr. Levengood looked at the wheat plants taken from that oval that the farmer thought might be helicopter downdraft because he had heard the sounds of a helicopter coming from the wheat field direction. And we got the, the samples just to see what they would look like. And in all of the wheat samples, Dr. Levengood found these all these changes. And his own hypothesis 
means is that the energy, whatever it is that's interacting, and is not the downdraft from the helicopter that will not uh, swell growth nodes and reorient growth nodes and cause changes in cell structure in the seeds. That will not happen from helicopter downdraft. So he has, over the past four years, taken wheat and barley and different crops and put them in just a simple microwave oven to see if... Uh, knowing what the time exposure was, could he duplicate any of those changes? And when he has put plants in a microwave oven uh, with a certain energy, up to approximately 29 or 30 seconds, he gets some of the changes, not all. But the thing that is amazing to him is if they were left in the presence of that microwave any longer, the plants would be cooked. And we've never found cooked plants. In the cows or the other animals, when we find the hemoglobin cooked at the excision line, it's, it's well known, it's established. Medicine is a hard science. That's how, why you can have a biopsy done and a pathologist looks at tissue and knows whether it's cancerous or something else. When, he, when Dr. Lev, or Dr. Altshuler or any pathologist looks at this tissue under a microscope, if the hemoglobin is cooked, it's called a late blood phenomenon. It actually has an orange color under a microscope and it's quite distinct. The temperature to cause that effect has to be somewhere around 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that is a different kind of interaction. That's a searing, burning of the tissue, whereas in the plants, the plants continue to grow uncooked, unaffected, except for these strange biochemical and biophysical changes. So the answer is it would appear to be a different energy. Something different. All right. Uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, KEX, Portland, Oregon. Portland, yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Linda. Uh, have you heard about the uh, the criminals that uh, scam wealthy or desperate people that need transplants uh, but can't wait to go through the system? I hear a lot of these uh, mutilations uh, can be attributed to this, uh, you know, where they, they show the mark, uh, cow eyeball or liver, and, uh, you know, claim it comes from a poor Mexican or something. Have you, have you found any uh, evidence of this kind of activity in your research? No. Well, if you're suggesting that anyone could go out into pastures and take tongues, eyeballs, and genital area and ears from cows and then end up using those parts in some kind of human surgery? That's what he's suggesting. Uh, I think that any, uh, I think any transplant surgeon in the world would tell you, mm. if we can't take the heart from one human and put it in the chest of another human without major uh, uh, autoimmune reactions or, or trying to, the, or rejection, you know, when they have the problems with rejection, you're not going to be able to take parts from cows and use them in humans. I mean, that's just... It makes sense to me, too. Wild card line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hello. Oh, this is Fred, Missoula, Montana. Hi, Fred. KLCY. Yes, sir. Uh, got a, like, two questions, actually. I'd like to know if uh, hypnotic regression has been used on any of the folks that have seen the, the silent black helicopters to see if it is a false memory. There was one case in which uh, I worked on this one with Bud Hopkins, was a farmer in the Midwest. He was on a tractor. He saw what he thought was a helicopter land near some hay that he was going back to bail. And he saw what he thought were blonde humans on the helicopter. And when uh, Bud worked with hypnosis with that farmer, when he got to that part of the scene, I remember the farmer became very, very agitated and surprised in his regression that the helicopter was actually a round silver disc and that the blonde humanoids weren't blonde humanoids but were some other kind of being. That's the one case that I know where I've heard myself uh, the regression and... Uh, it involved specifically a helicopter that... All right. Does what I'm going to do is ask you both to hold on. The caller has one more question, so hang on. We'll be back to you in a moment. 
You're listening to Dreamland on the CBC Radio Network. My guest is Linda Moulton Howe, normally um, featured at the beginning of each one of these programs on a weekly basis. So stay right where you are. There is more to come. From the Kingdom of Nye, we continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255, 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222, 702-727-1222, or the wild card line at area code 702-727-1295, 727-1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Now again, here I am, back to Linda Howe in just a moment. The I'm now to Linda Bolton Howe. Linda? Yeah. Um, we have a caller who I believe hung in there, and he had one other question. Right. Call, caller, are you there? I sure am. Go right ahead, sir. Uh, last year I attended a UFO conference at which a gentleman, I believe he was from Brazil, presented what he thought was a human mutilation case. Yes, I'm familiar with it. I have the photos. The problem is I've shown that to a medical doctor and asked about the black. That there's black. It looks almost like carbon around holes that go into the flesh. Right. And the medical doctor said that that reminded him of napalm, of what napalm does to human flesh. Now... It is possible the following program that that has been pre-recorded for broadcast at this time. Murder, and that napalm was used, and the whole story uh, may be something at a terrestrial level, and this is my problem with it. There is no evidence that I know of that right. ties that uh, body to anything that was uh, anomalous. It's just a very... Uh, terrible-looking uh, murder. Yeah, it was pretty gross. Uh, are you aware of any other cases that might involve humans? All right, thank you. We'll hold it there. Linda, that's a good question. Yes, that question comes up. Um, you hear rumors, but that is the problem. If I personally feel that we don't have any evidence for any major concern. Uh, in terms of human mutilation, if there were any, they have to be so small in number that we're not aware of them because I've never seen a coroner's report or any hard evidence, and I know other researchers who have tried, and they don't have hard evidence. So that remains in that issue of, well, if it's happening to the cattle and the horses and stuff, it must be happening to humans. Right. That may not be true. It may be that the human abduction syndrome is the other part of the interaction in which people are basically, they appear to be returned at least alive, even if there's amnesia and other traumas, uh, and the animals are what are handled in this other way. All right. Uh, wild Card Line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hi. Hi. Art, this is Darkman, KVI. Yes. I had a couple questions, and then I'll uh, listen on the air. How close to the Seattle area have there been reports of any kind of UFO activity? That's my first question. And my second question is, um, with all the uh, UFO global activity that's been reported over the you know, countless years, has there been any evidence at all that there is some, maybe another race that has discovered us and maybe some rivalry between? I realize this is kind of an out, outlandish question, but it, has there been any evidence at all of any kind of conflict? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Conflict, you mean between uh, those who might be here? Correct. All right. Uh, Linda, that one first. Okay. Um, in 1990, a man corresponded with me to an intermediary by FedEx only. And a long story short, when after about a year of this, we finally had a meeting. Uh, my problem is in situations like that, people can say anything to me and they can show ID. I still can't prove it. But the, his basic contention was that he had worked inside of a very classified office on the executive branch of our government and that he was a spy on spies on spies in the SDI program. And he asked me, based on 
Leaving for he had been in attendance and the discussion was some other kind of life form or intelligence involved with our planet. He asked me if I knew what Earth's secret war was about. And I said to him, you mean with all of your clearances and being a spy and a spy of SDI scientists, you don't know? He said, no, I've heard it discussed, but I don't know what the issue is. If there is a conflict between two or more things that is our non-human entities and our government has knowledge about their conflict, that's one possibility. It's also part, part of the scenario has been suggested that we, the, the Earth human government, may feel it has an ally in something out there against something else. Yes. So that it is a two-way conflict between non-human entities and non-human entities with us, our government, feeling an alliance with one of the non-human entities against something else. Wow. Now, that's another possibility. Um, if there's anybody listening in our Dreamland audience, which is growing across the United States, who feels they have any hard information about what Earth's secret war might be, and I, when I say hard information, I mean people who have worked in military or intelligence and who feel they could communicate to me in some non-public, uh, confidential way, I certainly would be... Uh, uh, interested in seeing what uh, other information people might have. All right, and let me have this. It's a good time. Linda Moulton Howe, who you're listening to, uh, has done a number of significant things that you can get your hands on. She's done a recent documentary, uh, Strange Harvest 1993, which is available on videotape for $35. She also has a very revealing book, uh, absolutely chock full of pictures, called Glimpses of Other Realities, which is $45. So whether you would like one of her publications or videotapes, or you would like to speak to her about an, an incident, uh, there are two ways. One is to write to her at Post Office Box 538 Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania. That's H-U-N-T-I-N-G-D-O-N, Valley, Pennsylvania. Zip code 19006. Or call area code 215-491-9840. 215-491-9840. Is that about right, Linda? That's right, and I certainly... Uh hope that some of our listeners uh, will uh, try to get some of these books and videos because I've worked so hard trying to synthesize the harder data, and uh, I think it's important for people to know it's there and uh, can be accessed. All right, good. Uh, on the wild card line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hello. Well, no, you're not. Uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Good evening. Yes, uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to shut off my radio. Can you hold on a second? Uh, yes, indeed. Remember to do that, everybody. We have about a six-second delay system here, seven seconds maybe, and it is uh, very confusing. This is Carl calling from Spokane. Yes, Carl. And I wanted to ask Linda if she ever heard of about something that happened here in Spokane in August of 1972. And it appeared as a huge ball of fire going across the sky. And they said later that it was a meteor. Did you hear anything about that? I can't place a 1972 event in my mind right at this moment, but it does uh, tie in with the earlier caller's uh, first question, which we didn't really address. With regard to UFO activity in or near Seattle. That's right. And over the decades, going all the way back to uh, Kenneth Arnold and those sightings over Rainier, uh, right. that was certainly... Uh, in uh, that general area and since that time as recently as uh, in the early part of june i was speaking in vancouver british columbia and there was a radio uh this was a, a very active uh, talk show radio program there in vancouver and the host of the program had had his own sighting of odd moving lights that were forming patterns in the sky stopping and he was telling his story uh, as my interviewer and then talking to me about the incidents that they were having over 
Vancouver, Vancouver. There were uh, there were other people reporting. There were also reports down in the Tacoma area recently of people seeing something moving in the sky that was very odd. And I think that whole northwest region. I remember uh, in uh, my uh, book, Glimpses of Other Realities, I show a photograph of a cow on a uh, farm that was outside of uh, Seattle. And it was a very healthy cow. The farmer uh, kept it close to his house, uh, knew it was alive and well uh, the night before and in the morning, found that cow uh, in the way we've been talking about tonight, could not believe it. And th there had also been reports of odd lights uh, in and around his vicinity. So the Northwest, Seattle, Spokane, Tacoma, Vancouver, those are all areas over the last 50 years where there have been reported cycles of these strange events and what they mean and, and why there are certain parts of the country that get it more than others, I don't know. Oh, well, see, the thing about this is this wasn't at night. This was in broad daylight. And it was a huge flaming object. That All right, well, that, that is, in fact, the way uh, objects re-enter. Uh, what, what reason do you have to believe that it was not uh, a meteor? Well, I was just, I, I didn't really. I was just wondering if she'd heard about it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, but that sounds, uh, w without uh, additional explanation, uh, like a meteor. It does sound like a classic meteor, especially if it was going in a straight down or angled, or uh, some of these can go at a horizontal or pure horizontal tra trajectory uh, until they hit the ground. Um, the, the ones that defy explanation are especially the green fireballs that have been reported and scientifically studied that have come in and even done angular changes uh, in the sky. Now, that's not something that a normal meteor will do. I have seen green fireballs, Linda, but I, I always attributed them uh, to some sort of re-entering object. Uh, but I've seen several of them in Las Vegas. Wildcard Line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Yes, this is Danny from Mesa, Arizona. Hi, Danny. Yeah, I, I, could, would you do me a favor and repeat that quote by Neil Armstrong and the date that he, he said that? Well, it was about two weeks ago, Danny, at the White House while they were celebrating the 25th anniversary of, uh, of Apollo. Uh, I see. Uh, could you repeat that? I, 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 I want to try to write it down. I've got right. about three quarters of it. All right. It is a very short quote. There are great ideas undiscovered breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. There are places to go beyond belief. Neil Armstrong, uh, just about two weeks ago. On the wild card, or on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hello. Uh, yes, uh, let me point something out. Uh, earlier I didn't think that uh, uh, we were transplanting cow parts into people. What I wanted to point all right, out... All right, sir, I'm sorry, but we only allow one call per program. First-time caller line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Hi, this is John from uh, Silverdale, Washington. Yes, sir. Um, I would get a couple questions. Um, the the crop circles, uh, circles rather. Um, what would somebody actually put those down there for? Um, and there was another question I had for you, Art. Is uh, I'm going to be moving to Boise. Is there a station down there that picks you up? Yes, uh, there is, and uh, it's KIDO in Boise, Idaho. Uh, okay. Do you know the frequency number? Not offhand, but when you get to Boise, you'll find it. Okay. All right? Thank you. You're right. Yeah, KIDL is a big station. I grew up in Boise, and I'm glad Dreamland is uh, broadcasting there. Um, about his uh, question, why would anyone put these gigantic formations in the middle of crop fields like wheat, barley, rice paddies in Japan, rapeseed, uh, and almost every cereal crop now known, and, and grasses. Well, that's what a whole bunch of people now, for it's going on 12 years, have been trying to find out, because uh, the phenomena actually started back around 1978 in terms of circles that evolved into circles with rings that evolved into what are called Celtic crosses that evolved into Celtic crosses that seem to be uh, in a 
corridor, and the corridors and the Kelsey crosses and the circles kept evolving uh, by the year 1990 and 91, especially 89 to 90, and, and 90 was the year that Time Magazine, Newsweek, all of the uh, major uh, publications, the New York Times, uh, were showing uh, dozens of these uh, formations, some 460 feet long, and the entire world was reporting them in 20-some countries in the year 1990. And in the fall of 1991, for reasons that are still not clear and never have been clear, two old men from a county in southern England were trotted out by a tabloid videotape thing to say that they were responsible for this phenomenon, and all of the world's mainstream media bought that and ran with that as the story. Now, they said that they did it for fun. But that didn't explain at all the same formations in rice paddies in Japan and Australia, the United States and Canada and France and Germany and Russia and all over. And to date, the ones that are truly anomalous, there's never been any explanation from any place all right, why and, these are there. And for that man, it is KIDO 630 on the dial in Boise. And uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Yes, I'm calling from San Diego. Yes, sir. And my question is, uh, what do you wish to accomplish through all your research? Well, I'd, good... I'd like to know the truth about what is happening uh, with something or something, some other intelligence interacting with this planet. I think that we all should be trying to find that out. That's a good answer. First time caller line, you're on the air with Linda Howe. Yeah, hi, Art. Hi, Linda. Um, first of all, I wanted to ask if you guys had heard anything about a book called The Gods of Eden. Yeah, I know. Bill Bramley is an attorney who wrote that book, and it started out as a research project in his law career about why do humans fight? Why are there so many wars? Yeah, it, it seemed to me that that would be a good explanation as to why there's so much violence in this society. Is, well, is, as you know, in that book, when he did the research, he kept finding that in many wars and pivotal uh, battles in wars, that there had been reports and that they had been logged in histories and diaries about lights in the sky or funnels of light, all sorts of odd things. And one of the most interesting chapters was uh, concerning the plague in the uh, 1300s in Europe, where one-third of the European population was wiped out yeah. and there were diaries there, there, this is very well documented and footnoted and he did a great contribution to, to let readers know that that there were reports village after village of some kind of entity in a hooded cloak that carried something that looked rod-like in the hand and that was always associated with a greenish mist or fog in the village the night before the morning when people began dying. And that became the figure of death. Most people don't realize that the figure of death, drawn as a cloaked figure with a scythe collecting souls, goes directly to the European tragedy of one-third of the population being wiped out by a plague. And yet here was this cloaked figure, the rod in the hand, green fog, green light seen in the sky, and Bill made the point in the book, is it possible that something has been manipulating and interacting with this planet down to the point of spreading disease in order to reduce population? He left it as a question mark, but it certainly is an interesting one to contemplate. Mm. Uh, we're very short on time. Wild card line, you're on the air with uh, Linda Howe. Hi. Yeah, Texas Bob, San Jose, California. Very quickly. Yes, uh, uh, Roswell was a great show this evening. I think uh, Linda will find the end notes very interesting if she has a chance to watch it. I hope you all taped it. I, right. I did tape it. Good. All right. Talk to you later. All right, thank you. Uh, maybe one more. First time caller line on the air with Linda Howe. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Oh, I'm... Turn your radio off. Am I on the line now? Turn your radio off, ma'am. It is. Okay, good. Yes, you're on the air. Go ahead. Thank you. 
Um, Linda. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I'm so glad that I have your telephone number because right. uh, I'm on a cordless phone and anything can happen. All right. Very quickly, ma'am. Um, I'm going to be calling you tomorrow anyway about an unbelievable story, but I want to go back to 1955 when I first saw UFOs. All right, ma'am, this is obviously going to take a while. I'm sorry you're going to have to uh, do it in a telephone call. I'm terribly sorry to have to do that, but, Linda, we're out of time. Okay. Well, all right, as always, it has been a pleasure to do the three-hour special. I've enjoyed this immensely, and we'll look forward at some point in the future doing it again. And next week I'll be back with a report on whatever is the latest going on somewhere. All right, Linda, and I would ask that you hold on the line for just a moment, all right? Sure. All right, stay right there. I'm sorry, everyone. We're controlled by the clock. Um, and we have, when we've got to go, we've got to go, and we've got to go. So we'll do this once again next week. Linda Howe, who is a regular reporter with us every week, will once again be back. Uh, we'll see you then. For everybody at the network, thank you and good night. Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped, and yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. It absolutely is. Good evening, everybody. Sunday evening, another Dreamland. I'm Art Bell. And we'll have the, um, the usual lineup in that Linda Howe is here this evening. She'll be with us in a moment from Philadelphia, which she calls home. And then a bit of a different tack this morning, uh, John Zajac, who is um, a physicist and author of The Delicate Balance, will be here. And he's got uh, a bit of a different theory on the Great Pyramids. So we'll talk with him uh, right after Linda Howe. At any rate, I think you'll find it a fascinating adventure into areas, uh, as the billboarding said, where things are not so neatly or easily put into a box. And now all the way to Philadelphia and Linda Howe. Well, good evening, Linda. Are you there? Yes. Good. And, uh, you know, a couple of weeks I talked with Dr. Eugene Shoemaker, uh, who was uh, one of the co-discoverers of those uh, strings of comet pieces that have been bombarding uh, Jupiter for the last week. Shoemaker Levy 9. And he described the uh, potential impact that some of those gigantic pieces would have made on our planet if they had hit here. Yes. Uh, essentially being a major catastrophe. And today in the paper, in Philadelphia, they did a large headline asking, could it happen here, uh, basically following up uh, the same idea that Dr. Shoemaker and I were talking about, what would happen uh, in terms of an asteroid impact, and they reported something very surprising that I think is important for us all to keep in mind, uh, and consistent with the Dreamland theme, that many things don't fit in any of the neat boxes that we think about. This is a quote. In 1989, a half-mile-wide asteroid flew through Earth's orbit. The Earth had been at that exact point only six hours earlier. Oops. This was reported in a journal to the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. The quote from this House of Representatives report continues, Had that asteroid in 1989 struck the Earth, it would have caused a disaster unprecedented in human history, unquote. It's to think that we passed within six hours of a asteroid that was the same size as Fragment A that impacted on Jupiter and caused the first big bruise on that enormous planet, and that we came that close without any of us really realizing at the time, I think, is a sobering fact. Well, it's a sobering, Linda, I've always thought, that they did not know about this, apparently, until after it occurred. So. After it had happened, that's right. And they also asked a question that I think everybody should also give some serious thought to in this universe we live in. Uh, what 
is more likely to kill you in a lifetime? A hurricane, a flood, a volcano, an earthquake, a lightning strike, a shark, a grizzly bear, a poisonous snake, snake or a terrorist bomb? And the answer is that more than any of those would be a comet or an asteroid smashing into the Earth. The odds are the same risk as flying in an airplane anywhere. Wow. Yeah. And in addition to the fact that what has just happened on Jupiter could happen in our lifetime or maybe in the next thousand years to this Earth with yet unknown consequences, uh, as the violence has subsided on Jupiter, it has raised even more mysteries now with scientists who have some really interesting questions to solve. And among those are what is all the black stuff at the impact site? It might be sulfur, but no one knows for certain. How long will these big dark bruises stay on Jupiter's face now? And the answer is maybe months and that they will be visible for amateur uh, telescope watchers. So anyone listening who still wants to see these dark spots on Jupiter's face, they are visible for the amateur telescopes right now. Linda, um, one thing that a lot of people are asking, I'm asking in my own mind with regard to the dark spots, uh, Richard Hoagland incidentally thinks they're carbon, uh, but whatever they are, uh, Jupiter has a very very violent atmosphere, and it's um, uh, it's surprising that in effect they have not been quickly erased. Yeah, and everyone is uh, is tracing that, and in fact, I'm going to play an excerpt from an interview here uh, from uh, Dr. Andrew Ingersoll, who is professor of planetary science at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. He is going to be summarizing all of the 70 some Jupiter studies for a major scientific review in Bethesda. Maryland in October, and he talked to me yesterday about several of uh, the surprises they have so far, and they expect more to come, including the dark stuff, which he personally thinks is sulfur, and the issue of a carboniferous chondrite made up sort of comet hitting Jupiter is beginning to have a big question mark at the tail of it, because they have yet to find any presence of oxygen or water, and uh, as this uh, interview begins, uh, Dr. Ingersoll is uh, discussing that, uh, that very fact, which currently is one of the biggest puzzles so far at the end of this uh, impact, because it might not have been a comet at all. It may have been a broken up asteroid. This is Dr. Andrew Ingersoll, planetary scientist from Caltech. Uh, I think the, the big thing we've learned is that uh, there's not a lot of oxygen either, either dredged up from Jupiter uh, or else uh, brought in with the comet. Is that that there was no signs of water? Uh, very little indication of water uh, because in this hydrogen-rich environment, the oxygen you expect uh, to be tied up with hydrogen in the form of water. And comets are made out of ices and Jupiter is thought to have water clouds deep down and is already pretty firm, and I think uh, over the next few weeks we're going to firm it up some more and discover, people may discover traces of uh, oxygen, but uh, I think the, the lack of oxygen is so pronounced that we, that we can say we already know that, it's already a big mystery. Uh, now, if your question is how long will it take us to figure out the mystery, that might take a little longer. Well, isn't the implication of the mystery that the comet itself may not have been an icy snowball, but be must be made of something else completely different? That, that's certainly part of it. Um, it, it comet uh, really couldn't have been a, what we normally think of as a comet. It might have been a rocky asteroid, in fact. Um, the latest results um, suggest that uh, it might be just that. There, the latest results uh, show that there's metal uh, in the comet that, that are, are now seen in Jupiter's atmosphere. Right. Uh, like easium and silica. And uh, you can get metals if you vaporize a rock and uh, break the uh, molecules of, of uh, silicon dioxide and so on up into their constituent pieces. Um, so one implication is that um, the, uh, it wasn't a comet at, at all, but a, a, a rocky object like an asteroid. The other implication is that the comet didn't go deep enough uh, to dredge up uh, water from Jupiter's interior. Meaning that it may have been uh, vaporized uh, on the surface. Well, yeah, um, if you can speak of its surface, but uh, 
uh, or the upper atmosphere. The upper atmosphere. Yeah, from the top of the clouds that we normally see to the uh, zone where the water is, it's about 100 kilometers. And it's quite possible that the comet burned up before it got down that far. If Jupiter had no water uh, molecules in the uh, atmosphere at all, therefore no oxygen, what would that say to you? Well, that would be uh, just one of the most upsetting things to uh, our current understanding of how the solar system formed. Uh, and, uh, of course, we we all have open minds to that possibility that, that Jupiter just has no water, it has no oxygen. But uh, it's probably the last thing we're going to give up, uh, based with a lot of barrage of these data. So, Art, right now, the sum is they haven't been able to see the water and the oxygen that they had expected, especially if this was an icy comet that was breaking up in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. This is the truly one of the biggest mysteries so far from this impact. And Boy, it is. It yeah. is, Linda. And it may not have been a comet at all. It may have been a large asteroid that broke up and was all kind of a hard metallic mm. rocky material and that may be why uh, they have got in the spectrograph some of these uh, metals. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, and I, I'm sure this is going to continue to unravel over the next many months, isn't it? Yes, and I'm going to continue to talk with uh, Dr. Shoemaker, Dr. Ingersoll, some of the others, because each scientist around the country, uh, I have a list of about uh, 75 or 80 of them, they're taking different aspects of uh, these, uh, of all of this data, and I think periodically I will try to uh, bring uh, some brief updates. I thought tonight it was definitely worth going into this in depth uh, and uh, next week when I'm your full-time guest I plan to give you uh, some fascinating updates on what's been happening in the crop circles who've been in Canada the United States and England uh, new mutilation cases with some very interesting anomalies and reports and uh, if I have anything more to report next week concerning scientific discoveries on uh, the Jupiter impact I will certainly we can talk about that too good uh, I'm also getting reports uh, on my regular syndicated program, Linda, of crop circles up in the Washington State area. You've been hearing about that? Yes, there was one that I know of that has two parts to it, and it's the only formation I know. It's in the same field, uh, and I have uh, a drawing of it, and the size is about 150 feet in diameter, and it is actually resonant with both a formation that was in England two or three years ago and with oh. the current new one that's up in Ontario, Canada, which I'm getting videotape and photographs and have a, a drawing uh, from, and we're also getting analysis on the wheat from the one in Ontario. So um, by next weekend, I probably will be able to report some of the preliminary data on that. All right. Uh, the gal who called, by the way, tells me she has photographs and she's sending them to you. Great. Was that Iowa or Carol? Patterson. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, okay. I, I wouldn't have gotten the names, but right. um, but somebody's doing it. <laughs> All well, right. that's that's good. And uh, so even while our attention has been out in the solar system, much has been happening on our own planet in these strange other mysteries. Excellent, Linda. We'll look forward to it uh, next week and your full uh, guest appearance. Thank yeah. You. Thank you very much, and I look forward to it. Take care, Linda. Yeah. Bye bye. If you would like to reach Linda Howe, uh, the way to do it is. Uh, um, uh, to uh, write to her, and I've got her address here. And I might add that her documentary, uh, her new documentary, um, Strange Harvest 1993, is available now for $35. That's on videotape. And, of course, you can also get um, one of her publications, Glimpses of Other Realities, the most recent, $45. And Linda Howe's address is Post Office Box 538 Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania. Once again, Post Office Box 538 Huntingdon, H U N T I N G D O N Valley, Pennsylvania. Zip code 19006. So whether you want uh, some of her materials and or you would like to contact her regarding a sighting uh, or anything else, um, that is the appropriate address. And in a moment, we'll be back with a physicist and author 
His name is John Zajac, and I hope I'm getting that correct. First thing we'll ask him about. Right back to John. Imagine you. My, um, uh, my um, listener suggests that we particularly ask John about the Great Pyramid. So many people, uh, of course, think the Great Pyramid could only have been built using some sort of alien technology. And uh, Dr. Zajac apparently feels uh, very differently about it. And so we're going to explore why he thinks that's a bunch of rubbish. And uh, so here he is from somewhere in, I think, Central California. Is that right, John? San Jose, California. San Jose. All right. Uh, John, I take it you do not think the Great Pyramid was constructed by the Greys? By the Greys? Or greens or yellows or... <laughs> the polka dots and the blues? Yeah, that's right. Well, no, I don't. Um, I could understand why one would think so, because even with today's technology, we cannot duplicate the Great Pyramid, even if we didn't have financial restraints and uh, political uh, problems and so forth. We could not reconstruct the Great Pyramid today. Apparently science is wise enough to understand why the Great Pyramid is unique, but not so wise to be able to copy it. Hmm. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to allow you to make your case. Tell us a little more about yourself first, though, if you would. Uh, is it Dr. A and is it Zajac? Is that correct? Zajac is correct. There is no PhD associated with it. All right. Um, my claim to fame is the ability to have a very um, diverse and wide background and view to be able to show commonality between seemingly unrelated fields of science, very often creating a whole new field of science in the process. All right. How did you come upon this talent for connecting these things? Oh, it's kind of kind of inborn. Um, it's just a keen sense of observation and the recognition that things similar or related um, indeed happen in other disciplines. Uh, that has led me to some reasonable successes as Vice President of Research and Development for some leading corporations, um, Vice President of Research and Development for some leading corporations, such as Cutler Hammer, Eaton Corporation, uh, General Signal Corporation, mm -hmm. uh, Electrotech, uh, and some others. Oh, yes. And um, uh, with patents in many diverse areas, from chemistry to electronics, mechanics to um, uh, biometrics, etc. So um, it's a wide field, but the field is because the great Greatest technological advancements typically happen when the astronomer is talking to the metallurgist or to the anthropologist, and and when those seemingly unrelated scientists sit down and have dinner together and start realizing there's a common thread through their problems and put them together, then we come up with with uh, theories that can be later substantiated for the uh, uh, extinction of the dinosaurs, for instance. And do you, uh, while we're at it, do you have any thoughts? Uh, there's been a lot of talk lately, of course, about the dinosaurs. Uh, because of Shoemaker Levy 9 plowing into Jupiter and the fact that it might have happened here, do you think they were driven extinct by um, some comet? Actually, the evidence is overwhelming that that's exactly what took place. Uh, I was not um, just throwing some loose terms around. It actually came about that... Uh, a very leading scientist, uh, Nobel laureate actually from University of Berkeley, Alvarez, uh, has a son. And uh, Alvarez is in many areas of physics, uh, very diverse by himself, now, now passed away. But uh, he was having Thanksgiving dinner with his son, who was an anthropologist. Um, and uh, as they sat there, his son was saying that in, in different parts of the world, particularly in, in, uh, in Italy, that he could find some uh, very high levels of, of deposits of iridium and other such materials, and uh, that that happened about the time of, of the extinction of the dinosaurs. And uh, his father says, wow, but do you understand that that's not popular on Earth? He says, yeah, I know it's kind of rare, but uh, what can I say is a half-inch thick layer in, in, in Italy. Right. He said, that's only really found in asteroids. And uh, what you should do is check on other continents and see if it coincides and if the layer is there as well, if it also took place at the time of the, the Great Extinction. Um, which, is, by the way, extinctions have happened many times in Earth's history. And uh, sure enough, it turns out that this layer is global. And uh, knowing the thickness of the layer, they could measure what they would anticipate the size of the impact to be. In other words, the, 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 the size of the mass coming in from, from space. Certainly. And it, it turns out to be somewhere in the order of about three plus miles in diameter, which fits very nicely with with lots of things. They also could go backwards and check the frequency of great extinctions, which happens oh 
every 35 million years or so, which leads to a theory that there is a black, dark companion to the sun, um, about a thousand times out further than Jupiter, perhaps, that makes an elliptical path. And once every tens of, mil uh, of millions of years uh, comes in close enough to cause uh, a gravitational tug, if you will, through what we would call our expanded solar system. And let me mention what that is. I mean, we know there's nine planets, but the solar system is actually considerably bigger than that. It's as far out as our Earth has influence. And there's a whole lot of space junk left over from the beginning of our solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something called the Oort belt, if you will. It's a cloud that's sitting out very much further out than Jupiter, cannot be seen from Earth directly. Uh, and it contains something in the order of 100 billion pieces of rock junk left over from the beginning of time uh, with space junk in the, in the size of 1 to 10 miles in diameter. Well, that's the junk. Um, uh, well, John, I'm going to ask that you hold on. We're at the bottom of the hour, so we're going to do that break and we'll come right back to you. Uh, my guest is John Zajac, and uh, he's got quite a strong moment. with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222 or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. It is, and this is Dreamland. I'm Art Bell. John Zajan is my guest. And he is the author of The Delicate Balance. And we're talking about extinctions and cycles and dark suns. And John, are you there? Yes, indeed. Uh, there are a number of people, John, who think that uh, not only have there been cycles of extinction, but that man has been here before, uh, created civilization, and become extinct. Is it possible? Well, the evidence doesn't support that. Um, you would think that if man was on planet Earth before, that there'd be some fossil, some some remnant of his existence. Um, and to date, we haven't seen any anything to support that at all. All right. Uh, there are those who believe that it's very deeply buried within Earth, but that's probably a pretty long shot. Uh, so what is your view of how all this occurred? Well, uh, we mentioned, we're, take, we're talking about a delicate balance here, and right. if there's one underlying theme that I, I keep trying to present to folks is that just because something didn't happen yesterday, last week, or last year, or maybe even for the last thousand years, no reason to assume it couldn't happen tomorrow morning or next week. Um, the fact that we have gone through a very, very mild period in our climate and a fairly stable period in uh, geological effects and earthquakes and so forth doesn't mean that we can automatically anticipate that trend to continue. Continue. In fact, in many cases, we can uh, can look at, at history and say there's no reason for it to continue. History has never been this con this consistent and this, this temperate uh, for a long period. And we, with relation to that, we were talking about uh, the Oort belt and the fact that there are 100 billion, that's with a B, pieces of space junk sitting out there in a very delicate balance. Uh, we'll use that term a few times through this discussion, I think. Um, uh, where these pieces are as far out at the very edge of our solar system as possible, held in place by the extremely weak forces of the pull of gravity of the rest of the galaxies and the pull of gravity of our sun. That is, you know, being out there a thousand times out further than Pluto, you've got to know that those forces are extremely weak. Therefore, small forces could indeed cause a disruption in that balance and cause some of that space junk to fall in towards the sun. And of course, the Earth is in the path of some of that debris heading in towards the sun. Uh, the, uh, the evidence for such is rather amazing. Uh, we, temp we tend to be comfortable about things and say, well, yeah, in the early solar system, uh, there was lots of impacts caused upon the planet, evidenced by just looking up to the moon. Sure. Uh, the man, the moon, and all those craters are indeed obviously impacts. But the moon would have been struck by meteors considerably less frequently than the Earth itself because of Earth's greater gravitational pull. And it turns out that we have on Earth today that we can measure um, 
measure and observe 28 impacts still in existence, of course, eroded and corroded and covered over by, by growth and so forth, but 28 major impacts. The major impact is between 1 and 100 miles in diameter. Uh -huh. Now, when we talk about the average piece of space junk that's between, you know, something between 1 and 10, we pick the arbitrary number 5 miles in diameter. A 5-mile diameter piece of space junk with an average velocity of just under 50,000 miles per hour crashing into planet Earth would indeed cause a, a meteor impact about 100 miles in diameter. It would throw up so much dust and debris that we would immediately go into a new ice age. Um, certainly sunlight would be blocked out and, and if animals and, and humans didn't die immediately from the shock, from the quake, from the uh, inhalation of dust, uh, one would certainly think that food growing would be extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, for some length of time, probably years, um, but would throw us immediately into an ice age. That is the rough equivalent, is it not, of a nuclear winter? It is indeed where the theory for nuclear winter came from. Well, all right. Um, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting, but in fact... I'm, I'm just curious, John. If you were to do projections, yeah. uh, as they do with nuclear warfare... Right. And this were to occur, based on current technology, right. uh, how many people, if anybody, would survive? Maybe, uh, you know, handfuls of people uh, would survive. Uh, let me give you a, a for instance. For instance, in the, in the American arsenal, we talk about having 10,000 nuclear weapons, thermonuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. The Russians claim to have nine or 10,000, but our resources suggest perhaps 40,000. However, the average size of the American arsenal is about half a megaton. It's roughly a, a little bit bigger than that, approaching one megaton for the Russians. If we added what's known of the American and Russian arsenals together, and even added in all the stuff we think the Russians are hiding, we're talking in the vicinity of 50,000 weapons, less than one megaton apiece. That would, say, that would be to say that if World War III broke out and every single weapon got used, and went off, we're talking in the terms of 50,000 thousand megatons mm -hmm. okay if something the size of a half of five mile diameter struck the earth we wouldn't be talking about 50,000 megatons we'd be talking 100 million megatons mm, big bang of course, the, uh, of course uh, it would be concentrated in one location versus uh, a nuclear exchange being in many, many, many or almost all locations. Well, that may or may not be true completely. And as we've just seen, the gravitational pull of Jupiter broke apart uh, the, the comet that smacked into it. Uh, we might see fragmentation or companion parts as well. It has been... Uh, Two thoughts come to mind in this regard. Uh, it has been uh, pretty much shown by now that we've seen this, this comet break up that if we look at the moon and other places, that many of the impact craters are in straight lines, which pretty much says that it's multi or multiple impact. So it would be like a shotgun blast. Well, you know, one blast would be enough to do it, but we might not have the luxury of only having half the Earth destroyed. Certainly, if, when you throw debris up into the atmosphere, you cause enough of a, of a um, uh, global problem from a standpoint of, of falling dust and, uh, and blocking out of the sun to cause very, very many problems. Uh, not only from inhalation of the dust itself, which is, of course, even during uh, volcanic eruptions, what has killed many people, but uh, because of the sudden change in temperature. You know, uh, here on planet Earth, it's kind of interesting. Uh, people have looked at the, form, the, at the farmers almanac for years and said, uh, gee, isn't it in county? They, they have a whole bunch of things which kind of tend to make sense to come true. And one of them is, is that a severe winter always has an early snowfall. Hmm. But that's not coincidence. That's absolute fact. And the reason why is, is when the first snow, snow falls, the white area reflects 97% of the sunlight coming in, guaranteeing the temperatures directly after snowfall to be cooler than they would have been if there wasn't a snowfall, causing additional precipitation in the form of snow, <laughs> causing additional sunlight to be reflected, therefore causing the winter to be more severe. In fact, hmm. scientists have recently put together <clears throat> reasons why we have colder winters, uh, some one of the reasons for having some colder winters. And it's got to do with whether or not the first snowfall takes place on the northern or the southern slopes of the Tibetan Mountains. They said, now wait a minute, 
that that's for sure the other side of the globe. What's going on? Right. Well, what happens is is that with the first snowfall, just as we've mentioned, um, additional sunlight's reflected, causing a a colder region. The hot and cold cause high and low pressure areas. And as the jet stream smacks into the Tibetan Mountains, it needs to make a choice whether to go over the you know go up around the north or down around the south. However, when it moves around the Tibetan Mountains, it sets up a pattern which tends, I use the word tends here carefully, which tends to encourage either northern or southern movement of the jet stream around the rest of the of the hemisphere. Therefore, the first snowfall in Tibet can very much affect what what we see in terms of uh, of our winter uh, because our weather patterns are very much controlled by the jet stream. In fact, when we look at the weather patterns we've had lately with drought and, and so forth, we see that it's really because the jet streams are not where they, we, we typically want to, to find them. Right. Our, our droughts in California have been caused because the jet stream has been about 400 miles too far north. It's been raining buckets up in Washington, Oregon, but California has been having Mexican weather and has been very, very dry, causing a six-year drought and mandatory water rationing cutback of, of agriculture and so forth in, in California, uh, the most uh, productive area in the country, by the way, from, for produce. We produce more, uh, more produce is produced in, in California, and by produce we're talking about fruits and vegetables, not particularly wheat, um, than any place else in the country. But many of the orchards have been forced to, to uh, literally have their trees uh, die for lack of water and so forth because of our long drought. We've also seen this in the southeast, where, again, jet streams being too far north North uh, change the weather pattern significantly enough to cause uh, thousands of chickens to die from from the heat, and as well as extreme failure in, court, in corn crops and so forth. So, so our weather pattern is a very delicate system set up upon the difference in temperature between the poles and the equator. With the rotation of the Earth, that difference uh, of, of temperature, which drives the heat engine, sets up the jet stream, sets up our weather pattern. And without that delicate balance being there, we don't recognize what we end up with. And even small shifts has caused large changes. Now, talking about this, this meteor impact thing, if I, if I may, uh, which, by the way, is discussed in great detail in the book, The Delicate Balance. Yes. Um, it is uh, also, though, uh, something that I've been talking about since uh, this uh, comet going into Jupiter has been recognized in all the science journals, which is about a year and a half ago. It's kind of amazing that it didn't reach the public till now, uh, as many of us have been giving uh, lectures on it uh, uh, before this. But, but what is exciting and interesting to me is uh, how real this is. In the, the, the beginning of your program, it was mentioned that the probability of any individual on Earth being killed by some uh, catastrophic event um, or by even some natural causes, such as snake bites and bear, bear attack, uh, earthquake, I think she mentioned earthquake, um, but certainly hurricane and, and lightning and so forth, was, was equal to a trip on an airplane. It actually turns out that although air travel is the safest means of travel, it is more likely that anyone will be killed by a impact of a foreign visitor from deep space, namely an asteroid or a, or a comet, than, it, than they will be by flying because most people, the average person, takes more than one trip in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. That is very, very significant. Now, she also mentioned that the, we have this major uh, comet or asteroid uh, fly by the Earth, crossing Earth's path six hours apart from where the Earth would have been. And that happened on March 31st, 1989. And indeed, um, it was close, but it did miss us by something in the order of a half a million miles. It was found only six days after uh, it passed by because no one was looking for it. It also turns out that in 1989, we had two other close encounters, and that's three in one year. That's I I, you know, I remember it very well. I remember the Associated Press reports of it, and they were always, gee whiz, we just found out we just had a close encounter. Again. Yeah, again. Again, and each time it was found afterwards, and each time it was because people would examine uh, photographs of the night sky and see what, what was that, it wasn't there before, and then could make projections for its course and so forth. But because uh, they don't send out uh, big, long tails, and we don't see them coming from a long distance, uh, they're not being observed. Well, three of them in one year was rather unsettling. 
uh, remember we mentioned that there was this delicate balance holding things in the Oort Belt out there. And one of the things that happened significant, or maybe insignificant, I, I can't say, because uh, science has never figured out what gravity is. Uh, oh, we've got names called the graviton, and we talk about gravity waves, but no one has a clue what it is. We don't know how fast gravity travels. We don't know what it will uh, travel through. We don't know if gravity waves can bend gravity waves. We don't know anything about gravity except Sir Isaac Newton, who we'll talk about later. I was sitting under apple trees, so the story goes, and got hit by head by an apple. I've maintained that if there were no apple trees, we wouldn't have the word gravity. So, I mean, that's how, how in the dark we are about gravity. However, if you would take any significance to the event that in 1986, all of the planets wind up in a perfectly straight line, an event which happens only once every hundred, I'm sorry, once every 286,000 years, you know that that's not a common event. If gravity waves bend or are focused or add together, and we don't know that to be the case, could that have an effect or a tug on that Oort belt? I don't know. How long would it take for stuff falling out of the Oort belt to fall towards the inner planet? Yes. I don't know. How many pieces could fall at a time? Well, if even one piece fell, probably hundreds, maybe thousands of pieces would fall. Uh, there's no reason to think a piece would fall when there's a hundred billion of them out there in different positions delicately balanced. Here comes the kicker. In 1989, yes, there were three, but in 1990, there were six. That was exciting enough that the science departments of Yale and Harvard put together a, 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 a team to, that came up with the first analysis that you were more likely to die if this trend, can, if this trend does not go away, uh, sent then Vice President Dan Quayle to Congress to ask for $125 million, which was appropriated, yes. uh, to build a number of inexpensive, short-sighted telescopes to quote-unquote look for the killer asteroid. Now, it was believed at the time that that study was started that there were 40 pieces of space junk, at least a half mile in diameter, that were known to cross the Earth's orbit. And they were, except that in the first two years of study, they found 25,000 more. Oh. So as we speak, and the number goes up every day, there are 25,000 pieces of space junk, half mile or larger in diameter, that, co that cross the Earth's path. Now, those may not be the most damaging ones because they are not coming from deep space. They are remnant of, of different things, which we'll talk about later probably, but probably the asteroid belt or whatever that cross our path, but have been fairly stable for a, a, obviously a long time. The more concerning are those pieces that will fall out of the Oort belt um, that we don't have any clue about that um, may be of any size between 1 and 10 miles in diameter, as just, just, just mentioned. And um, uh, that is much more concerning. And in the scientific community, it is a real concern. Let I'm me saying. ask you the question that I have asked others with regard to Sh Shoemaker Levy 9. Had Shoemaker Levy 9 been headed directly toward Earth instead of Jupiter, could we have stopped it? The answer is absolutely not. However, that does not stop science from thinking they have the possibility to do it. There is a joint effort with the USSR at this time to build deep space missiles carrying atomic warheads. And although it, it's feasible, the realities of it are not. And let me tell you why. Number one is that uh, there is no reason to believe that we will see the thing coming at us long enough advance. Now, with, with Schumacher, we saw this a year and a half in advance because it already made one close pass by Jupiter, and we saw that. Uh, Jupiter's gravity then, you know, said, no, you can't keep going, and pulled it back in, and so we saw this happening. And the only question for the last year and a half was picking the date. Interestingly, science did not pick a, a set of dates so far apart. They kept picking July 20th and 21st, which uh, were, I thought was very conspicuous, coincided with the 25th landing of the first man on the moon. Um, but um, as we know, it's, you know, we came in here for almost just about a week, from last Saturday to... Either 
Thursday or Friday of this week. That's right. So, so it was spread out further than we, we, we probably anticipated. Uh, we couldn't tell for sure the size of each of the objects because uh, of their distance and so forth. But we, we were standing by ready and waiting because uh, we had uh, a year, approximately a year and a half notice of the event because of its last close path, which indeed caused it to break up into fragments. The, the consideration here, though, is, is that if we saw three in 89 and that we continue to see close encounters passing by us, in fact, the closest was 1993, we had a piece of space junk approximately a mile in diameter, perhaps slightly less, come within half the space of the Earth to the moon. Oh, boy. Okay, I mean, closer still, much closer still. We talk about things closer than the moon. Under 200,000 miles, I would take it. Well, uh, if it was half the distance, to be 125,000 miles. Uh -huh. so, so closer again, which leads us to believe that perhaps, and perhaps likely, we are a meteor shower. Of what duration? We do not know. Will it intensify? We oh, well, that, that would mean that the likelihood would be uh, numerically much greater. John, hold on just a moment. We'll be right back to you. Um, it seems to me it would be numerically much higher if that is true. You're saying that we may be in a period of increased frequency uh, of these objects uh, making close passes? It would certainly seem so. We saw no record of it until 1989. Every year since then we've seen you know, a high number. A high number three is a high number when you haven't seen it for hundreds of years. Um, uh, that the closest one was just 1993. Uh, time, time to be paying attention. However, look at the logistical problem we're talking about. Wait a minute. Important uh, fact here. Are we paying attention now? I believe we are. I believe we're paying much more attention to the possibility. I think that what has just happened at, at Jupiter is uh, increasing public awareness and uh, making the public more willing to, to fund projects that would allow us to see what's going on. However, do remember this. We didn't see the, the, uh, the Jovian uh, comet until it was close, uh, making a close pass at the, at the planet. We only know now that it was going to take place because after we saw it go by and we had our eyes trained on it, if you will, um, we could project uh, where it was going and what would happen a year and a half in advance. Right, okay, but John, this, an advance yes, this calls for a little bit of speculation, John. Uh, speculate for me. If they determined that an object was coming, but that we could do nothing uh, about it, in other words, explode uh, things on it as we might, we couldn't change its path, um, would they tell us? Might. Might indeed. Might? Right, yeah. Um, Might not, not because then. not because Washington would make the decision, but rather because the uh, the scientific community and uh, people looking at, at looking for comets and asteroids, which by the way, almost all of them are found by amateurs. Mm -hmm. All of the big telescopes have a you know very busy schedule, and they're all busy looking at at uh, new at, at new formations in the sky and and distant galaxies and looking for for planets around stars and so forth. Um, they're not looking close by, and they don't have time to just sit there looking for, for something they may not find. They have, a, they have a real agenda. So if they missed one, joke would be on us. Well, they're not likely to find it, as I just mentioned. I most most uh, asteroids are found by, by amateurs. It's an awfully good point. And, and, you know, if it ever happened, uh, all the, if there was anybody around to uh, uh, serve up recriminations, they would be saying, well, then why didn't the London Observatory see it or something? And there would be people like you uh, trying to explain they weren't looking for it. They're not looking for it, no. Their budget is to go, go find life on distant planets or something. <laughs> the, the, and, and it, you know, uh, it was re it's very John, 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 you've got to freeze it right there. We're out of time at the top of the hour. Relax for about six minutes. We'll be right back to Jack on the CBC Radio Network. This is a pre recorded, previously broadcast program. Or the wildcard line at area code 702 727 1295. 
727-1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Now again, here I am, Dreamland, on a Sunday evening. Uh, John Zajac is my guest, and we'll get back to him in just a moment. And, John, here's a quick question for you. Um, it came in by fax from Albuquerque. A quick question for your guest. What is your best guess as to when this dark body, the one you referred to, will again pay us a visit? John? Well, uh, that dark body probably isn't due for oh, another couple of million years. Oh, good. However, uh, that may not be the only cause for, for such things to occur. So it's, it's not the black body figuratively called the nimbus that would uh, necessarily cause this. Um, but if anything is out there that far, barely held on to, to our sun's gravity, uh, it too may have changed um, its path and, and so forth. So, so we really don't know. That, that's the whole mystery here is that we have barely understood some of what's going on, understanding why it may fall out of balance if we had a real good handle on when things would fall out and when we'd be in, in deep, in deep straits. Um, that would make, make things easier. Uh, right now we're just barely smart enough to understand that these conditions occur and they could fall out of balance quickly. The, uh, what we're talking about is whether or not mankind, with its infinite wisdom and technological abilities, uh, would just simply send up our nukes and, and blast the thing out of the sky. Well, it's kind of interesting that even just recently on CBS News, and I'm talking just three days ago, they were saying, yes, this is one of the few natural disasters that, that modern science can uh, can prevent. We can't prevent hurricanes. Not exactly true. We could nuke those too, I suppose. Um, uh, we can't, you know, predict or stop the earthquake, something we really should talk about later on. Uh, we can't do those type of things, climatic change. But, sure, big rocks flying through space, yeah, we can blast those puppies out of the sky. Let's think about it for one second. Number one, we don't have any deep space probes. Number two, <laughs> we don't have a Saturn V anymore, which, it's, which was required to get to the moon. That's true, except as a museum piece. Uh, except, yeah, except as a non-operational piece. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. um, our shuttle it takes things into low Earth orbit, a couple of hundred miles above the surface of the Earth. Even when we launch the shuttle, have you ever seen one launch on time? No. No, I've never have. I mean, it may, there may have been one or two that actually went off within a couple of hours of, of assigned time. But even then, it takes four days just to roll it down to the gantry. Well, you see, that's exactly it, uh, John. I don't think we could do it either. If something right now was uh, in, 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 you know, close in, found to be headed toward us, we wouldn't be able to do a thing about it. And if that were the case, then uh, if they knew, why say anything? Well, it depends on who the they is. If it's the amateur scientist, they'll be yelling and screaming to anybody who'll pay attention. If it's the scientific community, they'd probably rush to publish. If it was the government's observatories or paid for uh, telescopes, they might indeed wish to halt it um, if they could keep it under wraps. Uh, I have a strong suspicion everybody in the know would be making quick phone calls to everybody they cared about. Mm -hmm. So it might not be able to be kept well under wraps, although it would only be spread about as a rumor. If I can examine one more little aspect of that is the following. I mean, how far away would we have to reach it? Some scientists say before it got as close as the moon, a quarter of a million miles away. Mm -hmm. But think about that for a minute. We just finished saying that the thing would have an impact of 100 million megatons. That is to say that that's when its velocity, its energy is converted from potential energy uh, at the site of impact. What are we going to send up? A one megaton uh, charge? That's a pretty big weapon to us. A 10 megaton bug? What's 10 megatons? is going to do against 100 million. Well, I guess the Nothing. conventional wisdom, John, is that it would change the orbit not much, but just enough to cause it to miss. Well, that, does that mean instead of hitting dead center in New York, we only hit Brooklyn <laughs> with a 100-mile impact? I mean, you see my point. We'd have to be able to see it coming, you know, from, from great distances. If things moving at, at close to 50,000 miles per hour, mm -hmm. our fastest rockets travel at 18,000 miles per hour. Uh, first of all, do we have the technology and radar are to time things so perfectly that we can actually get this thing to explode 100 yards ap uh, apart from this thing at speeds of 50 or 60 plus thousand miles per hour? Very problematic. Yeah. Probably not. Uh, and we have to get close because most of the energy is not going to go in the direction of, of the rock. So 
So, yeah, it gets more and more unrealistic. That's not to say that the government and our government that with the USSR are to do trying to build some deep space missiles to do it. Fortunately, the, the Russians can launch at will where we can't. Um, John, I, the, the, I want to... The likelihood of it being successful are rather remote. Right. I want to quickly change directions. Uh, about the bottom of the hour, I want to get the phone lines open. Right now, I want to ask you for the short version, if I can, uh, with regard to the Great Pyramid. Um, I'll give you the, the bottom of the hour. I know you said it takes about an hour, but if you could give us sort of a shortened version of it or the high points of it. Uh, you don't think that an alien uh, race built that pyramid at all? Uh, who do you think built it, and how do you think they did it? First of all, I don't know who built it, except to say humans probably supplied the horsepower. Okay, that's item number one. Okay. Item number two is that <clears throat> to understand what's really taking place here, more important than knowing who built it, who supplied the horsepower, is who, did it, who supplied the design for it. And the design is so phenomenal, so overwhelming, that I will make, I will make a prediction right here and right now that you have never gotten a response on your radio show as strong as the one you're going to get one hour after I start talking about the Great Pyramid. Um, it's it happened everywhere we've ever gone because this is a very exciting and different approach. I can't summarize it to you in in in, in fast terms because it, the great pyramid story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And you need, to, you need to know why it's unique, then how science was able to establish its uniqueness, then what it did that nothing on Earth could do, and why not only could science not build it, but science could not design it. Well, one of the tickers we're going to get to at the end of that comment is if every scientist in the world just on paper tried to design the Great Pyramid using all the supercomputers available in the world for any other planet in the entire universe, it could not be done. It could not be done. It's a mathematical impossibility. And we will do that. And it's fine thing, but we can't... You can't do it without going from beginning, middle, to end. And if we have just a few minutes before the, the bottom of the hour, uh, maybe we should close off on this, this connection thing with, with uh, the asteroid. And that is to say the following. You know, one of the nice things about your program is it says, let's look at things, let's look at them intelligently, and let's look at all aspects. But let's not put it in a box. Right. And that's really important. And in the delicate balance, we again take this wide view and tie seemingly unrelated things together. The economy, the ecology, scientific uh, development developments and so forth. And one of the things that happens as we do this, as we look at meteor impacts, again, which is covered in detail in the book and so forth, uh, it's not something that just happens because of what's going on on Jupiter. Uh, but as, we, as we're looking at those things, very often one says, gee, haven't I heard this someplace before? And sometimes we have. And here comes one of these things, going to sound really out in left field. But what we examine at the same time is prophecy. And not prophecy from Gene Dickens, Dick, Dick, Dickens mind you, but rather from, from three. We, we, I chose purposely to use only three from very different walks of life. And those three are no less than George Washington, the founder of, the United, uh, of our Constitution in many respects, but certainly the father of our country. Um, Miguel de Nasty Damas, probably the most popular secular uh, figure in terms of, of prophecy, a futurist and a world-renowned physician who would have been famous on that court alone had he not also been able to foresee and foretell the future. Yes. And just because, why not, uh, we look at John at Revelation as well, because uh, as a good scientist, you can leave no rock unturned, and there are things there that seem rather significant. Well, you almost seem to apologize for its consideration, you need not do that. Well, I only I only preface it as I do and give John third billing, so someone wouldn't think that I am uh, I am trying to uh, uh, be especially religious and or to prove the Bible. Neither of those are the case, but rather to say let's keep an open mind and and let's make the examination. And it's kind of interesting uh, as we, we approach the close of the hour, the bottom here of the of the hour, so that we'll go on to the whole new subject of the Great Pyramid. Is to say if if what we've just described is these three people being prophets. 
exist. If they foretold their future, which was now our history accurately, then maybe we should be paying attention to what they claim our future to be. And indeed, the Gelby Nostradamus speaks of, and he's misinterpreted very widely, but speaks of great devastation happening on planet Earth right. because of climatic changes, great drought and pestilence, probably due to food shortages and so forth as well. When the great comet makes its run, and that was from other quatrains shown to be in the latter part of the, the 20th century. Right. And so everyone said, ah, Haley's Comet, Haley's Comet. Nostradamus is predicting worldwide drought and famine um, in 1986. But that's not true, and it wasn't true for several reasons. He was speaking of an unknown comet because it does things that Haley's never could come close to doing, uh, including drying up the lakes and rivers and so forth. Not to say we don't have drought and famine presently, but not on the scale that Nostradamus was talking about it being severe worldwide. Right. So Miguel de Nostradamus was talking about this great comet. When the great comet makes its run, that all of these universal uh, effects of Earth start changing. Uh, John, in the book of Revelation, also speaks of a time when a great mountain, a flaming mountain, is hurled onto the Earth, and that it destroys a great um, uh, city. Uh, it's called Babylon, but it's, it's, it's a representation of Babylon, a place of, of sin, if you will. But we're a great trade center, where he says that uh, all the merchants at sea will wail and grind their teeth, saying, but what city could compare to this great city? Uh, which would cause, by the way, because of its impact, a worldwide earthquake that would uh, leave, quote-unquote, no island left in the sea, no mountain left in its place. How does Nevada and Las Vegas sound to you? In terms of safety? In terms of a target. <laughs> well, there are some who would, who would pick that. I, I personally think that if we're going to try picking a, a city of, of center of commerce, we'd probably have to pick New York. But um, <laughs> with child pornography and so forth. Uh, I, I do believe I did tuck some New York in your accent, don't Yes, there's, there's, there's some there that's been trying to be, be uh, tucked away for about 20-something years. Why did you leave New York, John? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> you, need a, you need a, a long semi. list of reasons? <laughs> and no, no, I don't. I was just wondering if it was connected to prophecy. No, it wasn't connected to prophecy. It was connected to good weather <laughs> and to um, a, a nicer lifestyle and yes. to get away from some of the uh, rudeness and toughness of, of New York area. But um, because there may be no place on Earth that's safe, if we had time to talk about earthquakes later, we'd see that California may be the safest place in the entire country to withstand a major earthquake because they're due within the whole country. But California has earthquake standards and some, some provisions set up and a mindset that will probably help to handle it. And, and every mile underground, the telephone company has a 10-foot loop of wire to pick up to, to allow for, you know, movements of ground and so forth without breaking down communication. So the earthquake, the major earthquake we're looking for in California will not be a pleasant one, but any place else in the country would probably be considerably more devastating. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the bottom line here is simply that prophecy is something which I keep threading through the things we're doing, and, we'll, and I think it's very significant because it shows that some of these things may not be out of left field but been foretold for centuries. And when we look at the Great Pyramid, we will find that the Great Pyramid is probably, and I say probably loosely, it's almost definitely the most incredible prophetic message ever left on the planet. Ever left on the planet? Left, uh, left by whom, John? Well, we'll have to discuss that, but, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's not that I, I'm claiming it was not built by humans, but that's the horsepower. The question is, who supplied the technology? Who supplied the design? Why was it so important to leave a prophetic message um, uh, for the planet, uh, which no one can really refute? And it's very interesting how the message is left. But the message is not left in hieroglyphics. It is not left in symbols or terms or words. It is left in the universal language of numbers. In fact, we know from computers that every computer on Earth speaks the same language, regardless of whether it's built by the Japanese or by the French or by the Americans. They all speak the same language. It's true. And I have a, uh, a cousin who, when, when uh, being presented the information, says, well, a universal message. I mean, if it was really to be so so universal and someone wanted to leave a message, why didn't they just leave it on videotape? Why did they have to leave it numerically? And I'm just dumbfounded by that because the Great Pyramid is the oldest structure on Earth. It is 4,614 years old. And 
as I think of this, I ask him, well, you know, I can't understand Shakespeare, and he spoke, quote-unquote, English just 300-plus years ago, and I can't understand that very well. Uh, if we're going to put it on tape, what kind of tape should we put it on? Should it be on VHS, Super VHS? Should it be Betamax? Uh, is it on quarter-inch tape, three-eighths-inch tape, half-inch tape, one-inch tape? Um, at what speed is the tape running? Do you know that the li average life expectancy is a piece of plastic tape but seven years? Sure. It is 50 years for a piece of metal tape. How many lines to the inch are we talking about here? Are we talking standard television broadcast, 330 lines? Are we talking uh, home broadcast, which is 220 lines, where you seem to lose resolution? Are we talking uh, online, super VHS, 440 lines? Are we talking super high density? All of this took place in the last 10 years. So if you wanted to leave a message for the ages, you would roughly build the pyramid. Well, you would leave it in stone. You wouldn't leave it on tape. You wouldn't leave it in some cryptic language which kept changing. No, that makes sense. You'd have to leave it in something universal. The only universal language is that of numbers. And so that's, that's the only possible thing it could have been left in. And certainly it had to be left in stone, for that's the only thing that would last uh, the period of time necessary to get the message to whom it was directed. Who do you think this message... Um came from. I know I'm, I'm probing ahead. Well, the message came from the designer. And who do you think the designer is? Well, I am absolutely positive it was no one from planet Earth. Oh. But I also... Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh really? I, I, now, this kind of goes against what I thought your position was going to be. And that is that, um, uh, that it was, um, in essence, designed and built by Earthlings for Earthlings. And now you're suggesting to me uh, that is not necessarily the case. You think that I'm designers... I'm I'm making an absolute statement. The horsepower was probably supplied by humans. But the design concept was definitely not. And on what basis do you conclude that? Well, you have to, I, I, you know, I, if I told you 3.1497, or you went down 17 digits, yes. and you didn't understand what pi was, it would have no meaning. So we have to first understand why it's unique, and then you can understand why Earthlings couldn't have designed it. I understand the math is unique. Uh, tell me now why that means Earth people um, could not have designed it that long ago. Well, first of all, the technology to do it not only didn't exist then, it doesn't exist now. The second reason why is, and by the way, I'm not suggesting it was made by some clever Martian either. But, and that almost seems that there's nothing left, but that's not true. The next thing, though, is, is that I just finished telling you that the greatest piece of prophecy ever left on planet Earth is the Great Pyramid. But how do you explain the ability to foretell the future in such precise ways by anything that's called scientific? Um, all right, given the available choices, then. All right, Kip Copeland, you're going to break, you're going to go to break now. I see. You, you want that was my hanging you want, a, you want a cliffhanger, huh? Well, why not? Well, um, okay. And then we could start right in and, and with the pyramid as soon as we get back and, and do it up right. All right, John, uh, very good. Uh, we will do exactly that. Uh, John Zajac is my guest, and uh, he wants us to be cliff hung, so cliff hung we shall be. <laughs> and we'll wait till we get back and find out about the, uh, the Great Pyramid uh, before it kills me. Who designed it? Um, when was it done? Who did the work? He suggests that our uh, long-distant ancestors did. But the designer was not... Uh, it was not human. The designer was not some Martian. So then, darn it, who was the designer? Perhaps he will suggest that that which we regard as a creator <laughs> was a designer. We'll have to wait and see. From the Kingdom of Nod, you're hearing Greenland with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free. 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. It is. Good evening, everybody. I'm Art Bell. My guest is John Zajac. He is the author of The Delicate Balance and a Physicist. And uh, we've been 
talking about uh, the possibility of collisions on Earth, and now we're beginning to talk about the Great Pyramid. And uh, we're going to have to try and condense it, John, into something less than an hour now, because I do want to get the telephones open. Uh, okay. But I also want the story on the pyramid, so I, I want a lot of things here, John. Probably my cake and eat it, too. Well, I will try my best. Maybe we can get it in under the hour uh, spot that we talked about. All right, and, let's, uh, let's give it a try. Let's, let's give it a go. First of all, let's just say what the pyramid is. Uh, and also, probably what I'm not going to talk about. Uh, this discussion is not going to deal with things like sharpening razor blades and mummification of cats and finding your anniversary date and all that kind of silly stuff. I'm going to look at some really basic, fundamental parts of the Great Pyramid. And what we should know about the Great Pyramid is it's the only remaining uh, great seven wonders of the world. It is indeed the oldest structure on Earth and the largest structure on Earth. Now, there is one pyramid that uh, some people will claim was, is older, but that pyramid was built in four stages. The first stage was nothing more than a burial site, <clears throat> which does uh, predate the pyramid. But of any size, it, uh, it no, in nowhere comes close to the Great Pyramid in terms of its actual age. Now, we mentioned that the Great Pyramid is the largest structure on Earth, and uh, one would quickly point out that the Great Pyramid is 454 feet tall, and the Twin Towers alone, uh, the second tallest building on Earth, is uh, 1,368 feet tall. So, John, what are you talking about, the biggest structure? Well, let's just examine that for a moment. The Twin Tower was built by 5,000 people. It took them 11 years using modern equipment. But if we realize that the Twin Towers office building is indeed mostly space, okay, that is to say that there's roughly an acre of space per floor. Sure. Um, the, pyramid is, the pyramid is dense, obviously. Uh, the pyramid is, except for a couple of very tiny rooms, is solid stone. Right. So if we say, well, let's expand the 209-foot base of the Twin Tower to that of the pyramid being 761 feet, and of course in both directions. And then if we had Godzilla come by and put his big foot on the puppy and squish it down to take the space out between the floors and the space out even in the floors itself, which is mostly girders and space again, then you'd find that next to the Great Pyramid, which is 454 feet tall, the Twin Towers would be 4 feet 10 inches high. <laughs> It, 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 yeah, it gives us a scale. Yeah, another example. Uh, you could take all the masonry required to build a highway lane from San Francisco to New York, eight feet wide and six inches thick, and put it inside the Great Pyramid. In fact, when, when we look at New York with all its t uh, tall skyscrapers, we're reminded that it's built on Manhattan Island because Manhattan is, is rock. And we needed a good base, if you will, to hold up the weight of those large structures. Mm -hmm. But when you consider that even the Twin Towers is only four feet, ten inches tall next to the Great Pyramid, you got to wonder what's under the Great Pyramid. Well, the first coincidence, and I'm very willing to accept it as a coincidence, is that only a few places on Earth could hold the Great Pyramid. And the Great Pyramid just happens to be built on a flat granite mountain, the height of which is the same height as the sand, so that the pyramid could be built on top of it at what we would call ground level, and that that would represent um, the foundation of the Great Pyramid. So you are suggesting no uh, or a few other spots on Earth could support that weight? Uh, correct. A few spots on Earth could support that weight. Absolutely correct. So how did they know where to build it? Beats the stuff in enemy. Okay. But coincidences happen. Right. Okay. Uh, an interesting coincidence while we're talking about the Great Pyramid and its height is that <clears throat> uh, modern science using uh, new techniques from, from satellites have been able to pretty accurately measure the height of all the, the, uh, the mountains and so forth. And if we take the average land mass of, of Earth, and this is not insignificant to me, uh, but if you take the average land height of, of the Earth, the Himalayas being high and Florida being low, sure. uh, we find that the average height of land on Earth is 554 feet tall. Hmm. Same height as the Great Pyramid. Hmm. Uh, but of course, coincidences do happen. Here perhaps is one that's a bit harder to understand. If we took a picture of the globe, when I say a picture, I mean 
if we actually went to the globe or took a, a split um, picture of the globe, one that does not distort land masses, and we decided to find the land, longest land parallel, that's to say uh, a, a line parallel to the equator that would go through the longest land line, we would find that that line would go through the southern tip of America, the northern tip of Africa uh, and Asia, and right smack dab through the Great Pyramid. Hmm. Uh, coincidentally, if we took the land, longest land meridian, we'd find it to go through Europe and Asia and Africa and Antarctica. And guess what? The Great Pyramid. Right through the Great Pyramid. Now, there's only one place on Earth that those lines can can uh, uh, interconnect. The majority of places that you think could be possible would end up being underwater. But for some reason, way before Columbus sailed the ocean blue to prove that he knew where India was, which, of course, he was wrong, but long before anybody could have had a global map, the Great Pyramid ends up sitting right in the center of the longest land parallel and longest longest line, uh, land meridian. It also does so in such a fashion as to make all four quadrants exactly equal in mass. Hmm. Very peculiar. Yes. How could anyone on planet Earth have distinguished this particular capability? And just coincidentally, at the same time, be fortunate enough to find a solid granite mountain beneath it to hold its weight. All right. Would would these facts, John, give uh, give a poor investigator any clue as to um, w the why of the Great Pyramid? In other words, uh, as you look at these things, these uh, uh, this coincidence of uh, of lines that you've drawn, would would it give us any clue as to the why of the pyramid? No, but it would it certainly indicate that someone knew something about the Earth yes. in, in detail that only modern science knows in terms of center of landmass, height of landmass, sure, etc. Sure. Uh, at the same time, you know, we always hear about the Great Pyramid being a very precise um, instrument. Uh, but you look at the thing, it looks like a pile of rock. I mean, it, it doesn't look so precise when you go up to it, does it? No. No, not at all. And, and there's lots of pictures in the book. Uh, maybe we should even tell people how to get it later. But there are lots of pictures in the book showing that. The, the thing that is not known by most people is that as the pyramid looks is not how the pyramid was built. It is 4,614 years old, but around 1,400 or so, a major earthquake loosened one of the top stones of the Great Pyramid. Mm -hmm. The stones that covered the Great Pyramid were called casing stones. Some people might take significance in the fact there were 144,000 of them, 20 tons per piece. Wow. These stones, these casing stones, were polished with a smoothness and a fineness equal or better to that of your reading glasses. Think of polishing stone that well. They were also held almost perfectly square of each other, and I'll tell you how they were, the, the precision of their placement in a moment. But it actually created a mirror, a mirror that shone light down back upon the earth itself, a, a, a pyramid of such brilliance that it could be seen from the mountains of Israel. It's indeed the only structure that could be seen from the moon. Now, I know astronauts have said <clears throat> the only thing they could see on Earth uh, that they could recognize is the Great Wall of China. But the Great Wall of China is like 30 feet wide. Consider that with something hundreds of feet wide uh, and square, uh, also with a mirror surface, and you realize there's no comparison, except that on their flight path and cloud cover, what they saw was the Great Wall. Well, in addition, a lot of the original reflectivity is no longer there. Well, indeed, that's true, but I think the Great Pyramid is probably still one of the few structures that can be seen from the moon. I'm sure. In any case, the, the stone under the casing stones were just filled stones. Okay, and they were cut with the precision of the people of the time, with the tools of the people of the time. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, that's remarkable or it's nice, but it's not overwhelmingly spectacular. Well, let me go further. By the way, just so we don't lose track of those stones, when the Arabs found the means to topple these stones from the Great Pyramid, they ended up building many of the great mosques of the Middle East and several cities for, for Shahs and, and others. Um, it's kind of interesting, and maybe we'll get to that later, but I doubt it, but uh, dealing with uh, the stones that were stolen. However, as they topple these down, they would fracture and break some of them, uh, many of them along the way, uh, 20 tons of heat. But beneath the rubble, there were still some casing stones left. And it's those casing stones, the very bottom row, uh, that are pictured in the book and are shown. And after 4,000, 
2,600 years, you can look at these and see their incredible flatness and straightness at 20 tons apiece. In fact, without computer enhancement, you can't see the separation between the stones. They have just five thousandths of an inch of space between them. Five thousandths. That's roughly about the thickness of a piece of tinfoil, I guess, to, to between them. But the, the space was put there on purpose. The space was put there with a precision of better than two thousandths. Now, five thousandths is the thickness of a, of a hair from my beard, okay? So we're talking here in, in relative terms, the thickness of a human hair is the space between the stones. But that space was precise within a thousandth or two and was put there to accommodate a white glue to keep the pyramid from absorbing water. Hmm. That glue, 4,600 years old, is basically as strong as the stones it's gluing together. Cracks dark, it starts at the, in some stones, but stop at the glue. It is still watertight. You know, Elmer's would go nuts for this stuff. I don't know about you, when I was a kid, my soles and my shoes would always fall off. I'd glue them back on the first puddle they were off again. Certainly the shuttle scientists would love to have a glue to keep piles on their spacecraft. Yes. This stuff, after 4,600 years, has been analyzed. We know what it's made up of. It's oxygen and nitrogen and carbon and a few other things. But we can't quite figure out how these things go together to make this incredible glue to last this great length of time. Yet, in the Great Pyramid, it does. And all of these stones are placed so precisely. Now, when I say so precisely, again, we're talking one or two thousandths of an inch of their intended spot. Mm -hmm. They're 20 tons a piece. Just for, to, to put this in perspective, uh, when they built the High Aswan Dam in, in, uh, in Egypt, they had to move some of their stone statues. They cut them into pieces 10 and 20 tons a piece. They could place those with an accuracy of one to two inches of their original <laughs> nesting place. Really? Now, if you say, well, they weren't trying that hard, it didn't matter. That might be true, so let's look one step further. The most accurate macro manipulator, that's a fancy word for precision movement of big things, was designed by NASA. Now we're talking, this is modern technology here, right? Well, the biggest item they could move was one and a half tons, not 20 tons. And the greatest precision that they could possibly muster was 50 thousandths of an inch, not one to two thousandths of an inch. But you're busily making a pretty good scientific uh, presentation that we could not have done what you're saying we did. Now, well, even though we, saying, we, we, saying we, we may have had knowledge, uh, that, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'd be glad to pin you against the wall and try to uh, get to the bottom of who you think it was who did it. Oh, but let's go. This gets spiky. Yeah, all right. Uh, to do this, I need to mention something about measurements. Okay? Okay. Uh, for instance, did you know that, cause we, and the reason why is that, you know, we were talking about the universal language of numbers. Yes. So we're going to have to measure those numbers. And there's a small difference from what one might anticipate, but I need to explain something about that small number. Did you know, for instance, that the British inch and the American inch, although they were meant to be the same, are not? No, I didn't know that. Yeah. The U.S. Bureau of Standards will list the, um, the British inch as 25.399978 millimeters, and the American inch is equal to 25.400508 inches. Hmm. I'm sorry, millimeters. millimeters. It's not a lot, and it's, it's accurate for the first three or four decimal, uh, three or four significant digits. But, in fact, only to the third. It, it changes it. It's only accurate to the third. In fact, it's only accurate for the first two digits. The third digit's already off, but it's not off by a lot. The, the, the point being is, is that even when you try to copy things precisely, as America did trying to copy the British inch, and we set up a standard for it, and the platinum bar held in temperature and humidity and so forth, there are slight errors to it. Okay. And what I want to state is that um, what happened is, is that he who broke the, great, the, the, the code to the Great Pyramid no less than the greatest scientist that ever lived, recognized that if he used an inch, but not the British inch and not the American inch, it was a slightly different inch, but almost as close to the British inch as the American inch is. Okay, it's off by a thousandth of an inch. Okay. Okay, which he calls the sacred Jewish inch. Okay. One might call it the sacred Israeli inch for slightly more accuracy, but he calls it the sacred Jewish inch. Or the ancient inch. Or the ancient inch. <laughs> and that, that inch is... The, 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 
significance for breaking the code of the Great Pyramid. And, and it's very important that we talk about, about that. And, and it's also important to know that it's not John Vega who came up with this code, and it's not Joe Schmidlap at 33rd and 3rd Avenue in, in Manhattan. The greatest scientist ever lived is, without real argument, Sir Isaac Newton. Yes. And Newtonian physics, you know, most of what we, we learned about physics was all from Newton. What people don't know about Sir Isaac Newton was that he accomplished all of his great works and discoveries, which were enormous, uh, just absolutely enormous, and we don't have time to go into them all, or even into part of them. Uh, he accomplished by age 28. At age 28, he was trying to prove his theory of gravity, but he had a problem. Science couldn't accurately measure the size of the Earth for him to prove his theory of gravity. Mm -hmm. And he needed to know more accurately the size, particularly because he was sure that there'd be a bulge about the equator due to the Earth's rotation. And he had heard that the, all the history of the world, past, present, and future, was contained within the Great Pyramid. And he went there to find the size of the Earth. Yes, he did not find the size of the Earth. It is there. But he didn't have the means to make the measurements to find it. Hmm. Um, however, he was so taken by what he found that he dedicated the bulk of the rest of his life to the study of Scripture and indeed wrote a book about the interpretation of the prophecies in the Bible, published after his death, by the way. In any case, what is it that Sir Isaac Newton found? Well, if you and I took apart a Honda, I won't say a, a Ford anymore because that might be more confusing, but if we took apart a Honda, we would notice something was pretty significant in terms of a universal commonality. In other words, things turned out to be in equal denominations if we picked the unit that we personally call the meter, or the millimeter, if you will, which is the vision of the meter. But if we said, hey, you know what, this is a, if, if we pick some unit, this becomes a 10 millimeter bolt and a 20 millimeter bolt, and this becomes a, a, a 50 millimeter wheel or a 150 millimeter gear or whatever, but everything would work out. It's the millimeters. Well, Sir Isaac Newton found that everything in the Great Pyramid broke out nicely in something called a sacred Jewish inch, which is just about as close to the bridge British inch as the American inch is. Okay. And when he did this, he started with some basic things. He started with <clears throat> the, the height of the pyramid and the periphery of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty straightforward to do, right? Sure. Well, when he did that, <clears throat> he found something kind of interesting. Now, you know that uh, pi is twice the radius of the circle divided into its circumference. Yes. So Sir Isaac Newton, just out of curiosity, divided twice the height of the pyramid into its circumference or periphery. Mm -hmm. And it comes out to pi to six significant digits. Interesting because in his day, science could not yet predict pi any greater than six significant digits. All right. Well, I think you've made a pretty good case that science at the time could not have done what was done. Um, who, um, who do you theorize... Uh, did it? Do you believe, uh, John, that it was a? Oh, but you can't, you can't do that to me yet, because I'm going to prove that something's not possible. But to do that, you have to know the parts I'm going to use to prove it with. Fine. Let's let's go one step further. Does the number thirty-six thousand five hundred and twenty-four mean anything to you? Nothing. Nothing. But if we move the decimal point, that becomes three. And that's the periphery of the Great Pyramid, by the way, mm -hmm. inches. That comes out to three hundred and sixty-five point two four. I don't feel bad about this, but how many days are there in a year? 365. Exactly. Mm, no, I suppose you... Uh, are we averaging here with leap years and such? I... Yeah, well, either way, most people would say 365 and a quarter, which would be 365.25. Okay. So that's pretty close, but not close enough. Because, you see, it wasn't until George Washington's time that we even adopted the Gregorian calendar. And the Gregorian calendar basically says, yep, you'll have a leap year every four years to make it come out right, but not exactly. So to make it come out exactly, we have a leap year every four years, except in years ending in double zero, except in years that even, even is divisible by 400, in which case we put it back in anyway. Bottom line is, the exact length of the Earth year is 365.24 days something that the average citizen is not quite aware of, something that we didn't adopt uh, throughout the world until roughly George Washington's time 200 years ago, yet 4,614 years ago, built into the Great Pyramid is this wonderful little thing called the exact length of the Earth day. We've also heard that the Great Pyramid points perfectly due north. That is not true. It is off by six minutes. 
sake of art. Now, each degree, you know, 360 degrees in a circle, and you could break a circle down into 60 minutes, and it's off by six of those minutes. Okay. Turns out that in the International Geophysical Year, Martin Science, in its infinite wisdom, decided to build a perfect monument to the Earth and decided to point it due north. Oh, I'm sorry. I said that the Great Pyramid was off by, by six minutes of arc. That's not true. It's off by three minutes of arc. The best that science could do in building that monument was to make one six minutes of arc off, twice the error of the Great Pyramid. But since the Great Pyramid was built, there has been a movement of the North Pole. In moving that backwards as we, best we possibly can, 4,600 years, we find that the Great Pyramid pointed to point zero. 0.001 minutes of arc when it was first built. A lot better than we could do. John, hold on just one moment. We'll be right back to you. And I want to ask John, John, we've got about a minute now, and you're leading us uh, down a very careful path, so tease us with what's just ahead a little bit in the path. Well, what I want to tease you with is, is what directly ahead. So far, we've talked about whoever designed the Great Pyramid knew an awful lot about planet Earth and had technology greater than we presently possess today. However, one could say, could that not have been built by a smart Martian? Mm, perhaps. But so far, all we've looked at is the evidence on the outside of the Great Pyramid. As soon as we come back, we're going to look at what takes place on the inside of the pyramid, which not only excludes humankind, but excludes those Martians and, and Venetians as well. All right. Uh, well, I'm going to look forward to that. John Zajac. And next, we find out what's uh, what's inside the pyramids that would exclude, uh, exclude us and exclude any grays or greens or whatever they might be. Okay. I'm up for that. Uh, once again, I want to mention uh, my picture. Yet shine down that passage. And it's 
due to happen in the future, we probably won't get to talk about it. In any case, from that point, he says, if I measure in what he calls sacred Jewish inch, inches and call each inch a year, something rather interesting happens. If he goes forward from those scribe lines up to the face of the Great Pyramid, he cut up the year 2623 B.C., the year that the Great Pyramid was completed. If he goes down the passage, he comes to the point where the ascending and de descending passage um, uh, split. And that happens in the year 1453 B.C., which coincides with the exodus of the Israelis from Egypt. As he continues going up the ascending passage, he comes to the year 33 A.D., in which case this tiny little passage um, explodes into this huge room of tw with a 28-foot high ceiling, coincidentally called the, the, uh, the Grand Gallery or the Passage of Light and Knowledge, on the year 33 A.D., most interesting. Yes. What he does then is looks closely at that triangle that we mentioned, the horizontal floor of the Queen's Chamber intersects the ascending passage right at the beginning of, of that, of that uh, chamber. And again, um, if we consider this a triangle, uh, the the um, the uh, horizontal leg would be equal to the beginning of that great passage opening, if you will. And that coincides not only with the year 33 A.D., but the Great Pyramid, measured by laser and other techniques, is the most heavily measured structure on planet Earth, measured thousands of an inch, comes out to not only a year, but they can actually hit the day. And that comes up to the year 33 A.D. on April 3rd, coinciding with the crucifixion of one man of Earth that we call Jesus Christ. Right. If we look further at that triangle, we will see that the um, uh, the, the, where the where the corner of the triangle comes together comes together on the September 29th, 2 B.C. Christ's birth. And you say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Christ was born in the year one. People, most people think, I suppose, think he was born in the year zero, but there was never a year zero, so it had to have been born in the year one. Right. But there's a two-year error in our calendar. And in the past, we always used the same references going back, and we used the 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 um, uh, the uh, reigns of kings to determine how long ago things took place. And one right. king in history ruled twice, second time under a different name, caused a two-year error in our calendar. So indeed, we now know that Christ was probably born in the year 2 B.C. Some will argue 3 B.C. But basically, we know there's an error in our calendar. It's about two years. Two years places it into the B.C. 2. So here we have this Christ triangle, as it's called. The Christ triangle depicts three dates depending upon which leg you measure, either Christ's birthday, his crucifixion, or the other leg comes up at October 14th, 29 AD, the date of his baptism. Interestingly, if we take that Christ angle, keeping the angle very precise, and it is very precise, it's 26 degrees, 28 minutes, 9.63 seconds. Trust me, nothing gets more accurate than those numbers. You place that over an area of, on a map of the of the, uh, the Middle East or where the Great Pyramid is, putting that triangle exactly as just clicked it here over that um, over the Great Pyramid itself, so that one of the corners of the Great Pyramid, we find that there is a horizontal line running parallel to the equator. The other line goes right through Bethlehem. And goes right through Bethlehem. In fact, if standing on the Great Pyramid, one would see the sun rise, literally, on the longest day of the year, directly over Bethlehem. So what we have is something that is mind-boggling. What we have is a structure using science, modern science can understand but can't duplicate, that is putting together a prophetic message of the future, for it was built 4,614 years ago, talking about the greatest natural event or the greatest um, event to affect mankind on planet Earth to be a person born in Bethlehem in the year 2 B.C., the way our calendar counts. And that is absolutely mind-boggling. For whoever built this could no longer be just a clever Martian understanding science, technology, and the Earth, but has to be someone who is able to either foresee the future thousands of years in advance or control the future so importantly that far in advance that we could only call it supernatural. If you combine that with the fact that this is obviously a message of a spiritual leader, you end up with an amazing paradox that it can't be 
the American uh, a human, and it really can't be quote unquote intelligent life forms from another planet. So your conclusion, I think, is what my guess was that somehow this information, this technology was imparted by a supernatural force which you probably would, would view to be from our creator. John? Well, scientifically, I can't define God, but I can say that what we're talking about can only be defined as supernatural. And you know what? It goes one step further if we examine the mathematics of it. Remember I kept saying, well, that could be a coincidence, that could be a coincidence. Yes, you were building your case. Yeah, but you know what? It's mathematically impossible. Let me tell you what I mean. If I asked you to draw on a piece of paper a one-inch diameter circle, you could do that, right? Mm -hmm. If I asked you to, design, to, to draw on a piece of paper a square with a one-inch leg, you could do that. Yes. If I ask you to design a triangle where two sides of the triangle were one inch in length, you could do that. Yes. However, if I asked you to design me a three foot... However, if I asked you to design me a three-sided square where all points were equal distance from the center... You can't do it. That's, that's mutually exclusive. That's three separate things. None of, the, none of the above can happen simultaneously. Right. Because each one of those is a unique object, and you can't have a round square or a three-legged square. Right. And therefore, it's mutually exclusive. No one in the world has ever looked at this, but look at the mutual square elift cubity. I can't say that. Look at how exclusive what we're going to be saying is. The Great Pyramid's height is fixed by the average height of mass on Earth. The yes. Pyramid's height is fixed. Yes. Its periphery is fixed because it is equal to the length of the year. Right? Yes. Now, if I ask you to design pi to that, you say, wait a minute, I can't do that unless it already happened because you can't change the periphery height ratio if the periphery and the height are fixed. Yet, it comes out to pi. Mutually exclusive. All the greatest scientists in the world with the entire universe. All right, let me stop you here. John, you, you are making the case, are you not, that the Great Pyramid is, um, without knowing its source, prophecy in numbers. Absolutely. All right, um, if you... If you can, um, if, if, if you can uh, mathematically derive uh, the biblical events that you talked about, can you um, can you derive any further prophecy or as yet um, unrevealed prophecy from the same numbers? I can't. We, there is a date further up where the where the Grand Gallery, you know, ends, and that's the year 1914, start of World War One, first global war. Um, invention, if you will, or, or the culmination of modern technology from a medical standpoint, aviation standpoint, uh, uh, technology really started exploding in the beginning of the, the 20th century. Um, but no, after that, there are those who will argue that the timeline changes to an inch per month, et cetera, et cetera, looking at making a closer cosmetic look, uh, 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 look at what's taking place, microscopic look. Uh, I don't particularly follow it. Most people making predictions of the future have kind of put the square peg in the round hole in my mind and usually been proven wrong if they, if they ever got to pass. So no, I, I do not see directly what it's telling us about our future. It is really, I think, showing some key points, but that the most significant point was that of the, the birth and crucifixion of a very significant figure in our history, um, which most would not argue was the most significant event to happen on planet Earth. You could be Jewish or Muslim or whatever. You have to be Christian to say, yeah, uh, belief in Christianity probably affected more the world than anything else. All right, John, um, I do want to open the telephone lines, so let me do that. Let uh, everybody ask a few questions. Uh, you've had a lot to say, and there's a lot to ask. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with John Zajac. Hello. Good evening, Art. Portland, Oregon, KEX. Yes, sir. I have a couple of questions for Mr. Zajac. Yes. Uh, in reference uh, to Edgar Casey, first of all, I reference to Edgar Casey, the psychic who you failed to mention earlier. What's your opinion? Uh, of his prediction that the pyramids, uh, ancient hall of records would be located and that its builders were Atlantean colonists. And two, what's your opinion of the effect of the upcoming alignment of the planets in our solar system on the Earth and its precession? All right, thank you. Uh, 
I didn't mention edu education only because I was not trying to look at all profits, but rather three unique ones. Um, there may be some significance to things that Edgar Casey has done, some things looked important. I could never put my finger on, on the precision of it and uh, authenticity of most of it. That's not to say it wasn't authentic, I just, I could. In terms of the uh, upcoming alignment of the planet, uh, we had uh, the most significant one that I'm aware of uh, in 1986 when they were all in a perfectly, perfectly straight alignment. Usually when we talk about alignments, we're talking within so many degrees, right. either 90 or 20 or something. But in 1986, they were perfectly in a straight line. Um, I don't expect anything more spectacular than it happened in 86, and I'm not sure that anything happened in 86. Uh, these things are very far apart and pretty small. However, so were the force changes necessary to knock things out of the Oort belt. So if things were knocked out of the Oort belt in 1986, the question is, how long does it take to fall in towards them before we see them? And the answer is, I don't really know. They may be moving at 48,000 miles per hour when they get close to the Earth, but they start out moving at, you know, 20 miles an hour. So, um, uh, one one doesn't know. Uh, one can only speculate. All right. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with John Zajac. Hello. Uh, good evening, Art. Uh, good evening. Okay, let's come to my right. Where are you, sir? KBI. Uh, I'm going to be up in uh, the Washington area. Okay. Yeah, up here in the... And, uh, All right, go right ahead, sir. Listen, uh, you know, you, uh, so your guest here uh, revolves everything around Christ's birth. He fails to uh, uh, acknowledge that uh, Buddha was born in 563 B.C. And Buddhism, the missionaries, the Buddhist missionaries, went over to Mesopotamia and the Tigris and the uh, Euphrates. And uh, they uh, spread the seeds of the concept that there is a higher being. Well, uh, perhaps so, but apparently the mathematics does not uh, surround Buddha. It surrounds Christ. Does that disturb you? Yes, it disturbs me a lot. Well, I guess um, I, I guess there's nothing we can offer uh, that man, is there, John? Uh, except the math is the math. Yeah, one one needs to put one's personal purposes and bias aside when looking at evidence. Um, then that, that is what that sounded like too. On the wild card line, you're on the air with John Zajac. Hello. Yes, good evening. From Albuquerque. Um, question. Now, this was on your show a uh, few weeks ago. Uh, there's going to be a discovery of an ancient library within the uh, pyramid. Is that so? Is that in the waiting? John? Oh, you're asking me. I'm sorry, I was referring to a, an old program of yours. Well, um, not that I'm aware of. Apparently, from a previous caller, uh, Edgar Casey, you know, so stated. Um, I have uh, no opinion on the comment. Okay. All right, thank you. On the uh, toll free line, you're on the air with John Zajac. Hi. Good evening, Art. This is Jim in St. Louis. Hi, Jim. Finally, St. Louis, we get the full three hours of the show. We love it. We love it here in St. Louis. Good. Anyway, uh, great show. I had a couple questions for your guest. He mentioned earlier that, uh, that uh, men provided the horsepower. What uh, physical, I mean actual, means do they have to to construct this, um, this themselves? And secondly, um, is he familiar of the this, this hall of records that might lie beneath the Sphinx? All right. I really doubt the Hall of Records is beneath the Sphinx. Um, we have a, here in Jose a Egyptian museum that talks about a secret passage that goes between the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx. And I ask the curators, why do you speak of something you've never found? They go, well, it must be there because why else would the Sphinx be nearby? And I go, well, <laughs> that's, that's the most convoluted argument I could possibly imagine. Um, uh, I don't think the Sphinx has anything to do with the Great Pyramid, per se, except that it's proximity. Uh, also, it did not weather well with time. If you look at the Sphinx, they're always trying to plaster it up and fix it. It's made of soft sandstone, not of the hard limestone that is impervious to the elements of the casing stones of the Great Pyramid were. I don't know anything about a Hall of Records or um, any great library that would be found. It's not to say it isn't there. It's not to say anything about it except All right, well, I personally am unfamiliar with it. All right, John, we'll leave that one alone. What about the physical construction? What kind of technology could have accomplished that? Well, that's a mystery. You know, the Japanese recently just spent uh, a great effort with something like 2,000 workers trying to make a scale pyramid with uh, much smaller stones. And they set out to prove that, that they could they could figure it out by rollers and by slides and by doing other things. And of course, they could use measurements such as laser beam. 
And they basically said, complete mystery. Even the Japanese can't do it, was their conclusion. So it was building a small one. So the Japanese cannot accomplish it. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with John Zajac. Hello. Uh, Art, how are you doing, Mike and Albuquerque? Yes. Um, what about the... Um, Turn your radio off. Please. I wish I could. It's my neighbor. Okay, well, thank you then for the call. And uh, Wild Card Line, you're on the air with John Zajac. Hello. Hi, this is Stan Diego. Yes. Um, quick opinion do you have, John, on monuments on Mars, the structures on the moon, and uh, what's your opinion of these uh, mysteries surrounding the Bermuda Triangle? Okay. <laughs> well, um, first, I have seen a picture which has been reportedly uh, taken on the surface of Mars. Um, I've also seen one looks like Ted Kennedy, they tell me. However, I've gone through all the slides from NASA, and I've never seen them in the originals from NASA. So where these came from, what tabloid, I couldn't answer. I'd need to see more and make sure it's not just illusions and light work and so forth. But nothing, I have seen nothing to make me want, uh, feel that there's really something there. That it may be, but I have seen nothing from NASA, which is my source, um, to conclude that. Um, in terms of the Bermuda Triangle, there are some areas of the Bermuda Triangle which have just been exaggerated and put out of, out of proportion. Certainly, Edgar Casey thought a great deal about the thought that Atlantis would one day be filmed. Um, uh, that, that's really a discussion for a whole other program. I can't go into it much except to say that much of what we see reported about the Bermuda Triangle easily explained away without supernatural phenomena. All right. Very quickly, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with John Zajac. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about a couple of things that I heard about. One was that geologists at the Sphinx is at least 9,000 years old, and the other was the, who said that uh, the blocks of the pyramid are not actually stone blocks at all, but they're concrete blocks. All right, we'll, take a point. Yeah, we'll answer uh, those when we come back. Joss, we're at the bottom of the hour. You're listening to the CBC Radio Network tomorrow. It's called Dreamland. Your last caller had uh, asked two questions. The uh, first was, uh, if we say that the Great Pyramid is the oldest structure on Earth, what about the Sphinx, which is at least twice over 9,000 years old? And the, the answer to that is, yeah, it's way over 9,000 years old, in fact, because the Sphinx is made out of a natural upcropping of stone, sandstone, and was carved. The Sphinx is carved, not not built. Therefore, it's as old as whatever it is, uh, but it wasn't made by mankind either. It's a natural formation that's carved. In regard to the Great Pyramid, saying that the stones were not carved, but, but rather uh, a cement that was molded, if you will. Um, I've heard this argument before, but I'm even more impressed, because uh, not only was what we call cement not invented by Bernard afterwards, but think of the constrictive the, the control problem. How would they have made the mold? How would they make the name? How would you prevent shrinkage? How would you prevent the warpage that takes um, she made poor molded, um, none of them no two are alike. I'm talking about precision. More impressed if it could have been a cement that was molded and popped out of a mold. Mm. Even more so than just the carving, which is spectacular by itself. What about the materials in the blocks? He asked about that. He said um, uh, perhaps it is not stone, or some people have thought it is not stone. Well, he was suggesting that it, would, that it was some type of cement. Oh, I thought I'd be even more of a big man. I'm sure that would entail uh, a later tech call. Yeah, Wild Klein, you're on the air with John Zajac. Video for America. Yes. Listen, I, my, my knowledge of the subject is not real big, but I'm wondering if there's any question of the pyramid of uh, handing the Ten Commandments or the possibility of uh, the uh, refining of the Ark of the Cutty uh, uh, pyramid that correlates. All right. Do you find any math that coincides with those events? I see no nothing that coincides except that the Ark Covenant dimensions are exactly um, uh, easily divisible by the dimensions of the King's Chamber. In other words, the multiple is the, is the Ark of the Cutty that is supplied by a continent. Also, the, the only thing that I know of with regard to the tenements is that there are three granite books that they could not carve through and had to carve around to get past the ascending passage, which is believed to have come from the same mount because the very unique red granite that the Ten Commandment tablets were carved in. But you can't absolutely prove that, but it does test against minerals extremely well. All right, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with John Zajac. Hi. I hope you'll take a skeptical call. Uh, of course. Uh, where are you calling from? I live in Spark. Spark? Nevada. All right, go ahead, sir. Well, your statement that modern technology can't uh, reproduce the pyramid is wrong. In fact, I've seen a lot of uh, stories and reports and a record of uh, graduate engineering students actually being a model of the pyramid or a section thereof. 
it's been repeated more than once. So that statement that modern science can't do that is absolutely wrong. Technically, okay, where was this done, sir, just for the record? Uh, I, saw the, I, I seem to remember the story in uh, National Geographic. It was a story about the pyramids, and then uh, it was, there was a small section of re that uh, reported the technology uh, and how it was built. But uh, I'll, I wanted to also bring up something I've seen on... Uh, computer bulletin board. It was a mathematical proof that uh, Barney the dinosaur was actually Satan because by breaking down the letters and playing with numbers in a certain way, you came with the number 666. So my complaint is that these mathematical games, when you only use the numbers to define what you want to come out, really don't mean anything. Uh, it is a, now, that is an interesting criticism, uh, John, and I was going to ask you about that myself, that in essence, uh, if you play long enough uh, and look at a band and to string them together, as you suggest, uh, is your specialty, um, or connecting events, you can uh, set out and finally prove about anything. Absolutely. If I wanted to find my birth date by uh, finding the 77th tier two inches over from the top and, you know, some other stone two inches from some other place, I'm sure I could do that. However, um, one must realize that if you want to contrive things, tell me how. All we look to is the height of the pyramid, it's periphery, period. <laughs> There's nothing contrived about that. When we got into the pyramid, all we measured was, was the length of the passages, period. And we used the same unit of measure throughout, from the outside to the inside. So if you want to contrive things, be my guest. But it's really hard to contrive things. I mean, when you talk about Barney and the number 666, well, 666 is E. Humbai. Who said it was Ronald Reagan in front of dress? Yeah, that's right. 666 is not an exclusive number, and, and they tried to, to get there. The trick is going the other way. If you look at something and only measure its height and its periphery and the length of passages all on the same measurement and all these things in place, that's not being contrived. All right, what about Ranger? with student projects that have created uh, pyramids? Or well, the first thing is that if the graduate student is trying hard to be published, you wonder what they're going to say. But second of all, I can assure you that no one's ever solved the problem of the Great Pyramid. They could build them up and say, look, we built these stones, and with pulling people, we moved one ton of stone, we had more people, we could pull more, and they could get that conclusion. However, the Japanese demonstrated when you went up in scale, the things that supported this weight no longer worked. They, they, because the Japanese, funded by the Japanese government, attempted to build a scale model of the Great Pyramid. I think it was like a one-quarter scale. It lapsed under its own weight because things we didn't talk about. The Great Pyramid has things like cornerstones that have uh, uh, special uh, anchor mechanisms that we have only on Martin bridges and so it pulls in sockets and so forth to allow it to have lasted this time. Uh, other pyramids, even Egypt, four copies of the pyramids have bulges on them because of its great weight. They literally can't stand. Uh, the pyramid is unique even to Egyptian pyramids and there has never been anybody of any credible value ever making the claim that they could understand how it was done or if they could replicate. It. All right. Um, hi there. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with John Zajac. Where are you calling from, please? Hello. Hello. Where are you calling from, sir? All right. Turn the radio down. Turn the radio off. Actually. Yes, sir. I, I sure did. All right. Go ahead. Well, uh, regarding the uh, the Great Pyramid, there's a couple of passages in the uh, Old Testament. I think re regarding that, I can only find one. Um, from what I can gather, it also speaks of Christ. And that's in Isaiah, uh, chapter 19, and that's uh, starting with verse uh, 19. Yes, very common passage. Oh, yeah. Oh, are you familiar with that? Oh, of course. Oh, uh, there's, there's, there's so much that we couldn't get into in this short period. Uh, um, uh, what's your interpretation of Do you think of that speaking of the pyramid? It sure sounds exactly like the pyramid. Um, for everyone else's uh, edition, uh, that passage, I could look it up and quote it to you, but basically it says that a altar to the Lord will be built center of Egypt at its, at its border, which in the first place sounds like a contradiction because how could be at the center and at the border, but there were always two Egypts, the upper Egypt and lower Egypt, the different pharaohs wearing different colored hats, and the, the, the borderline between Egypt goes right through the pyramid. What, I mean, <laughs> what a coincidence. What a coincidence. And of course, the Giza the pyramid, uh, the, the Greek pyramid is called the Pyramid of Giza, which also means the border, the border of, of the river, I, I suspect. Um, actually, the word pyramid doesn't isn't even Egyptian. It's Greek from the word pyros and mitos, I guess, but basically means center of knowledge and wisdom. All right, John, on the toll free line, you're on the air with John Zajac. Hi, where are you calling from, please? Portland, Oregon. Okay, go ahead. Well, I had a question for your guest. I wanted to know if he believed that Christ, that 
be the son of God and the savior of the world and what his opinion on the Bible was and if his research in it all affected his belief of it. All right. Uh, care to talk about your beliefs at all, John? Well, I, yeah, sure, why not? Because biases can't be removed. Um, though my book does not try to make a case for it except to show similarity between science and theology, stating that they need not be diametrically opposed. Uh, I do, in fact, uh, accept Jesus Christ as, uh, as the Son of God, and I think that there's a lot of, of scientific things that can be proved scientifically uh, within the Bible, though I am not trying to prove the Bible, rather that when I do the scientific investigation, a scientist one says, but haven't I heard some of this before? And just as the other caller said, gee, does the Bible refer to the Great Pyramid? It's interesting to note that it, it might, uh, but I don't make a big deal about it. I would like to understand how, I would like to understand, John, how you um, structured your research. Were you, uh, did you start out uh, trying to find uh, some connection to the dates, uh, the birth of Christ, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, crucifixion, um, all the rest of that, um, or did you, were you led to that by the numbers? Actually, what I was doing was research for myself. I wanted to know if it was the air safe to breathe. Should I live in California, going to fall off into the ocean? Are the banks going to be there? Is the financial system, you know, cute? And I did this research as a research scientist for me. Where do I start a family? Where do I live? Where do I place my investments? Uh, what do I eat and what do I breathe? And as I did that, um, breathe. And as I did that, um, my colleagues would corner me for hours at a time wanting to know what I had found out. Mm -hmm. And that turned, got to be so so tiring that I did a video uh, one day, quite by accident, while doing a commercial for Motorola, where they said, to John, tell the, tell the director what you told me about so-and-so. And we did that, which later got shown in movies, uh, inverted or transcribed into the book. Um, well, and maybe before we was short, John, uh, you, your book is The Delicate Balance, uh, How People Get It. Well, it's a whopping $10. If you want to get it, I think, at Walden's bookstores, but you probably have to kick them twice to order it. Oddly enough, most Christian bookstores carry it. They can call my office to order an autographed copy of it. Oh. And they can do that at uh, 408 226 0750. And there will be operators all day tomorrow. Uh, there might actually be some just after the broadcast tonight as well. All right. It, it's area code 408 226 0750. Yes. One more time, area code 408-226-0750. People love autographed copies. Okay. All right, uh, you may be signing quite a bit. On the uh, uh, wild card line, you're on the air with John Zajak. Hi. Hi, Art. Uh, I'm listening on KOPE, Rogue River, Oregon. Yes, sir. Uh, we're about to run out of time, and uh, your guest has not related what George Washington and uh, Nostradamus and the Book of Revelation all had in common. I hope you can do that now. All right. Uh, John? Well, it could easily be another program, but they all foresaw the future. Uh, George Washington and Miguel Nostradamus saw World War III very vividly and clearly. Uh, George Washington also saw the Revolutionary War and its outcome, the Civil War and its outcome, and the only other war besides those two would threaten America, which is World War III. And in World War III, he talks about it being global, the whole world against the United States, where the seas are destroyed by fire before the invading army approaches the shore of America, which can only be what we now describe as atomic warfare, something that is unthinkable during George Washington's time and the technology which it is to then. The Gildi Nastadamus saw a pestilence warfare, great plagues, the comet, uh, actually, if you will, um, for our future and World War III. He was very explicit about World War II, naming the countries involved, the leaders of those countries, how and when they would be taken over, the weapons to be used from submarines shooting to the torpedoes, and in World War III, submarines, they could fire fish through the air. We still call torpedoes fish. Mm, yeah. they, hit, they hit in um, enemy cities. And, of course, John in the book of Revelation speaks of a time of great sea and drought and and pestilence worldwide earthquake by the way we have 6,000 percent more earthquakes today than we had just 40 years ago uh, a great one about to happen momentarily in, in Japan it's going to devastate the whole western banking system and of course John the book of Revelation talks about the battle of Armageddon and if that's not a good description of how World War III um, is culminated then I don't know what is so they all had common on they all stated it in different words but they overlap very very clearly in, in their predictions for the future all right, on uh, wild card line, you're on the air with John. Whoops, would have been on the first time caller line, you're on the air with John Stakai. Hi. Well, I guess he's gone. On the toll free line, you're on the air. Hello. Uh, hello, Carson, California. Yes, Carson. Carson. I'm curious, uh, you know, one of the uh, most interesting Bible verses you can have alluded to, at least from what I've heard, is the one where they start.
dark called wormwood apparently falls in all the fresh water, making all fresh water unbearable and deadly. And uh, some uh, prophecy type creatures in the radio have equated that star to be some kind of mineral that is actually poisonous to the uh, fresh water system. And I'm curious, is your, is your guest aware of any uh, asteroid or comet that would potentially have some kind of mineral or a compound in there that could do that kind of damage to all fresh water? All right, wormwood. No, but I'll tell you one thing real interesting about wormwood, and I guess it's written in Greek in the original, and Greek in wormwood comes out Chernobyl. And so, what a coincidence yet. Chernobyl is wormwood. And if you're to talk about the waters being poisoned, um, I can't think of a better way to do it through radiation, but I think it's mankind doing it to mankind that will accomplish that particular task. All right. So, so fine, you're on here with John. What are you calling him, please? Anchorage, Alaska. Yes, sir. This is Martin, uh, ufologist, theologian. We've talked lots of times. Yes, Martin. A um, couple of questions. Uh, uh, I'm curious. Uh, I don't uh, I think that it is possible that uh, there could be... Um, a combination of extraterrestrial or um, superior intelligence other than earthly and not necessarily uh, uh, the supreme being involved here is it not possible well only if that 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 extraterrestrial being uh, had the desire to promote religion and at the same time have the ability to control events thousands of years in advance. And then, then you'd be right. Then my only question is, why is he promoting religion and why is he telling the whole world that these events will occur and on these particular times, particularly the most significant one is the birth and crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Well, my real question would be not regarding necessarily religion, but the truth. I mean, that's not really, and that's my religion, but religion can make beliefs some even false. Oh, but what I'm saying is that if this, this uh, Martian, if you want, for want of a better term, not only as to the Earth, but could also control future events on planet Earth with good precision. Why is he doing it with such a obviously religious figure, except to promote religion? I'm not saying religion is bad, and I'm not saying some religions are not equal to other religions. I'm just saying, obviously, Jesus Christ is a religious figure. Why well, I was a message directed at a religious figure? Yeah, I have a problem with the term religion, in that the most you want religion. to be spiritual. I mean, uh, okay, there you go. I mean, uh, okay, there you go. Okay. Well, then, okay, I don't have a problem with that. You know, okay. neither do I. Do you believe that, uh, you know, planet Earth is the only place that God created life? Uh, no, and uh, nothing that I said here to get... Okay, well, did you develop uh, the um, life from other places? I mean, said we are not of this world, and he had sheep which were not of, of this flock, and I would interpret... Yeah, that, that, could, that could certainly have been the tribes of, of the ten tribes of, of Israel, but that's what's been assumed uh, yeah, by the... Yeah, but what I'm saying is, even I, if he created life on other planets, or if life evolved anyway on other planets, my only concern here is, is that could some other life form, regardless of how technologically advanced, uh, be able to predict and control the, the future so well, and if so, why would it be centered around a spiritual figure? Okay. Uh, Wildcard right. line. Wild line, you're on the air with John Zajak. Hi. Hi. Uh, when we're talking about the asteroids and so forth, uh, how big a piece would it take to hit the Earth with such force that it would sort of like pop and let the hot stuff out from the inside? Uh, <laughs> well, well, good point. Um, I'm not sure how much the hot stuff would come out, but surely in, in sizes that we're talking about, somewhere between two and five miles in diameter, we would probably move the Earth off its course somewhat. We would probably shake it off its axis. We would probably create a wobble. Uh, aside from the earthquakes and the tidal waves, which uh, would be over 300 feet high and circumvent the, the globe several times. Uh, by the way, 300 foot wave would probably climb 1,000 foot mountains without mm. any difficulty. Mm. Uh, aside from all of that, um, you know, it would certainly cause uh, eruptions uh, worldwide and certainly a lot of hot stuff coming out from where the impact was. But uh, it, would, it would do other things too, like, 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 like knock it off its axis, push it off its orbit slightly, um, create dust and debris. It, it would be, well, in, at the very beginning of the program was that, uh, well, something like, you know, a catastrophe. Well, let me tell you, the world recorded history has ne not only never seen one like this, it can't possibly imagine all the ramifications and destruction uh, of what we call planet Earth and our society uh, due to it. John, we're way short on time. Um, I, I guess I would like to uh, sort of wrap up by saying we didn't have enough time. We could obviously have used a couple programs more. We will have you back again, possibly on the uh, syndi other syndicated program as well. Well, thank you. Uh, let me um, give out again uh, the telephone number. Uh, where people can order your book. Is, is that all? Or do, you, do you have videos as well? 
Um, well, what people probably can talk about is that there are some audios on different aspects, including the Great Pyramid and, and some of these other subjects as well. All right. It's area code 408-226-0750, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, John, it has been wonderful having you here. Well, thank you. And we will have you back. Good night, everybody. Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped, and yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. This indeed is Sunday evening and Dreamland underway once again. Hi everybody, I'm Art Bell. Great to be here on a Sunday evening. As you know, one of my favorite uh, areas of investigation without question. A little bit of a difference this evening. Uh, Linda Bolton Howe is not with us. Actually, we have no idea where she is. Not in touch. So, in a moment, we'll be going to our main topic with John Rotter way back in Tennessee. And we're going to be talking about angels. Angels are uh, absolutely all the rage, and uh, a remarkable number of people, almost 70% of the American public, believe in angels. Isn't that a shocking stat? About, actually, it's, I believe 69% uh, believe in angels. And in a moment, John Ronner, he knows, he's written about angels. All right. About John Runner. John has been writing for a publication since age 15, when an article of his appeared in a National Astronomy magazine. After receiving his journalism degree in 1973, John worked as a reporter and an editor for newspapers in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama, covering primarily the police and court beats. He repeatedly won awards for his news writing from the Associated Press and other news organizations. Uh, John has written uh, several books on the subject of angels. Uh, I believe his first was, Do You Have a Guardian Angel? His latest is, The Angels of Cokeville. And there have been more and more and more reported uh, encounters across our nation with angels. So let's go find out about it. Here from, I believe, uh, Tennessee. No, wait a minute. Let me put him over here. Here from Tennessee is John Ronner. John, are you there? I sure am, Art. Wonderful. Uh, you are in Tennessee, aren't you? Oh, yes, very much so. Okay. Right in the middle of it, near Nashville. Uh, it's been, what, John, about a year since we've had you on the program? Oh, I think it was about a year ago in April, mm -hmm. yes. Um. It's almost hard to know where to start, um, but I guess we could start with the survey. When was that survey taken, uh, John, the one that showed almost 70% of America believes in angels? That was taken in December of 93. Time magazine, as, as some of the uh, listeners may remember, did a cover story back in December of 93 on the phenomenon of angels. Uh, the country was just beginning to wake up to the significance of the subject. Uh, we still uh, had most of the major television network specials lying in the future at that point, but uh, uh, people were beginning to realize that uh, this was a topic worth looking at. In that particular survey, the 69% raised a lot of eyebrows that uh, that, that large a slice of the population believed in the existence of angels. But uh, uh, also in that survey, 46% uh, of, the, of the respondents, and this was a scientific poll, of course, that could be uh, uh, extrapolated out to the whole population, 46%, almost half, uh, felt that they had a personal spiritual guardian. So you're talking about, well, my goodness, I mean, 40% of the American population, we got 260 million people in this country, so that's over 100 million there. And um, uh, just over 30% felt that they had had interactions uh, with this guardian spirit, whatever it was. Now, well, in other words, a, a close encounter with an angel of the third kind. Yeah, and, and of course, unfortunately, the poll didn't go into detail as to what kind of encounter that was, but other polls have. 
and they range from seeing a luminous being, you might think of that as the angel in its native glory appearing, hearing a voice coming out of thin air warning you at, a, at an important moment to do something or just comforting you, uh, having an overpowering hunch to do something that seems against all logic at the moment but later is the right thing to do, uh, physical intervention, hearing celestial music, uh, uh, incredible coincidences that some people feel were made in heaven. There's an entire old category of stories in which people feel that angels disguise themselves as mortals in order to intervene, and, and the list goes on and on. So uh, we don't know exactly how that breaks down from that poll, but other polls give us a, a clue. There's a lot going on. Why don't there. we begin with what is a very, very, going to be a very hard question, but very important. All right. What's an angel? Uh, well, actually, there is a strict definition that comes down to us from the medieval philosophers, and, and of course, this, is, uh, this was their opinion. Uh, the, the philosophers felt that uh, an angel is a superior spiritual being. And I guess for best results, we probably should just break that down. Superior, we're talking about something above us on the evolutionary scale. Of course, in, in medieval philosophy, evolution was not a concept yet. Uh, so to them, it would be something it, it, they would probably have said higher in the cosmic order. Okay, uh, so I, I want to be very clear. I want to be very clear. This is not a former human spirit. Exactly. I'm glad you brought that up because there's a lot of confusion about that. In the strict definition, you're talking about a non-human superior being, a completely a higher uh, order of being. And you're talking about something in spirit form, um, not flesh. So, uh, as I said, there are there is a case in which people feel that angels sometimes temporarily take on human form, disguise themselves as mortals in order to intervene, but that's a special right. case category. So according to the strict according to the strict definition, an angel is a superior spiritual being. However, the term angel, um, when you get out there in, in the real world and, and start asking people um, about their guardian angel, quote unquote, they'll come back uh, with with a lot of different types of experiences and experiences with dead loved ones often get lumped into this into into this uh, angel encounter exactly. uh, subject matter so that they may say hey john let me tell you about my guardian angel and i start listening to the story and it turns out they're talking about uh, a departed loved one that is looking after them they feel uh, but although strictly speaking that's not an angel if, if you want to approach it loosely you could say that, that that might be a de facto guardian angel if not a de jure guardian angel not a not one according to the strict definition here's something that might interest you um, I, of course, interview a number of people, experts in the field of UFOs and uh, so forth and so yeah. on. And um, a couple of them that I've interviewed recently, John, have suddenly, inexplicably, begun to talk about angels. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of wonder if um, there's beginning to be a crossover uh, in the field. Well, now, there's always been kind of a, a linkage there. I al often get asked about that. Uh, some um, uh, parapsychological observers, I guess for want of a better term, have, right. have constructed the term EHE, Exceptional Human Experience, as kind of a blanket term to cover all sorts of paranormal experiences, everything from angel encounters to uh, UFO contact, T cases, and so on. Uh, what they're, I think what they're trying to get at is that um, the... Um, the, the, the spiritual reality that is larger than our, our, our physical world uh, encompasses a lot of possibilities out there. And uh, it, as you said at the beginning of your program, it's not always easy to wrap all this stuff up in the neat little packages. Sometimes there's a crossover. Well, what about the perception of the person having the experience? In other words, if we have a fairly heavily religious person who has an experience with an entity... Yeah. Uh, are they not likely to, in their own mind, say, this is angelic or this is from God? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, obviously, versus somebody, uh, maybe even a UFO buff, who will see something and say, aha, an E.T. It's perfectly human to frame experience in, 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 in one's own frame of reference. I mean, in, in the near-death experience, for example, uh, uh, religious figures are often viewed, and, and uh, especially, especially when the being of light, this superior spiritual being that is very much angel-like, it's overwhelmingly loving, profoundly wise, it can appear uh, at the time of, say, a life review, uh, right. where you see every tiny action of your life played out in front of you uh, uh, for purposes of moral or spiritual evaluation. And uh, a person may come back having 
experience this this awesome being of light as a superior spiritual being and they may put it they, they put labels on it according to their own beliefs they may say well i saw jesus i saw god or they may just say i saw an angel if they're a secular person they may say i saw a being of light uh, hindus who have had near-death experiences have often reported that they saw yama the the judge of the dead and yes. so on so the labels may vary but the thing that's interesting is, at least uh, with the appearance of the luminous being that as a component of the near-death experience, they very often report, uh, this, they, they seem to be describing the same thing, which is kind of intriguing. Intriguing and comforting, in a way. Yeah, well, you very know, when I, when I mean, I, every, everybody's searching for some sort of proof that there is a life that extends beyond this one. And by the way, in all the studies you've done, John, uh -huh. how sure are you that there is a life after this one? Oh, that's a great question. I, I would say this. Personally, I'm convinced of it. I don't want to sound like a true believer. I don't want to sound like an ideologue because I'm none of those things. In, in fact, I'm opposed to being that sort of thing. I'm not a fundamentalist in any stretch of the by any stretch of the imagination, whether whether in the religious or the non-religious realms. Mm -hmm. But I personally, yes, am convinced. I've seen enough to satisfy myself. I don't. I would agree with the skeptics out there that that there is no scientific proof that a spiritual realm exists in the sense that we, we, we've shown it beyond a reasonable doubt, as the lawyers like to say. But I would feel that, again, to use a legal term, there is a preponderance of the evidence in favor of a spiritual realm, and that anyone who takes a little bit of time to investigate it on his own will, I think, come to the same conclusion. Uh, um, what we have out there is not proof, but, but circumstantial evidence. And, you know, there's a difference between proof and evidence. We don't have, in other words, we don't have a smoking gun. Nope. All right. If I were to ask the you for telltale signs, right? If I were to ask you for a guess and say, John, do you think if proof ever comes, it will come uh, in the scientific area, or it will come from an exploration of our own mind? In other words, some turn uh, inward, mm -hmm. um, or may we we just may simply never ever prove it one way or the other? Yeah, that's possible. I think that that, that if proof comes it could come either way and and there's there are indications that uh, that it is coming both ways i mean there are developments developments in science itself that are seriously undermining the materialist philosophy the idea that the physical is all there is and and by the way i call it a philosophy i didn't call it a science yes, sir. this idea that the physical is all there is the skeptics often get that confused with science it has nothing to do with science it's a it's sort of a religion that has attached itself to science over the last two centuries um, what I'm referring to when I say scientific developments, I'm talking about things like quantum physics, that branch of physics that deals with dimensions smaller than the atoms. It's shown us that the external universe out there needs, in a sense, needs our consciousness to be real. Those subatomic particles are not discrete little BBs that are independent of us. If we don't, if a scientist doesn't observe them, they literally have no existence. And, and while this may seem strange and bizarre to somebody not familiar with this, there's no dispute about it among physicists. We have to look at them in order for them to be real. And depending on how we look at them, they can change their nature. If we look at a, a photon, if, if a scientist conducts a certain type of, of observational experiment on a photon, looks at it one way, to put it in plain English, it, it will act like a little particle. Einstein did that at the early part of the century. Right. If another scientist looks at it a completely different way, it'll act like a light wave. And if, the, and if it's not looked at, it has no existence in, in and of itself. This, has been, this is quite shocking. And Niels Bohr, the great uh, mind uh, in physics in the 20th century, that he had this in mind when he said that anyone who is not shocked by what quantum physics has to say about the world has not understood it. And this, this one little development, development here has shaken materialism at, 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 its, at its root. And you've got the Gaia hypothesis, which uh, indicates that uh, some sort of planetary intelligence may be, in effect, uh, uh, guiding and, and uh, uh, causing the systems of the Earth to interact with one another to maintain conditions suitable for life. You've got the anthropic uh, principle coming out of astrophysics, which suggests that we appear to be living in a designer universe suitable for human life against incredible odds. And any one of these things we can go into later if there's more time. Oh, there's time. Uh, all right, fine. Radio well, has a luxury of time. Let me uh, okay. hold you right there for just a moment, take care of a little bit of business. My guest is John Rahner, and uh, John will be back in just a moment. North and back now to John Rahner. John. Um, John, the, I, I'm not sure how to approach this. There is something that I call the quickening. Maybe it's real, maybe it's not. I've done, you know, I've been doing talk radio for about ten years now. Have you? 
And I have never, this show, as a matter of fact, for 10 years. Oh, really? Broadcasting for more like 30. But in the last two or three years, I've begun to notice what I call a quickening of events. More earthquakes. Uh, more bad weather. Uh, more wars in scattered places. More of just about everything you can name. Uh, political events, social upheaval. All of it, everything that's going on seems to be accelerating. And I, so I just call it the quickening. Uh, yeah. It's just, you know, a word. But I wonder if it might fit in to those who would uh, somehow or another end up helping us. End up what? Helping us. Helping a us. Angels. Angels. Yeah. I think, uh, well, what came to my mind when you were talking about that was the fact that I think that our world is in flux, and we, we clearly see signs of that. I think even the materialists would concede that. You've got a technological revolution. We've gone from Kitty Hawk to Voyager in about 70 or 80 years. Exactly. To me, mankind is in, or humankind, is in a stormy adolescence right now. We've had a long childhood stretching out for thousands, even you might argue hundreds of thousands of years. We were in a stormy adolescence. Adolescence, and I think we're headed toward a more mellow adulthood shortly. And we shouldn't <laughs> we shouldn't be too discouraged by the. I, I think Shakti Gawain pointed out that uh, you know you can look at you can look at all this turbulence um, one way. You can be distressed by it and say, oh, this is terrible. The world's going to hell in a handbasket, and that's the usual way that, that people look at it. Sure. Or you can take the positive look and, and say that well, we're kind of we're kind of working out our problems, and and you don't do that uh, without um, a, a little bit of uh, dislocation. Um, uh, and as far as uh, angels, the way to relate angels to this, I would say that one of the ways that our society is in tremendous flux is that materialism is a philosophy. This idea that the physical is all there is is rapidly fading as as the major, uh, the, the dominant uh, belief of the intellectual elite of our culture. They're they're rapidly shedding this for reasons we just went into in the last segment. Um, a lot of um, people are coming around to the idea that, well. Just take a look at the climate today. Uh, couldn't, couldn't, toward, it also, toward... couldn't it also, John, have a lot to do with the graying of America now? As yes, you, yes. As yes. you get older, uh, you tend to realize your own mortality more, and so you think about it more. And... and I think there's a tendency for most of us who develop normally to become more spiritual as we get older. The process is called maturing. Um, I think this is happening in the culture at large. I think the intellectual elite is changing its mind about the basic nature of reality, and I think you see signs of this change of mind. You see it in the media, for example. Uh, last year, we had a whole raft of specials on angel encounters in, which, right. uh, in which the spiritual and the metaphysical is given the best. I, I would say that the spiritual, spiritual and metaphysical subjects are getting the best press today than they, than they ever have in my lifetime, and I, I, can, I have a clear memory going back to the early 60s. And I can remember in the 60s as a, you know, as a teenager sitting on my, on the front porch of my duplex in, in Alabama, you know, reading the newspapers or whatever. Uh, if anybody dared to express a metaphysical experience, heaven mm -hmm. help them, you know, because oh. they were immediately surrounded by an, they were immediately followed in the, in the print report or the, or the broadcast by an expert saying they had seen the planet <laughs> Venus or the, <laughs> oh, John, <laughs> or that, uh, I, I, no... I, I could tell you so many stories. John, we're at the bottom of the hour. Hold okay. on. We'll be right back to you. Uh, believe me, doing a standard uh, five-hour-per-night talk show on regular subjects during the week and then doing this on the weekend gives everybody in the world an opportunity to take a cheap shot at me. I'm used to it. We'll be right back. From the Kingdom of Nye, we continue with your calls on Greenland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255, 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222, 702-727-1222, or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295, 727-1295, in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Now again, here I am. Hi, everybody. Back to John Runner in just one moment, three. And, uh, John, we're back on again. As I was saying, I've done this for ten years, John, and I find that um, um, I'm going to continue to examine the kinds of areas that I have been for years now with shows like this one because I think whether it's extraterrestrial visitors and, and the question is whether there is life elsewhere, which to me has always seemed probable, 
uh, or we're talking about life after death, these are probably two of the most important questions uh, mankind strives for as long as he is alive to answer. I mean, they really are, and so I'll keep examining them, and I'm sure that you've had plenty of people come after you, too, in your time, kind of chuckling and laughing, and, uh, and you know, it's an easy, cheap shot. Well, the uh, the existential questions are always going to be with us, and, and we've really got a choice of universes here. If the materialists are right, then we live in a meaningless, accidental universe, and all of our spiritual lessons, which we have learned at, at great cost over over the, our lifespans, are for naught. It makes no difference at all. That's right. Uh, if they're right, uh, then the universe is essentially meaningless. Now, I know the existentialists, they argue that, that you know, you can still put your own meaning into life, and that's, that's true up to a point, but to me, it's small potatoes, it's thin gruel to compensate me for the fact that my whole universe is meaningless. And... Uh, it also, you know, I want to get back to what we were talking about a while ago. There, you know, the heartening thing about this is there, there is some circumstantial evidence out there to suggest that a spiritual realm actually exists. You don't have to be credulous. You don't have to be empty-headed, as, the, as some skeptics often suggest, in order to believe in all of this. Let's take the near-death experience, for example. This is one okay. of the things that impressed me so much as a young man. I couldn't, uh, one, of the, one of the first things I noticed during all of the hoopla about the near-death experience in the mid-1970s, which caught us all by surprise, very few of us at that time had ever heard of it. I certainly hadn't. Um, you, 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 of course, you have the original, you have the initial stage of the out of body experience and then the journey through the tunnel, uh, which is kind of like a halfway zone between the physical plane and, and the spiritual realm. Then the, uh, the person having the near death experience emerges into the world of light. There, there they interact with, uh, departed loved ones who preceded them in death. And sometimes this, this, uh, superior being of light, this angel like being of light that we talked about earlier, which sometimes is described as angelic, sometimes as a divine figure. Uh, you have the life review where you see every tiny action of your life uh, in all of its many uh, small details, almost like a morality play, a theater in the round, completely surrounding you in technicolor. You're right in the middle of it. For many and of us, that is a terrifying prospect. It can be terrifying. It can be exhilarating. It can be a combination of both uh, because you suddenly, for the first time, uh, get into the heads and the hearts of everybody around you and you see the implications of everything you've done, good and bad. And, and of course, the people who have had this life review experience have often come back saying that the one thing that struck them the most about it was that all of the, all of the things that we consider so important and so big tend to be very trivial and unimportant during the life review when you're looking at it from a higher consciousness. And, and, and some of the things that were seemingly trivial, like a little act of kindness or, or, you know, a kind word to somebody yes. you need, suddenly take on tremendous proportions, uh, in the life review. It's almost like your priorities are turned upside down. And uh, to get back to what I was going to say, though, is uh, we're familiar with some of the stages of the near-death experience, and, and evidentially what impresses me about it is that somebody can be lying flat on their back for 15 to 20 minutes with no vital signs, clinically dead, the brain's mm. not working, the electroencephalograph is flatlining, and all of a sudden they come back and they say, you know, the story is, well, you know, I was floating around the room, I was looking down on all of this, I, you know, I, I saw the doctor over there doing this, the nurse was crying because I was the same age she was, that's what she was thinking, she didn't say that, and it goes on into 101 different details about what happened while the person was clinically dead, while he had no vital signs, and sometimes they even passed through walls moving into other rooms. My question is this. I've heard the standard explanations from the materialists. Okay, your brain is flooded with feel-good neurochemicals like serotonin and, and endorphins and whatnot. That's right, yes. To try to ease your transition into oblivion because your body wants to resist the idea that it's all over. Right. I've heard, uh, you know, the, the problem with all of these explanations is they're non-explanations. And they, then don't forget None of them the, explain where you get this knowledge from. Don't forget the brain cells dying from the outside moving inward. Uh, accounting for what some doctors say is this center core of light. Uh, oh, yeah. Right? They've, they've come up with that one for the light. Well, all of these theories sound good on paper, so to speak, but if you look a little bit deeper, they don't explain where this knowledge comes from. Um, and uh, experiments have actually been conducted uh, in this effect, to this effect. Uh, Michael Saberman, Atlanta cardiologist. Well, let, let, me, let me back up just a couple of steps. The skeptics have said, have been confronted with the fact that these people have all of this knowledge about about what went on while they were clinically dead. And, and I want to emphasize this again at the risk of beating a dead horse, that while the brain is not working according to the EEG. Yes. Um, where do they get this knowledge from? And also, where do they get this perspective from? Because very often they describe looking down on it all from a corner, you know, an upper corner of the, of the room. 
that they could not have had that perspective if they were lying flat on their back on a hospital bed hallucinating the whole thing. So the skeptics have come back and said, well, they're just good guessers. You know, they're old hands in the hospital. They've been through the routine, and they kind of know what's going to happen anyway. Michael Sabum, Atlanta cardiologist, was one of the researchers who followed Raymond Moody. You know, Raymond Moody came out with his book uh, on the near-death experience in the mid-1970s and, and woke the whole country up to the near-death experience. But, but Moody was not actually doing scientific research. He was just collecting anecdotes, and he put it all together into the different stages of the near-death experience so that people would have a handle on what was going on. And he was followed by researchers like Sabum and Kenneth Ring, the Connecticut psychologist, and uh, uh, Bruce Grayson and so on who did scientific research. Now, Sabum addressed the good guesser theory, okay, the idea that they're just good guessers, they're old hands in the hospital. That's how come they know what's going on. <laughs> he got himself two groups, a control group and experimental group. Control group uh, had no recollection whatsoever while they were clinically dead of anything that went on, no recollection of an NDE. The experimental group claimed to have been out of body watching the whole thing. Both groups were given questionnaires to fill out uh, before they had a chance to be briefed. Right. You know, after they were resuscitated, uh, to describe what had happened. And, of course, uh, you know, um, the experimental group that claimed to have witnessed all of this stuff out of body was uh, largely successful in describing what had happened. And the uh, the control group that had no recollection, well, they, they, they fumbled miserably. They couldn't begin mm. to describe what had happened. So, so I, you know, we're back to what we said earlier. There's no scientific proof for any of this, but there's a lot of tantalizing telltale signs that something's really going on out there. All right. There. I, I've I want... seen enough. Let me ask you, stop and ask you a question. I don't know whether you happen to catch the 60 Minutes episode or not. It was on a few weeks ago. No, I missed it, but tell me about it. I'd like to hear this. Okay, well, uh, it covered an op... Uh, this poor lady had a brain aneurysm, a big one. Uh, in other words, a big uh, bulbless uh, uh, expansion of, uh, you know, a blood vessel or whatever in her brain. Yeah. And there was no way to operate on this lady other than to literally kill her. Now, they reduced her body temperature wow. way down. They drained all of the blood from her body, which, of course, allowed them, to, you know, the aneurysm uh, at that point, without blood pressure, mm -hmm. um, shriveled, and they were able to operate on it, excise it, and everything. But, but in the process of doing this, it was the only way it could be done. Otherwise, they would have killed her. They lowered her body temperature. Uh, she went flat, all the way flat, no brain waves, nothing, for the better part of an hour, an hour, I say, mm -hmm. they heated her blood, and as they put the blood back in her body, John, she, uh, she revived. They didn't have to do anything, no electric shock, nothing. As they put the warmed blood back in, back comes the lady. Now, um, this is actually, uh, though rare, a fairly common procedure. Where, John, did that lady go? Well, that's the question. That that's the philosophical question. Yeah, I mean, uh, it sure I, is. I, I, uh, uh, my, my feeling, my opinion, is that uh, it's entirely possible that people do experience the phases of the near-death experience, but may not have any conscious recollection of it once they come back, and that uh, some do and some don't recall it. I mean, I can't prove that, but. Uh, it would seem more logical to me that, that everyone has a near-death experience when they're out. There was one other 60... I'll stay with this for a second. Um, it, it covers what you just talked about. It was an operating room, and, you know, frequently uh, they would have these NDEs that would occur, and the doctors would be told about it. And so they took uh, a little um, a neon sign and put it up on top of some equipment... Uh, in the operating room, where nobody would be able to see it except somebody who was uh, out of body, who was out of body oh, on the ceiling. Yes, and uh, nobody to date, John, has come back and revealed what that sign says. Uh -huh. yeah. on, on the other hand, if you were out of body and you were looking down, it, it, in all probability, the sign is the last thing you'd read. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, there are, there are instances where. Uh, uh, people have reported uh, objects out of sight, so I'm not. I don't know. Uh, I, I would say that the the neon sign definitively disproves the near death experience. I mean, there was a case in which uh, one of Moody's cases in which uh, somebody came back and and had allegedly been on an out of body flight and uh, had gone out. I, I think he was hovering outside the uh, 
one of the windows of the hospital many stories up from the ground. He saw a sneaker sitting out on the window ledge. He came back into his body and mentioned it to the medical personnel, and they checked, and sure enough, there was the sneaker. Wow. Uh, I interviewed uh, Sandy Rogers for uh, for one of my books. Uh, she lives in Lebanon, Illinois, and she was popping in and out of her body during life-saving surgery being performed on her after she tried to commit suicide. And um, she uh, picked up a lot of information about her relatives in other rooms and so on. And uh, so while while the neon sign to date has not been uh, deciphered by anybody, there have been other instances in which people have seen things that were beyond their their range of vision if they were just lying on their on the gurney. I'll stay with this for a second. Um, it it covers what you just talked about. It was an operating room. And, you know, frequently uh, they would have these NDEs that would occur, and the doctors would be told about it. And so they took uh, a little um, a neon sign and put it up on top of some equipment uh, in the operating room where nobody would be able to see it except somebody... Who was uh, out of body. Who was out of body oh, on the ceiling. Yes. And uh, nobody to date... John has come back and revealed what that sign says. Uh -huh. yeah. on, on the other hand, if you were out of body and you were looking down, it, it, in all probability, the sign is the last thing you'd read. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, there are, there are instances where uh, uh, people have reported uh, objects out of sight. So I'm not. I don't know. Uh, I, I would say that the the neon sign definitively disproves the near death experience. I mean, there was a case in which. Uh, one of Moody's cases in which uh, somebody came back and, and had allegedly been on an out-of-body flight and uh, had gone out, I, I think he was hovering outside the uh, one of the windows of the hospital many stories up from the ground. He saw a sneaker sitting out on the window ledge. He came back into his body and mentioned it to the medical personnel, and they checked, and sure enough, there was the sneaker. Wow. Uh, I interviewed uh, Sandy Rogers for... Uh, for one of my books, uh, she lives in Lebanon, Illinois, and she was popping in and out of her body during life-saving surgery being performed on her after she tried to commit suicide. And um, she uh, picked up a lot of information about her relatives in other rooms and so on. And uh, so while while the neon sign to date has not been uh, deciphered by anybody, there have been other instances in which people have seen things that were beyond their, their range of vision if they were just lying on their on the gurney. So uh, you've examined uh, lots and lots and lots of cases uh, of apparent uh, intervention by angels or angelic figures or beings of uh, light. Um, if I were to ask you, which I will in a second, to recount to us in some detail the very best one or the best proof you've ever heard to date, um, I wonder what you would say. And in a moment, we'll find out what he says. We'll be right back. Zero three. All right, back now to John Ronner, subject to angels. John, what would you say is the best case? Well, I tried to uh, list a few candidates here. I I took this this uh, particular story for the the new book. Uh, in fact, I'm, I titled the book "The Angels of Cokeville After This. Cokeville is a small town in uh, Wyoming, a ra ranching community. Uh, back mm -hmm. in 1986. Uh, uh, a psychotic genius by the name of David Gary Young. He had an IQ of about 180. Uh, yeah. when, to give you an idea of what we're talking about here in terms of intellect, an IQ of 130 is 1 in 100, an IQ of 140 is 1 in 1,000. And Young had an IQ of 180, but unfortunately he was a warped genius. Uh, he built a bomb that took up an entire shopping cart, rolled it into an elementary school in Cokeville, and took the entire school hostage, of about 150 kids plus uh, about 10 or 15 adults. My goodness. And he said he wanted a rap session with Reagan. He wanted two million per hostage. Uh, and uh, but his, his an examination of his diaries after the incident revealed that he he secretly intended, no matter what happened, to take the ransom and blow all the kids up, including himself. He had this crazy idea that he was going to reincarnate in a new dimension called the Brave New World, and he'd be like a resurrected Pharaoh. You know, story. As a crane operator, I got into a situation where my crane would have tipped over if a dangerous situation was not brought to my attention. My crane had an extreme load on the hook, and one of my outriggers was sinking into the pavement. When an outrigger loses its stability, the crane tips over and can cause loss of life or at the very least damage to property. In this case, four men could have lost their lives. I noticed nothing wrong since my crane was swinging the heavy load to the men. Somebody, now listen to this, somebody wearing carpenter whites and no hard hat, he's got that underline, no hard hat, called my name, pointed to the ground and said, 
your outrigger. I saw that my crane was about to go, and I was very busy swinging the heavy load away from the lives in jeopardy and was able to keep it from tipping. Later, I tried to find the man that saved the crane and those guys' lives. I couldn't find him. I described him to the other guys. They didn't know him. He was dressed as a carpenter, and the level of the building he was on had only laborers. He had no hard hat on. That would have meant immediate termination. I later thought about it. Now, I believe an angel was sent to save these men's lives. Again, from an anonymous author and location. That was for you, John. What do you think? Oh, I think it's a classic story. I really appreciate the fact that he took the time to send it in. It's a, this is a, this is an example of the angel in disguise, or what, what many people feel would be the angel in disguise, and certainly that's the, the facts, the man who facts that, that's his opinion. Uh, in, in this kind of category of experience, <clears throat> The angel looks like a human being, acts like a human being, but there are so many uncanny little details surrounding the incident that by the time it's over, as in the case with this crane operator, the person is convinced that this could not have been a human being after all, despite the fact that it, it, it looked to be that way. Um, Wouldn't it almost be necessary uh, on occasion they would disguise themselves in a form that we would understand so as not to totally throw the person off? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot to touch on that. Right, the uh, uh, the what we what uh, the the crane operator feels was an angel in this case disguised himself as a carpenter in whites, and yet there was no hard hat on his head. And oftentimes there are anomal anomalous little things like this. Uh, in a typical um, angel in disguise story, you uh, you might find yourself uh, uh, broken down on a deserted road. The helper uh, tends to appear out of nowhere at a critical moment. You didn't notice him coming, and then disappear again at another critical moment you, uh, when your attention is diverted, once the, once the assistance is, is rendered. Another little key feature of this, which happened in this incident, is that other people never see the helper, just the person who needs to see him. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a widespread um, it, it's reported on a widespread level there, and it's, uh, the skeptics have a hard time with this one, but uh, it's it's... It's pretty common out there, and it's, I guess to get a handle on this, it's very much, it reminds me of the old TV series Highway to Heaven with the late actor Michael Landon playing the angel Jonathan Smith, who looked like a human being, but right. uh, tended to hang back and let people solve their own problems. He would be the catalyst for change, but not, would not take uh, drastic action himself. All right, here's another fact. This might be a skeptic from Honolulu. Okay. Jo uh, Jeffrey, he says, All right, John said that we have to look at, quote, them, end quote, to be real. I don't see you on the radio, and yet I believe you are real. If angels are so real, why hide? I, I would like to get some help. I need help, and they hide from me. That's from Jeffrey. That's a good point. I, I want to point out, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to get into that, one of the things that, that we, we have a danger of, of losing sight of when we talk about these spectacular experiences is that there's some kind of spiritual elite out there having all the experiences and the rest of us are just kind of sitting on our hands looking around waiting for something to happen. I don't think that's the case. I think every, we're all surrounded by, this, by spiritual forces. We're immersed in it and, and we are touched by the heavenly and by the uh, angelic. Uh, the challenge for us is just to pay more attention to what's happening to all of us. I think yeah. we're all affected by it. I don't think Jeffrey's left out or I am left out or anybody else. My sister is a, is, uh, has had lots of dramatic experiences over the years, and I've had relatively few, and those that I've had have been subtle. Uh, but I, uh, I consider myself uh, a part of all this also. We're not sitting on the bleachers. We're all in the playing field. And the more you pay attention to this phenomenon, the more it uh, comes into your life. I think, first of all, we're all affected uh, by meaningful coincidence or synchronicity, that's probably the most common way that uh, the other side touches us in our day-to-day -day life. You know, uh, is, uh, is William what, Temple it, said, when I pray, coincidences happen, and when I cease to pray, they stop happening. And people who have kept diaries of synchronicities in their life have noticed that they have increased in frequency and in intensity. And uh, What were you going to say, Art? Well, I was going to say, is what we, uh, what I would generally call intuition or a very strong intuitive feeling that if I do this, I'm a dead duck. That's another good example. Yeah. Is that an example? I think I think intuition, uh, the hunches that we have, are another are another very very common way that we are all affected by this phenomenon. Uh, uh, 
uh, probably the most dramatic example of, of, of a hunch type of experience uh, that comes to my mind immediately was a, a lady in Wisconsin who, let's see, how did that go? Her two sons were out on a joyride, and all of a sudden uh, she was seized with this uh, horrible feeling of dread that they were in mortal danger, and, and without really understanding why, she found herself bursting into tears. She flopped on her bed and started crying and praying for their lives. She had no logical reason to do any of this. A short time later, the two boys come in. Their faces are pale. And the story is that uh, their car had been surrounded. Their car had stalled on a street and was surrounded by an armed, hostile gang armed with baseball bats and guns banging on the windows of the station wagon with full, a full-force pounding of baseball bats on these windows for two minutes. Uh, one kid was in the back seat with his head right close to the window, just inside, of course. And as he happened to kind of uh, glance outward, he saw the head of a baseball bat come come down with full force on the outside of that window. And it hit the window. The window didn't crack. The window didn't spider. But the baseball bat cracked in two when it hit the window. Something the kids felt was keeping the windows from cracking or spidering or even shattering. Protecting. Now we can argue, you know, we can argue back and forth about, uh, you know, gee, maybe that's a little far-fetched, John. Uh, are you trying to say that the angels turned that car into an armored presidential limousine? Well, you know, we can't prove that that happened, but we do know that their mother, uh, on some level, was was keenly aware of the danger that they were in and prayed for them, and perhaps that prayer had an effect on on saving their lives. Eventually, they got the car started and they got out of there, got away from the gang. Hey, John, have you heard any stories about angelic appearances uh, with reference to the big explosion in Oklahoma City? Well, you know what, um, I heard, <laughs> I I caught just a passing reference uh, in in just a, a garden variety news report. You know, there was so much mega information coming out of there. Somebody was uh, somebody had mentioned an individual who uh, claimed that an angel had led him out of the wreckage uh, through some kind of cart or whatever. I don't really? know if anybody else out there in in Radio Land heard the same account. I was intrigued by that. I've had people ask me whether or not uh, I thought that that a lot of spiritual experiences occurred uh, in that disaster. And all I can say is, well, I have no way of knowing, but usually in times of, of great disaster, uh, all sorts of paranormal activity occur. Uh, if nothing else, a lot of people are aware on a subconscious level of the disaster um, uh, and and uh, steer clear of it. Uh, uh, David Booth, Cincinnati office worker, had uh, terrible nightmares ten nights in a row. This is back in the mid-'80s, and uh, we see how that went. He... Uh, after three or four nights of this, well, what he would dream is he dreamed that he saw uh, an American Airlines, uh, let's see, uh, I'm trying to, uh, it was a, it was a DC, American Airlines DC-10. He saw that much in his dream, a jumbo jet mm -hmm. taken off in a slow ascent from an airport, and then he watched uh, an engine break off from the wing. Then he saw the plane flip over and come upside down back to the ground. There was a Boy. huge orange fireball, and he'd wake up crying. If this happened two or three nights in a row, he couldn't st stand it any longer. He got the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration. And they didn't treat him like a nut. They took him seriously. And they interviewed him, trying to figure out what in the world, you know, where was this flight? What, uh, when is it happening? Right, sure. And unfortunately, this, you know, this is, uh, these visions are right brain phenomena. Phenomena. The intuition comes in through the right side of our brain and doesn't give us a lot of facts, figures, and details. He had, he had a lot of, uh, of visual detail, but not a lot of numbers and names to put on it. He didn't know it was American Airlines, and he didn't know it was a DC-10. Anyway. American Airlines had too many flights. It just couldn't pinpoint it. So the nightmares went on ten nights in a row. On the tenth night, uh, Booth had his last nightmare. The next day, Lindsay Wagner, the actress, and her mother were about to get on board American Airlines Flight 191, taken off from uh, Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Right. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, Ms. Wagner, was, who was known for her intuition, was seized with this overpowering feeling that she should not get on this flight. And uh, she, you know, for for reasons she couldn't explain, but she trusted her intuition. She just walked away from the plane with her mother. A few minutes later, uh, this Flight 191 took off, and an engine broke off. The plane flipped over, came down, inverted. Uh, orange fireball went up uh, uh, just exactly as Booth had seen it in the dream. And uh, unfortunately, uh, all 273 passengers on board were killed. It was the worst aviation disaster in North America up to that point. That's incredible. And Lindsay yeah. Wagner walked away from that? She walked away from it. And, and uh, to get back to what you were saying, though, originally, what I was saying, I, I feel we're all affected by this phenomenon. Uh, most of, 
with most of us, it's a subtle thing. Well, that's and, a, okay, let me stop you, John. That's yeah. the problem. I'm a, I'm a kind of a halfway white knuckle flyer, you know. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, in other words, when I get on a plane, uh -huh. and I think this is most people, it occurs to you, this thing could crash, you know. Anytime you fly, what goes up could come down. And, and you could and end you up like Apollo it. 13 out there yeah, halfway to the right. moon and nowhere yeah. to go. Yeah, well, that's, that's more or less right. And so I always worry about it, and I have a sort of thought, and I try to trust my intuition, and I always go those little flicks, and you're never really sure. In other words, oh, it should be before you walk away from that flight, <laughs> and I've thought about it a few times, it should be a true overpowering feeling. Is that right? Not just sort of a gentle worry. Well, the people who have uh, powerful int intuitive uh, experiences will usually report that uh, you know that there's there's no doubt in their mind about it. Ex I've not had a, one. Not a vacillating. No, I, that's right, John. I've had one. I've had one, and it came at me like ocean waves, uh, so strongly I could not ignore it. So it was the only one, and it was really strong. I've got another fax for you in just a moment. John Ronner is my guest. He'll be right back. Zero. All right, we're going to get to calls shortly, but uh, this is from Diane in Southern California. Dear Art and John, in the fall of 1983, after my father and brother died, I had my first experience with a guardian angel, Flora. So this one has a name. During the hour and a half she spent with me, I got a lot of questions answered. I no longer need scientific proof of angels, as the many things Flora told me proved out true over the next few months. The one question, though, I did not ask her is the one I would like to ask John tonight. Here it is. Are those little flashes of astral-like blue-white light that one sees sometimes an indication that an angel is near? John? I think I know what Diane's talking about. If I understand that correctly, uh, uh, it can either... I've seen instances where those were taken to be an indication of the presence of a departed loved one or a superior spiritual being uh, and, and possibly something else, but usually one, one or the other. Huh. Uh, I've, and, I've heard people talk of them, blue-white flashes. Mm -hmm. Or speckled light or uh, sometimes balls of light and so on that, that will appear. Uh, exactly. It's, it's, it's one way the other side can make its presence known. Uh, usually, uh, usually when somebody encounters uh, 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 an angel as a superior being, they'll, they, they, they'll see kind of a, well, they may see a shimmering column of rainbow light. They may see uh, balls of light. They may see a, a human form against a, a kind of a very bright uh, halo. Um, it can take a lot of different forms. Do you believe in ghosts, John? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, as a matter of fact, I thought I was beginning to think that was what Diane was leading up to when you first started. Uh, and it's an, important, uh, it's an important topic to be discussed within the larger context of angels because a lot of people out there feel that departed loved ones look after them, as I said earlier in the program, like de facto angels. The term guardian angel gets used even though, technically speaking, we're talking about a guardian spirit because... You know, a ghost would not be a higher order of being. It would simply be a human being who had died mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, continues to be essentially human just in another dimension. Uh, usually, uh, the contact between the living and the dead is very fleeting. It's momentary. It occurs around the moment of death. It's usually a chance for people who have been suddenly separated to take care of uh, unresolved affairs, uh, you know, maybe the husband tell the wife, gee, I'm sorry, I never told you I loved you, it's just the way I was raised, I, I, I couldn't do any better, I'm sorry, I want you to know now that I love you and, and I'll see you again sometime, goodbye. Uh, it's also a chance, these moment of death contacts are also a chance for us to uh, answer for our loved ones that the two great questions, uh, you know, does life go on after yes. death, which, which addresses the fear of oblivion. That's one of the two great fears in our culture. And the other fear, of course, is the fear of hellfire. So we get the fear of oblivion from one end of the spectrum, and we get the fear of hellfire from the other end of the spectrum. Hellfire. Let's yeah. Let's, let's, so, let's, you know, the, so in other words, you can, you, the, the person, the, the, the dead appear, and they say, look, I'm alive. Look at me. Life goes on. There's no oblivion. And also, I'm not in pain. Everything's fine. You don't have to worry about me. And, mm. and I love you. I'll see you again sometime. And that's, usually that's the end of it. Uh, however, in a minority of cases, people feel that a relationship forms and, and continues sometimes indefinitely and sometimes for a few years, sometimes just for a few months after death in which uh, uh, there's repeated contact and, and sometimes a sort of guardianship 
uh, that that begins. I spoke with a widow in Florida who felt that her late husband continued to make repairs around the house in the same way he had made them when she was alive. I huh. talked to uh, another lady who uh, felt that her husband rescued her in the middle of traffic one day when a car pulled in front of her, and she was she froze up and and was unable to take any evasive action, and her late husband materialized in the car and jerked the wheel uh, so that uh, it went into a ditch and so on. But whatever kind of form it takes, Art, this thing is very common. I mean, uh, 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 what uh, Andrew Greeley, the famous uh, Roman Catholic uh, priest and sociologist, most of us know him through his novels, he asked uh, 1,467 Americans in 73 if they had ever felt that they were in touch with someone who died. And 27% said, well, yeah. So that was one in four saying, yes, they felt they had been in contact with the dead. And among widows and widowers, it was even more startling. Uh, 51% said yes, a majority. That's one in two. And uh, he, uh, Greeley went back 10 years later and did the same survey with another scientific, scientifically selected group. And the numbers were even higher. They went up into the 30s overall All right. and, and into the 60s among widows and widowers. All right, John. Uh, hold it right there. We're at the bottom of the hour. We'll be back. Yes, we're about to begin taking phone calls, so get ready. John Runner is my guest. The subject, angels. Kingdom of Nye. We continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1 800 618 8255. 1 800 618 TALK. First time callers, area code 702 727 1222. 702 727 1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702 727 1295. 727 1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Now again, here I am. I uh, want to add, and we're going to talk about photography in just a moment. It's a very interesting question online. Back now to John Ronner. John, um, you heard me talking about the photograph that we've got. Are there any photographs uh, of angels? Um, there are. I'm, you know, I'm not aware of angels having been photographed per se. Uh, well, sometimes I've, I've run across people who feel that they've seen uh, patterns of angels in clouds and whatnot that they photographed. Uh, I'm sure it's happening. Just because I don't know about it doesn't mean it's not not happening. No one's ever uh, sent you but, one. Excuse me. No, nobody's ever sent you one. No, no, I haven't run across it, but it's probably happening out there. Spirit photography, of course, has a long and and uh, you know colorful checkered history, and I. I uh, I, I don't dismiss it. I do think that you know that overall it's valid. Of course, it's had a lot. There's been a lot of problems with fraud and so on. But still, I think uh, in sum, it's it's a valid uh, thing. All right. Uh, I want to go to the phones, John. Let's take some calls. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Ronner. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Uh, yeah. Welcome to the show. Well, first I was going to mention... Okay, talk, hon, you, I can barely hear you talk into the phone good and loud for us. Okay, can you hear me? That's better. Okay, um, first I was going to mention the Alpine the, uh, advertisement that yes. you have. Yes. I have uh, some of the Alpine 150s in my house. Yes. And I was just going to tell the people out there that they really are neat because, like, if you have, like, a little doggy accident or a baby accident or whatever kind of accident and it makes, like, the cat smell or the floor smell, you can just aim that thing right at it. And I know. I've got one. I've got one, too. So, anyway. But any anyway. <laughs> Um, anyway, I was going to ask him, do uh, angels, people that see angels, they, they're not with these um, craft and, and you know, flying saucers and everything like that, are they? Well, well Pete, that's a good question. Uh, in other words, wh where, is, where are all these angel encounters coming from? What types of people are having the experiences? Yes. Uh, I would, that's a really good question. We haven't even touched on it at all tonight. This phenomenon crosses the board. You have people who are traditionally religious, you have people who are secular, you have metaphysically oriented people, all sorts of people uh, having these experiences. And, and, and what has really surprised even me is that this interest in angels and the experience uh, of them is almost becoming a global phenomenon. Um, mm -hmm. 
one of <laughs> one of my books, No Heroes, was recently translated into uh, Japanese, and I would never have thought that the Japanese would be interested in this, but uh, I, I suppose they have their own Buddhist traditions. Uh, I know that you have the Bodhisattva in Buddhism, which is a mortal who has broken the wheel of karma and yet chooses to remain on Earth. It's very much angel-like in order to help others with their evolution. So... Um, it, it is interesting that, uh, that certainly within our neck of the woods, uh, all sorts of people uh, are interested in this phenomenon. All right, this one, another fax. Uh, would you ask your guest, Art, about angelic appearances on the battlefield and the appearance of the war witch in odd moments during combat? Never heard of the war witch. Well, that's an interesting expression. The war witch is probably colloquial just for, uh, you know, any kind of spiritual event that occurs you know, on the battlefield. Oh, yes. Uh, battlefields are places of great stress. And whenever you have a lot of stress, you often have metaphysical experiences because now the skeptics say, well, you have metaphysical experiences in times of stress because the mind's snapping. But I like to think, I suspect, that what's really happening is that stress puts the mind into an, spontaneously into an altered state of consciousness which enables us to perceive other realities that we that our normal waking consciousness doesn't make available to us uh -huh. so battlefields are places of great stress and so you have a lot of experiences you have there's a there uh, in world war 1 uh, many of the soldiers uh, up and up uh, uh, along the uh, Allied war front were claiming to have seen angels and saints and, and whatnot uh, during an Allied retreat from Mons, Belgium. Uh, that became a very famous uh, series of incidents, and many of the older generations uh, still remember that to this day. Um, Closer to our time, uh, Raymond Moody, uh, the near-death researcher, uh, uh, interviewed a gentleman who, uh, during World War II, was being approached by a strafing warplane, and as the bullets, you know, headed straight toward him, kicking up the dust, he was, you know, feeling horrible, a terrible fear, uh, feeling that he would die, and all of a sudden, he, he was within the aura of something beyond himself, a very pleasant, calming aura, and he suddenly felt totally at peace and wonderful. And he heard a voice speaking to him out of thin air, and it said, I'm here with you, Reed. Your time has not yet come. So the battlefield is, a, is because, I think, of the stress factor, is a, is a place where very commonly you have an interface between the physical world and the spiritual world. All right. Let me, before we go to more calls, every line's ringing, but I want to ask this, because everybody wants to know. I sure do. You probably won't have an answer. And <laughs> uh, you, you have all these great stories about people that have been saved by angels. Oh, yeah. I know it's coming. Yeah, sure you do. Uh, but there are so many children in Oklahoma City, children across the nation, innocents, wonderful people, killed, no intervention. They're just killed. Yeah, just like the uh, plane crash we just talked about a while ago. I mean, uh, Lindsey Wagner walked away from the plane, but where were the angels of the other 200 passengers, 200 plus passengers? Yep, that's the question. Uh, that is it. Why do angels go on vacation? You know, uh, why is, is my angel working, but yours is out to lunch? That's you know? good. Yeah. Uh, why? There, in, in the book of Acts, you have uh, Stephen is stoned, but a couple of chapters down, Peter is freed by an angel. I think, uh, first of all, as you said, there isn't really no answer to this. It's been asked for thousands of years, and, and uh, I've never come across anybody that had a completely satisfactory answer. I'll throw a few things out, and, and with, with no hope of it really totally satisfying. <laughs> all right. Some people have pointed out, well, first of all, a lot of bad things that happen in this world are of our own making. Let's not start blaming God and angels for World War II. World War II, for example, got started because nationalism ran wild and racial hatred ran wild and infected millions of people. And you ended up with trillions of dollars worth of damage and, and millions of lives lost, all man-made. Um, secondly, people have pointed out that uh, there's a very popular metaphysical theory that uh, we come into this world uh, deliberately with a choice, uh, by choice, that we have our, our life roughly sketched out or mapped Hmm. Uh, we have a life plan. We choose to have certain experiences before we incarnate. Now, this is, you know, I'm not saying yay or nay to this theory. I'm just throwing it out for discussion. And that uh, we may choose uh, uh, to experience tragedy, maybe a, a long wasting away from cancer to teach us what it's like to be helpless and to have others love us and, and care for us, or, or vice versa, to, to learn how to care for others who, who we love. Um, some people have argued, uh, Emerson, for example, talked about the law of compensation. The Hindus call it karma. The, uh, uh, the old timers just say what goes around comes around. This is another idea. This is the idea that what we put out into the world, that the world is our mirror. And what we put out into it is reflected back to us by, uh, in, in, whatever we put out in word or deed comes back to us. Kind of an so, elegant way of saying God's will. 
Yeah, well, it's the idea that we create uh, a lot of the misfortune that comes to us is a reflection of what we have put out into the world. Um, unfortunately, this sometimes degenerates into blaming the victim. So without further ado, let me just wrap it up by saying that there are a lot of theories out there. I don't find any one of them totally satisfactory. Mm. I wouldn't trot them out in front of somebody who had just lost a child or just had some kind of terrible right. tragedy occur to them. I would say this one final thing. A lot of people, when they ask this question, are really asking, why did it happen to me? It's not a broad philosophical question for them. It's just a personal thing. Is God mad at me? Do the angels hate me? Or whatever. And I just have to say, I can't, from the bottom of my heart, I cannot believe that we live in the kind of universe that would, would, would deliberately visit negative things on people. All right. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Rahner. Hi. Hi. Where, where are you calling from? Uh, San Diego. San Diego. Okay. Yes. Uh, what brought you to studying angels, and what is your belief in a supreme being? Sorry. That's, a, that's a great question. Um, I was I started out as an agnostic. I thought the physical was all there was, that the universe was an accidental machine. I, I guess I was kind of a child of that materialist thinking of the, of the 50s and the 60s, which was so rampant, so strong, the idea that there's a logical, mechanical explanation for everything if you just look slightly beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. But I, as a young man, I began to, to come to the conclusion that that's true if you look superficially at things. There do seem to be mechanical explanations for many things. But if you look deeper, some of those mechanical explanations start falling apart. And we touched on a few things earlier in the program where I think materialism is running into trouble. Uh, the near-death experience flies in the face of the materialist uh, mindset. Developments in science fly in the face of it. Uh, uh, I guess the near-death experience probably had the greatest effect on me in changing my own mind. I, I couldn't understand. I remember, I remember as a young man, I couldn't understand how people with wildly differing ideas about what the afterlife was supposed to be like could be having essentially the same experiences. And this was all in the 1970s, long before there was massive publicity about the near-death experience. Most people were like me. They didn't have a clue about that in the 70s. So there was not any chance of contamination of people, you know, saying, well, I've heard so much about the tunnel, I'm going to talk about the tunnel, or, or I've heard so much about the figure of light, I'll say I experienced that. Sure. So I was very impressed by that. Okay, uh, back to the phones. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Ronner. Hi. Yeah, John. I, hey. I have, I have a little experience I'd like to relate to you. Okay. Uh, this happened when I was around 16 years old. Uh -huh. I dropped out of high school, and I was kind of at my wit's end, and this was back uh, quite some time, and this was on the East Coast. And uh, I was going to this store every night that had bay windows and had a big turntable in one of the windows, and had a bunch of guns on there. And... Uh, and I kept eyeing him, and I came to the conclusion that I was going to break the window and steal a gun, and I was going to do some robberies. Yeah. And uh, I came up that night, and I had a brick in my hand, and I raised it up, and I was ready to throw it through the bay window. And those little doors that they have for loading up the showcase, there was a policeman there huh. in full regalia with his hat and his badge on his hat on his chest, his badge. He was just looking at me. He didn't say anything. He just looked at me. And I dropped the brick, and I left. A year later, I went in the military, and I got out of the military. I went back and got my high school. I went and got a degree in engineering. I work in high tech today. Yeah. I've done an awful lot of things that contributed to the science of the world. You've come a long way. And the way. very cutting edge of technology. And, yeah. and I believe... I didn't realize it at that time. That about, about a decade later, I realized that uh, that was indeed a possible guardian angel. Oh, that's so an incredible story. Where, where are you calling from, please? Albuquerque. Thank you. That, that's an incredible story. And it was a pivotal time in his life and uh, just turned him around completely. I, you, if you want, you want to talk about being at a crossroads <laughs> where, the, where, where the road forks and you could go one way or the other, that story certainly exemplifies that, doesn't it? Exactly. Uh, was, was that policeman an angel? It's entirely possible. Uh, well, it certainly had about the same effect. And whether and and it, it could either be the mysterious stranger type incident, it could be a meaningful coincidence, it could have been an actual policeman there. You know, who knows? But certainly his life was changed. <laughs> um, all right, John, hold on. We'll be right back to John Ronner. He's our guest. You know the numbers. Get on the phone. You may think you're a home zero three three. John, are you ready? I'm ready. Here comes somebody else. Okay. West, west of the Rockies, you're on the air. Yes, uh, my friend. Uh fellow Gemini. Yes, <laughs> sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, 
I have a, uh, a question, a statement, and a quickie little story. The uh, question is, the, the Bible, for those that read, uh, clearly states that God says not to get involved, do not seek, look for, or try to contact spirits or the dead. Uh, All right. It is. How do you respond to that, John? Basically, he's saying the Bible says don't do what you're doing. Well, I think some of the biblical writers were of that opinion, and and but the ancients uh, had had different opinions about that both ways. Uh, um, the contact. First of all, there are some people who are troubled by the idea that that you might want to try to summon the dead. I think Saul got into trouble in the Old Testament for what was it uh, going to the witch of Endor to conjure the. Uh, uh, Judge Samuel, and then he was rebuked by Samuel as a result. Um, that uh, uh, that may be as much because Saul defied the. Will. I'll give a quick statement because I know you're limited on time. You're talking about intuitive. Yeah. I've led led my life that way, and uh, sometimes even take it for granted. It's something that I have seemed to have either learned or acquired early in life. I ride motorcycle. So you you got to be very conscious. But I take it in every form of life activity. I would be on the road and I think, no, I'm not going to pass this vehicle. No, I'm not going to change lanes. It was just like a mental game or a gut feeling, I guess, for lack of better words. And sure enough, had I have done what most people or you commonly see people do or maybe you've done yourself, yes, there would have been an oncoming obstruction of some form or another in the road. Uh, another uh, quick story here. Uh, I probably shouldn't mention the person's name because they're no longer living to defend what I'm saying, so you just have to take it at face value. This happened many years ago with a famous short man, black entertainer. Got to be quick, sir. And he was, uh, we were at a dinner club. A blonde gentleman come up to the table and said, Sir, God loves you. And this... Uh, person uh, was so moved by it, he did his best to get a hold of the head waiter and the people of the club and said, I want to thank that blonde man for saying that. Yes, sir, we have no blonde waiters. All right, well, uh, we'll hold it there, and I'll extend that. There are all these stories going around, John, about the hitchhiker, mm -hmm. uh, Gabriel's Horn. You've oh, the hitchhiker, the millennialist hitchhiker. Yeah, that's the right. End of the uh, that's right. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these things are, are categor categorized as urban legends. In that uh, we, I, I personally have never personally interviewed somebody who has experienced that. I'm not saying it hasn't oh. happened, but um, the, the buzz that that I get is that um, people are having trouble actually pinning down these stories to to um, um, you know to find out. To actually get a name of somebody that you can speak with who says they had that type of experience. But I'm not necessarily throwing cold water on it. I just have not personally interviewed anybody myself, nor do I know of anyone who has interviewed somebody personally who has had that story. I have. Have you? I've, I've had, All right. Oh, oh I've had calls, John. Uh, that's okay. why I asked. All right. East of the... Uh, well, you would have been. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Rotter. Hi. Hello. Hey. This is Nancy in Seattle. Hi. Um... I had a, a couple of questions, one of which was I hear a lot about angels, and I've never been particularly uh, religious or not religious. I guess agnostic is where I fall. Mm -hmm. From the Kingdom of Nine, you're hearing Dreamland with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll-free 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-8255. First-time callers, area code 702-727-1222, or the wildcard line at 702-727-1295. This is the CBC Radio Network. Yes, it is, and I want to remind people I'm getting faxes asking me the Richard Hoagland program that was on the regular syndicated weeknight show this uh, last Friday night, Saturday morning. Uh, may be ordered. You may get a copy of the r latest uh, Richard Hoagland show. A lot of just packed full of new information. Or you can get a copy of the program you're hearing right now. Or any other Dreamland program. Or, one more or, or you can get uh, a subscription to our newsletter, which is $29.95 a year and is now coming out with color photographs, I might add, of our Orient trip in the next issue if you get it ordered now. The number to call for all of this is 
800-917-4278. Now, that line's open now or 24 hours a day. Write it down, please. 1-800-917-4278. John, here's one for you. A missionary deep in the South American jungle had been trying for some time to convert a local tribe to Christ. No success. The chief finally had enough of these trespassers and brought a full division of warriors down on the missionary and his family. They spent the night in prayer, ready for deliverance or death. Unexpectedly, the warriors just left without harming them in any way. Later, when on more friendly terms, the missionary asked why he didn't attack. Well, Ajit said that he was outnumbered by his army. The missionary was puzzled, but the chief assured him the hut was surrounded by an army in bright white robes holding flaming swords. Have you heard that one? Yeah, there's a there's a whole class of stories, Art, just like that. Um, I think uh, uh, Billy Graham in in his uh, particular book was talking about John G. Payton in the Pacific Ocean's new uh, Hebrides island chain. They yes. had a similar experience like that. Um, very often, uh, missionaries have reported that they were under duress or or whatever, and that uh, when attacked by hostile forces in their in their area they they received uh, angelic help that was not visible to them but was what they found out later was visible to the attackers hmm. um, yeah that's that's there's a whole class of stories just like that east of the Rockies you're on the air with John Ronner where are you calling from please I'm calling from Oklahoma and I'm listening to KFH in Wichita Kansas Wichita Kansas all right uh, I want to tell a story about my mother she had a premonition or a dream the night before my uh, grandfather was in a mining accident his men had gone down and set a charge the day before and the charge didn't go off so he went down to check it himself well anyway in her dream she dreamed that he was in an explosion and that he was hurt badly. Well, she went to take his lunch to him and begged him to come home, and he wouldn't come home. She told him what, you know, she had dreamed, and he didn't come home. And they went on, she and my grandmother went to Pittsburgh, Kansas, and uh, they had to come find them because he had been blown up in an explosion in the mine. He lost his eyesight, and his body was all blue where the shot went into his body. And uh, he almost died. A little Catholic nun took care of him and kept him alive for six months. But then, when he was 81 years old, she told me I was pregnant with my son and had to go back to Wichita and couldn't stay with her while she was taking care of him at home. And uh, she said... I had a dream that Grandpa was going to die on my birthday, and he died on her birthday. Hmm. It was really a strange experience. I think uh, we're all uh, there's uh, there's evidence that uh, when when tragedy is about to strike, that um, we may be aware on a subconscious level, or there may be a spiritual prompting from the other side about this. However, you want to interpret it. Um, the the uh, Parapsychologist at the University of Virginia, Ian Stevenson, did a famous study on uh, uh, coincidences and premonitions surrounding the sinking of the Titanic uh, that became a classic. Uh, very often, people seem to uh, be aware through dreams or through hunches that something is about to happen. Uh, w. E. Cox, uh, a researcher in the 1950s, conducted a study of railroad accidents, and he discovered that there was a statistically significant drop-off in ridership on trains that were doomed to crash on the days that they actually did crash. And there was a further drop-off in ridership in the cars that suffered the worst damage. Uh, he called this phenomenon accident avoidance, and his theory was that people were aware subconsciously that the accident was about to occur, and probably in most cases, without any conscious knowledge, they simply stayed away. Uh, maybe they lingered over breakfast a little bit longer and were late, sure. uh, like the members of the uh, West Side Baptist Church that we talked about earlier. I think in most cases... Um, w when we uh, when we experience something like this, it, it often does occur subconsciously. Let me ask you for a second about the dark side. We talk about um, near death. We talk about angelic appearances. Yeah. 
But there is the dark side, John. There are people publishing books uh, relating uh, stories told with a, a, a much more hesitantly about going to hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a lot of criticism, Art, you know, of the near-death experience uh, some years back. It became kind of all the rage. You, you might have even treated the, the subject on your own program. The, the, the criticism was, well, the near-death experience is just too warm and fuzzy. Everybody's having a wonderful time, you know. Yeah. Isn't, yeah. Anybody, <laughs> isn't anybody having a bad time in the afterlife? And, and uh, there was a lot of examination about that issue in, in different programs. So, uh, I, think, I think what has happened, it, well, first of all, let me say this. What's so bad about the overwhelming or, or the great majority of, of average people who are neither Al Capone or Mother Teresa having a rather pleasant time of it in the afterlife? If we, oh, live, in a, if we live in a sane universe, wouldn't you expect that? I no, mean, nothing's uh, wrong with that, John. No, I'm, 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 and, I'm and very encouraged by it. Uh, my, uh, but, you know, the other may be there. Sure, yeah, and I was coming to that. There, uh, Nevertheless, there is some justification in raising the point. Uh, doesn't anybody have a negative experience? And the answer is yes. Um, I think what's what's been happening is that in the early stages of near-death investigation, most of the people who were being interviewed were rather typical average people, you know, as I said, neither saints nor horrible sinners. Mm. Uh, now, upon closer examination, we find that people who are above average wrongdoers very often do report uh, rather negative experiences. Uh, 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 Jack London told the story of a a gentleman who was in uh, uh, solitary confinement at San Quentin and had a metaphysical out-of-body experience and near-death experience during during that time, and in which he experienced the life review that we talked about early in the program. So all the tiny actions of his life, and as as you alluded to earlier in the program, he was aware of all the negative consequences, and it was a painful experience for him. Uh, uh, I can just imagine what it would be like if I were, if you were say Saddam Hussein, who had started the Gulf War and cost 100,000 Iraqis their lives. We're not talking about the injured now, we're just talking about all killed. People who were buried alive in those berms when the you know, when the when uh, Schwarzkopf's uh, tanks yes. went over there and you know, yes, remember that? Yes, remember that we read in the paper about how they they just they roll over these these barricades and just bury these guys alive. They did, yes. And to be Saddam Hussein, I mean, this is just speculation. And you're having a life review and suddenly you are aware on an intimate, empath empathetic level of every tiny bit of suffering that you have caused to everybody and you're seeing it you're feeling it from their heart. That would be quite a hellish experience. As a matter of fact, uh, near-death experiencers uh, uh, going through the uh, tunnel phase, you know, first you have the out-of-body phase, then they tunnel through this dark passageway on their way to the world of light. Right. Sometimes they have reported kind of looking to the side of the tunnel, so to speak, and seeing a drab, a gray zone around the earth, uh, people with numberless spirits kind of shuffling around, looking sad, weighted down, burdened, uh, almost as if everybody's, each person has his own problem. Uh, some people shell-shocked by a violent death and not realizing they're dead. Others uh, running addictions that they ran in, in physical life and never dealt with, and uh, maybe uh, uh, hang, alcoholics hanging around a bar trying to vicariously get the pleasure of, of the alcohol and so on. Uh, there was, I remember in particular one instance where a lady who had a near-death experience uh, noticed in this gray zone on her way to the light, she noticed a, 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 business, a young businessman kind of walking down the street, and he was in the flesh, you know, alive. Right. And hovering over him was the specter of a gray-haired woman who was waving her finger in his face as if trying to lecture him or tell him what to do. And, and the near-death experiencer said that she felt, she got the impression that that lady, that spirit, was his mother, still trying to tell him, still trying to boss him around. Uh, in death as she had in life and was unable to let go of that. Of course, in spiritualism, there's a long tradition uh, of belief in the idea that that one minute after death, we're very much the same as we are one minute before death, and that is to say we take all of our, our virtues with us and also all of our baggage, and if we have enough baggage, too much baggage, we, 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 according to this theory, and if that's all it is, it's a theory, we remain earthbound, unable to ascend, unable to get to the light. So if you, if you look a little bit deeper, not all the near-death experiences are warm and fuzzy. All right, John, good. Uh, hold, hold it right there. We'll be right back to John Ronner. Um, I always imagined that. If you, if you can imagine the good, you've got to imagine the other. And if one exists, it seems to me... It, it argues for the existence of the other, and we'll be right back. Mr. Three, back now to John Ronner. John, are you there? I'm here. All right, a lot of phone calls, so let's keep going. <clears throat> East of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Ronner. Hi, where are you calling from? Please? I'm calling from San Francisco, California. Uh, you're on the wrong line. 
Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's quite all right. Now we'll go west of the Rockies. Uh, you're on the air with John Ronner. Hi. Hi, Art. Uh, you got the Washingtonian Druid up here in this uh, KONA country. Yes, sir. Tri-Cities, I believe. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I just wanted to call uh, call you up there and, uh, and uh, kind of warn uh, all your listeners about this type of stuff. Um, um, there are a lot of uh, evil angels out there. And uh, sometimes they like to cause a little bit of mischief now and then. Um, I had some experiences uh, um, beforehand with this type of thing. Um, um, so uh, uh, you kind of want to watch out because uh, uh, they do tend to cause a little havoc. Now. Well, all right. Uh, that's a good point. I remember the old Disney movies where you got the good little guy over here and the bad little guy over here. John, are there any cases you could document of the bad little guy leading people into a disaster instead of the other way around? Well, I, 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 I can't think of anything right off the top of my head, but the thought that I did have about what the caller was saying is the, the, the principle here is, is to watch out, be careful that, uh, you know, not all spirits are benevolent. And I, I thought of the New Testament principle of discerning the spirits, the idea that, uh, that you, should, you, uh, you should test uh, the validity of the advice you're getting, the validity of the experience itself, and if uh, uh, I think Ignatius of Loyola, the uh, uh, the great theologian from the 1600s, the founder of the Jesuits, uh, actually elaborated a system for discerning the the spirits uh, or testing whether the experience is bona fide or not. Uh, the idea was first. I think one of the major points was to to see what effects the experience is having on you. Uh, are you becoming um, are you becoming more spiritual or less so? Is life becoming easier and more clarified for you or more confusing and more negative? These, right. are, some of the th these are some of the issues that crop up. Huh. All right. Uh, east of the Rockies, you're on the air. Where are you calling from, please? Albuquerque, George. Again? Uh, again. Oh, you're only allowed to call one time per show, sir. Uh, two years ago. Oh, you mean you haven't called in two years? Right. Oh, well, that's not... Ex <laughs> What's on your mind, George? I expected you to remember. Hey, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking, you two gentlemen could conduct a grand experiment. Art Bell, you have a, a tremendous audience, and if you could ask them all to meditate on uh, a, an improvement of a certain kind that could be verifiable, and Mr. Parr could, could uh, help you with that, John Ronner. Um, all right, he's, he's talking about an experiment. Have you ever thought of doing that, John? I, I've done that. Uh, for example, I have taken uh, a little object, I forgot, I think it was a pen, and balanced it on my table, knowing I've got millions of people out there. And I said, come on, everybody, let's push this pen over. Stupid pen sat right there. <laughs> it's probably, is it like that with angels? I mean, um, well, first of all, uh, uh, we were talking about the whether an experiment has been performed, and you you could say that an experiment of sorts is, of, of that ilk is already underway, and that's the the mass meditation that generally occurs around the Christmas season every year for world peace and world stability. Yes. Some people have argued that the uh, the gradual uh, um, uh, raising of spiritual consciousness on the part of, of politicians and the the the, the peace that seems to to be breaking out all over the world. Although you know some will take issue with me, they'll point to Bosnia and so on, but, but I'm talking about things like the fall of communism, the, uh, the formation of the United Nations coalition to police Iraq, and so on. Uh, peace really is breaking out in a lot of countries, and if you follow the international news, for example, Angola just recently ended a long-standing war. Uh, some people have said that, that all of this meditation is having a subtle effect on the politicians and just on the planet at large. Um, I suppose it would be bad karma to uh, try and get together and meditate on causing a blood vessel to break in Saddam's head, eh? <laughs> yeah, and that gets back to is that I, you just jogged the, the, me on the original point of this whole thing. Uh, the idea, that, I wanted to point out that angels um, generally are not believed to be capable of manipulation. They're superior beings, so you would not be able to, uh, you know, force angels to do anything. That's That's been the most common belief, of course. I'm sure that, as with everything else in metaphysics, there's no unanimity of, of belief. So but kind of, uh, but like I there. guess I do think it would be bad karma. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of it. like sitting there and uh, demanding of God that he supply immediate proof of his existence to you or you're uh, going to stop believing. Oh, sure. And and I think that... Uh, uh, I think that a lot of the uh, the mystery and the and, and the uh, challenge of life would be removed 
One of the one of the things that I, I you know we didn't touch on this earlier when we were this why you asked the question why do angels go on vacation and one point that I didn't make was that a lot of people argue that our existence here is a great adventure. And if any time you're going to have a great adventure, uh -huh. things have to go wrong. If, the, if, if every time you right. did a show, you had a 100% rating, whether it was a great show or a that's middling exactly show or a bad show, you'd be bored stiff after a few that, days. That's true, John. Uh, we'll be right back with whatever it w is we've got going right now. And it's good. Stay right there. Very angry with a particular angel for taking her brother away from her. I looked the angel's name up in the dictionary, and it was the angel of death. I can't remember the name now. Prior to the accident, my husband was blinded by a ball of bright light. Our explanation is the sun, because he cannot justify anything else. I know better. My son's greatest gift to, to me, the many people he knew in the family, is the absolute knowledge that death here is not the end, but just the beginning of something else. I hope it helps other parents whose children have left at a young age. Look for the meaning and purpose for that child's life and look at all the people affected by their short existence. It does help, but the pain never goes away. That's Deborah in Seattle. John, you're back on. Yes, that was uh, quite a story. In the, uh, in the accident, I was unclear about whether anybody else was hurt. When the son was killed. Well, they don't say the extent of the um, the injuries of the sister. Um, she apparently was okay, I guess, because she was by the bedside of the brother for several days. Yeah, I'm L not. I'm listen, not... John, before you get started, sure. Um, you haven't done it, so I'm going to make you do it. Um, look, I've already had. I've got a fistful of faxes here of stories like these. I've got enough stories just from the show we've done tonight. You could write another book. <laughs> now, uh, if people want to contact you and give you stories, or people want to contact you and get your books, I mean, this is the time when you can give out your info, so give it out. Well, what I'd like to do is, first of all, give, a, give an address where they can write me if they, if they would like to. They can write me care of Mamre Press, M-A-M-R-E-P-R-E-S-S, and uh, that's at Post Office Box 3137. And that's in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and that's M-U-R-F-R-E-E-S-B-O-R-O, -E -E and the zip is 37130. So that's 3137-37130. Um, as far as uh, um, one, one other thing I'd like to do is, is just point out that I'll be speaking at a couple of places. Uh, on August 6th, I'll be speaking at the Unity Church in Franklin, North Carolina. Uh, on October 28th, I'll be speaking at an angel conference in, in Maryland, and uh, for information about that, they can call uh, Greenlee Associates at 301-270-2185. Uh, on November 30th, I'll be speaking at the Unity Church on Hillcroft in Houston. Uh, on April 22nd next year, I'll be speaking at a meeting of the Canton Metaphysical Society. And on July 23rd of 96, I'll be at a conference at Lilydale, New York. Uh, uh, All right, you don't have a fax number you'd like to give out, do you? No, I don't. Uh, if, if they're interested in, in, in uh, writing care of the publisher, that's probably the best approach. All right. Um, the books themselves are probably pretty widely available. They, they've been in the chains for years. Uh, do You Have a Guardian Angel is the original book. That's the old favorite. It's, it talks about many of the things we've covered in this program. Um, I you, wrote you that way that? back in... You can get that in most major bookstores uh, and many of the minor ones. It's it's had it's been a bestseller for some years and it's got pretty widespread distribution. And uh, I wrote that one first back in '85 when I was a young reporter and I wanted to uh, uh, I wanted to do a journalistic treatment of the subject of angels because many of the books were kind of strident religious tracts, so yes. forcefully putting forth this author's viewpoint of that. And I thought, gee, it would be nice to rise above the fray and just provide uh, journalistic objective information to the to the extent I could. I'm sure many criticize you for that, don't they? Well, it's uh, it's I, I, I think I, I'm sort of immune to all of that. I, I, <laughs> I, I've talked to all kinds of groups, everybody under the sun, all the, you know, all the way from 
from the mainline denominations uh, uh, and to spiritualists and so on. And I think the one thing that immunizes me from criticism is that I don't try to tell people what to think. I, I want the people to do their own thinking. It's the one thing I wanted to get away from when I wrote Do You Have a Guardian Angel in the first place. If this was going to be a book that didn't tell people what they had to believe. And, in fact, the, 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 uh, the title itself, Do You Have a Guardian Angel, is a question. It's not a flat statement ordering you to believe in angels. And then the next book, uh, Know Your Angels, The Angel Almanac, came out in 93, and that's like a mini encyclopedia of the subject. And the newest one, The Angels of Cokeville, uh, I've, I've encapsulated a few of those stories tonight. That is a, a collection of what I consider to be the outstanding angel encounter stories that I have ever run across in the last 10 years of talking to hundreds of people about it. Excellent. All right, back to the phones. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Ronner. Where are you calling from, please? El Paso, and I got a low battery on my south. El Paso, Texas. All right. Kind of in between the Rockies. Anyway, uh, I mean, I'm sure you've heard, I, I think I heard you mention it once, once before, but there, that light theory at the end of the tunnel? Yes. Yeah. It's a trick, according to people. It's true, sir. Thank you. Uh, let me relate this, John. An old friend of mine, who is a UFO buff, uh, almost the granddaddy of UFO uh, investigation in this country, John Lear, the son of Bill Lear, who, you know, the Lear jet guy, uh -huh. um, once said that it had been said to him, and he passed on to me, and it has driven me crazy ever since. He said, don't go to the light. It's a trick. Go to the darkness. I have never been bothered so much by a statement in all my life. <laughs> you know, it seems so easy. Light is good. Um, darkness is bad. Yeah. It's a trick. Go to the darkness. Any well, comments? Well, the, the, some people out there have misgivings about the being of light. They feel like it's the devil in disguise tricking them. Um, and there is uh, there's some mentioning. I think a lot of this comes from uh, some of the New Testament writers mentioned that uh, I think Perhaps it was Paul, certainly one of the New Testament writers, mentioned that the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light, and I think that's caused a lot of fear and trepidation out there. But i also like to point out that one of the most famous appearances of a being of light in the history of our Christian culture was the appearance of a being of light to Paul of Tarsus, the number two man in Christianity, when he was on the road to Damascus to persecute the Christian community there. Uh, he was you know, knocked off his mule, blinded for three days, according to the book of Acts, and later interpreted the experience as being uh, Jesus uh, after, the, after his death, appearing to him and asking him why he was persecuting him. So, so I think we come back to what we were saying earlier, and that is... Um, it's just a matter of, of using spiritual discernment, not accepting every metaphysical experience that comes down the pike, but uh, uh, being selective and, and gauging it by the effect that it has on you. All what right. kind of direction does it put you in? First time caller line, you're on the air with John Ronner. Hi. Hello. Hello. All right, let me turn my radio off. Turn it off. That's good. <laughs> Do that right away. Where are you calling from? Just a second. I'm going to reach around the corner and get the radio. All right. All right. There, it's off. All right. Where are you, sir? I'm in Florence, Oregon. All right. I hear you out of Portland. Okay. Uh, I don't know where to start. I believe in guardian angels because I've had one. On, um, my family's had one for years. Uh, whether I have it now or not, I don't know. My wife died in October, and it may have been her guardian angel. Uh, anyway, uh, I got my job through the guardian angel uh, the guardian angel told my wife where to look for the job, and I got my job. When I retired out of the service, I got my house through a guardian angel. Hmm. Uh, my son passed away with muscular dystrophy in 89, and the day he died, he told my wife that he had somebody holding his left hand. And my wife said, there's nobody there. I said, but there's somebody holding my hand, Mom. And uh, apparently there was, you know, because he died that night. And... Uh, but there was many cases in my family where uh, the guardian angel uh, helped us. Never got us uh, the greatest things, but always kept us right on the verge of disaster. You know what I mean? Yes, uh, thank you. John, it begs a good question, and that is, he said he thought the guardian angel might have been his wife's. Now, does it seem true to you, John, that guardian angels follow one particular person 
uh, versus another, and then when that person is gone, and then so is the guardian angel? Would that? Well, the uh, the most common belief, Art, is that each of us gets a guardian angel. This is this is just the most common belief in in the uh, uh, in in our culture has been that each of us gets a guardian angel at birth. That angel stays with us until death, at which time there's a separation. Most of the medieval theologians uh, accepted that particular idea. It doesn't make it right. Uh, and that uh, everybody gets a guardian angel. It doesn't make any difference, you know, how, whether, you know, if you're Joseph Stalin or if you're um, uh, Albert Schweitzer, you're well, still going to get one. Well, okay, now. so then would you say some of them are lazy? Some of them are no count guardian angels versus uh, ones that will stop tr trucks and stop accidents. In other words, this goes back to the uh, what happened to the other angels, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, I would say that that uh, most of the things that we talked about would apply here. Um, and and here again, I, I keep coming up with with other little ideas. One of which that we didn't mention earlier is that some some people uh, come into this world more just better wired to interface with other realities than the rest of us and they may be they may be picking up signals that that some of the rest of us can't pick up it may be that the other side is trying to get through hmm. uh but just can't with some of us and can with others uh one thing that that uh, the gentleman from Florence brought up that I'd like to address real quick. I know time's running short. He talked about how his son had died in 89 with uh, MS. Yes. And the day he died, he he was talking about how he felt someone had someone was there with him holding his hand. Right. One thing that we haven't touched on in this discussion is the is the deathbed vision, the idea that uh, uh, there's a there's a genuine medical phenomenon that in the in their dying moments, uh, dying patients will suddenly perk up and begin oftentimes speaking in an animated way with somebody in the in the room with them that nobody else can see. That's right. Uh, and by listening, you know, it's, it's an incredibly startling experience for, for the onlookers. And for those who listen to the to one half of the conversation because they can only hear the, the dying patient talk, it becomes clear that the, the patient feels that someone is there in the room with them to to escort them into the beyond, that to, to take them uh, at the moment of death and, and lead them on. Sometimes it can be a, an, an angel that they may be dis feeling that they are with. It may be a departed loved one who is there. Uh, uh, to give you an example of that, James Moore, the famous tenor, was, was on his deathbed dying, and all of a sudden he perked up. And he said uh, very excitedly, Mother, what are you doing here? His mother had been dead for decades. Oh and then he went on to say, oh, wait a minute. You're not coming to I'm not. You're not coming to me. I'm coming to you. Well, wait, mother. Hold on. I'm al I'm almost over. I can jump it. Wait. And then a few moments later, he slumped and he died. Uh, John, I'll hold that thought. Um, you know, everybody, when you listen to this, and I hope that you do listen to it. And this is why we do these kinds of programs. You need not automatically believe, but one would hope that you would be open-minded enough to listen and to uh, allow it to enter your brain and rattle around with everything else you've heard. Angels? Huh. Silly? I don't think so. I hope you're listening carefully. We'll be right back. North American trading has done a very wise thing. You see, not very long ago, we interviewed Steve Jurich, who is an investment analyst with North American Trading of Scottsdale, Arizona. We talked about every aspect of the economy. We talked about the newsletter carries an unconditional money-back guarantee from the publishers. Again, that's 1-800-830-9830. All right, uh, back to the phones. Um, John, we've got very little time, but east of the Rockies, here's somebody in El Paso, Texas. Hello there. Hi. You're on the air, sir. Okay, thanks. Uh, John. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, um, I was listening to your theories about disembodied spirits, and uh, I had a friend of mine in California tell me that uh, he's into radionics. I don't know if you know what that, what that is. Well, I've heard of it, but I, you have to explain it because I can't pull it off the top of my head. Uh, radionics is uh, uh, where disembodied spirits will uh, in, um, uh, come back into your aura, your magnetic field. Mm-hmm. Up, oh, I think we just lost oh, the shoot. caller. We lost him. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, let's try and take one more west of the Rockies. You're on the air with John Rotter. Hello. Oh, I am. Yes. Uh, here in San Francisco, there's a church. Uh, in, all right. Know. Turn your radio off, sir. It, it is. I got it off. I just turned it off. Okay. Okay. Angelic things happen there. Uh, free. Evangelical Church near 14th in Valencia. Have you heard of it? 
Are you saying angelic things are happening at an evangelical church in San Francisco, right? Yes, there's okay. been healings. Uh... Actually, yes, I've heard of that. I, I really have heard the rumors. Uh, how long has it been going on? Oh, it's been going on at least 10, 10 or 12 years. All right, well, uh, that begs the question. John, um, do angelic things tend to happen around churches, or is the incidence of angelic assistance simply widespread? I would say this, Art. I'd say angelic things tend to happen where the belief in them is strongest. And that the belief is an energy that facilitates uh, the, these things. Uh, lack of belief is uh, is denying it energy. And, and ten, you know, whatever we whatever we put our belief and our attention into tends to expand in our lives. And whatever we withdraw our attention or our belief from tends to contract from our lives. And this is one reason why I think we have such adamant skeptics out there in their universe. In the universe that they have created for themselves with their skeptical consciousness, there are no healings. There are no miracles. So in other words, those, there are who, no visitations, those right. who say it's a bunch of baloney are liable to experience that reality uh, for them. If It'll... they begin to open their minds, I think it will start coming into their lives. And But as long as their minds are closed, I think it will stay away from them, yeah. Hmm. All right, maybe one more. First time caller line, you're on the air with John Ronner. All right, hi, this is... Uh... Sanaka in Norman, Oklahoma. I'm really glad to get through to you. I'll know you've been running short on time, and I'll try and be as quick as I can. I'd like to, if I can hang on, I'd like to give you my phone number because I've been monitoring your show for about a year uh, here. I'm a college student. I'm 22 and having a really good time living life, uh, enjoying the quickening. I very much agree with your, your description of it in that term. Uh, recently, I underwent a most profound spiritual awakening within my own self after much dedication and hard work and much pain and much suffering mind you as a child I experienced much conflict over the apparent contradiction in, in good angels and bad angels and heaven and hell and eternity and what it all meant all right well we're way short on time do you have a question I wanted to ask you what you or your guests knew about the new star but uh, John New well, star? I'll, I'll, I'll have to ask you about that, Sanaka. Could you inform me? There's a, there is one new star. The only mention I've heard of it so far has been on the G. Liddy program, and all he did was read the 25-word or less AP wire, which uh, said, uh, you know, basically there was a new star. It took 18.5 million years or something like that for us to see it. All right, well, on. Right. Are you talking about like a? You're not talking about a nova. You're not uh, talking look, about John, a nova where a sun goes. John, over. John, 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 John. We're out of time. Okay, we're out of time. I mean, that really is it. We've got to go, John. All right. It has been an absolute pleasure having you here, John. We will have you back again. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. John Ronner on Angels. Good night. And thank you all very much. I'm sorry, there is never enough time. Don't forget our bulletin board service number, area code 702-727-1709. To get a tape of this program or any other, call 1-800-917-4278. From the high desert, good night. This has been Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland. Welcome to Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not that. And yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. This is Dreamland. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to yet another Dreamland. A uh, very, very enjoyable series for me to do, as most of you know. We, uh, we barely made it, but I guess what we did. And we connected with Linda Howe, who is, believe it or not, at the Philadelphia airport, where I guess she just zoomed in. And uh, that was a nail-biter. And our guest, of course, is going to be Bud Hopkins. Been looking forward to this one. UFO investigator, extraordinaire, author of Intruders and Missing Time. So it should be, uh, to say the least, quite an evening. 
I'm Art Bell. This is a sort of an unusual program. And if it is your first listen, I suggest you sit back in an armchair and prepare yourself. Because this is some pretty fascinating stuff. Now, all the way to Philadelphia, literally, I guess, at the airport, and Linda Howe. And hi, Linda. Uh, you're at the airport, actually? Yeah, all right. I'm in a uh, relatively noisy uh, phone booth out here. I'm going to hope that we're going to be able to transmit all this well. And if you hear what sounds like the loudspeakers or the music of an airport behind me, that's because that's where I am. Understandable. Uh, I was in Eureka Springs uh, this weekend at the Eureka Springs Conference that discusses the large complex UFO phenomenon. And one of the guests who spoke for the first time in 28 years about his experiences as a television producer and writer in 1972-74 to 74 with the Department of Defense working on a documentary called UFOs Past, Present, and Future was Robert Emenager. Uh In my new book, Glimpses of Other Realities, I show a drawing that he used in the first edition of the book when it was published in 1974 and was never published again after that. And he explained uh, to me uh, some time back, and I'm going to uh, play an excerpt actually with more details here in a minute, that this drawing was made in the presence of Department of Defense officials who had the photograph and 16 millimeter film taken from two cameras at Holloman Air Force Base in May of 1971 when there was what appeared to be a pre-arranged landing at Holloman Air Force Base in the White Sands Missile Range area. And what I'm going to play for you right now is an excerpt of his telling, really, for the first time, the blow-by-blow, blow, as he understands what happened. And All right, Linda, uh, Linda, let me ask, uh, are you able to hear me, Linda? Yeah. Did you say a pre-arranged landing? Yeah, it assumes, it Im implies that there was some communication. All right, uh, very good. Uh, this should be an interesting report. Go ahead. Here we go. And uh, I want you to know that the, the cord from my tape recorder and the cord from the payphone don't overlap. <laughs> this will be about five or six inches from the speaker on my tape recorder, so let's see how this works. All right, okay, let's, let's try it. He said that uh, there were three discs, three uh, ships, which were filmed by a ground camera and a helicopter. He even gave me the names of the cameramen. Uh, but none of them seem to be in difficulty or because of the way it's uh, sort of rattled down. It's not falling. Kind of, yes, yeah, kind of a falling leaf. And it, it landed at the base. But it seemed like there was some understanding ahead of time. I'm not sure about because they said they dispatched a couple of, uh, uh, the after one of the I think it was a great monstrous, it's wonderful to see them, you know, flying around, but he, uh, to guide it down or to secure the area, they did have an alert at the base, and I understood that the, I was told that the uh, commander of the base, fire chief, several other people were there as the craft landed and were waiting and at the opening of the door and out came, uh, I guess, one, two, or three human tight-fitting suits, which did not look quite human. They had, uh, they had those cat eyes, I uh, looked to the front face, thin mouth. They had a, almost like a Sumerian-looking hat, as a matter of fact, rope design, and even Sumerian-looking face. Thank you. 
TV wise and foreign technology. And he he may not have been a tech sergeant at all. I, I but that's what I was told. But he was uh, he, apparently he was an attendant to one of these beings. Took care of their whatever their needs were. Uh, but we can't question of that. Well, he he was somewhat freaked out, and he's the one who contacted his friend at night to be on the alert and look for and the film that would be coming. He said, "I know there's got to be film," and he kept corresponding with Paul. Uh, Paul Shatter. Paul Shatter. Did he have a personal human reaction? Yes, yes, he did. His comment was that they, they, to him, they appeared like scientists, you know, like educated scientists. Now, I don't know what kind of communication was done, but it seemed like there was no problem with communicating. They held a, in the drawing in your book, there was that drawing. Uh, there was a which is a half uh, caduceus of it. It looked like, yeah, a coil around a, a staff. And I he, did, yeah, he did mention what that was. That was, um, that was a communication sort of the ability to also, I imagine, to paralyze or to do whatever. It was like the leadership role. And it's very interesting that we have, all through our military history, we've had the short baton as a power of, as a symbol of leadership and power. And I've kept wondering, I wonder if, this is something that we, in our ancient past, have copied, like, you know, like little humans that we are. All right, I want to double check. Is this coming true at all clearly? Well, uh, not very, Linda. Uh, well, not that's very. what I'm concerned about, and it's such an important interview. I understand. So maybe what I ought to do is just give you a quick summary on this, and then Good. next week uh, do it again in, uh, in the finer audio of abilities I have in my office. All right, let's do that, Linda. Give me a summary because it sounded fascinating. What what was the essence of the report? Yeah, this is the very first time that Bob Emenegger has described the beings in any detail uh, and using the terms Sumerian. Uh, he said this was uh, the context within which they were described. Uh, the same kind of pleated uh, headdress that rose over a bulging head. Uh, he said the eyes did have vertical pupils. He referred to them as cat eyes. Uh, they were holding a rod in the left hand, which is in the drawing, that had a coil uh, roping around it. That he said uh, the uh, our people understood to be both a communicator and something that they could use as a paralyzer if they were threatened in some way. All right, this is uh, this is fascinating, Linda, but I'm a little bit lost. Exactly where and when did this occur? This was May 1971 in a portion of Holloman Air Force Base. Three uh, discs. This is the part apparently you could not hear easily. Uh, came down uh, at the air, at this particular air base. They were met by a party of us. There were three beings. One of those is the Alfonso Lorenzo name that he was referencing, uh, who was uh, in, a, in some uh, scientific capacity there, okay. uh, who was saying that his impression of these beings was that they were scientists. And he was describing that in this meeting of these beings that uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, seem to be like uh, the so-called old ancient Sumerian gods, at least in what we have in replicas of stone statues. Mm. Uh, they and uh, their craft was transported uh, for reasons that he said had something to do with uh, a repair, but he was not sure if that was a cover story and there was some other reason, but that this was put on some kind of a, a truck uh, covered with a tent and transported to a building at the end of a street that was called Mars Avenue. Mm. Um, this happened in May of 1971, according to Emanager. They were filming at Holloman and filming the documentary in which they described this event then as a hypothetical sequence because that's what the Department of Defense told them to do. And that film was first broadcast in the United States in 1974, about three years after the event. For those who have seen that documentary, 
uh, at conferences or maybe on uh, television in late night. It was uh, one of the last projects that Rod Serling did as a narrator. And in it, it is this sequence at Holloman that he is now describing um, in detail for the first time. All right, what I'm curious about, yeah, Linda, documentary what, Linda. they described as hypothetical. Yes, Linda, what I'm curious about is why is he just telling this story now? Because he feels that he can. Because he feels that people are ready for it, do you think? Or because uh, something else has changed? Uh, in other words, uh, you say he feels he can. He feels people will accept it or that it's time or what? Well, uh, he does not uh, apparently because he said he had checked with uh, some of his still contacts in Washington about uh, speaking at the conference and uh, making these descriptions and uh, that no one said that he could not. So this is... In a way, it is a step forward beyond the documentary 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gone from hypothetical to the description of a reality. All right. Well, there, there is yet another reality. And while we're on the subject, Linda, I know your book is out. Why don't you tell everybody how to contact you or get a copy of the book? Well, thanks, Art. Um, glimpses of other realities. Uh, you can uh, get information about ordering from Linda Howe Productions. Post Office Box 538 in Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is 19006. I'll repeat that one more time. Post Office Box 538 in Huntingdon, H-U-N-T-I-N-G-D is in dog, O-N, Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is 19006. And next week, uh, I will uh, redo this uh, so that you can hear his interview clearly. And I'm sorry I got trapped uh, late on an airplane in an airport. Oh, no, that's quite all right, Linda. And uh, if it had been any, any closer, I suppose you'd have been calling from in flight. <laughs> I would have had to. All right, wonderful. Thank you. Well, thanks, and my best to Bud Hopkins. All right, take care, Linda. Take care, Art. That's, uh, that's Linda Howe, uh, literally at the airport. And uh, sometimes that's the way things work out. I thought she had perhaps uh, uh, spaced out on the time change that, of course, we all went through, the one-hour time change. Well, on a summer afternoon in 1964, Bud Hopkins and two others watched a small, round, metallic craft maneuver in the sky over Cape Cod. This daylight sighting marked the beginning of his interest in UFO phenomena. But his first nationally known investigation did not take place until 1975. Well, I understand that. You need a while to think about an experience. Then a UFO apparently landed less than a mile from Manhattan, was observed from various vantage points by a number of witnesses. Bud Hopkins' carefully researched account of this incident appeared in the Village Voice Cosmopolitan magazine and elsewhere and was covered extensively by television and radio. Bud is an accomplished author, probably the nation's uh, premier UFO investigator, and he has appeared uh, just about on everybody's important television show. And I'm sure that you know him, so he doesn't really need a great introduction beyond all of that. Let's go to Bud Hopkins. Bud, good evening. Good evening, Art. Are you able to hear me okay? I certainly can. I hope you can hear me. Just fine, clear as can be. Bud, um, first of all, welcome back. We had uh, had you on Area 2000. Now the program is syndicated, mm -hmm. and uh, we're sure glad to have you back again. Listen, what did happen? I speculated there a little bit. I had my own sighting, Bud, and I had to sit back for a long time after it and think about it. Was that the case with you? Yeah, that was the case. And, of course, I didn't think of myself uh, at any point of someone who was going to do investigations. Uh, I was making my art and exhibiting, and that was my life. And uh, <clears throat> it wasn't until uh, this friend of mine uh, reported an object landing near his car and little guys getting out, little figures and so forth, right. in a quite dramatic way that I just simply thought, I've got to look into this. And so I think I was sort of uh, pulled into this uh, business by circumstance rather than by, by choice. But I think you're right about uh, sitting back and thinking it over. You see, no one can overestimate, really, the uh, resistance all of us have to uh, what this really implies. This is the biggest change, the biggest event in all of human history. It is, if it's yeah. going on. 
And the evidence is there, and it is so absolutely shocking that people who have the experiences are sometimes even more hesitant to accept their reality than the people who are just reading about them on the outside. Because sure. it is so shocking. Sure. As you got down line from your experience a year or so, Bud, did you find that you began to question the experience yourself in your own mind, or did you find it became uh, more clear to you? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would say, depending upon the day you might have asked the question, one or the other might have been the answer. <clears throat> there is a, uh, a strange way in which, uh, if everything's going well and the world seems uh, orderly and uh, uh, the edges are nice and clean, uh, you just convince yourself it just must have been something. You don't know what it was. It must have been something. So you convince yourself uh, as best you can that uh, it's just something that's going to go away because it, it has to have an explanation. On the days when the imagery comes back in your mind vividly and... Uh, God forbid you've read about somebody else having a similar thing. It comes back to haunt you. Right. This really happened. Right. And uh, so I do think that the ambivalence is bound to be there. Uh, you know, one of the things, Art, that bothers me a great deal is uh, TV programs or whatnot, when they're do dealing with people who've had abduction experiences, they will say so-and-so claims to have been abducted. Right. No one ever, no one, but very few people, will step up and say, I had an abduction experience, I claim this. Uh, what people really say is, this happened to me, it is so confusing, it is so upsetting, it, it was it was totally real as far as I'm concerned, but it just can't be, I'm having trouble even believing it. Sure. So therefore, it's a long way away from a sort of a cold-blooded, clear-eyed claim for anybody. Well, I, maybe it's easier for the storyteller, uh, no matter how it is, uh, how real it is to the individual, but maybe it's easier for the storyteller to, in essence, give themselves an out if the other guy hearing the story says, boy, what a bunch of bunch of baloney. Yeah, well, I don't think it's so much the fear, of, although that does enter into it, uh, the fear of, uh, of ridicule. It's the fact that uh, if you accept the reality yourself, uh, what this does to your whole belief system about virtually everything in the world. Yeah, but there's a lot of fear about about the listener and how they're going to react. I, I remember after my experience, I thought, do I say anything or don't I say anything? I finally decided to, but I was in great fear, bud, about what people would think of me. Yeah, that's true. Well, well this is... <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I've just finished writing a uh, uh, an article, which I'll be publishing fairly soon. I'll send to the MUPON Journal. Uh, and the title is... Uh, uh, losing a battle but winning the war, something to that effect. Yes. The basic point is that we're winning the, ba the war uh, about bringing this material uh, and uh, this phenomenon, the abduction phenomenon, to uh, more and more serious mainstream attention. Matter of fact, just last week I had uh, uh, Susan Spencer here from 48 Hours uh, doing some work. They're going to be coming back next week on a 48-hour special. But, I mean, the New York Times, Time Magazine, I've been interviewed recently by, you know, a lot of very fine mainstream people. We are winning the war for simply the idea that this has got to be taken seriously. Whatever uh, idea about it you want to have, whether you think it's uh, some completely strange new modern psychological aberration or whatever, or whether you feel that these events are real, uh, still more and more people are coming to the conclusion. You can't just sit on the sidelines right. uh, without looking into it. But the battle we're losing is the fact that a, a particularly virulent group of uh, what I call true believers are people who believe that this cannot possibly be true. In other words, they have a very narrow belief system. These people uh, like to think of themselves as debunkers or skeptics or whatever, but there's a very narrow group of them who have set about almost single-handedly to make a climate exist, to bring about a climate of opinion that makes it almost impossible for serious people with a lot of risk to come forward and talk about their experiences. Sure. That battle we're really losing. I've worked now with maybe 450 people, something like that, one-on-one, -on -one, who have had abduction experiences. And uh, one of them was a NASA scientist. I, I was just approached the other day by my sixth or seventh, rather, psychiatrist who's had uh, his own experiences, police officers, military, and so forth. Uh, some very, actually, a person I'm going to be working with shortly, um, her father uh, was up for an Academy Award recently, a major category. These are people from all walks of life who uh, 
Now, it, it, I mean, of course, if they did come forward, it would be extremely important for the credibility of the whole issue. Right. Uh, but, but I was going to ask, what happens to a NASA scientist who claims he uh, or uh, claims publicly that he was abducted? <laughs> well, <laughs> might be looking for a new job. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say, but uh, I would say to any NASA scientist in a situation like that, don't go public. Because the climate that's been established uh, of ridicule uh, by these virulent uh, uh, you know, reputation trashers, really, sure. uh, is such that it's, uh, they are trying to create a climate in which nobody can come forward and talk about this objectively in terms of personal experience without enormous risk. And to show you the level of the risk, I've received two letters, two different people, women, who had uh, <clears throat> uh, explored their experiences, and now we're in the divorce court, and their husbands were trying to get custody with the ch of the children on the grounds that the wives were crazy because they believed they'd had these experiences. Mm. Uh, you can imagine, uh, well, if you were a, a neurosurgeon, if you were a uh, police lieutenant, uh, would you ever come forward and talk about that under the present uh, uh, climate of ridicule? No, I don't think so. So I, it, I advise people not to. It's really amazing that this many do, and if you get a yep. chance to talk to them first, you say, no, don't do it. I actually do. Uh, now, I'm involved in, a, in an extremely important case uh, here in New York uh, involving witnesses to an abduction, uh, an abduction that was evidently put on for people to see. I mean, an, uh, a very important political figure was involved as a witness, and it was a kind of a show for this person, uh, uh, I believe, as you, uh, the inferences you make from the evidence. And there are numerous uh, uh, witnesses, wow. including a new uh, witness that I have just recently uncovered. But the point is, I have given the advice to these people not to come forward because uh, the uh, the skeptics are ready to savage sure. anybody who uh, who reports this kind of experience. Well, I was about ready to ask you for some names, but obviously that's <laughs> not going to happen, is it? Yeah, I can't do it. Can't do and it. And that's, uh, that's a, a big problem. That's a battle which we really are losing. How big a person, how big a person are we talking about, Bo? Well, we're talking about, <clears throat> um, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, how, uh, let's find an analogy. Uh, Let's say uh, the importance of the level of, let's say, a former Secretary of Defense of the United States, a former uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain, something oh of that my. level. Oh, that, that's, uh, that's... We're talking very, very high. Yeah, that's... But a... the point is... Uh... All right, but listen, the point is we're at the bottom of the hour right now, <laughs> okay. so let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. My guest is Bud Hopkins, and uh, this is already fascinating stuff. You're listening to Dreamland on a Sunday night from the CBC Radio Network. the kingdom of nine this is dreamland with art bell on the cbc radio network another sunday night another dreamland my guest is bob bud hopkins and uh, he really ought not need anybody's introduction and he really doesn't he is the nation's premier ufo investigator author of intruders and missing time and talks about all that sort of thing and he's telling us now about uh, Fascinating case, actually, uh, involving somebody up high who's had an experience, an apparent abduction, and uh, has been interviewed recently by 48 Hours. And, Bud, I want to ask you about 48 Hours. Have you noticed any sort of sea change, Bud, in the way uh, 48 Hours and other programs are, uh, are, are coming at you? In other words, are they more serious about the subject? Absolutely, Art. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And I believe that this really began, the change began back in 87, because there was a simultaneous uh, appearance of uh, my book, Intruders, through Random House, uh, Whitley Strieber's book, uh, Communion Through Morrow, and uh, Light Years by Gary Kinder. I've forgotten the, publication, pu the publisher, but it was a major publisher. Three books came out at the same time, taking the subject very seriously, and they were uh, published by major publishing houses. And uh, it, it, at at that point, there was just no way that uh, the press could totally ignore this. And things began to change at that time. I, I was favorably reviewed in the New York Times and the Washington Post and places like that. 2020 did a piece and so forth. Uh, plus, you know, lots of other things. But the point is that uh, the public is extremely interested in this because I yes. think there is a subtle awareness in this country that this has never gone away, that the subject just... <laughs> The evidence is there, and that there's an, ev uh, there's, there's an ev effort on the part of the government and other people to keep this quiet. 
and people just want more and more to hear about it. All right, I, I'd like to understand, Bud, what you can tell us about your own success. In other words, you are regarded, so well regarded, uh, throughout the mainstream media, and why is that compared to others who are ridiculed, frankly, and laughed at at times? Why? Well, I, I, I don't think, I, maybe you should ask the press to, to answer that question instead of, my, uh, instead of me. I can just tell you what I try to do, and that is, uh, I try to uh, never make any assertions beyond those that I feel the evidence can really support in a very clear-cut way. Uh, I tend to uh, sit on aspects of the phenomenon which uh, are more outré, more peculiar, sure. uh, which I cannot really support so well by clear-cut evidence. Uh, a lot of people want to go with the, the most, most dramatic story they can find, uh, which, of course, then makes it sound as if, even though they may be very sincere and, and actually have some evidence for it, but it, make, it, it makes them sound a little bit more like the supermarket dreadful, those sure. little papers, than, um, you know, uh, serious individuals. And I think that uh, I can say I haven't really had to retract anything that I've written uh, over the years simply because I've been very careful. And I think that, that carefulness uh, comes out because in, in people's response, and they feel that, uh, well, here's somebody who doesn't sound uh, wild and crazy and does uh, marshal his evidence and uh, uh, perhaps he should be attended to or listened to. I think that's perhaps, I, I, I hope, that's uh, the reason why uh, I have received more attention on some of these subjects from mainstream pe people. All right. Uh, what about people like Phil Class? Phil Class I'm going to have on the program in in debate uh, in a few weeks. How has Phil treated you, evenly along with everybody else, Claude? Oh, uh, the man has lied, as a matter of fact. Uh, uh, I, you see, when we talk about balance uh, and Philip Class, it would be as if you were having a program on uh, on politics, <laughs> and supposing I were uh, uh, Senator uh, oh, uh, Senator Lautenberg, say, uh, and for balance you got Lyndon LaRouche. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I understand. I'm going to have him on with Stanton Friedman, though, and Stanton can hold his own. Well, he can hold his own. But, you know, uh, I, I, years ago, Mort Saul said that he defined a liberal as a masochist who will buy and read everything a bigot publishes. <laughs> and uh, I've always thought of, uh, of, of Philip Class as essentially a bigot. There's no sense of his having an open mind um, on any of these issues. And uh, just to show you what's... The, the typical situation why I can say these very harsh things, and I'm, I don't say harsh things about many people, but uh, uh, as an example, he wrote a book attacking uh, me at, at great length and attacking a number of abductees, uh, Charles Hickson, uh, Betty Hill, uh, uh, Kathy Davis, uh, you know, many, many different people, sure. uh, attacking the entire phenomenon and had never interviewed or spoken to a single solitary person that he wrote the book about. All right, let's 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 look at motivation for a moment. There are those who say he works for the government, he's part of the disinformation campaign, or do you think it's just a personal thing with him? Uh, well, I don't I, I don't really know. I shouldn't even say. If he's working for the government, the government's not getting its money's worth. Let's put it that way. Um, I don't know what's, his, what his problem is. I think he adores the publicity. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I'd just like to make one point very clear. This is an example of the way he operates. He started attacking uh, abductees, and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't do this in, in any kind of even attempt at a gentle way of saying, well, maybe these people are misguided or something. He implies everyone is a liar and a crook. Uh, and uh, this is his basic. It, recently in the Times, he said, uh, he was quoted as saying, these, these people aren't crazy, meaning there isn't a, a mental problem. Right. Uh, they're just little nobodies. This is the only way they can get on the Oprah Winfrey show, which I think is, of course, a wonderful piece of self-description on his part. I'll ask him about that. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's not the voice of a scientist. That's the voice of a, of a mad fanatic. And let's always remember that uh, Santayana defined a fanatic as someone who, when he loses sight of his goal, redoubles his efforts. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, but the, this is the point I'd like to make. Uh, he started attacking uh, abductees a long time ago, saying if they really had these experiences, they would report them to the FBI. 
which is kind of funny if you're Charles Hickson and you're in Pascagoula, Mississippi in the middle sure. of the night, how do you find the FBI? Absolutely. You go to the local police. But at any rate, uh, he said the reason they don't report to the FBI is because there's a federal law against falsely reporting a kidnapping, which would imply that they are aware of that law and therefore they're, since they've made up the whole story, they're afraid to report it. Right. Well, of course, uh, to report it to the police, there's a, there's a state law always against falsely reporting a kidnapping, too. It's the same same thing. It doesn't make any difference. You don't have to bring in the FBI. But uh, years ago, uh, under the Freedom of Information Act, we got a uh, uh, an internal FBI memo describing uh, an abduction reported to it in 1967. And copies of that were sent to class, of course. Uh, meanwhile, when I did the Oprah Winter show with him one time, the only time I, and I will never do it again, the only time I ever uh, appeared with him, uh, I handed him a copy of my letter to the FBI reporting all of the cases that I had been working on and demanding an investigation. Oh, really? How do you react to that? Uh, well, he was, uh, of course, his immediate thing was to uh, counterattack and say, well, you should have done it earlier, you know. Huh. And, of course, it was a, an exercise of futility because the letter I got back from the FBI was exactly what I expected. You know, dear Mr. Hopkins, the FBI does not look into such cases. Please report it to MUFON, etc. cetera. Uh, at any rate, hmm. uh, the basic point is that as recently as two weeks ago or three weeks ago, something like that, someone was interviewing him, and he went into his FBI routine again and said, uh, maybe because of the law against it. Maybe that's why, to this day, no one has ever reported a UFO abduction to the FBI. Now, that is an outright lie, which he knows to be a lie. I don't know what's eating the man. He certainly seems to be an unhappy human being. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I wish you well with your experience. I think I've talked as much as I want to about this man. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, my next question would be a really broad one, uh, Bud. What is it, in your view which is and has been for years now been seen in our skies what what are all these things how many of them would you say are legitimate possible extraterrestrial visitors of some sort right well um, the uh, the first point is as to what they are i mean obviously none of us know what they are in any kind of absolute way we know what they aren't yeah the word alien defines something uh, in terms of what it isn't. You know, when I'm in Mexico City, I'm an alien. That's sure. anything about me. Uh, the basic point is they're not from Nebraska or wherever. I mean, they are an alien phenomenon. Therefore, what we can say about their origin and their nature is uh, uh, always speculative. And uh, I always quote uh, to show the impossibility of getting at it correctly. Uh, Scott Rogo once made the remark that he didn't, I think he must have regretted this, uh, he was a, a, a good man and, and died far too young, but he did make this little slip, and he said he didn't believe that UFO occupants were extraterrestrial because they were not doing what extraterrestrials would do. Oh, and, and how does he know what... <laughs> well, that's just the problem. Yeah. So when people get into arguments about, uh, oh, I think they're interdimensionals, and somebody says they're time travelers or they're extra... whatever, I just sort of slink away from the argument. Uh, we know that they're not human. We, what do we know about them? Uh, we know that they obviously exhibit intelligence. They have a humanoid appearance. Uh, they uh, have obviously a, a technology which is uh, thousands of years ahead of ours. They seem deeply interested in us. They are deeply foreign to us in their sense of uh, uh, not really understanding human emotions. Uh, we know many, many, many things about how they behave, but as to what the bottom line is, uh, what their goal is ultimately, what they're going to be doing uh, a year from now, 20 years, 100 years from now, we have no way of knowing. And you you are, no, you. <laughs> okay, but you are nevertheless convinced that they are in one of those categories, whether yes. it's interdimensional or it's extra galactic yeah, or whatever they, it is. They are physically real at least some of the time. Now, they seem to be able to uh, dematerialize, uh, virtually disappear, and so forth and so on. Uh, whether that's whether you want to talk invent a term called interdimensional or whether we want to just say it's an advanced technology, uh, you can flip a coin. It doesn't really make any difference to me. But the point is that uh, they represent a non-human intelligence from elsewhere, mm -hmm. uh, which is of enormous uh, uh, advancement over us technologically and so on. 
All right. We are a commercial operation, so we're going to do a little of that right now, Bud. Relax for a second. We'll be right back to you. Yeah, okay. All right. My guest is Bud Hopkins, and uh, if you've been listening, you well understand what the subject matter is. We'll be right back with more of it. The gold we got to take some calls tonight. Yes, I'm we very are. interested in that. Yes. Uh, well, they're coming up in the next hour, Bud. Uh-huh. Good. Um, absolutely. Are these friendly beings, or are they... Um, what are they? In other words, we see one of these things. Uh, what would you advise a person? Uh, walk up and offer your hand or run like hell? <laughs> well, the, the, the truth of the matter is you're probably not going to have any choice one way or the other in, in this. Uh, they seem to be able to uh, uh, control the situation as they need to. Now, the basic uh, point about this, which is extremely, uh, I think, central to understand, um, is that all of our science fiction uh, uh, films and the simple stories and so forth have always dealt with uh, visitors from outside, extraterrestrials or whatever, uh, as one of two types. Either they're going to come as conquerors, body snatchers, etc., right. or they're going to come uh, as saviors uh, to uh, clean up the environment and clean the, close up the holes in the ozone layer, etc. They're either going to be, in other words, uh, gods or devils. Yes. And uh, neither one of those uh, descriptions fits what we're getting. What we're getting is we might call a third world, a third force. Uh, they seem to have their own agenda. Their own agenda does not uh, involve any kind of causing of deliberate pain or deliberate uh, hardship or taking over the world or anything of that sort at this point because they've been here for a long time and I have abduction cases that go back to 1929. Uh, they could have done an awful lot of mischief had they wanted to in the meantime. And, of course, in all of that time, there's absolutely no sign they've done anything to help us out either. Uh, the, nothing stopped, uh, uh, for instance, the Holocaust. Nothing stopped our dropping bombs on Hiroshima. Nothing, nobody stopped the Korean War, the Vietnam War, or, or the, the carnage and the genocide that uh, various factions have practiced. Since then, uh, nobody stopped the spread of AIDS, uh, the problems of cancer, the difficulties with our planet, uh, the environment. Uh, they seem to be bent on their own purposes, which are not uh, malevolent or benevolent. And that's a very tough one to understand. All right, so then maybe w they're closer to actually just monitoring what we're doing. Well, they seem to be monitoring it, but they seem to be taking material uh, from us and taking from us uh, with as little disruption as possible, it would seem, and as little di uh, uh, deliberate disruption. The involuntary disruptions, the side effects of what they're doing are truly horrendous. Uh, I don't think they understand the uh, the terror and the confusion and the self-doubt and the, uh, the family disorders and dysfunctions and so on that follow in the wake of what they've been doing over these years. Uh, but I don't see that those are uh, intended results. Uh, so uh, they are taking from us our genetic material and our DNA, uh, our particular genetic makeup, uh, because it seems, and this is the, the, the basic theme of my book, Intruders, and really this has been replicated and is accepted by virtually all abduction researchers that I know of, uh, they are picking people up in childhood and picking them up again at intervals throughout their lives right. as objects of study. And they seem to be taking uh, sperm and ova samples and genetic material uh, in what is apparently an attempt to create a, a mixture of themselves and ourselves, mm. uh, a hybrid being. And you know, quite along with that, they seem extremely interested in understanding our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings about one another, our sense of relationship with one another, love we feel for one another, uh, for our children, and so forth. All of those uh, uh, wonderful human things they seem to lack, and they seem to be very anxious upon it to, to acquire them. Well, as you look at their behavior, Bud, would you say they're more likely... Uh, oh, let's see, how can I put this? Would you say they're more likely our creators or they are tampering with what has been created? Boy, that's a tough one to answer. I mean, we're out in real deep speculation. I mean, there are a lot of people who talk about them as our creators and uh, so forth. Uh, uh, the idea being that we must have some uh, common genetic root for a, a hybrid program to work. I really don't know how to answer that. My feeling, though, are actually is that uh, on Earth, we females carry their babies for nine months. The fetuses in their bodies 
uh, and when they give birth, there's a tremendous sense of connection of bonding with their children. If you imagine some kind of developed species, which no longer reproduces by that method, uh, which no longer has females that go through the discomfort and uh, warmth and everything else of carrying a child inside the body and giving uh, it nurturance, nurturance and so forth, uh, if they have evolved past that and they somehow need that, they feel that perhaps they've reached some kind of evolutionary dead end, and there are reports that would suggest that, that we can't, you know, again, we're in speculation. Okay, again, that it is they have reached the dead end. Yes, exactly, they have. rather than us. I think they're envious of us, to tell you the truth. I think that uh, they're gaining uh, spiritual and emotional nurturance from us at the same time that they're uh, taking, uh, forcibly, I should say, uh, genetic material. All right. A lot of people speculate in order to do that, there was with our government or somebody a deal made, bud, a long time ago, uh, a, some kind of a technology swap for yeah. genetic tampering uh, permission or whatever. I think that's uh, totally without foundation. I think it's even kind of ludicrous just on the ground that uh, if all we've gotten out of it is uh, some stealth technology, as people uh, allege, uh, stealth uh, planes manage to cost an inordinate amount of money and don't even work very well. Um, I don't know what we've gotten out of it. I don't see anything that we've gotten out of it, that uh, any kind of a quantum leap in uh, technology. I wouldn't, uh, on the other hand, say that we haven't perhaps found uh, wreckage if they have had accidents and acquired that wreckage and tried to reverse uh, engineer that wreckage in in some way to learn what makes their equipment go. But uh, uh, the idea that, you know, I, I always used to think, uh, uh, under the previous administration, I always sort of made a joke about it that I always saw a little, the idea of small gray men with clipboards standing in Dan Quayle's office with a list of children they wanted to abduct that week or, yes. or aluminum siding salesmen or whatever. I mean, it's just totally foolish. They can do whatever they want to do. They don't have to ask any government position, permission from anybody. Uh, I think that that kind of theory gets uh, uh, foisted upon us because a lot of people who look into this have a natural paranoid tendency. And uh, uh, the uh, I don't mean that in the strict clinical meaning, but Conspiracy theories are wonderful oh, for a lot of people. They abound. And, uh, of course, you understand uh, paranoia uh, is a wonderful thing because it instantly organizes what's otherwise chaotic. <laughs> you know, if you and I uh, have a, uh, uh, a flat tire in the afternoon and lose a poker in the evening, we think we had a couple of bad breaks, but the paranoid will tell you who did it to you and why. That's right. So uh, the point is that if there's a lot of paranoia about the UFO phenomenon, there's, of course, tremendous paranoia, and some of it, obviously very deserved on the part of uh, belief about the government. So if you can put the two together and say the two are working hand in hand, uh, we've got a kind of very satisfactory thing. To uh, all right, you almost, you almost speak as though there is not a government cover-up. We're close to the top oh, no. of the uh, no, 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 no. There is one. Absolutely. But there's a big difference between uh, complicity and some kind of a deal that, uh, where the government or some branch thereof is, quote, unquote, allowing the aliens to abduct thousands and thousands and thousands of our citizens daily. So, in other words, you think the government may understand uh, that it is here and that they are here and even have evidence of that, but not really know what the story is themselves? Absolutely. I think ah. that they, their, their knowledge is, is far more extensive, I'm sure, whatever branch this is, than my knowledge or anyone else's. But uh, the point is, what can they do about it? Uh, you know, it's... Uh, uh, I've used this example again and again. If all a president can say is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, they're here and they're flying around, they can outfly anything we have, and they're taking our people uh, on these uh, one and two and three hour uh, abduction uh, events, medical experiments, uh, sperm and ovum sample being taken, they were race people's memories. We have no idea uh, what it's ultimately leading to, whether they're going to be friendly or not. We don't know what this is all about. There's nothing we could do about it. Thank you. Good night. We'll talk about it when we hear more. So in other words, why say anything? You're just going to scare a whole bunch of people. And Without call... any... Could you imagine being in the bond market when something like that drops? No, I cannot. Bud Hopkins, <laughs> hold on. We're going to take a break. Top of the hour. Then we'll come back and take phone calls. This is uh, Greenland on a Sunday evening. I'm Art Bell. My guest is Bud Hopkins, nation's premier UFO investigator. Get close to your telephone. Get ready because you're about to have an opportunity to speak to him.
This is the CBC Radio Network. And we own the night or evening, whatever day part it happens to be. My guest is Bud Hopkins. And as the man just told you, those are the telephone numbers. The telephone lines are now open. Bud is our nation's, I believe, premier UFO investigator. I'm uh, honored to have him on the program. Bud, are you there? I certainly am. Okay. And if I may uh, just make a comment, because we do live in the real world, too, with this, all the rest of this, I'm always I'm sort of astonished at the, uh, the heavy-duty right-wing ba- bias of the uh, news reports we're getting. It's really cool on your program. Uh, it isn't so much news as a little sermonette about how bad... Uh, uh, anything liberal, I'm surprised. But anyway, I don't want to uh, short-circuit what we're talking about. But we do live in the real world, and these other things are important to us, too. They really are. And does the twain ever meet, Bud? Uh, oh, yeah. It does. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, 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 the twain meets in the sense that uh, these experiences, uh, and we're again dealing with the whole abduction phenomenon, these experiences uh, have such uh, powerful effects on people's lives that uh, there is no way that your day-to-day existence is not affected uh, very subtly uh, by what's happened to you. Now, just to give you a quick example, if, you're, uh, if you've, these experiences have happened in childhood, and that's where they seem to always start, versus abducted as a little child, and uh, you're five years old and you wake up uh, and you can't move, you're totally paralyzed and you feel there's some strange figure that's come out of the closet or whatever with his huge black eyes and you feel yourself floating or whatever and uh, you don't remember all of the experience. You come back with a, uh, a cut on your leg that wasn't there. Maybe you're upside down in your bed or maybe your pajamas are no longer on. They're on the floor or something and it, it, all the signs of physical problems and you start calling out for help for your parents and your mother says, you just had a bad dream, get back in bed. And you try to say it wasn't a dream, it was real. Right. Uh, what happens, is, of course, is a terrible kind of uh, uh, split develops between the child and his or her sense of trust of, of adults. And if the adults begin to feel maybe something like this really is happening, they begin to feel a tremendous sense of, of impotence, of helplessness in, in protecting your own families. And much of this can remain unspoken. And it does not help anybody in your day-to-day existence, whether you're talking about your first-grade teacher or your friends at school. You're afraid to let them know that uh, you're, these strange things are happening to you, which you think, am I crazy? Is this me? Or what, what is this? Sure. All so, right, uh, but well, one other thing. You brought up politics, so one question, then we'll go sure. to the phones, and that is this administration. They've revealed an awful lot about the nuclear testing and a bunch of other yeah. baloney that's gone on. What what kind of hopes do you have that they're going to release information or what they know about UFOs? Well, my hopes are slender, sad to say. I mean, I, uh, I, uh, we have been hearing day after year after year after year that this, this is the year and they're going to come clean and so on and so forth. I honestly don't see how they can do that without really uh, terrifying the country. They've put themselves in a completely terrible position by the government cover-up program because by uh, denigrating the experiences of literally millions of people uh, they're really saying you didn't have these experiences you either made them up you're a liar or uh, or you're mentally ill it didn't happen some some problem psychologically uh, and uh, this is of course very much like on a, on a national scale, scale what I was describing within a family sure. where the parents are telling the children this didn't happen to you you just had a dream and the child knows it wasn't a dream uh, the, the people who have had these experiences know that the government is lying to them. And, of course, it means that they have no place to go, for, uh, although we're trying to, to supply that uh, as best we can with our limited resources. Uh, numbers of researchers and mental health professionals are turning around to uh, do this, but it means, I mean, to help people as best they can. enormous damage and of course if they admit now after years of lying about it uh, as I said I wouldn't want to be in the bond market when this happens so they're really in a spot right all right let's take some phone calls uh, on our toll-free line you're on the air with Bud Hopkins good evening where are you calling from please um, Portland Oregon Portland Oregon all right go ahead um, well I had a recent experience um, um, and I was just wondering how familiar this is um, not too long ago I was I had just gone to bed with my fiancé, and it was quite late, it was about midnight, and um, uh, I felt as though something had entered my room, mm-hmm. and I opened my eyes, or tried to open my eyes, and 
my vision started to just kind of blur, mm -hmm. and then my hearing went out, and I was completely paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And um, all I really do remember seeing is something kind of dark um, and not too huge, but kind of large. Mm -hmm. And um, then I remember trying to yell or scream for my fiancé, and all I remember being able to do is kind of mumble and groan a little bit. And then, not too long after that, he was shaking me, trying to, as if he was trying to wake me up. Mm -hmm. And then, um, after that had happened, I still couldn't move or hear or anything. And then there was like this, this loud wind in my ears. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to get up and scream and tell him to turn on the lights. Mm -hmm. And that's basically all I remember, except for that the next morning I woke up and had a bruise across my sh shoulder that hadn't been there before. No. Well, uh, this is uh, something that should definitely be looked into, and we have some people in uh, Portland, and you're very fortunate uh, to be in a city where there's a, uh, a very sensitive investigator, uh, who, whose name I don't want to give over the uh, air here. Uh, this is what I would su suggest you do. If you write to me, uh, this is the address for anyone who uh, wants to describe the experience. Just write to me. Uh, care of if, just the initials if. It stands actually for a Trudis Foundation, but just say if. Okay. Box 30233. Okay. And that's New York, New York. And the zip is 10011. Okay. Now, if you write to me, and you, uh, we will put you in touch with uh, a very um, uh, skilled and helpful and very, very warm person. Uh, an investigator in the Portland area uh, who has had these experiences herself, and she has uh, a support group and people who can be of help. But your experience should very definitely be looked into. All right. Well, I have another question. Does this usually happen um, because um, not too long before that I had had kind of a sighting. Um, I'm not too sure exactly what I'd seen, but it was definitely something not usual or out of, you know, kind of... All right, all right. Listen on the radio for us, please, ma'am. Is that typical sighting and uh, experience? It, it's not necessary. Many people have these experiences without remembering a sighting or uh, without having had a, a recent sighting. Uh, according to uh, the Roper survey, it would, it would suggest that perhaps uh, more people have had abduction experiences than have had UFO sightings. Hmm. Uh, so uh, yeah, we used to think of the abduction uh, as a kind of a bizarre, uh, very... A minor aspect of the whole phenomenon, but now I think it's, of course, the central purpose, and UFOs are, uh, as it were, the getaway car. And as I pointed out, we have, uh, we spent originally, before we accepted the idea of abductions, we spent many years uh, trying to get the license plate number on the getaway car without having figured out what the crime was. Right. Uh, so UFO sightings are not necessary, and are not necessary for someone to have had these experiences. All right. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Where are you calling from, please? Good evening. This is Fritz from Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Angeles. Yes. Okay, Fritz. Go ahead. Now to a very serious, sensitive subject about the alien. Way back in 1965, I learned about two alien federations on the cosmic doorstep. Now the kind ones, with a democratic, utopian, free will belief. And the not so kind ones with a socialistic I'm your leader, you will follow me system. What I want to say is that for hundreds of years there has been a great conflict over who will connect with this solar system. Now my question to Bud is, have you heard new research running into this conflict about the two alien races out there? who want to see this take over the earth sooner or later. All right, thanks, Ritz. Well, we've got the left and the right in this country. It's kind of a question about uh, extragalactic politics. I, I would say that uh, uh, what's been described here is essentially, uh, with all uh, due respect to Fritz, uh, it sounds to me like the kind of pro uh, projection that we get from people who uh, uh, want to put this in the duality of uh, gods and devils, uh, gods and demons, and so forth, uh, that I was talking about earlier before. I haven't seen in the 18 years I've been doing this kind of research, uh, I haven't seen any sign that we have different groups doing specifically different things. Hmm. Now, we have different physical types described from time, time to time, but they very often are seen in the same ship doing the same kind of uh, work with human beings that uh, I've been describing. Do you think that they are in contact with each other, aware of each other, or could we, uh, are we being simultaneously contacted uh, or sporadically contacted by many different groups and different origins? Very hard question to answer, Art. Uh, 
what I said, though, essentially is, uh, as an example, in one uh, California case, uh, the woman reported uh, uh, small gray figures with huge heads and black eyes uh, and a tall figure that was more insect-like uh, with uh, huge eyes. Uh, people have made associations with the praying mantis look and so right. forth. And other pe uh, in that same ship was a relatively speaking normal human being. But they were all cooperating in these um, genetic experiments as I've been describing. So uh, it would seem that we don't have different groups doing different things. I, I suspect that, uh, uh, we, although we have no idea where the place of origin of these figures are or whatnot, they still there doesn't seem to be a different uh, different groups doing different projects. Kind of a consortium then. Yeah, it would seem to be. All right, on the first time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Well, good evening. Uh, I can't believe I got through. You have. Where are you calling from? This is Bill in Albuquerque. Yes, Bill. And I wanted to ask Mr. Hopkins if he's the one that wrote Missing Time. I read that book. And I forgot it completely. Is he with the alien? <laughs> you mean you had a missing uh, missing memory about a book, right? Yeah, about oh, your book. About your book. <laughs> no, my question is brief. Uh, I want to know if you think that we have experimental aircraft that flies as fast as the speed of light. All right. All right, Mr. Bell's guess. Uh, I would doubt that very seriously. Uh, I, I'm not a scientist, and uh, but uh, I would doubt very seriously we've, if we have anything that uh, remotely approaches the speed of light. I think that there are undoubtedly uh, uh, aircraft under, uh, you know, in the, in the planning stages, advanced aircraft of one sort or another, and also there is uh, evidence that has come up actually in. Uh, uh, to, in Nevada and so forth, it would suggest that perhaps there's been some reverse engineering of crashed uh, UFOs, right. which would suggest an attempt to try to get something to work. Uh, but uh, the idea that we've got anything that can go near the speed of light, that if somebody had that, uh, NASA would be out of business and somebody would be making zillions of dollars at it and so on. So, What about modes of travel, But I've heard a lot of people talk about the bending of time and space and a leap across that bend. Uh, have you heard a lot about that? There, there are lots of, of theories of that sort, and uh, we really don't know what to make of it. I mean, I, I don't. Um, as I say, leave that kind of speculation to other people. I'd rather stay with the data and uh, away from uh, uh, heavy speculation. It's it's a, it's fun to do, but uh, it, we know that this is going on uh, in the lives of many, many millions of people, actually. Uh, how they get here, how they travel, where they're coming from. I mean, the idea, for instance, that they are necessarily locked into a uh, planetary system some, somewhere is not necessarily uh, true. I mean, it's highly possible since we are... Uh, we have had up in space a Skylab at one point, and space stations are going to be built by us in, with, within uh, not too long a period, um, uh, orbiting Skylabs. And uh, one could imagine that an environment could have been constructed, and it could be uh, movable through space, and so they might not be tied down to a planet. Who knows? All right, good. Well, I think that's why you're so highly regarded. You don't, uh, well, on a moment's notice or a second's notice, leap into the unknown. We don't. Yes, we, yeah, don't. That's, we that's, don't. No. Good. All right. Good evening. Uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Where are you calling from, please? Uh, Lawrence Laboratories, Livermore, California. Uh, uh, very good. Well, I'd like to contribute by helping uh, Bud Hopkins and your audience understand the nature and the origin of UFOs. All right, sir. Are you on a uh, speakerphone? And if you are, could you pick up the telephone? Well, I can't do that because I'm on an unsecured area, and I don't want my that's fellow fine. workers to know tonight. That, that's just fine. Then go ahead. We'll put right. up with it. Um, just before Einstein passed away in the 50s, he was working on the time continuum theory and trying to explain it. Uh, UFOs are simply our descendant scientists from the future who are visiting us from all points in the future and studying mankind without interference. And on what basis do you conclude that? Well, Lawrence Laboratories in Berkeley is, is working on some of the projects. Well, uh, oh. the the idea of, of uh, time traveling, of course, has been uh, brought up many, many times uh, as a theory, and uh, I don't see that it really changes anything, frankly. Uh, I'm really taking a chance and even talking about that. I understand, and you are giving us news. Can you give us some idea of what technologies you're talking about, please? Well, the, the different 
crafts that you see are simply the different time machines, modes of travel machines that are from all different points in the future. They're simply scientists who are coming back with a policy of non-interference, studying the history of mankind. That's why they're taking DNA samples to the to the future to find out what has gone wrong with mankind in the future. Uh, that's quite incredible, and uh... they're not extraterrestrials. They're from right here. They're from right here. That's why we see ships, as you call them, materialize and dematerialize, because they're simply going in and out of time. The, the issues, uh, the descriptions, of course, here uh, of uh, time traveling, uh, uh, I mean, it fits one of the uh, modes of, of explanation of the UFO phenomenon that we've had for a long, long time, uh, along with, you know, ideas of interdimensionality and so forth. Um, so what you're saying is, as a theory has been around a long time, the news would be, if you can say officially, uh, that this is some kind of uh, government, uh, I mean, that, that uh, Lawrence Livermore Laboratories is working on something. There is a point in the future where mankind learns to travel in time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's... And it's less than 200 years. Uh-huh. Well, the issue would be if <laughs> if some kind of statement could be made that would be official about this, that would be you the know, big news. Maybe this caller would like to comment on the paradox problem, since you seem familiar with... What well, there is no paradox if there's non-interference. All right, good enough. All right, I've got a run caller. Well, there is, of course, an amazing uh, amount of interference. Uh, lives are being interfered with uh, daily. Uh, suicides have resulted in this. In other words, the, the interference is extraordinary. Uh, so uh, it isn't a question uh, of, of it, well, let's say, deliberate interference in the sense that uh, governments are being changed or altered or something, but lives are being altered on a, on a vast scale. Uh, I don't feel it's possible to say uh, there's been no interference. But that was a remarkable call. Would you like that person to contact you privately? Well, I, I would like to hear more. Yes, absolutely. And he could, uh, uh, that address could be given. I would like to talk to him about it. Uh, as I say, the, the, the theory has been around for a long, long time. The question is whether or not um, there's some kind of uh, official statement uh, coming from you know, from a, from a, uh, a research scientist. Absolutely. Uh, All right, that, but hold the news. Yes, that that might be big news. But yeah. hold on, we've got a couple of things to do. Let's get those done, and let me give Bud's address. Uh, write simply to if I F Box three zero two three 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 zero two three three, New York, New York one zero zero one one. Did you get that? If Box three zero two three three, New York, New York one zero zero. One one, and we'll be back to Bud Hopkins in just a moment. I want you to know it. Okay. All right. Um, hello there. On the uh, toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, Grants Pass, Oregon. Yes, K O P E. Yes. Go ahead. Hello there. Hello there. I find this absolutely fascinating. Good. Uh, have uh, who am I speaking to? This is Bud Hopkins. Oh. Have you heard of the Sumerian uh, story of how uh, humans came to the Earth? Uh, this is the, you're talking about uh, the ancient astronaut uh, work, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Sitchin's work and so forth. Um, yes, about the two brothers who came down from a um, uh, 12th planet. Their father was the yeah. uh, leader, and his his name was phonetically written as a star. One of the brothers had a staff with a medic with a snake on it. Yeah, this is and material you, you've gotten from Sitchin's books, is that right? Uh, some of them, yes, yeah, and some right. of the ancient writings of uh -huh. the Sumerians. Right. I find this absolutely fascinating, and I find it also uh, uh, plausible. Do you? Uh, since they took the fertilized egg of, the, of a human being here on Earth and uh, re-implanted it in the egg of the female astronaut, mm -hmm. it seems to me so modern in its concept, um, but then they wouldn't have any idea that this, were pos this was possible. Right. All right, well, thank you. Uh, we're way short on time. It's almost yeah, mythology. Essentially, I, I, I just... I hesitate to ever speculate on ancient astronaut issues. There's so much going on. Uh, I've, I've had two, two people call me not too long ago in the past month 
two people call me uh, after they had been returned from an abduction that had, that had ended within about a minute or two from their phone call to me. Mm -hmm. And to worry about mm -hmm. the, the Sumerians at this point in my life is, seems a long way away. I'll leave that to uh, the, uh, the historians. All right, uh, Bud, we're at the bottom of the hour. Almost, it's almost mythology, isn't it? Yes, it really is. All right, uh, Bud Hopkins is my guest. This is Dreamland on a Sunday night. I'm Art Bell. If you'd like to join us, pick up a telephone. Uh, I know it's very busy, but keep trying. You will get through. You're listening to the CBC Network. From the Kingdom of Nye, we continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222 or the wild card line at area code 702-727-1295 727-1295 in the 702 area code now again here's Art Bell and Bud Hopkins good evening everybody uh, an unusual opportunity for you to talk to uh, what I think most of us consider to be our nation's uh, premier UFO investigator, Bud Hopkins. Bud, are you still there? I certainly am. I'd like to make a comment here. The, uh, your uh, point was uh, uh, the man was on a speakerphone a minute ago on the uh, Lawrence Livermore call. Well, when I first heard him, I thought it was a speakerphone, and it may have been, and it also sounded like a portable because I heard it kind of wishing around a little bit. It, uh, oh, I see. What did he say it was? Uh, what do you mean? I forgot what he said, what kind of phone it was. I'm a little suspicious of the call, frankly. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you had a chance to think about it. You, you thought it was perhaps uh, not real at all. Uh, people don't tend to call and say I'm calling from Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, to tell you the truth. It's true. Uh, and um, uh, that's the, if someone is from a very highly uh, secure area uh, making a phone call and uh, having his voice go out and so forth uh, with uh, apparently uh, sensitive material, it's not the sort of thing that you announce on them. It is true. We're talking careers here. Yes, exactly. It's much more likely to say I'm uh, a truck driver who stopped at a truck stop here, but I have this information. Yeah. You know, this is what I have heard or something. At uh, any rate, that's, we can move on, but I just wanted to say for the audience, I may be doing this gentleman an injustice, but uh, I'm not so sure about it. Let's see what you get in the mail. Okay. All right. On the uh, toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Hi, uh, I'd like to... Uh... All right, hold on, sir. Don't do anything yet. Turn off your radio first. That's number one. Okay. All right, now tell us where you're calling from. All right, my name is Eric, and I'm calling from Eugene, Oregon. Eugene, Oregon. All right, mm -hmm. go ahead. And I'm calling to find out, are you familiar with uh, Al Bielik and his time travel experiments? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, how, and, and how likely are they right now? How likely do you think that, um, they are? All right, thank you. Uh, that's a question about the credibility of Al Bielik. Yes. Well, it, that's a hard question for me to answer because I'm not as familiar with it as I should be. I'm aware of it. Uh, I know that uh, he has devoted a lot of time to... Uh, uh, writing about it, lecturing about it, and uh, I would I would prefer to just let this one kind of dangle. I I don't like to step out and pontificate in areas that I'm not uh, as uh, sure as my knowledge and information as I should be. All right, well let, let let's this one go. All right, let's go away from Al Bielik though, and let me ask you about the Philadelphia experiment. Did something in your view, Bud, happen? Uh, my my general sense is that no, it did not happen uh, in the way it was originally reported. Now, uh, of course, uh, 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 Mr. Moore, who wrote the book about the, the Philadelphia experiment with with Berlitz, I believe, together, um, has since felt that uh, the evidence is not uh, really uh, com compelling that uh, such an event took place. That was a long time ago, and obviously every single one of these uh, uh, issues, such as that that amazing event, uh, the disappearance and, and reconstitution of a, of a ship and so forth, uh, if something like that were, were feasible, I think uh, we would have used this in one way or another, militarily or, or commercially, whatnot. Uh, one of the problems, of course, with all of these ideas of uh, which, which verge on conspiracy theory about right. uh, super duper government, uh, uh, um, all military gear or, or material that could have military usage, is that uh, people forget we went through a war in the Gulf 
uh, more recently, and uh, of course we had no real uh, special equipment in that war that uh, gave us the ending we would have liked to have had. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had had some really incredible equipment, I think right now, as I've always said, Saddam Hussein would be sitting in a jail cell right now next to uh, Noriega, and we would still have Bush as president, we would still have the head of the CIA as the head of CIA, the Joint Chiefs of Staff would still be in place, and so on. Uh, none of that happened. All right. Well, that's a, that's a really good point. What about the other major events in uh, fairly distant history? The one in New Mexico that Representative Schiff is now going to cause the GAO to apparently investigate. Well, that's a very different issue because uh, that uh, has to do with alien technology, not military technology, uh, such as the Philadelphia experiment would, it would indicate. Uh, this is an alien event. I have absolute... Uh, now, I, after after many years of studying the the, uh, the evidence and and noticing uh, more evidence as it's accumulated, uh, some very good research. Don Schmidt's been doing wonderful research on that. So is uh, Stan Friedman, a number of people. Uh, I think that uh, uh, I definitely feel that something crashed, a UFO crashed, or two perhaps. Uh, there was the uh, speculation that two collided. Bodies were recovered, material was recovered, and I have no doubt about that at this point. All right. Uh, very good. And on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Hi, Art. This is Brandy in Bakersfield. Brandy in Bakersfield. Hi, Brandy. Hi. I was disappointed because baseball preempted this show, so I've only been listening since 8.30. Oh, well, we're sorry about that. Well, I mean, it's not your fault. The people at KZR. aren't. But anyway, I wanted to say it's a pleasure to speak with you, Bud. Uh... I just wanted to ask you, since you've researched this for many years, do you think that demonology plays any type of role <laughs> in these abductions? And also, is there any way that uh, Whitley Strieber could also come on the show? Uh, uh, all right. All right. Take well, it off the air. Thanks, Art. All right. Thank you. And, of course, there is. I'll answer the second question. Demonology, I'm sure you get that one a lot, bud. Yeah. Well, uh, again, as I've tried to explain, we have a basic need to kind of shove the whole uh, – uh, alien phenomenon, abduction uh, phenomenon, UFO phenomenon, into the idea of, of gods or devils. And uh, I do not connect this with uh, uh, any kind of theological uh, beings, demons, just as I don't connect it with theological beings, angels. Uh, I think that this is a very distinct phenomenon. Now, I'm not going to say that I don't believe that uh, there are necessarily gods and devils in the real world. I don't want to get into a theological hassle here. We'll get a million calls from people. Uh, consigning me to hell from my opinion, so I will <laughs> stay right. away from that. But I definitely feel that uh, this is its own business. It is not connected with demons. Uh, there are uh, very, very possible uh, uh, mistaking identity situations where people feel uh, the child is uh, possessed of a devil or whatnot who is having abduction experiences, and it might be kind of hard for some people to tell. Uh, I had a case where a woman uh, here in New York her parents were um, uh, rather uh, not very well educated, um, uh, first generation uh, Italian family, and uh, they used to bring in the priest every now and then with holy water to bless the apartment because these strange little men with big black eyes were coming through the walls. Oh boy. And what else to do? They must be demons. So there is some confusion here, but uh, I think it is a separate phenomenon. Well, let me turn the question around. Is that one of the main reasons that we're not told about all this because of the reaction in religion religious uh, circles well i mean that is certainly possible uh that uh, it, it it creates a lot of problems for uh religious people but it is not necessarily an insoluble problem we have to remember because and i should mention that i have worked with a number of born again christians uh who are also abductees and uh there was a problem for them of reconciling what was happening to them to uh, their abduction experiences. Sure. And as I pointed out, uh, you know, many years ago, uh, it was believed back in the time of Galileo that if, it, if the idea was accepted that we were not the center of the universe, that we were simply in a planet going around the sun amongst many other suns, uh, then that would mean the end of religion. And because it was against the Bible, it was this, that, and the other thing. And that was what the theologians of the time believed. And, of course, now virtually everybody understands that we are just a planet going in a particular solar system. But that has not damaged religion. Religion managed to, theologians managed to make sense of this and harmonize this new information with the Bible. 
and um, Christianity has not uh, suffered as a result. And I think the same thing can happen with this. All right, good. Well, I want to get off course here. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Where are you calling from? Uh, Spokane, Washington. Spokane, Washington. All right. Uh, Mr. Hopkins. Yes, sir. Yes. How many of these uh, abduction cases were preceded by a red light, a ball of red light coming through the wall first, like a probe? Well, many, many people who have had abduction experiences uh, at one point or another have noticed unusual lights or balls of light in the room with them, coming through the wall, coming down the hall, whatnot. Often people describe these lights as acting as if they're intelligent, as if they're looking at you. That's I'm, right. I'm curious about, since you raised the question, that you must have had an experience along these lines. Yes, sir. More, much like the young, the, the one the young lady related about well, 15 minutes ago where she was paralyzed. Yeah, well, that's a classic account. Yeah. What was your experience, sir? Well, I woke up, I called before and talked to uh, Linda Howe about this and also uh -huh. Mr. Bell. Uh -huh. But um, I woke up to a droning, whirring noise in the room, just whirring, you know, a, a mechanical droning. Uh -huh. That woke me up. And I looked up and he had a gigantic crucifix on the wall. And the ball of light came out the crucifix and it just pulsated there about the size of a baseball. Uh -huh. And then it tracked the ceiling, went over the ceiling, went down her side of the room, and I tried to wake her up. And my girlfriend's really like sleep. I said, wake yeah. up, please wake up, look at this. And she wouldn't wake up. Yeah. And when it got on her back, it pulsated for 30 minutes on her back and she was sleeping on her stomach. Mm. It then proceeded off her back onto my chest. Now, once it got on my chest, I couldn't scream out no more. Yeah. I couldn't move. I started sweating because I was fighting it. I was trying to sit up in I bed, but I could not move. All my eyeballs could do was go round and round. Yeah. Next day, I, I, I passed out or went to sleep. Yeah. I woke up about an hour and a half later, and the ball of light was leaving my chest, going off my body to the floor, back on the crucifix where it just pulsated for about oh, a minute. Uh -huh. And it just went into the crucifix and out the wall. And right. it took me about oh, a half an hour to recover before I could get up. Right. Now, but I was going to ask you, have you ever had anybody, uh, you know, do a study? Well, my last name is Simon. Uh -huh. And um, have you ever had anybody do a study to see how many people were, with religious last names, you know, are being tracked? And ha like uh, I, I, I honestly, right, Mr. Simon, I, I don't think there's any reason to think that uh, uh, any particular person is being singled out for this because of uh, their religious beliefs, their last name, or anything of that sort. I mean, this is a worldwide phenomenon. We're getting this in areas where there are no Christians to speak of, for instance. These things are occurring in, in, uh, uh, in China, in the Orient, uh, in um, uh, the backwaters of Africa, South America, and so forth, with, with people with uh, very, very definitely non-Christian uh, beliefs. This is not something that is limited uh, to people with, uh, uh, with a particular religious background. Uh, I think that's a coincidence in your case, sir, but uh, it's, it's, you're, what you described, though, certainly seems like something that should be looked into. So, uh, again, if you'd like to write, I can uh, put you in touch with somebody uh, perhaps near you. Boy, the M.O. is beginning to sound familiar now, isn't it? Uh, Absolutely. Well, uh, Art, it, uh, let me tell you that when we did the Roper survey, one of the questions we asked was, have you ever, uh, and, and these were not beliefs, these were, uh, have you had these experiences? One of the questions they asked was, have you ever... Um, seen unusual lights or balls of light in a room with you, which neither you nor anyone else could explain. And actually, 8% of the American people said yes to that, which is extraordinary. To that me. is extraordinary. So yeah. even if you say uh, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, four times too many, say, uh, but to cut it down to mistakes or, you know, uh, people misread things, you're still dealing with a very high percentage. And even if it's, as we uh, found with the Roper survey, using uh, five basic uh, indicator questions, one of which dealt with the paralysis, just as both of these uh, people have explained, have described it very eloquently. Uh, a period of missing time where they have no idea where they were, how it happened, or why it happened, and so on. With these uh, five questions, we came out with 2% of the American people said yes to four out of five of these questions, which would indicate if they are abductees, and it's certainly likely, uh, we're dealing with, uh, say, perhaps 5 million Americans who, are at the, who have been through this. That's a lot of occurrences, but hold, hold on just a moment. We'll come right back to you. Fire back to the telephones, and on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Where are you calling from? San Jose, California. San Jose, good. Hi, uh, Art. Hello, Bud. This is Tim from San Jose. Well, Tim, how are you? I'm fine. How have you been? So very well. Uh, I just wanted to share something with you. Um, Yesterday morning, uh, my daughter and her mom had an experience. They had a visitation. Uh -huh. uh, her mom woke up with an extremely sore throat, nauseous, nose, uh, nasals were stinging, 
uh, disoriented. <clears throat> she had a blue fluid coming from her nose, one nostril. Oh, boy. Uh, she threw up, and she called me. <clears throat> uh, I was curious if you'd heard of any sort of blue fluid with other cases like that. Well, uh, that's coming from her nostril. Was there any way of saving any fluid? Uh, she wasn't thinking of that at the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of different uh, uh, strange fluids uh, from various bod bodily orifices which uh, stain have created stains, and we have uh, uh, saved the material. Uh, it's very hard to analyze some of this stuff if you don't have much of it, and if it's very embedded in fabric. It's quite expensive to do it. But things like that have been reported more often, actually, kind of a brown fluid. Yeah. Uh, how, how about your daughter? Uh, she seemed to be okay. We took her to an uh, emergency pediatrician just to make sure. Uh, I tried to share this this phenomenon with him. Uh, I showed him the pamphlet that you and the Bigelow Foundation right. wrote, uh, Unusual Personal, personal uh, Experiences, I think mm -hmm. it is. Uh, he wasn't receptive at all. He laughed about it, shrugged it off, and didn't even want to take the pamphlet. Well, did, did she report anything specifically uh, happening, uh, her recollections, the daughter? Uh, no, she had no recollection of the event. Uh, but was there anything physical? Uh, not not to her, but to her mother, yeah. More to her mother than to her, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let's hope she wasn't taken. No. Uh, no. But, uh, well, thanks very much, Tim. I'm... You know, sorry this happened. Uh, this, these have been extremely difficult uh, situations to handle for a family, but uh, I think you're doing a fine job. Would you recommend somebody like that, Bud, uh, investigate further, contact somebody, find out if, in fact, the child or the mother or both were taken? Uh, well, I certainly would. The, the mother has, has worked uh, with uh, a psychologist in the area who's very, very helpful done a very good job and uh, uh, since I know Tim uh, there is uh, there are various people in the area including another pediatrician and others who who could be helpful we do have quite a uh, uh, a group this is generally in the San Francisco uh, area we have some very good people out there uh, so uh, he uh, Tim has got some uh, some support which is very helpful to him and uh, but is there any uh, geographic area that is visited uh, more frequently apparently or is it just simply uh, completely random it's very very hard to tell because uh, obviously what you hear about is only what <laughs> the press or or letter writers or whatever uh, are willing to um, to present and of course if, if it's a very conservative community where this is frowned upon uh, you're not going to get uh, uh, people talking about it as openly. For instance, in, in New York City, uh, I have um, people reporting these experiences who are, let's say, uh, white middle class uh, people, etc. I have quite a few African American background people and Hispanics, but very few Orientals. In addition to that, I think this isn't happening to Oriental people, but I think that uh, in, in such numbers, I think that there's a, a reticence perhaps as a societal norm uh, in that particular group to talk about this sort of thing. Some sort of cultural bias. Exactly. So if you go to, for instance, the Bible Belt uh, a town in the south, there might be a lot going on, but it might be attributed to uh, uh, to demons, or it might be something that people feel hesitant to talk about. It. And so you simply would think, well, we have a big blank in this area. We're not getting any reports. And yet, that might not be the case. No, that's a good point. Uh, on, on the wild card line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Yes, good evening, Art. Fascinating show this evening because I'm curious, going back to when you're talking about a lot of this happens to children when they're younger, have yeah. you ever dis discovered that this was uh, either a cover-up for child abuse or that child abusers have used this, used this uh, uh, guise or, uh, for uh, UFO abduct uh, uh, abductions? All right, or, or but the other way around. Well, that's see, that's a very interesting point, and I'm glad you brought that up because this has been... Um, uh, the uh, let's say the explanation du jour of uh, many uh, groups of, of uh, uh, skeptics on the subject that uh, the essential point is people uh, they believe are being sexually abused and are somehow uh, blanking out that memory and substituting for it a fantasy where they bring in aliens which uh, is, is an issue they can handle better than the fact that it was old Uncle Sid or Aunt Martha or whatever whoever who did the ab abusing uh, and, of course, if that were the case, we would expect to find amongst abductees a very low level of people reporting sexual abuse. And, in fact, uh, from the work that was done by Dr. Kenneth Ring and other people uh, with abductees, we get just as high a percentage of abductees reporting sexual abuse 
by normal humans in the, the bad old way uh, as we get with people who have not had abductions. So there's no sense that then these people are, um, uh, as a group, are substituting abduction experiences What's, uh, since they're remembering the child abuse too. What's mm -hmm. more, uh, and I'll give you a very quick and very sad story, uh, I have a number of cases like this. Uh, in this case, told me by the mother, uh, her little boy, and this is rather graphic, and I'm sorry about this, but her little boy at the age of, uh, uh, I think he was five or four, uh, she was divorced. Uh, he was having, uh, the husband had visiting rights, and the little boy would stay with him on the weekends. And uh, the mother said, who was a registered nurse, she found her little boy uh, in his bedroom uh, with a screwdriver, which he was trying to insert in his rectum. Oh, my God. And uh, he told her, when she was, of course, horrified, he said, that's what the man does. Uh, he has a, he uses a tool or something like this. Well, at any rate, she naturally assumed naturally. Uh, sexual abuse on the part of her husband, uh, who vehemently denied it, but she went to court and got a court order barring her husband uh, permanently any visiting rights whatsoever with the child. And the husband moved away, and of course, within a couple of months, the child was again talking, and he had he had some some damage to the uh, tissues, rectal tissues. Uh, he said the men had come in again, and they had big black eyes, and they were uh, he was frightened, and they had used some instrument there, and uh, plus a whole other range of things he was describing. I wonder how many times Uncle Sid is in jail because of an abduction. Well, I can assure you that it it must have happened because. I have many cases where, uh, a number of cases, one in which a woman had thought that she had been raped by her father at the age of 12, and uh, that she had harbored these feelings all her life, never accused him, he never really changed his behavior, but the description of the a rape scene, which I can't even go into, it's, it's, it's very, very odd, uh, it, there's nothing about it that sounds like a rape, but her father was present, and uh, as we explored the experience, it seems that it was a, an abduction of the two of them. And uh, at one point, uh, he was in the ship without clothes, as she was in the ship without clothes. Mm, boy. And uh, things were being done to the two of them. So it was interpreted uh, as a rape. Uh, but I, I, I can assure you that just even the questioning from uh, uh, what she remembered consciously uh, had nothing about it that suggested violence. Uh, she remembered that she was lying down, that she was unable to move, that uh, she had no clothes on whatsoever. Uh, there was no sense of any violence or struggle. Uh, she felt that something was inserted into her body. Uh, there was no sense of, of, a, of another figure, of another body in relation to hers, etc. That her father was standing off to one side, unmoving. Nevertheless, and, uh, but it, it isn't really a defense you'd use anyway, is it? It wasn't me. It was the grave. Uh, no, that, it wouldn't hold any water. And I, and I really do feel... Now, see, there may be some cases. I, I would not ever say that there aren't any cases where... Uh, what the gentleman suggested might not have happened, where somebody could have invented some sort of story. Uh, Lord knows uh, the the mind is very fertile when it comes to trying uh, to cover up uh, trauma and rationalize. It is. It reaches out and tries to explain. But we're at the top of the hour, so relax for about five minutes. We'll do one more hour. Okay. Bud Hopkins is my guest. Uh, fascinating night. We'll be back with more in about five. A lot of the abduction accounts talk about implants and mm -hmm. it's like in the nose right. nasal area uh, my question is why don't we see um, these devices and it would seem to me that if someone felt they had an implant in their nasal area that they'd go and get um, some type of scan like an MRI or a PET scan right um, it seemed like it'd be really easy to, to detect something like that with the um, technology that we have today. All right, well, that is a good question. Very good question. And have we detected any, bud? Yeah. Now, uh, this is a complicated subject I'm getting much more interested in as time goes on. Uh, there have been, uh, I, I know it now personally of two cases where uh, an X-ray uh, indicated uh, the presence of a, of a strange object. And uh, before the x-ray, uh, before anybody could do anything about the situation, in one case the x-ray was not in the possession of the person with the implant until a week after it was taken, uh, that person was re-abducted, uh, found herself bleeding from the nostril when she woke up in the morning, and evidently our little friends in the sky had come back and removed it. 
as if uh, when the x-ray was uh, taken, some alarm bell goes off, so to speak, and they come and take it. Uh, the second case happened to be a woman in um, uh, whose, whose child, it was uh, actually the child involved, was about a five-year-old girl uh, who, who had been having abduction experiences, and uh, uh, she had an accident completely unconnected with UFO. She fell off her bicycle or some such thing, and they thought she had fractured her skull, and she was taken to the hospital, whereupon the doctors, this again in Italy, uh, discovered uh, a strange object. Uh, by the time she was taken back to uh, uh, the army base where her father was stationed in Germany, and she was re-x-rayed, again, the object was no longer there. Wow. Now, I have those x-rays in my possession, and they, beyond any doubt, show uh, foreign objects of metallic origin. These are uh, have been looked at by Dr. Paul Cooper, who's a neurosurgeon, uh, who uh, is a friend of mine who looks at such things for me. I have recently received a case from, uh, uh, of, of again, a woman, an abductee, who uh, in another accident thought she'd fractured the skull, and the uh, radiological report uh, describes uh, a metallic object in the uh, parasagittal area of the brain. Uh, I know through the investigator Barbara Bartolik, who's done some very fine work on this, I have other... Uh, images of, uh, actually it's a videotape of, of the x-ray and MRI showing uh, a foreign object in the medulla and another one uh, which shows an odd object uh, with a very clear-cut symmetrical shape uh, in the hip bone. And the man had been abducted, uh, had terrible pain in his hip and even the scar right opposite where this uh, object seemed to be. I don't know what, uh, doc, what Barbara Bartolik is doing with those cases, but the point is the ones that are in the head are in places where it would be extremely dangerous to try to retrieve them. There have been some objects that have been recovered uh, from the nostril and two from the underside of different men's penises, of all things. Uh, these objects are not radio-opaque, do not have uh, any kind of heavy metallic uh, makeup. Uh, there are a lot of uh, more organic elements, carbon, uh, silicon, and uh, so forth. I, I believe, I don't know on what program, but I saw somebody actually holding one, Bud, which appeared yeah. to be triangular in shape and kind of crystalline. Yeah, that's the glass-like uh, object. Uh, we don't know much about, I mean, I, I've held that in my hand, too. Oh, you have? Actually, I've held several of these things. Uh, however, uh, this is the big problem. Uh, the objects that have been recovered so far, unlike these metallic objects we have not recovered, um, are an, made of enough familiar uh, elements, especially, uh, as I said, silicon, carbon, and so forth, that uh, uh, no scientist is going to say there's no way that this object couldn't have originated on Earth. Uh, sure. It would be a bit of a problem to imagine how an object lodges on the underside of the, uh, under the skin on the underside of a man's penis. But nevertheless, uh, it's possible to imagine an alien implant which uh, is made of fairly neutral materials, but which is charged in such a way that it does what they need it to do. Uh, we really have no way of knowing what these objects do, why they're there. Uh, and I always use uh, the example to show how complicated it would be to, to guess uh, alien motivations. All right, well, what about this, Bud? Uh, in the case of the ones you talked about where they have it in a portion of the brain, yeah. is anybody talking to these people about signing a release for when they die? That's what I would like to do. <laughs> Uh, that's what we have to do. Uh, the idea of, of autopsies, uh, uh, that's something we have to, uh, to go into. Now it's very possible that these objects somehow uh, can be removed by the aliens without leaving scars or marks. Uh, obviously their technology, if they can move a person through sure. a closed surface, sure. presumably they can move uh, a metallic implant through the skull without leaving a hole. How that happens, we have no way of knowing. It sounds totally off the wall, and yet uh, the evidence would suggest that's the case. Uh, at the same time, that sometimes when these things are put in the nostril uh, or the ear, there is bleeding. Uh, so, but, but are we kind of like the caveman tinkering with the Sony? <laughs> we might be. <laughs> uh, but I use the example that if you imagine a very primitive Stone Age tribe in the in the jungles of New Guinea or something like that, coming across the body of a dead um, anthropologist and finding uh, a pacemaker in that man's body, they would not have the slightest idea as to the function of that object. In e that exactly body. so. All right. Well, let's keep moving. A lot of phone calls. And on the uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Where are you calling from, please? Reno, Nevada. Reno, Nevada. Yes, sir. 
Go Hello, ahead. Or am I on the air? Yeah, you're on the air. Go uh, ahead. But um, uh, uh, this kind of goes with the last caller. Uh huh. Um, I was wondering if there are any other symptoms that identify abduction victims. And can I just kind of run down a list? Absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. Number one, unexplained fast healing injuries. Mm -hmm. Number two, constant bloody noses. Number three, blackouts or what I would call unexplained timeouts. Yeah, well, that's more to the point, yeah. Okay, well, let's, I, I got a whole list here, though, and there's only about three more. Mm -hmm. High intelligence in the victims or unsubstantiated strength. Substance abuse and people that may have been past abduction victims. Uh, All right, caller, thank well, you. It, is, is there any... Uh... The list is, uh, I mean, a lot of the things you said are very important. Now, the issue of uh, unsubstantiated intelligence, uh, we have to also know I've got uh, what case of a, of a man who was abducted who was rather severely retarded. Uh, I also have uh, cases, uh, it's one of the most bizarre things I've ever heard of, uh, two people who were comatose in a hospital who had been... Uh, in a comatose state for a long time, evidently, uh, after an, uh, a UFO visit to the hospital, uh, uh, showed uh, uh, puncture marks in the abdomen of the woman and an incision on the underside of the penis of the man. And these are people who hadn't been conscious for months. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it, it's hard to know. Now, also, the substance abuse issue does come up because these these are very uh, psychologically undermining experiences. One is thrown into self-doubt from the beginning. Am I crazy? What's going on here? This can't be real, et cetera, et cetera. And this can lead to that sort of problem. So uh, much of what you said is, is, is accurate. So is there any... Thank you for bringing this up. Right. Is there any particular profile of abductees? Uh, are, are they brighter? Are they lower on the scale of intelligence? It's, uh, it's totally across the board. And, and the demographics, when we did the Roper survey, of people who had answered yes to four out of five of our indicator questions, we thought were possible abductees, uh, just fell across all... Uh, uh, ethnic, uh, racial, uh, gender, uh, socioeconomic, educational levels, and so forth. There was no consistency. All right. On the uh, toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Where are you calling from? Yes, I'm calling from Seattle, Washington. Seattle, yes. Uh, Bud? Mm hmm Yes, hi, Bud. Uh, listen, I've been trying to discuss this situation for a long time, and I've, I tried calling that number out in Arizona, and they would never return uh, my call. Here's what happened. Uh, the night that all of the lights went out, on the east coast i think it was like 65 or 66 mm -hmm. well that afternoon while i was with my parents uh my mother we were driving in west covina california and i would say uh i saw flying saucer this thing was about i'd say it was between seven and eight thousand feet um i was amazed at the time because i was a young fellow about 15. Mm -hmm. i saw three or four jet planes uh mm -hmm. follow following it Mm -hmm. And I noticed that they fired what I thought was a missile, and the thing exploded. And it was headed eastbound. This would have been toward the Pomona area. Mm -hmm. And that night, as I say, all of the lights went out on the east coast. Mm -hmm. The lights also went out in the San Gabriel Valley mm -hmm. um, of California around 8.30 that night. Well, now, you said you reported this to a number in Arizona. I'm not sure what number. There are lots of numbers that come and go here. Yes. Uh, what I would appreciate, if you could write to us at the address that, that we've given, and we'd be, have somebody get in touch with you, uh, get some more information. Yes, I'd uh, be happy to. And I thank you very much. All right. Thank okay. you, caller. Bye-bye. Uh, hmm. uh, but what about effects uh, of UFOs, electromagnetic effects on radios, television, automobiles, uh, any sense to any of that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, it goes with the territory. We, we, again, don't know whether this is deliberate, whether they can sort of zap someone's car, or whether uh, it's a, a side effect of, of uh, uh, whatever propulsion system they're using, whatever that is. But uh, just to tell you a, a really fascinating recent uh, situation, Dr. David Jacobs uh, was working with a woman who uh, was quite Petrified, she thought something was going to happen to her that night. She called him. Her husband was away. The two children were asleep. Um, anyway, to make a long story short, he uh, got her to set up a video camera in the bedroom, which she had used on other occasions. Uh -huh. Trained on the bed, 
uh, and uh, she went to sleep. Uh, there was enough light, and it was set at half speed, so it would run for eight hours. Right. Uh, she went to sleep with the children in the bed. When she woke up in the morning, <clears throat> there was uh, uh, she'd been asleep about eight hours, and there was still 25% of the tape unexposed. And uh, it was still running. When she turned the tape on, it uh, it showed the image of her waking up, which she did not remember, getting out of bed and carrying each of the children away from the bedroom. So the bed was empty. Oh my! And the very next Ugh. shot, she was all she was back in bed with the two children, but it did not show her walking from the camera back to the bed. That gives me the heebie-jeebies. Now that means that that camera had stopped. Whether this was Somehow. whether it was shut off at, at the source or whether the power was uh, was interrupted, uh, and it was it was off for the time that the abduction evidently took place. And so when she was placed back in bed, this is all speculation. But when she was placed back in bed with the children, and the UFO left and the power resumed, the camera just started going again. But here you have an impossibility. There was no way that the film could have stopped and started this way without somebody doing it or some interruption of the power supply. All right, Otherwise, you would have filmed yourself getting in bed. All right, I've got one other question in, in this area, and I'll get to it as soon as we come back. Take a okay. brief break. Uh, Bud Hopkins is my guest, and we'll be right back. The oh, hard one to test is right. All right, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Hello. I'm pleased to finally get through. Where are you, sir? I'm calling from the Reno area. Reno, okay. K-O-H, no doubt. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but uh, I have a little description of an incident I had while flying in an airplane myself uh, mm -hmm. uh, as pilot. I'm a, a private pilot. Mm -hmm. I was uh, eastbound uh, out of uh, Sacramento, California, heading towards uh, uh, Placerville. Uh, just a little south of Mather Air Force Base, mm -hmm. which was an active base. It's about 10 years ago. I don't remember the exact date. Mm -hmm. I remember it as springtime. Mm -hmm. And uh, off in the distance, uh, about my 11 o'clock uh, uh, range uh, or uh, in field of view, I saw a very bright light. Mm -hmm. My first interpretation was it was probably a B-52 out there with his landing light on mm -hmm. uh, on approach to Mather. Uh, so I just studied it, watched it, and kept a note of it because he was out there where in the direction I was flying. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this light proceeded north at an extremely high rate of speed. Mm -hmm. I mean extremely. It went almost out of sight within, say, two seconds. That's <laughs> fast. And um, the funny part about it, if that was an aircraft of any type, a vehicle that uh, you know navigates through the air, mm -hmm and had a headlight on the front of it, or a landing light on the front of it, if he turned away from me, the light would disappear. Exactly, yeah. And this light did not. It grew dim mm -hmm. as, it, as it proceeded into the distance. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of logged that myself in my own mind to say, well, I wonder if I'm going to see something like that ever again, which I never did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was, I have heard of similar reports, but I, uh, that's the only one I ever had. Well, that's a good one, and, uh, I'd appreciate it if you wrote in, uh, so we could get some of the data down, and there are people who collect these reports. Uh, incidentally, I don't want to, uh, uh, <laughs> do alarm you, but, uh, I have dealt with, uh, three different pilots, private pilots, uh, who had UFO sightings, and who had, while they were flying, and, uh, actually two of them were daytime, one at night, and, um, they had missing time experiences hmm. in the air. They uh -huh. were in the air longer than they had fuel for. Uh, and so happily, that's not happened to me. Yet. All right. <laughs> I know. That's why I said I didn't want to yeah. lie you. You yeah. just got to look at one. Was, yeah. The one you saw was just going by. But, I mean, it, yeah. literally, this seems to have happened. Within, uh, within the, uh, the time period of that experience or sometime later? No, at, while they were in the air. All right, and I, I want to interject here, if I might, to uh, call our uh, question. You remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that magic moment where the uh, controller said, do you want to report a UFO? Yes. Did you? I didn't see that movie. Did you? But, did but you? you reminded me. I asked approach control if they saw something on the radar that proceeded north at a high rate of speed. Mm -hmm. And they reported negative. Mm -hmm. And I have another question for you, Bud. Sure, uh, very quickly. Uh, do you recall back in the 50s and into the 60s, there was, uh, the Air Force had a, an operation called Operation Blue Book. It was mm -hmm. supposedly the big government uh, 
uh, collection of data on UFOs. Yeah. It was uh, called Project Blue, and it was very little, actually. It was billed as big, but it was little. But yeah. go ahead. Well, was that ever declassified? Have you ever had access to the Oh, yeah, the material was, was declassified, but uh, what's happened is that uh, some other uh, reports that we have uh, found out about or got, uh, were de declassified separately. Material was released about some very good sightings. We found out they were not in Project Blue Book. Really? Uh, and so the suggestion was that uh, that the really best cases were not, not put mm. there. So I have, it's I have very a ambiguous story. It's complicated. Yes, I have a little anecdotal information on that. Very quickly. Uh, we'll okay, call it. I have a friend who was in Germany in the Air Force uh, subsequent to that, mm -hmm. who was uh, highly classified. I mean, he was working in highly classified projects. Mm -hmm. Ran across an officer who was in that Operation Blue Book. Mm -hmm. Asked, say, hey, what about this? You now we're down here in the vault. Tell me about it. Mm -hmm. He says, I do not want to discuss it, and that is the end of that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that has to be the end of that, too. Uh, thank you very much, Paula. Thank you. And, uh, Bud, we're going to have to take a break here at the bottom of the hour. Uh, do you have any quick comments on what he said? No. I'll be, we'll be we, when we come back. All right. Very good. Uh, we'll do that indeed at that time. You're listening to the CBC Radio Network. want to remind everybody, for copies of this program, you can call at any time, 24 hours a day, area code 503 664 Seven nine six six five zero three six six four seven nine six six. So I had to make it. Where are you? I'm in Gig Harbor. Gig Harbor, Washington. All right. Yeah. Uh, KBI. Yes. Go right ahead. Um, a, a very weird time loss. Um, and I think the whole town experienced the same thing, Art. The whole town? Well, uh, tell us about it. Okay. I was uh, leaving, I, I live on the Olympic Peninsula, Geek Harbor. I was going to my summer home up by Canada at Twin Lakes in Colville. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a town called Euphrata, which is across the Columbia River, I hit a stoplight and I was stopped there. I was the first car in line. Mm -hmm. There were no cars behind me. Mm -hmm. um, a very odd thing, it was about 110 degrees out, the middle of the summer, very hot area. Mm -hmm. Someone in a full jumpsuit, kind of a bright orange jumpsuit, was crossing the road. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, the whole thing was very unusual. Mm -hmm. um, basically, I had what I felt was a uh, time lapse, a blank out. Mm -hmm. um, when I came back to... There were about 30 cars behind me. No one was honking any horns. Everyone seemed to witness the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the person was gone. The light was green. No one was upset. Everyone seemed very content. Mm -hmm. And I found it highly unusual. Well, absolutely. Were the cars on the opposite side coming towards you stopped, too? There were no cars on the other side at all. But 30 on your side, which is... Yeah, it was like a city block backed up behind me. But and no nothing, and nothing no coming towards you. Thing. Pardon? And nothing coming towards you. That's very odd. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Now, tell me about the, the man thing. in the orange jumpsuit. Uh, how did he move, and did he look normal, and so forth? What did you... he, he was walking uh, uh, apparently like a normal human being. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I'm telling you, I've never seen anything like this. I have no explanation for what happened. Well, I would like to hear from you about that, sir. If you could uh, write to me at the address uh, that uh, I'm sure Art will give again, uh, I would like to follow up on this because we have cases like this which involve uh, quite a few cars. Now, these experiences, uh, many people in a cliche way think that this is just something that happens to one person at a time, but uh, I have cases which involve uh, uh, conceivably hundreds of people at once. Uh, and, and certainly in abduction cases that, where I've investigated them where the same experience happened to everybody, uh -huh. uh, seven people at once and so forth. But uh, your situation, I think, should be looked into. Do you have any idea of how much time elapsed? Uh, see, that's, that's the whole thing is uh, I, I'm really not certain because it, it, well, things like this happen out of the blue. Yeah. Did you, did you ever dream about this afterwards? Uh, no, I really didn't. I, I told my wife about it. I told people about it, and yeah. everybody kind of said, well, you know, uh, you probably just 
kind of well, heat exhaustion or something like that. But well, you send me a letter control. and uh, with your uh, name address, and maybe I can give you a phone call back because it, it's, it's something I'd like to follow up. All right, good. Uh, Thank uh, you please, very much. Please do that, caller. And, Bud, there are a lot of plane crashes, not a lot, but uh, a significant number, and, of course, car crashes. And I guess I want to ask, could some of them be the result of some sort of time loss and improper recovery? Well, things like that could happen. Uh, you know, I obviously the the after effects of these experiences are are uh, unfortunate enough, just in psychologically that uh, I hate to uh, suggest even more possible problems to people. Yeah. Uh, but things have happened. I did uh, look into an automobile accident once that seems to actually a couple of them that seem to have had uh, uh, causes related to this, where it would it would seem nothing was done deliberately, but. Uh, in one case, it seems the car was stopped and the people were switched off or taken, and then the car was started up before the people were fully conscious and an accident occurred. Oh, boy. All right. Uh, on the first-time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Good evening. Turn off your radio, please. You bet. Right now. All right, and tell us where you're calling from. Good evening. Hello. Yes, hello. Uh, tell us where you're calling from, sir. Uh, Sacramento, but I, they won't uh, publish or they won't broadcast... Your stations. I got 780 in San Francisco. It's not very clear. All right. Two questions. A question to Bud Hopkins. I wrote him a letter a couple of years ago about a crash of a UFO in uh, Jackson's under the Naval Air Station, 1964. Mm -hmm. And he had so many letters coming in that he sent me a foreign letter back. And I tried to give him as many details as I could. Mm -hmm. They found three bodies in this about, uh, oh, this craft was about 20. 25 feet diameter. The people were about 36 inches high. That's about it. Mm -hmm. And were you involved in this personally, or is it? No, all? I was stopped on the highway. It was they had all kinds of police, fire, everybody, yeah. the Navy, and the, I went to the naval base next day. I was interviewing the people there. And, yeah. uh, now, I, I, are you certain you wrote to me rather than to some other organization? Yeah, but I wrote to you. You did? Okay. Well, I wrote to Stan Friedman, too. Yeah, but I'll have to look into it uh, in in my files. I just want uh, you would you ever send me a postcard with your name and address and explain it so I can then look up your letter? Yeah. Okay. All right, do that, caller. Send him a Thank you very much, and I'm sorry. I hope that I, you know, didn't just drop this one. Okay. Thank uh, you very is, much, sir. Is it hard to handle the amount of mail that you get, bud? Oh, it's extraordinary. And, uh... Uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm still getting, I figure, even though the books have been out for quite a while, and truth is missing time, I, I'm still getting probably two new cases, potential cases a day. Oh, brother. And, uh, you know, some of these people are calling in uh, in tears and terrified, and um, it's, um, I have some people working with me and some volunteers, and I've gotten some funding and so forth, but uh, our organization, that's one of the things that with Intruders Foundation, we have a newsletter. And we're just about to do another one. Uh, we're way behind on getting it out. It's um, 22 pages. Uh, yeah, I believe that's it. Um, and we're going to be dealing with um, uh, children's experiences and uh, how to handle the problem with your little child is reporting these experiences. But at any rate, we, uh, if people subscribe, it's $25 a year and join if, and that uh, entitles you to four of the newsletters plus special reports from time to time and uh, the, the knowledge that you're helping to support uh, uh, a referral service, which is national. All right, uh, and I, I presume they could contact, get that through the same address. Is that correct? Yes, exactly, that same address. All if right. they ask for information, we will send them material. All right, and that address is if I F uh, box three zero two three three, New York, New York, zip code one zero zero one one. That's if box three zero two three three. New York, New York, 10011. Do I have it correct? That's correct, yes. All right, good. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Yes, this is Brian from Seattle. Yes, Brian. And this is going to sound crazy, but, of course, everything uh, you're talking about to, you know, someone who's not really, uh, oh, well. Anyway, um, I Thanks, been... Brian. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been listening for about ten minutes, so uh, I don't know what you've been talking about, but about the uh, abductions and the implants. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now... It, and, of course, we enter into these discussions. You have levels of credibility and proof that are really work along uh, a mathematical scale. Like, the more you can really prove, the less you really find out. So, I, I would, as, as a preliminary statement, you might want to listen more to the, the uncredible or the, you know, people you might 
be able to really discredit their information because they smoke and they drink and that kind of thing. Anyway, I, I, um, I have this thing in my nose. And uh, it's like, I always wondered what it was, and I've got these things in my ears, too. Mm -hmm. But they're really small, and they seem organic, and uh, I didn't know what it was, maybe like some kind of a calcium deposit or something. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. And, you know, it's, it's, it, I, it's for me, it's not a scary thing, because that's kind of me, in a way. Well, have you had them, I mean, how, how do you know they're there? Well, I can feel them. Yeah. I, I mean, just very slightly, but I, can, I know they're there. Uh -huh. I mean, see, here's the thing. You're talking about credibility. I mean, like, yeah. you're saying I'm going to have them checked out and all this kind of stuff. And just the very thing you were saying about, well, well, gee, now that the x-ray showed it up, then uh, they came and took it back. Caller, do you have any reason to believe they're not calcium deposits? Well, no. However... <laughs> well, my, my feeling is if, if, if you're really concerned about it, uh, curious about it, uh, I really have it looked at by an ENT man. That's what you really need to do. What? And he can tell you whether it's uh, strange or, or uh, whether it's an explanation. And, uh, well, in other words, caller, go to the doctor. No, you no, could, uh, yeah, no, you can no, have no, a guy no. help you out a lot with this, and you could help us. Too, so, uh, oh, oh, I get it. Okay, all right. Well, nice talking to you. You have a happy Easter. Okay, yeah, okay right, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Interesting. Um, he, he calls you as though you are going to declare they are suddenly alien objects, and I guess people have to go out and find out for themselves. On the wild card line, you're on the air with uh, Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Yes, Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Bell, uh, I think most reported cases of abduction by aliens are not true, but there are some authentic cases, and these are examples of a government program of mind control in which people are given a, an hypnotic suggestion that they have been kidnapped by aliens. So if the listeners want the truth about this, they should get a copy of Martin Cannon's book, The Controllers, from a mail order service called Prevailing Winds Research in Santa Barbara. All right. Uh, well, thank you. I, I know about uh, Martin Cannon's theories, and uh, I think that uh, the government does a lot of nasty things, and perhaps some branches have done some nasty things, but it has nothing to do with explaining abduction accounts, because if this were the case, it would have had to have started under uh, practically under Grover Cleveland or something like that in terms of the president. All right. On the uh, toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Where are you, sir? This is another Art from Edmonds, Washington. Edmonds, Washington. Oh, good, Art. Mm -hmm. As I uh, listen to your program, I'm also sitting here reading the April issue of uh, Omni Magazine. Mm-hmm. And the lion's share of this magazine covers the same topic that you're talking about. I just wondered if Bob would know uh, some of the people they mentioned. One of them is a Bob Lazar, L-A-Z-A-R, right. who is a uh, propulsion system engineer who claims to have been hired to examine one of the uh, disks that they had found, and he claims that it is uh, propelled by gravity waves. Yes. All right. Listen on the air. Um, Bud, not Bob, but Bud, uh, are you familiar with the Lazar story? Oh, yes, sure I, you are. yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, George Knapp is the uh, investigator who's done uh, the, the most uh, uh, careful work in relation to the Lazar case. And uh, uh, it's an ambiguous case, but there seems to be some solid evidence for his claims. Um, and I, I, it, it's an extremely difficult topic to go into at any depth. And I'm, it, it's, since it's outside my area of expertise, really, uh, I think that George Knapp would be the man to talk to about that. Bit. All right, and we do speak with him frequently. Stand okay. by, Bud. Stand by just one second. We'll be right back to you. All right, uh, back to Bud Hopkins. Are you there, Bud? I certainly am. All right, time is short. Um, on our toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Hi, where are you calling from? I'm calling from Richland, Washington. Richland, yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Gail. I'm curious to know what Bud's uh, opinion is on speculation that our government uh, is well aware of the abductions and the alien things that are going on, but either can't do anything about it and so keep it hushed up, or they're getting something in return and so keep it hushed up. All right, up. I think his view is the first yeah. rather than the latter. What? Yes, we've gone into that, in, and uh, I definitely think they're aware. I don't have any doubt about that. that. But I don't think there's any swap involved. We're not getting anything out of this. All right. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Reno. Reno, Nevada. Yes. Bud, mm -hmm. um, is there any other technique uh, of remembering 
an abduction experience other than hypnosis that you know of? All right, thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. There is another technique that has been used, and, of course, uh, people have talked about sodium pentothal and that type of thing, uh, although that's not something I have any... Um, use for myself. Uh, hypnotic regression works very, very well. Uh, there is a, um, uh, a a new technique which uh, is being used by some psychologists that uh, involves rapid movement of the eyes uh, to, uh, I don't know what the motor connection is with memory, but there seems to be one and it has been uh, used successfully by a number of people to elicit information. Uh, you would have to go to somebody trained in that uh, technique, but uh, hypnosis is a very useful technique in the meantime and safe. All right, good. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Hello there. Where are you, please? In Seattle. This is Jackie. All right, Jackie, you're hard to hear. Get close to the phone and ask a question. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. What's up, Jackie? Hi, Bud. Hi. I was just wondering if you noticed any significant trends in UFOs, like uh. in the things that they're doing. Trends, changes. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, yes, uh, in the sense that uh, new things are coming, are coming to light all the time, and we don't know whether they're a new trend or whether they've been going on for a long time. This particular uh, thing I'm going to mention uh, I think has been going on a long time, and that is uh, the UFO occupants seem very interested in how we form relationships. And I just dealt with a couple uh, who are about to get married, and uh, they're in their 20s. And when they first met exactly a year ago, they realized that they knew one another. Uh, they didn't know how, but they know a lot about each other, and uh, there were some amazing uh, uh, connections. I mean, since one of them remembered that the other had a, uh, a birthmark on his chest. Oh, boy. Uh, they knew a lot about uh, their backgrounds and how they looked and talked that when they were younger and how they fixed their hair and everything else. And it seems that they have been abducted over different periods of time at intervals and brought together as if the aliens were studying long-term the way relationships are formed. Believe it or not, I have now maybe six or seven cases like this. Now, this is something that's not really ever been made public, and I don't think it's all that common. But it definitely seems that this has been a systematic arrangement, and even to this point that there's a man in the United States in his 40s who, when he met an English woman here in the United States for the first time, she's about 41, they realized that they've known each other. They couldn't place where. They're both abductees, and when we looked into these experiences, they were first abducted when they were children. <laughs> that implies, one from England, one from the United States. That implies alien matchmaking. Yeah, well, it sort of does, the great dating service in the sky. Yeah, that's said. right. But the basic point is that these, uh, these people uh, assumed all along when they remembered that they knew somebody, they assumed, well, it's a dream or something. I'm having a dream companion, but it's real. Wow. Uh, Toll-free line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Time is short. Where are you calling from? Tacoma, Washington. All right, you're on the air. Go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hopkins. Yes, sir. I, uh, just a little while ago, I read a book by uh, Jacobs called Secret Life. A very good book, oh, too. An excellent book. And I'm right smack dab in the middle of a book called Abduction by uh, Dr. John Mack. Yes. Uh, uh, John, these are two of my uh, closest uh, colleagues and friends. Well, it's, it's interesting what they both say. My question is this. Mm -hmm. These uh, hybrid... Uh, fetuses, uh, children. Mm -hmm. There seems to be two scenarios to what they're doing with them. And I was wondering, uh, which one do you uh, believe? Uh, what are they doing with these children? Well, uh, I mean, it, it, I, I'm not sure that we have a scenario as to what they're doing with them. We really don't know what they're doing with them. That's the central question, actually, uh, as David Jacobs has said about uh, our, our point of knowledge right now. What are the hybrids for? Where are they going? We don't really know. And uh, I, now I haven't read all of, uh, of um, John Mack's book uh, fully. It just came out, uh, and I don't know that he makes any presents any scenario for the use of the future of the hybrids, nor does Dave Jacobs. Well, what were you thinking, sir? Oh, well, he's gone. These are both people that I have interviewed and will interview again. Right. All right. Uh, very good. Uh, we've got to move on. One okay. more, perhaps, on the wild card line. You're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Good evening. Hello. Hello there. Where are you, sir? Hello? Are you there, caller? No, I guess not. Well, in that case, we'll make it this one. First time caller line, you're on the air with Bud Hopkins. Hello. Hi, I'm calling from uh, Albuquerque. Albuquerque, yes. 
I'd like to ask him uh, if he thinks UFOs have anything to do with uh, the Lost Squadron, uh, like uh, when those uh, five uh, planes disappeared. Oh, yes, the Lost Squadron. Bud, you remember they thought they found it, and then I guess they didn't. What is the story? Yeah, this is the one of the um, um, uh, Bermuda Triangle issues. Uh, that uh, story has been pretty much uh, analyzed and discussed and explained away as a series of, of, of genuine navigational mistakes, people caught in a storm, and there doesn't seem to be a big mystery attached to it. Now, other things have disappeared. There was a pilot who disappeared, Fred Valentich, off the coast of Australia in 1977, uh -huh. uh, and uh, he was... Last heard talking on the radio, I've heard the radio uh, tape of, of the broadcast to uh, Melbourne Tower. That's a genuine case. The, the, the lost squadron, quote-unquote, which did happen, uh, seems to have a natural explanation, though, unfortunately. All right. Well, I guess they say leave them wanting more, and you are. It's a full board we've got here. Bud, um, go ahead and give your address out one more time, would you please? Okay. Uh, you can write to me, care of if, I-F, that's box 30233. New York, New York, 10011. And uh, I can be reached there uh, if you want information, a um, uh, sample of the uh, IF bulletin, uh, information about subscriptions, uh, or especially if you have something to report about personal experiences, uh, we would like to hear from you. And thank you very much. Well, Bud, it has been a pleasure having you on, and I hope we can tap your expertise at some future date. Would, would you possibly be able to come back? No, I think I would. It's uh, it's kind of late here in New York for me, 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, us uh, city boys have to get up early. All right. Bud. But at any rate, uh, I certainly enjoy the program very much, Art, and I especially appreciate uh, our listeners who have uh, who have been so open about talking about their own personal experiences here. It is amazing, isn't it? Thank sure. you, Bud. Thank you. Take care. That's Bud Hopkins. Uh, he's been our guest for the last uh, three hours. I want to thank you all for being here. As I said, there is never enough time. If you would, if you'd like uh, or even need, and I can understand that after hearing it, a copy of this program or any of the other programs in the Dreamland series, please call the following telephone number 24 hours a day to get it. It is area code 503-664-5600. Let me repeat that. It's an important number if you want a copy of this program or any other Dreamland program. Area code 503-664-7966. Next Sunday, we'll be back with another Dreamland. On behalf of everybody at the network, I'm Art Bell. Thank you. Classic Roswell, uh, widely thought to be the best documented uh, proof of alien existence and visiting uh, uh, of this earth. So uh, we'll be speaking with him. I think you'll find it fascinating. However, first, uh, we're going to go to Linda Howe in Philadelphia and get her weekly update. Uh, however, even before that, we're going to welcome a couple of new stations to the network. Uh, as we continue to grow, carrying now carrying Greenland, WGNS AM radio in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And uh, that's also Nashville, Murfreesboro and uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And also KOFE AM in St. Marie's, Idaho. KOFE AM in St. Marie's, Idaho. Welcome. Good to have you both on board, and uh, I hope you'll be uh, contributing this evening and uh, making some calls. Uh, this program, uh, for the weeks we've been on the air, uh, you'll be, I'm sure, happy to know, now is carried by 75 affiliates nationwide as we continue to grow at an outstanding pace. So, now, to uh, all the way back to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and with her weekly report, here is author, investigator, Linda Howe. Linda, good evening. Hi, Art. Hi. Well, reports about several phenomena have crossed my desk this week. Uh, one is a news story from Warica, Oklahoma, about a rancher there who discovered that 1,700 of his cattle disappeared between August 3rd 
and August 7th. 17, did you say 1700? 1700. Wow. The Jefferson County, Oklahoma Sheriff's Office has put a search out for 850 cows and 850 calves. The first theory was cattle rustling, but Sheriff Don Allen said it would take 25 trucks to haul away that many animals, and that would be obvious to residents in the small farm community of Warica. I will keep following up on this mystery. The rancher so far does not want to talk, uh, and uh, perhaps understandably, because apparently uh, even the bank that holds the uh, note on the animals have gone out and confirmed that the uh, animals are missing. Everyone is puzzled, and of course this poor rancher is facing a major financial crisis. Sure, I'm curious, Linda, of those that you do interview or request interviews with that have had something like this happen, how many generally say, no, I don't want to talk to you, go away? It can be, in some cases, if I thought over the last 14 years, maybe 50-50. As many as 50% of the people that I talk to in interviews say they don't want uh, to, to do anything publicly. Wow. So, so then we're missing, no doubt, a lot of very good stories. Yeah, the challenge is to get to the facts and to encourage people uh, to come forth uh, to discuss some of these. Uh, phenomena because uh, that may help us all to understand and uh, I'm beginning to feel from the letters I'm getting from the Dreamland audience uh, that more and more people uh, are beginning to uh, communicate that I think are really uh, very, very credible and solid cases. And in this case, too, animal disappearances have been reported in other regions of the United States and Canada even England uh, over the past couple of decades. Uh, earlier this year in 1994, 200 dogs were reported missing from backyards in northern Georgia, and several hundred cats have disappeared from Falls Church, Virginia, Plano, Texas, parts of California, and Canada just in the past few years. And the intriguing question is, could any of these animals have been lifted up in beams of light as reported in some of the animal mutilation and UFO abduction cases. I don't know how we would prove it, but the question remains since there have been eyewitnesses to seeing animals lifted up in beams of light. Sure. Now, since last weekend's Dreamland, when I interviewed investigator Gail Stalen about two more mutilations in Angel Fire, New Mexico, east of Taos, there were three more odd animal deaths in northern New Mexico. Last Friday, rancher Max Cordova near Espinola discovered two of his 10-year-old cows dead with tongues cut out deep in the throat, udders removed and clean bloodless circles in the rectum's cord out. That makes seven such similar cattle mutilations in the Taos, New Mexico area just since May. And in three of those, pathologist Dr. John Outshuler found evidence of high heat at the excision lines hot enough to cook the hemoglobin. What? Mr. Cordova also found another cow last Saturday lying in a pasture, shaking from head to hoof, as he put it, and then it died, cause unknown. Uh, I contacted a veterinarian who did a necropsy on that animal and collected tissues from the mutilated cows for pathology examination, and I'll report those results when we have them. Good. Reports from England are that the last big formation in Wiltshire near Avebury was a huge spider web laid out in a wheat field. And other images this summer have included scorpions, a beetle, a large eye, galaxy-like formations, and something that people have described as an infinity symbol. English newspapers and television have covered the mysterious formations with less ridicule and less emphasis on the hoax theory this year, and yet in the United States there has been no coverage about the continuing formations at all. And in the next uh, month or so, I hope to report from Dr. Levengood, who has been getting plants from England, uh, to see again if we are finding that same pattern of biochemical and biophysical changes which cannot be hoped. Why do you think something that is a story and making headlines there in this area wouldn't be touched by the media here? Because that 1991 tabloid story about Doug and Dave being the answer to the crop circle mystery that was carried by all of our networks and CNN and Time and Newsweek and the New York Times and all of that, 
accepted that those two old men were responsible for the mystery when it was very clear that since the phenomenon was worldwide, had been reported in up to 20-some countries in 90, uh, 90, I think it was, yeah, the year 1990, and going into 1991, those two men were not responsible for the entire phenomenon, but the media bought that story, and once the media, quote, main, mainstream media has bought the hoax theory, then they don't go back to cover it. Well, isn't it worth asking, Linda, why we have these serious questions, formations, cattle mutilations, all the rest of it, that absolutely cannot be explained, and, and, uh, and the media deals with those stories, and then along comes one hoax story, uh, and uh, it's, they buy it hook, line, and, and sinker. Right, and it's like one of the ranchers in Alabama last year that I interviewed for my new documentary said to me, it's denial, Linda. Denial is a coping mechanism for people. It's, it's much easier to deny it than it is to face the fact that some very strange kind of intelligence is interacting with our planet. I guess maybe that does explain it, Linda. And, uh, and going from the standpoint that we are dealing with hard physical evidence in the crop circles and the animal mutilations and even in the human abduction syndrome, there's also the hard physical uh, science area that was involved with the impact of, on Jupiter. And there, it, last week in Europe, a group of astronomers, physicists, and other scientists met in Holland to discuss the latest updates about the comet collision. Mm -hmm. And one of the lead investigators, Dr. Heidi Hamill, she's an astronomer at M MIT who specializes in high-speed satellite imaging and spectroscopy. And in fact, she was the one who was getting all those first images. Uh, uh, and she's the one who took happily that big bottle of champagne right into the first television news conference to present it to Dr. Eugene Shoemaker and his wife and others. Uh, when they had the very first image of that big black circle at the bottom of Jupiter. And I talked with her Friday about what scientists have been learning so far in the wake of the spectacular explosions from the comet impact, because even in that there have been some mysteries that are, are yet uh, not solved. And uh, just a moment, I will hook up here and we will hear Dr. Hamill. All right. Uh, she may be the one that for a while we called Heidi. We've had some tantalizing hints of interesting things on Jupiter. We've Some of the way that the material is spreading, uh, particularly in ultraviolet wavelengths, is very interesting. We're seeing spreading in latitude, things migrating across the normal lines of latitude. You know, when you look at Jupiter, you see these bands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, normally the winds blow along the bands. So that's what we think of as the winds. But when we take some of this high altitude material, it looks like it's just drifting across the bands. And that would suggest, what, no uh, atmospheric motion at the upper? Well, it suggests different atmospheric motion at those upper levels. It's not blowing, the winds aren't blowing the same way high up as they are deep down. And we didn't really have any way to measure that before. And now we're starting to think that we can actually see that motion happening, which is one of the things that we were all very excited about beforehand. We thought, you know, we might be able to do this. And now we're starting to actually believe we really can. And, and how long do you think at this point are these uh, brighter spots on the surface of Jupiter going to last? Will it be a permanent one? Well, that's a, that's a good question, and I don't think I can really answer that in any detail. Um, we know the features are still there now. Uh, we just had some new data from the Hubble telescope come down yesterday, and you can very clearly see them, and we can see them in ground-based images, too. You don't need the Hubble to see them. So we know that this stuff is still hanging around there now, a month, more than a month afterwards. Um, as to whether or not it's going to be permanent, uh, we really don't know. We won't know that for a while. Uh, maybe, you know, next year, if we see these things are fading rapidly, we'll be able to say, yeah, they're going to go away. Um, it's pretty clear they're not forming a new red spot. Mm -hmm. Some people thought, oh, this is how the great red spot was formed. But that doesn't seem to be true. Uh, we're not seeing giant new vortices or hurricanes forming at these latitudes. We're really seeing a band of material. So it's just a question of how long it takes that band to fade. It might take a year. 
Uh, it might take two. Mm -hmm. And somebody with a, like a normal telescope, let's say a four-inch uh, dinoscope reflector or something like that, can they still see these uh, uh, impact places clearly? Someone with a small telescope who knows what to look for can probably still see them. It's a little bit harder than it was months ago, though, and here's why. A month ago, these features were very localized. They were spots, and it's easy to see a dark spot. But when you then take that spot and you spread it out as it's happening, it, its contrast drops quite a bit. And so if you don't know where to look, it's not as easy to see the spots. So it's, it's a question of well, how familiar a, a person is with Jupiter. If they know where Jupiter normally does not have dark band here and they see the band, then they know that's from the impact site. But it doesn't have these very obvious big dark splotches like it did a month ago. Mm -hmm. So the, the most outstanding remaining mystery is why was the substance black where these impacts were? Yeah, that's, that's a, a, a one of the questions. Another question that we're all still very curious about is how deep did these pieces really penetrate? before they exploded. Right? Well, that's something that was very interesting because that tells us a lot about the comet. It tells us a lot about Jupiter. And it, we really don't know the answer to that yet. Uh, we, we, we think it didn't penetrate down to the water cloud layer because we didn't see any Jovian water, mm -hmm. just like we saw no comet water. Mm -hmm. um, at the meeting in um, Holland, we were talking about the fact that we did not see the bright flashes as these pieces went in mm -hmm. the meteor phase. Uh, most of what we saw was the fireballs blowing out after the pieces had exploded. Right. And the fact that we didn't see them on the way in suggests to many of us that they went relatively deep, uh, above, uh, below the ammonia cloud decks, which is really the top cloud layer that we see at visible wavelengths. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're not sure about that. <laughs> and if it did go deep, then it would again be the question, why not see water? Yeah, that's right. So our, the mysteries about Jupiter are still not all resolved, and at the end of September there will be another major scientific meeting in Baltimore. There might be more to report then. All right. Well, it would be interesting to know, A, how deep they really did go, and B, Richard Hoagland, who's been on the program, has, has speculated a number of times that the black spots were carbon, and they seem disinclined to be very interested in talking about the black spots. Have you noticed? Well, he uh, said that they have found some odd elements, like lithium uh, and some other really odd ones, which they're going to have more papers presented in September. But in terms of the identity of the black material, at least according to Heidi, so far, they do not know what it is. Mm. All right. Well, Linda, gee, a wonderful uh, report, and I was uh, hoping to get some follow-up, and I hope there'll be more on the collisions. I've been fascinated by that. Right. I plan to uh, talk with her and Dr. Shoemaker again uh, after the September meeting in uh, Baltimore. All right. Wonderful. Linda Howe, as always. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's give out your address. I know a lot of people want to communicate to you, so give it out. Yes, I have been very grateful for the uh, increasing number of letters, uh, extraordinary stories from people, and I will continue to try to share some of these in future Dreamlands as we go with those who give me permission. Uh, you can write to Linda Howe at Post Office Box 538, in Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania, spelled H-U-N-T-I-N-G, D is in dog, O-N, Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania, and the zip code is 19006. All right, there you've got it, and we'll give that out again in the program. Linda, as thank always, thank you. Thank you, Art. Right, Linda Howe, uh, our reporter slash investigator in Philadelphia and frequently elsewhere. She travels around the world to look at this sort of uh, phenomenon. And um, we will continue to have her on the program. All right, Dreamland continues in a moment with something a lot of people have been waiting for. A crash at Roswell, 
Uh, we're going to reach out to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, I hope, and find Kevin Randall. Hi, Kevin. Are you there? Yes, I am. Excellent. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes before the bottom of the hour break, Kevin, so tell us something quickly uh, about yourself. I think the important things to know is I used to be an Army helicopter pilot. I spent 12 years as an Air Force intelligence officer, and I've been investigating UFOs for about 20 years. So I've got a background that uh, in, in aviation and in investigative work of, of one nature, and I could bring all that to bear on the investigation that Don Schmidt and I conducted to learn what exactly happened at Roswell in July of 1947. Well, we'll certainly get to that. But if you were in intelligence work uh, and, uh, and you uh, piloted helicopters, I've really got to ask you about something uh, up front here that has uh, been a big matter of contention with our audience. What are these black helicopters that are flying around? Any idea, Kevin? I, I actually have no, no ideas at all. The, the, the stories seem to make no logical sense whatsoever. Um, according to FAA regulations and all other regulations, if you have an aircraft, it has got to have a number on it and it's got to be uh, flown in accordance with FAA regulations. And these things seem to violate all those regulations. I just... Do I don't you, know what's uh, going on. Do you, uh, do you get reports of them? In other words, uh, uh, I'm sure very much like we do here, uh, you, you are in a circle of people that hears about this kind of stuff. And so do you also get reports of these black helicopters? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. People from all over. In fact, up in uh, Portland, Oregon, I was working with John Kirby and uh, Don Newman up there. And the first time we ever met with them, they told us a number of stories about black helicopters. And I, and I confess, they just make no sense to me at all. Well, um, all right. Uh, I don't know what to do about that or say about that. It's, uh, it's just kind of an ongoing thing, and a lot of people are, use the street term, kind of freaked out about it, uh, uh, Kevin. And they, oh, absolutely. They feel these things are somehow flying around up there with... Uh, even though we don't have reports of harm coming to anybody, uh, somehow people feel they're trying to do harm to them. All right, Kevin, stand by. We'll take a break here at the bottom of the hour. It'll be about four minutes, and we'll come back and find out if we can really get the truth about the UFO crash at Roswell, which, again, is considered to be the, uh, the incident here on Earth with perhaps the best documentation to prove that they really have or are here, have been here, or are here. We'll be back. And once again, here is uh, our guest, Kevin Randall, author of The Truth About the Crash, the UFO Crash at Roswell. Uh, Kevin? Yes. Good. Uh, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Um, all right, Kevin. Uh, just before we get started w with regard to your story, uh, recently Showtime had the movie on Roswell, which I, I saw, and uh, I don't want to... Um, uh, lead you into uh, any review you don't want to give, but I sure would like to find out from you what you think about that movie. Well, it was based on the first book that Don Schmidt and I did, The UFO Crash at Roswell. So, frankly, we liked it. You liked it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were, But we were prejudiced. In fact, both of us are in the film in cameo roles. Uh, Don plays a bartender, and in the there's a oh, scene in the sheriff's office where there's a newsman way in the back arguing with a deputy, and as you as they move in and out of the camera, you can see me back there arguing with oh, the deputy. Oh, no kidding. That was you, huh? Yes, that was me. <laughs> yes, I, I do recall. I, I certainly do recall. Um, is there anything about the film that you found distressing or inaccurate or blown up, you know, for the sake of cinematography? They did a very good job of trying to stick pretty much to the story. And, you know, as, as the director said a number of times, they were making a film. So you have to keep it in context of them making a film. 
when I first saw the script, I was a little bit bothered by the stuff from Dreamland Area 51, uh, the animal mutilations, the human abductions. I thought this really has no relevance to the Roswell case. But in the context of the film, with Martin Sheen saying, um, telling, telling Jesse Marcel in, in the context of the film, uh, well, then none of it's true. Well, maybe some of it's true. Uh -huh. And in the context of the disinformation put out by the government, I thought it worked very well. What about, uh, one thing that struck me in the film uh, was the size of the debris field at Roswell. Uh, my gosh, for as far as the eye could see almost, uh, you know, there was debris. Was there that much debris at the original crash uh, site? On the debris field, according to Jesse Marcel, the debris field continued for three quarters of a mile. Wow. It was two to three hundred feet wide and, and, and uh, stretched for three quarters of a mile. And in fact, the reason the deep debris field is so large is because uh, I said something to the director. So the next day I found myself walking way out into the desert, dropping debris here and there with a number of other people. And uh, Paul Davids, the executive producer, suggested, well, maybe the director was getting even with you for, uh, for shooting your mouth off. You shouldn't have told him the debris field wasn't large enough. So. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, let's back up a little bit and uh, have you tell the story of the truth about what occurred at Roswell as best you've been able to determine it. And how did you determine what the truth was, by the way? A series of interviews, no doubt. Uh, interviews with the eyewitnesses, people who were there. No longer are we relegated to having to deal with this on the basis of my father saw, saw this and told me about it, my husband saw this and told me about it. We're now to the point where this is what I saw. So we have the, the first-hand witnesses, of, all of whom are named, or the majority of whom are named in, in the book. How many witnesses of that caliber were you able to find? We have found about a dozen people now who were on the debris field, I'm sorry, on the impact site where the craft and the bodies were found who have talked to us about some aspect of it. Mm. Unfortunately, a number of them have since passed away uh, since we had an opportunity to talk to them, but we do have that many. In fact, uh, Don Ecker at UFO Magazine in California uh, just found another first-hand witness oh. who, who corroborated some of the things that we published in the book. So no longer can people point to us and say, well, uh, the way you ask questions, uh, your agenda led, had you lead these people into what mm -hmm. you wanted to say. Now there's an, a witness that we had no contact with when he first told the story who was found by someone else, and now that we've been able to... Uh, review what he said, he tends to corroborate what the other first-hand witnesses had said it well. Have you, have you spent any introspective time, uh, Kevin, asking yourself that question, did I lead people into this, did I put ideas in their head, or was I objective? That always runs through your mind, especially sure. when you begin to get to the story as you wanted to hear it. I mean, we wanted to find the first-hand witnesses, the people who see the craft, the bodies, and when we began to find those people, the question was, are they telling us what we want to hear? That's right. Or are they telling us what they actually observed? And how can we corroborate this? And what, what it turns out is we kept a lot of the information to ourselves uh, before the publication of the book for that very reason. One of the first-hand witnesses, we identify him as Steve McKenzie in the book, uh, because he asked us not to use his, his real name because he valued, valued his privacy. Mm -hmm. But but he, he led us he led us uh, down a number of roads that we had not gone before. The, the the crash site being the impact site being much closer to Roswell, not the debris field by found by Mac Brazel, but the impact site. The shape of the craft not being a classic flying saucer with a dome on it, but something more heel shaped. Uh, the number of bodies, what they looked like. He told us all this stuff, and it and it varied from the conventional wisdom. And we thought, well, this is wonderful, this is what we want, but, but is this guy feeding us a line? Sure. But we found corroborative testimony. Lewis Rickett, the uh, NCOIC of the counterintelligence officer, office at Roswell, corroborated the shape of the craft using the same words almost, that it was heel-shaped, that the drive they made from Roswell, he and the man that he identified as Sheridan Cabot, made from, from the base at Roswell was about 45 minutes to the impact site, not the two and a half to three hours it takes to get out to the debris field. So it's much closer to Roswell. Well, let me understand. Uh, the impact site versus the debris field, how much distance between the two? Uh, about 40 miles. 40 miles? Based, based on what we've been able to determine, 35 to 40 miles. All right, well, then that means the craft broke up in the air. It, but the problem we have with that is that it looked like an intact craft was found on the impact site. We have a debris field, and the, and the debris, the, the wide range of debris, you don't have the wide range of debris 
you'd have if the thing broke up in the air. You, you have some metallic debris, you have some wires, things like that. But if an airplane broke up in the air, you'd have a lot of other stuff. And you don't have that on the debris field. Well, yeah, but that was a gigantic debris field. And how much of that kind of stuff could any craft uh, lose and, um, and still be basically intact to impact anywhere else? Yeah, that's a very good question. And we simply don't have the answer uh, to that question. What we know is we have a debris field, and that was described by a, a, a number of people. Mac Brazel uh, telling his son, his son talking about that. Uh, we have General Exxon, for example, told us about two distinct sites, the one closer to Roswell, the debris field. Yes. We have a number of witnesses leading us, telling us those things. There are questions we don't have the answers to because we, don't, we haven't got to the internal workings of this thing. All right, the creatures that they showed in the movie, um, how uh, did they arrive at how to make those creatures look in the movie? I believe what they did in the movie was they took... Some of the testimony that came about in our, uh, from, from our first book, uh, some of the things we'd said in the work that we were putting together for the second book, uh, the truth about the UFO crash at Roswell, especially based on the eyewitness testimony we'd, we'd since uncovered, mm. took some of, the, some of their cues from the um, abduction phenomenon in the current state of UFO literature uh -huh. and created a being that sort of fit all the descriptions. Um, but the, the, the beings found at Roswell, according to the eyewitnesses that we talked to, were much more human-looking than they were alien-looking. They're not the typical greys. The eyes, although larger than hum, human eyes, um, still had pupils. The heads, although slightly larger than human heads, were, were uh, just slightly larger than the, they would be proportioned to the bodies. The bodies were extremely thin. The bones were very fragile, uh, according to that. So, so some of the things that we had learned from uh, our investigation were incorporated in it, but they also, they also wanted to make the creatures look alien, more alien than, than it had uh, Than they probably they were. were. All right, fine. Well, uh, even, even so, uh, Kevin, assuming that there were beings and they were recovered, uh, we would not do autopsies and then cremate uh, uh, the remains. We would obviously retain for all time through some method or another, these bodies. So someplace now, today, those bodies must exist. I would, yes. The best information we have, and again, this is very speculative based on just a couple of people, is that they are in Nevada. Not yeah, at Nevada. Greenland, not at Groom Lake or Area 51, but at a special location in the central areas of Nevada in the mountains. Really? Uh, as, as you know, what, 90% of the state of Nevada is government territory. Oh, we well know that. Yeah, um, and our understanding is that there was a special facility created in central Nevada in the mountains for, for the uh, preservation of the bodies and, and uh, a great deal of the debris uh, recovered at, uh, at Roswell. Gee, I feel honored. In, <laughs> in the same state with the bodies, huh? <laughs> um... Uh, is would that be some? I'm always looking for some way, uh, Kevin. Uh, rather than reviewing what occurred all those years ago, fascinating as that is, to approach it today and try and prove it today. I mean, everybody wants to do that. That would be one way. That would, certainly would be one way. I think one of the other things we need to do is, and I think Don Schmidt and I have done a, a, a fairly good job. And to give credit where credit was due uh, is due. I think that uh, Stanton Friedman. I think that Bill Moore have pretty well explored what happened at Roswell back in 1947. What we need to do now is find out what happened at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in 1947. That's Some right. of that work has been done, but there's a great deal more to be done, and learn what was going on in the UFO phenomenon from, from that point forward, and that may provide us the clues to get to where we want to go today. But we need to take the investigation out of New Mexico and move it into Ohio and other locations. Well, uh, as there were witnesses uh, with regard to what occurred in New Mexico, uh, you would think there would also be witnesses, although probably more carefully warned, uh, from, uh, uh, from Ohio that you could interview and kind of track what's happened to these bodies and what happened in Ohio. And, and, and that's right. Again, General Exxon told us that uh, he was at the base when this happened, uh, July of 1947. Later, he became the base commander at Wright-Patterson in, in the mid-1960s. But he told us that one of the bodies had been taken to Denver because the Army's mortuary service was, was housed at Lowry Army Airfield at the time. Yes. And that, that, that it was uh, experimented on there, 
obviously with an eye for the best way to preserve it without uh, chemically altering the tissue samples or the blood the way we normally do when you embalm a body. They want, would want to preserve it as, as pristine as they possibly could without allowing it to decay. We have been told that one of the bodies went to uh, McDill, I think, Air Force Base in um, Florida and, and it had been preserved there. But, but you're absolutely correct. We have some witnesses at, at, at Wright Field and later Wright Patterson Air Force Base who provided us with some clues. Um, General um, Exxon told us some things that when he first told us them, they, they weren't that interesting. He mentioned that there would be uh, uh, groups of men coming in from Washington, D.C. to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. He was responsible for getting them an airplane, and then they would go out and investigate a UFO sighting and would come back to Wright Field, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. We thought, well, that's, that's curious, but not overly significant. Now, with the discovery of the 4602nd, at that point it would have been the 1127th Air Activities Group and Project Moondust, that information becomes extremely important because it's clear that the people Exxon was talking about were working with the, the uh, 1127th Air Activities Group. So and nobody knew that that group was at Wright Path? The, the group was not at Wright Path. They were at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, in the Washington, D.C. area. They came into Wright Patterson. He provided them with a oh. Wright Patterson Air Force airplane. He said they would come in in civilian clothes on commercial airliners and then go out and investigate the UFOs. So if you had a smart, smart aleck a reporter who tried to trace these guys back, he could I've trace them you. back to Wright Patterson, home of Project Blue Book, and everybody's happy. And that's where it would stop. All right, hold on just a moment, Kevin Randall. We'll be right back to you. Yes. All right, um, let us do a little of the original stuff and tell everybody, because there may be some out there who don't know. Back in 1947, what were the sequence of events, uh, roughly? What happened? What we believe happened, based again on eyewitness testimony, on the evening of July 4th, 1947, between 11.17 and 11.27 p.m., an object crashed just north of Roswell, New Mexico. Next day, the military is out there. They've cordoned the area and are picking up the craft and the bodies. Major Edwin Easley, the Provost Marshal of the 509th Bomb Group, told me it was an extraterrestrial spacecraft. Steve McKenzie told me that the, the, the object was heel-shaped, that there were five bodies. Lewis Rickett told me that the object was heel-shaped and that some of the metal uh, was extremely thin, but he couldn't bend it, uh, they, that they couldn't do anything to cut it. They recovered the craft, they recovered the bodies, took them to the Roswell Army Airfield. On the evening of July 4, uh, 5th, I'm sorry, July 5th, morning of July 6th, two airplanes left Roswell carrying the bodies. One went to... Uh, Andrews Army Airfield, Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C., so top-level people in the government could see the bodies. The other one went to Wright-Patterson, Wright Field at the time. They didn't put all the bodies on one airplane in case one of them crashed. Um, on Sunday, July 6th, now we, we, we run back into the conventional wisdom. Mac Brazel finds the field of metallic debris mm -hmm. on, on the morning of the 5th. On the morning of the 6th, he takes it into Roswell, takes some of the debris into Roswell, shows it to the Chavez County Sheriff George Wilcox, who in turn calls the 509th Bomb Group, and Jesse Marcel, and apparently Sharon and W. Cabot, who was the uh, commander of the uh, counterintelligence office, was sent out to the debris field. They spent the, the day of the 7th out there, collected some of the debris, came back late at night. Marcel showed it to his wife and son and uh, then went on out to the base. On July 8th, the Army announces, we captured a flying saucer on a ranch in the Roswell region. By uh, 4 or 5 o'clock that afternoon, General Ramey at 8th Air Force Headquarters said, no, no, they made a mistake. It was merely a weather balloon. Who made that announcement? How high did that go? The, uh, the, uh, the, the original announcement that a UFO crashed. It went all the way to the president. I mean, the president knew. The president knew. There's, there's no question. Edwin Easley, the provost marshal, told me one of the reasons he didn't like talking about this was because he promised the president he wouldn't talk about it. Now, I don't know whether Easley told the president personally, told Truman personally he wouldn't talk about it, or Truman's representative in, in, in New Mexico, but it's in essence the same thing. Easley felt that he had promised the president he would not talk about it. Wow. I had at one time, in, in my discussions with Easley, I had told him that I knew uh, Ch General Thomas DuBose. And I said, do you know General DuBose? And he said, yes. And I said, if I had General DuBose call you and say it was okay to talk, would, would, you, would you feel more comfortable then? Mm -hmm. And he said, no. I didn't realize that what I needed to get was the president to call this guy and, 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 and uh, 
tell him it was okay to talk about it. I couldn't find a general officer high-ranking enough. <laughs> All right. Uh, what about the other end of the scale? In the movie Roswell, it showed literally platoon after platoon of regular grunt-type GIs out there picking up debris like so many cigarette butt uh, uh, butts that you got to pick up around uh, that I remember picking up uh, around uh, the barracks and they were doing that crawling on their hands and knees and there was a ton of debris shouldn't there be a lot of uh, low-ranking people who participated in that debris pickup that you could find and interview absolutely and we've talked to so many of them we probably talked to four dozen people who handled the metallic debris. Wow. That, that they didn't see the craft, did not see the bodies, but handled metallic debris. So yes, there were a great, great number of them. Okay, well that's important. What do they say about the nature of the debris? Uh, Robert Smith, for example, who was a sergeant, helped load uh, some of the debris on airplanes, said that he'd seen a, a, a foil sample of it, that when you wadded it up into a ball and dropped it on the table, it would unfold itself. Yes, they showed that on, on the movie. And, 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 that's very, and that's a very easy one to show because, uh, I mean, it's something that's so unusual that that sticks in the mind. A, a, lot, a lot of people talked about that one. A Mac, a Bill Brazel, the son of, of the man who found it, Mac Brazel, played by Dwight Yoakam in the movie, um, had a piece of that foil that he talked about, and he, he liked it too because it would unfold itself. Frankie Rowe, who was, uh, whose father was a firefighter in Roswell, when a state trooper brought a piece of debris by the, the firehouse, uh, saw that kind of debris. Sally Tadellini, who was a neighbor of the Brazel, saw the piece of debris that, that Bill Brazel brought by, and she was impressed with it because she just spent all day ironing and thought it'd be wonderful to have fabric that wouldn't wrinkle. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's, there's a large number of people from civilians to, to low-ranking military people who saw the metallic debris and talked about what it was. When you get to the craft and the bodies, clearly that was much more important, and that was limited to a, 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 a smaller number of people. But there was a large number of people who saw the, the metallic debris, and the description we have from, from some of the people is that they lined them up across that debris field, shoulder to shoulder as you saw in the movie, picking up the metallic debris, first sweeping it at double arm intervals, then at shoulder to shoulder, and then finally on their hands and knees to make sure they picked up all the debris. Wow. Um, in the movie, uh, Major Marcells uh, had more than just one of the pieces of foil. He had a debris, a piece of debris, with some writing on it that looked like some sort of Egyptian hieroglyphics or something. Uh, it was hard to discern, but that's kind of what it looked like. Um, is that an accurate portrayal of what he had? He, um, I think a more accurate portrayal of what he had, according to his son, Jesse Jr., who was on the set with us, as a matter of fact. Oh, um, no kidding. After, after the movie Roswell, there was a short little thing they showed, and you see Jesse Jr. sitting in a chair out in the desert talking about that. Well, that was on the scene where they were filming the film. Uh, filming the film. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but according to him, the symbology was more of geometric shapes, mm -hmm. squares and circles and triangles and mm -hmm. things like that. But, but he described it as being hieroglyphic-like. Um, I think Mac Brazel told people that it was like Chinese writing, uh, the, the, the Chinese symbol writing, of course. All right, so, still just as strange. Kevin, I've got to ask you to hold on for a sec. We're surely. at the top of the hour. We're going to do a little bit of uh, news here at the top of the hour. And we'll be back. Radio is a wonderful land to be in. We have enough time to explore an issue the way it should be. Kevin Randall is my guest, and we're talking about the truth about the UFO crash at Roswell. Uh, we apologize. Network-wide, we understand there was an interruption that lasted for uh, uh, some period of time, some mis- all over uh, the network and it is of course uh, the government uh, not wanting you to hear what it is we have to say no just kidding what it actually is um, is severe thunderstorms in Vernon Valley New Jersey which is where the master C-band uplink is satellite uplink and uh, so I guess they're back there battling lightning bolts and trying to keep everything together so if there is any interruption well, and uh, that's the reason for it. Uh, Vernon Valley, New Jersey is being presently inundated uh, with rain and um, severe thunderstorms. In a moment, Kevin Randall once again.
Do you have Kevin problems? Randall? Kevin, are you there? Yes, I am. Good. Um, let's see. I guess everybody missed just a tiny bit of the show because of the thunderstorms back in New Jersey, Kevin. My personal opinion, it was Psycop doing it. <laughs> I, I do sometimes wonder, I, I admit, Kevin, uh, whether, uh, whether there is tampering about uh, with this kind of program uh, when you're dealing with the kind of information you're dealing with. But who knows? Uh, at, any, at any rate, uh, Kevin, if you would review for everybody just a little bit, uh, I, believe, I believe that it occurred uh, just prior to the hour, which would mean uh, while you were detailing uh, some of the events at Roswell, it went off, of course. Uh, of course, naturally. Mm -hmm. As I say, the best evidence we have in its eyewitness testimony is that the, the crash took place between 11.17 and 11.27 p.m. on July 4th. July 5th, the military moves in, cordons off the area, recovers the craft, recovers five alien bodies. The same day, Mac Brazel finds his debris field. Sunday, July 6th, Mac Brazel comes in, alerts the Chavez County Sheriff, who in turn calls the Roswell Army Airfield, Major Jesse A. Marcel, and mm -hmm. apparently Captain Sheridan Cavett, who was in charge of the uh, counterintelligence office, office accompanied Brazel back out to the debris field. They, they spend the, uh, July 7th there, Monday, July 7th there. Brazel uh, leaves them on the field. Marcel eventually sends Cavett back to the base. He stays there until dusk, drives home, shows some of the debris, the metallic debris, to his wife and his son, and then takes it on into the base. On July 8th, the military announces they have a flying saucer. Uh, uh, Roswell Army Airfield tapped his flying saucer and ranch in Roswell region. Three or four hours later, General Roger Ramey, commander of the 8th Air Force, announced, no, no, it's nothing more than a common radar target. The officers and men at Roswell... Uh, overreacted to the, the historical mm. times that they were in and misidentified this fairly common weather balloon uh, as, a, as a flying disc. Uh, and that pretty well shot down the story. Until Marcel surfaces in 1970 talking to uh, friends and, in fact, a woman who did a, uh, uh, a college thesis on it uh, about having captured a flying saucer. And then, of course, from that point, uh, UFO researchers became involved with Bill Moore's book coming out, I believe, in 1980, detailing part of the Roswell case. Huh. And uh, so how do you feel about it now? You've done all of the, these, I presume now, it's years of investigation. Right. What, do you, what do you personally believe, Kevin? There is no doubt in my mind that what was recovered was an alien spacecraft. I base that on the eyewitness testimony given to me by uh, Major Edwin Easley, for example. He was a provost marshal of the 509th Bomb Group, told me it was extraterrestrial, also told the president that he wouldn't talk about it. Uh, it was something so important the president uh, had to become involved in it. Jim Ragsdale, who was a, uh, a civilian living in the area, happened to be camping out in that area the night the thing crashed, was there the next day as the military came in and cordoned off the area. He saw the military coming, so he got out. But he saw the craft and he saw the bodies. He thought they were dummies. He didn't think they were real people because they were too small. Uh, we talked to W. Curry Holden, Dr. Holden, who was the uh, chairman of the Department of History and Anthropology at Texas Tech University. Holden told me personally he was there, he'd seen it all, he'd seen the craft, he'd seen the bodies just north of Roswell. So we have a wide range of testimony from very credible people, including men who have PhDs, to uh, military officers, to, to civilians who saw something, and we've been able to talk to them and, and learn what they saw. Well, that's remarkable. Just remarkable. Um, Kevin, I would like to expose you to the audience, open the telephone lines, let them ask you questions. Um, let me ask you this. Does your experience now with UFOs range beyond Roswell? Oh, absolutely. For the last five years, you mentioned how long we've been doing this. Don Schmidt and I have been conducting this investigation almost exclusively for five years. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, I spent a lot of time researching UFOs. I did a book called The UFO Casebook which details the history of the UFO phenomenon from Kenneth Arnold signing up to 1988 when, when the book was, uh, had to be submitted. I've done some work on abductions, and I, in fact, may have done work on the first abduction case where the family suggested the aliens had come into the house, and that was the Pat uh, Roach abduction from Utah in 1973. 
All right, very good. Well, let us uh, let us go to the telephones. Let's talk to a few people out there. And so if you have questions about the UFO field in general, now is the time, folks. Jump on the lines on the toll-free line. You're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Uh, yes, that's David from Palm Desert. Hi, David. Uh, I was just curious. I missed the Roswell show. I just wondered if it was going to be out on video cassette or rebroadcast. Well, that's a good question. Uh, Kevin, it was done for uh, Showtime, correct? Yes, and... it was. And, in fact, they just showed it for the last time last night or this morning at uh, 1235. Oh, boy. But, but it will come up again, as I understand it, in December on the Showtime network. There are plans for it to be marketed on video cassette. And there's a possibility it may it may be shown theatrically in this country. They're they're discussing that now because the response was so positive to the film. All right, but I assume because uh, it was Showtime, there will not be a video cassette automatically available. Is that right? No, there there are plans to market it plans. as a video cassette. But it's not out there yet. But it's not out there yet. Absolutely correct. All right, fine. On the first time caller line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hi. Hello, Mr. Randall. Yes. Yeah, I um, read your book about three months ago. I thought it was an outstanding book. Thank you. And I was wondering if you've seen the video by Norio Hayakawa. It's called The Grand Deception UFO is Area 51 in the U.S. Government. I'm familiar with the video. I haven't seen it yet. Okay. This was made in late 91. And according to him, in the fall of 95, there's going to be a fake um, encounter with the aliens in our government trying to prove that the aliens are um, are dangerous and they're going to attack us and that this is going to be is kind of a hoax to, to promote this one world government. Have you heard any theories on that? All right, thank you. Well, I think that we we have to take a look at the whole phenomenon. It's going to be very hard for anybody to, to uh, fake a sighting for very long. There's so many people out there with knowledge of the field that if they try to fake something that it's going to be pretty clear pretty quickly what's going on and there'll be some discussions about it i i don't see what benefit our government or anybody's government would derive from that and we can always fall back and say well these things have been around for 47 years and they have not overtly attacked us uh, up to this point so uh, you know there's a, a body of evidence to suggest that uh, uh, we don't need to worry about that all right now representative schiff in new mexico is doing an investigation and I wonder where you think that's headed and what we might be able to pry loose with that, Kevin. Well, from what uh, Representative Schiff says, he's not looking into Roswell specifically, but looking into the government procedures, which is what the GAO would, would necessarily do. And I know that a number of people have been in communication with the GAO, supplying them with information and data and suggesting where they, would, where they should look. What I'm hoping is we will find some kind of documentation that will lead us in the right direction, and the GAO certainly has the powers to get toward to that documentation. Um, we've tried to suggest places for them to look, and I know others have done the same thing. So with their clout, there may be something coming down that would suggest something extremely unusual happened at Roswell. All right, very good. Uh, back to the phones. First time caller line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hi. Hello there. No, you're not on the air. Let's go to another line. Toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Hi, this is uh, Greg from Phoenix, Arizona, KFYI. Yes, Greg. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, Kevin Randall might uh, want to detail the differences between E and Stan Friedman on the details of the Roswell incident. Good. I think the major difference between Stanton Friedman's theories and ours is Friedman subscribed to the idea there was a, a second craft and bodies found over on the plains of San Augustine. And we find the evidence suggesting that to be fairly weak. It, it's based uh, almost exclusively on the testimony of, and not even the testimony, but the story told by Barney Barnett to friends. And we have not had an opportunity to, to uh, interview Barnett. In fact, nobody did. He died before the story came out, so we must rely on secondhand testimony there. There has been no firsthand corroboration for an event on the plains. Uh, the one fellow who talked about first-hand corroboration. Gerald Anderson finally admitted that he lied about part of the story and actually created some documents to uh, tend to uh, corroborate his, his, his lying about this thing. So I think that's the major area where we differ. And I think we also differ on the MJ-12 document. We believe that the document itself is a hoax, and, and I think believe that uh, Mr. Friedman believes that the document is uh, authentic. So those are the major differences. We all agree that there was a crash 
of an alien craft. We agree there was a craft, uh, a crash near Roswell, New Mexico, and we agree that bodies were recovered. All right, good enough. Uh, back to the lines on the toll-free line. You're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Hello. Hi, yes. Yes, ma'am. Turn your radio off, please. Turn your radio off. Off. Yeah, Hi, yes. Um, I had a question for Kevin Randall. Sure. Where are you calling from? This is Allison from KVI Country. Okay, Allison. Um, I was wondering um, if there were a sex. Did they have any type of sex or how many were there that they found or anything like that? And if I could from Art sometime tonight get his BBS, how to get on his BBS. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, anything with regard to uh, the gender of the beings? There were five of them, and we have absolutely nothing on the gender. Uh, Glenn Dennis, the Roswell mortician, had gotten some information from a nurse that he knew assigned at the Roswell base, and she participated in some of the preliminary autopsy work done at the base, and she said she knew she noticed nothing, no, no overt uh, sexual characteristics, if you will. She said that it's possible that the doctors who had done some of the work may have, may have been able to distinguish between male and female, but she mm -hmm. did not know. So the answer is we have uh, no detailed knowledge on that. The answer is you have no answer right now. <laughs> exactly. All right, very good. Um, back to the telephone lines, toll-free line. You're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Hello there. No, I guess not. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Hi, Art. This is Doug calling from Phoenix. Hi, Doug. I just wanted to ask, uh, are, are you going to face any repercussions by talking about this? Am I? Yeah. No, I think that uh, our theory has always been that the people who, for example, were involved in the recovery and were sworn to secrecy or whatever, when they talk, they're suddenly protected because if the government moves against them, it's a tacit admission that what they were saying was, was true. Uh -huh. you, can't, you can't prosecute somebody for uh, inventing a tale of a flying saucer if there's nothing to it. I see. And, and I think it's, it's sort of the same thing with, with Don Schmidt and me. We are now very visible on that, and if there was any kind of a move against us, uh, to suppress the information, and that would be a tacit admission that we were going down the right path. Their best move at, at, the, at the moment is just to leave us alone. Um, there was a movie out a, a number of years ago where the reporter discovered a real live vampire, and he told, told the vampire, I'm going to tell the world you exist. And the vampire said to him, go ahead, nobody will believe you anyway. And I think that's kind of where we are in the UFO <laughs> phenomenon. The government's attitude is, well, go ahead, nobody will believe you anyway. But eventually we will. <laughs> eventually, eventually we will convince people because what what's happening now, and, and it's kind of what I predicted in the UFO casebook, is we've moved into the libraries and the archives, and we're beginning to find the documentation to support what we've said. For example, we've always maintained there was a secret UFO investigation, not part of Project Blue Book. We can now prove that. In fact, Air Force Regulation 200-2 is published in August of 1953, says, if you read that as an intelligence officer and, and you become involved in a UFO sighting in some fashion, a flight crew reports it to you, whatever, your obligation is to report it to 4602nd Air Intelligence Service Squad in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. You don't send it to Project Blue Book at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And so what this does is demonstrate that there was another investigation going on. Um, th there apparently was coordination between Blue Book and uh, this other investigation. But clearly, the important cases were going somewhere else. We can now demonstrate that. Project Moonduck, which we can now demonstrate, was a real government project, was involved in UFOs. It was also uh, involved in, in the retrieval of, of returning space debris of Soviet origin or something of that nature. Clearly, it had another more, more mundane mission. Can you, tell, can you tell us what that was, uh, what that project was? Moonduck, you keep talking about it. What did they do? Moondust was designed, according to the documentation, in 1953 to debrief of um, captured f flight crews. It evolved into a project that was, whose one mission was to recover space debris of foreign, un foreign origin or unknown origin, which clearly could mean extraterrestrial. It's, uh, UFOs are, are mentioned in some of the Moondust documents. So we have a, and, and, and Moondust was run by the, get this, 4602nd Air oh. Intelligence Service Squadron. <laughs> Later, the 1127th Air Activity, Air Activities Group, I mean, it's the same unit, but Moondust is involved mm. in that. Moondust, uh, uh, that, that organization is also involved in 
UFO investigation. So Moondust clearly had a mission that revolved around UFOs. Now, we know uh, that when Senator Jeff Bingham from New Mexico queried the Air Force about Moondust, the Air Force wrote back and said, no, nah, there was never such a project. Never existed. When we presented the documentation, actually Clifford Stone from Roswell gave this, the uh, documentation to, to Bingham who sent it to the Air Force, the Air Force wrote back and said, we'd like to amend our last statement. There was a project Moondust, but we never used it. We can now prove that Moondust went out a number of times. Oh, so, boy. So I, what, what I'm saying is we, can, we now have the documentation on our side. It's no longer we ufologists running around saying these crazy things about secret government projects and all this. We now have the documentation to prove it. And we have the lies told by the government documented as well. What do you think uh, movies like Roswell and books like your book will eventually produce? Well, what we're hoping is, is the movie, because they followed as, as, as closely as they possibly could, keeping in mind it is a movie, uh, the, the situation, it, it opens that door to a lot of people who'd never heard of Roswell. What is Roswell? Well, the movie tells you pretty much what it is. Uh, it doesn't tell you how detailed the information is. Our book, because we were very careful in uh, listing the sources, footnoting everything, uh, giving a bibliography that has more than 200 items in it. Right. Uh, the, the list of organizations that uh, participated in the investigation provided us with information. All that information is detailed in the book so that when someone comes into this new, they, they realize the level of investigation. It's not Don Schmidt and Kevin Randall, sensationalists, decided that they were going to blow Roswell up into something you are listening to, North uh, to make money, but they had actually done a lot of research into it and, and come to these startling conclusions, if you will. Uh, so what we have to do is convince the media and convince the public this is an area of legitimacy. It's not the area of crackpots and drunks and, and that sort of thing. And I did a radio program just last week, and someone called in with his UFO sighting, and the host said, well, what were you drinking? And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting because here we have the same problem we've always had. If you see a flying saucer, you must be drinking something. Yeah, that's right. Or you must be crazy. It's not that, well, gee, maybe you saw something extremely unusual in the sky and you're a sober citizen. Um, but the immediate assumption is, what were you drinking? And I think what we've got to do is we've got to remove that. We've got to prove to people something happened at Roswell, which we can do. We have the New, the New York Times, for crying out loud, mentioned the Roswell case on the front page of the July 9, uh, 1947 edition. So we can prove something happened there, something crashed. We can prove there was a cover-up based on the testimony of many of the participants. General Thomas DuBose told us, that the balloon was a cover story for General Ramey to get the reporters off his back. But he was not to discuss it with Ramey. It was a cover-up. We can prove that. Now, I believe, based on all the people we've talked to and the testimony we've taken, that we can get to the extraterrestrial answer. I mean, Edwin Easley told me it was extraterrestrial. Uh, oh, that it would be so. I hope so, Kevin. Hold on. We're at the bottom of the hour. We'll be right back. You're listening to Dreamland on a Sunday evening. This is Kevin Randall. He's talking about the truth about the UFO crash at Roswell. From the kingdom of Nye, we continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222, 702-727-1222, or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295, 727-1295, in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. It's widely thought to be the best uh, uh, documented uh, occurrence here on Earth. That is to say, whatever it was that uh, crashed at Roswell, New Mexico. That's what my guest is talking about this evening. His name is Kevin Randall, and he'll be back with more of it in just a moment. It's Randall, Kevin? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, tell everybody, Kevin, how they can get your book. Well, it's in the bookstores, of course. So, uh, you get to the bookstore, you can do it that way. Mm -hmm. But it's also available um, at... Uh, through 1-800-462-6420. So they can call that, that uh, toll-free number. Uh, you can give us that uh, number one more time, please. 1-800-462-6420. 
and they can order it through that number as well. How much is it? It's 19.95, and I think there's two dollars shipping and handling for ordering it that way. If you go to the bookstore, um, you might be able to con them out of uh, a 10 percent discount or something like that. But it's 19.95. All right, very good. Uh, back to the telephones now. Uh, Kevin Randall, the author of The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell, on the wild card line. You're on the air. Hello. Hello there. Yes, this is Steve from Washington. Hello, Steve. Yeah, I got two questions for you. One for your guest is why isn't there a possibility that that was a smaller craft that it collided with the cause that size to the debris field? And number two is on your alien photo. Have you uh, passed it off to a uh, marine biologist? Because I believe what your, yeah, uh, that photo you have is of, of a devilfish or a skate. It's called a devilfish or a skate. Well, uh, look, the photo is soon going to be available to everybody, marine biologists, you, everybody else. So until we, until you see it, it's it's kind of a hard call, isn't it? Well, you described it, what you described, I just saw it, a, a seashell sea store up there. Okay. The Very wall. good. Well, then uh, when we get the photo out, you can so declare it, sir. Yeah, okay. All right? All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Kevin, um, any comments? Um... I, I get it. We you, just don't... He was asking you about the possibility of another craft or a small... Yes, yes, I know. And, and, and the thing is, we just don't have enough, enough information. We've got a field of metallic debris. We've got a, an area, an impact site where, where craft and bodies were found. We don't know what else was picked up there. We, we're, we're basing it on the eyewitness testimony of the people who were involved. And until we can get better, better data, it's very hard to guess exactly why we had such a large field of metallic debris. Mm -hmm. Uh, we know it was there because it was described by a number of people, including General Exxon, who flew over it some time later. But we just don't have all the particulars at the moment. Is any of that debris available today? None of it is in private hands that we've been able to locate. Now, we've heard stories from people. Uh, Robert Smith, for example, said he knew a sergeant that had a small piece that he'd, he'd uh, stuck in a pocket. And we've tried to trace that guy down and had no luck finding him. Um, there is metallic debris available. It came from the Ubatuba sighting from September of 1957, uh, and that is currently held in California. And a lot of work has been done on that. The Center for UFO Studies, for example, in their latest, I think it's the latest issue of the Journal of, of UFO Studies, details the, the uh, work done on the Ubatuba sample over the last uh, couple of decades, and the conclusions are drawn in very scientific terms about all the various testing done on it, and that the conclusions drawn, for, the, for example, by the Condon Committee, that they, they showed that the metal samples were not completely pure, just do not make sense in, in good scientific terms. So it's something that people, people ought to take a look at. So there is some metallic debris held in private hands that has been tested and suggests that it was something not available on Earth. And then, of course, there's all sorts of other types of physical evidence, uh, landing trace cases where the craft interact with the environment, photo cases, radar cases, where there's some kind of indirect evidence provided. All right, Kevin. Uh, back to the telephones now. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hi. Hi. Um, when you were up the air, um, you were talking about, he was talking about the crash site and then the de debris field being 40 miles away. That was the part that was blacked out. We had the uh, thunderstorm. I was wondering if you could have him uh, explain that further. All right, fine. Uh, Kevin, you want to roll back over that one more time? Best evidence we have, again, eyewitness testimony, there's an impact site close to Roswell, 30 miles away from the front gate, just off, off Highway 285 north out of Roswell. The debris field is much closer to the Corona area, the, the area that Mac Brazel found. The debris field is approximately three-quarters of a mile long and maybe... Uh, two to three hundred feet wide filled with metallic debris. Now on the debris field we don't have the range of debris you'd expect if a craft had come apart, if an airplane had come apart. You'd, you'd have a wide range of debris but there only seems to be three or four different items that were found there. The uh, wires, the fibers that were described by Bill Brazel as, as monofilament fishing line that, uh, but apparently were fiber optics. Uh, some uh, lightweight metal that, that had the density of balsa wood and this lead foil or aluminum foil type stuff that when you wadded it up it would unfold itself. On the impact site we've got a craft that is uh, heel shaped about uh, 25 feet long, maybe 15 to 20 feet wide, and five alien bodies. And five alien bodies. 
Yeah. All right. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Yes, hello. Hello, sir. I'd like to ask Mr. Randall, what is the reluctance of the government uh, about releasing information that we're not alone in this world? I mean, obviously, something like that would have uh, an impact on the way all governments of the Earth you know, do their business. Sure. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Bakersfield, California. Bakersfield. All right, KNZR. Uh, Kevin, what about it? What about this reluctance? What do you attribute it to? Would it be the social disruption that would be caused? I think that's part of it. I think part of it is the natural inertia of, of, of the government to declassify anything that has been classified. I think part of it is studies done by the government that suggest that if we uh, announced that there were alien civilizations there would be some sort of a uh, reaction by the uh, by the people I know that the Brookings Institution did a study in 1962 mm -hmm. where they interviewed representatives of various di disciplines such as anthropologists economists theologians what would happen if if there was a confrontation between people of earth and an alien race right uh, not necessarily face to face but through radio astronomy and it, they, they determined it would be disastrous for our society we believe that the reason it was originally classified was uh, they didn't know what they were dealing with. There's a line in the Roswell movie that I absolutely love where they're sitting around talking about this, and one of the generals said, well, the people would think that we're not in control of the skies, and the Secretary of Defense uh, says, and they'd be right. And so that may be part of it as well. But we also understand that when they were attempting to, to hide things, the government, the military, the government representatives went in and threatened people. Frankie Rowe, who was 12 at the time, was told that if she ever talked about what she'd seen, she'd be taken out in the desert and she wouldn't come home. Glenn Dennis, the Roswell mortician, was told they would be picking his bones out of the sand. The, the Chavez County Sheriff was told that not only would he be killed, but the entire family would be eliminated. So there was a, a large number of civil rights violations that were involved in this as well. And, and I just read a couple of interesting things that Ken Jeffries um, sent to me that dealt with the, the, the hiding of the fact that there may have been living... American POWs left behind in Vietnam and Laos when the war ended in the uh, early 70s. And, and that was one of the questions that, that came up. Why do they continue to hide this stuff? And Hotting Carter III, in an article that he did, said it, it, it makes no sense to continue to classify stuff when, when the Soviet Union has collapsed, that the Cold War has ended, and yet we continue to classify stuff and hold things that classified they clearly have no relevance in the, in the world today. Why do you think we're doing that? Do you think it's just um, this Nobody whole... makes a decision. Nobody wants uh -huh. to decide this should be released and this shouldn't be released. We, we found evidence of a, of, a, of a first aid manual that talked about mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation that had been classified in, in, during the, the, the Second World War still being classified. For God's sakes, we're so far beyond mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, it's unbelievable, yet that stuff is still held in cla uh, classified. And it's costing us billions of dollars a year to hold this stuff in class, at the levels of classification they're held at when they have absolutely no relevance. And so if they're doing that with things that have no relevance, what about the stuff that could have an impact on our civilization and our society, like an announcement that there are... Uh, that we have been visited by beings from another planet. Absolutely right. All right. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Good evening. This is Mark from Cogo in San Diego. Hi, Mark. Um, I wanted to ask Kevin if, if he found any evidence of um, what I guess what Richard Hoagland would say is hyperdimensionality and uh, any sort of uh, um, uh, double-inscribed tetrahedron and... Uh, and uh, if there could be any connection uh, with uh, the structures on the moon. All right, thank you. Uh, are you familiar with the research of oh, Richard Hoagland? Absolutely. Uh -huh. absolutely. Um, there is, again, there, 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 we have found absolutely no connections between Roswell and, and, and the structures on the moon or the face on Mars, which doesn't mean there aren't any. We, just ha we haven't found them, and that's not an area that we've really gone into because it's very hard to draw those conclusions without some kind of additional information provided by what was found at, at Roswell. My belief is that it, it, there's a 95% probability that what was found at Roswell was extraterrestrial. There's probably a 4% chance that it was an interdimensional type of craft. It's still extraterrestrial, if you will, but, but not the classic nuts and bolts explanation we would think. And then there's probably about a 1% chance that it's time travelers from the Earth's future. Uh, so, so clearly we're dealing with something extremely unusual that has no basis in our society, oh, yes. but, but comes from outside. But I think the, the most 
logical explanation based on the evidence that we have is it's extraterrestrial, meaning interstellar, as opposed to interdimensional or something else. All right, very good. Let's keep moving. Um, there are a lot of people talking about this interdimensional business now, and uh, it seems, frankly, as likely as it does that they, you know, come from someplace else. Uh, to me, on the uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hi. Oh yeah. Hi, I'm calling from KOPE land. Yes, up North in California. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, now this thing that happened in Albuquerque last night at the uh, convention center. There's supposed to be, it was advertised as a, uh, an intergalactic reception, kind of sort of like, perhaps like, if enough of us earthlings would would call forth them to come in. Now, this took place yesterday. Now, are you aware of this, Kevin? Yes, I was. All right, what is the story? Well, it's just, it was just a... Uh, uh, um a gathering that they had in Albuquerque, and there was an opera. We, we we thought we were going to have an opportunity to actually be there, and it just didn't work out for us, uh, given everything else that was going on this week that we had to, had to do. Um, but we were aware that there was a, that organization meeting going on in Albuquerque. Well, do you know what what were they formed for? What did they do? Uh, that I don't know. Huh. Odd. Um, all right. Very good. Uh, let's keep moving here on the wild card line. You're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hello. Radio Free America. Hello. Uh, I've got two questions, Art. One would be uh, what the witnesses described as the aliens to uh, look like. And the other is on the 48 hours piece uh, that I uh, was talking about Roswell, the witness said that she had uh, seen uh, the, the, the form of the metal it poured out like a liquid. My question is, how uh, would uh, something uh, that is made of that molecular structure a break up if it if it could form itself into a liquid. Now I'll uh, listen to your answer. Thank you. All right, very good. Uh, well, I, um, the uh, forty hours. Well, she said that it, it unfolded itself with a, a fluid motion, or like water flowing. That's her description of how it unfolded itself. And I don't think there was a suggestion that the metal actually turned into any, into any kind of liquid. Right. It was merely her perception of how it uh, 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 reformed itself. And what was the other question? I. No, I'm sorry. He's he's gone now. And you don't remember either. No, 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 no. <laughs> I usually I do better than that. I lost I lost the first part listening to the second part. And uh, <laughs> all right, uh, sorry uh, yeah, about I'm, that. I'm terribly sorry, caller. We both blew it off. Um, on the uh, toll free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hello. Hi, Art. <clears throat> this is Martin up in Anchorage. Hi, Martin, Anchorage, Alaska. Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, yeah, I got uh, about 50 questions. I'll narrow it to about two or three. Um, uh, the origin of these folks, I'd, I'd like you to give us your opinion on that. Uh, you touched on time travel. I think that, <clears throat> excuse me, that's an interesting aspect. And uh, one that if they're not from our future, they if they have the capacity to time travel, then just about anything is possible. I'd like you to comment on that. Also, uh, Bob Lazar, what you think of him? Well, now, let's not, I, I don't want okay. a whole lot of enough? this here. Uh, let me leave you on the line, sure. and uh, Kevin, deal with what you remember. Well, I actually remember the other question. You want to know what they look like. Yeah, that's, oh, that's right, that's <laughs> right. But, but um, what, would, what was the... the uh, uh, I, the, the time Where travel aspect, the time travel from? aspect, I think, is one that is is, is fascinating, but it, it leads to all kinds of, of of additional problems, and I think that it's probably unlikely that that's what what we're dealing with here is our time traveling. Uh, it's just it's just one of the possibilities, and I think there's a very remote, very remote possibility that that's that's what we're dealing with here. Uh, what else would you like to know? Uh, where you think they would be from then? Uh, oh, I, I, th there is nothing that we have that gives us a clue uh, based on the, on the evidence that we got from Roswell and what the witnesses could tell us about it. The only clue that I've ever heard that that uh, suggests anything, of course, was the Betty Hill star map that suggested Zeta 1, Zeta 2, or Articuli. And I don't think that's a, a, a real good clue. It's, it's an interesting clue, but I don't think it's a, a very good one. So we really don't know where they're from. The question becomes is if you can travel interstellar distances, does the length of, 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 the, tra of the trip become relevant? In other words, is it as easy to travel 8 or 10 light years as it would be 100 light years or 200 light years? And if that's the case, then, of course, it could be from practically anywhere. If I was to speculate, I would speculate they're probably within 40 light years of Earth, and there's a number of very good star systems around, or stars around, 
that are, are um, like the sun that would suggest that's maybe where they're from, but it's all very speculative. Yes, uh, of course, you have the wide uh, uh, testimony of people calling them greys, and, and uh, of course, Bob Lazar's testimony saying that they're from Zeta Reticuli and, and all that, of course. I, I think that the thing with the greys, what the, the, the beings found at, at Roswell clearly were not greys. Uh, to get back to the other caller's question briefly is, they were four and a half to five and a half feet tall, the head slightly larger than human head, the eyes slightly heart larger than human eyes, but not big black orbs. Uh, the bones were very uh, thin and fragile, described as bird-like. They were very thin individuals. Um, you know, they had no hair, but they had the peach fuzz. So there, there's a real quick description of what we've been told. All right. Uh, by our standards, then, that would make them very fragile beings, wouldn't it? They seem to be very fragile, yes. And they, um, uh, but, but again, without better information from the autopsy, I mean, we talked about the outward structures and what they look like. Uh, from that point of view, but we have very limited information of any, any of the internal structures or things like that. I think Len Stringfield has done some work that suggested they had a big heart-lung pumping station that pumped a clear, clear fluid through the bodies, but they mm. didn't have a, the separate organs like we do for the heart and the lung. Uh, but we have very limited information on that. Still, somehow, it's nice to think of them as, by human standards, kind of glass-jawed. In other words, we could take one swipe at them and probably knock them across the room and break several bones. And, and the question that I like to speculate on is, what is if, if, if you're an alien race and you want to introduce yourself to another civilization, what is the most non-threatening way of doing it? Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's with a crash ship and dead bodies because it proves that you're fallible. And, of course, the, the, the problem with that theory is, well, they tried it in New Mexico. It was covered up by the government. Why didn't they try it somewhere else where it couldn't have been covered up by the government? So, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's interesting areas to speculate in, but it, it doesn't really get us very far. So we're, we're, we're dealing with uh, information specifically about the craft, cra crashed craft and the bodies. And when we start doing some of the other work, we're, we're getting into areas of speculation. All right, Kevin, very good. Back to the phone lines on the wild card line. You're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Steve, and I'm from San Diego, Kogo Radio. Excellent, Steve. Uh, I wanted to ask him, uh, how about the intimidation that seems to uh, go hand-in-hand in hand with these type of sightings with Roswell, and what, what was the level of government intimidation, and also... Where, what level of administration, what level have, have people such as yourself uh, advanced the cause to get this administration to open up the books or Freedom of Information Act? All right. Well, what we've done, the Freedom of Information Act, I, I just counted up the number of, of ones I've filed myself just yesterday because I was filing a couple more. Freedom of Information get you to a point and then they, the government if they don't want to answer they say well we have no documents if you feel that this answer is not right you can appeal or we can either confirm nor deny the existence of these documents and you have to appeal and you end up in a court so they, they can they can pretty well shut you down if they don't want to talk to you about that um, the, the intimidation clearly um, many of the civilians who had some knowledge of it were threatened by the government if they talked about it they would be killed if Frankie Rowe, for example, was alone on that, she was 12 years old when this took place, the government came, the uh, military people came to her house, told her that if she ever talked about it, she'd be taken out in the desert. Now, you can say, well, she was 12 years old, she misunderstood what was being said to her, she overreacted to it. But she's not alone. There was Glenn Dennis, who was 22 years old. There's the sheriff's family who remembered these events. So there was a, a level of intimidation that was directed at the civilians. The military people were reminded that they had taken various oaths, that they were cleared for classified material, and as if they talked about it, they could end up in jail. All right, what about you, Kevin? I mean, uh, you're writing about this. You're digging into it. At what point during the investigation did a couple of guys in suits come to you and say, all right, Kevin, cool it, you know, or you're going to be in the desert? Well, I always thought what the, what the military would do is call me to active duty and say, here's the stuff, it's classified, you can't talk about it, tough luck. You right, know? right. And then Don would be out there by himself with me just saying, well, if I was you, I'd look at uh, that sort of thing. But, but again, if they do that sort of thing, then it's a tacit admission that what we're doing is, is accurate and correct, and the best <laughs> move is to leave us alone. Uh, and that's exactly what they're doing. So time, time taken care of a lot for them. Yeah, I think so. And, and, and again, this, this, this brilliantly orchestrated cover story that they started uh, and, and, the, and the curtain of ridicule that they've, they've pushed down on, on UFO siders works wonders for us. We, 
did the Chicago Tribune, for example... No, it, we're going to have to hold it there, Kevin. Sure. We'll, we'll come back to that point. It does work wonders. There is no question. This is Dreamland on a Sunday evening. I'm Art Bell. More in a moment. All right. Um, is there anything that I have neglected thus far to ask you about that really is important to get out? I think one of the things we need to look at is the emerging theory that what was found at uh, Roswell, specifically on the Mac Brazel debris field, was nothing more extraordinary than a Project Mogul balloon. That seems to be the latest theory that surfaced in the last few weeks. What is a, what is a Project Mogul balloon? Project Mogul was a constant level balloon project designed specifically to put an instrument package up in the atmosphere to monitor the, the uh, Soviet experimentation with atomic weapons. Oh. And these were launched in June, some of them were launched in, June, in July of 1947, and the emerging theory by some is that what was founded by Brazel was nothing more extraordinary than this Project Mogul balloon. But what they've really done is reinvent the balloon explanation. They, they've ignored a large body of testimony to, to get to that point, accepted some testimony from three specific witnesses, Bessie Brazel, Schreiber, the, um, Jason Callahan, and a, a fellow identified only as reluctant, but, but without good evidence to, to support it. But more importantly, the, the documentation available shows that uh, they believe it was balloon launch number nine, but they cannot prove there was any balloon launch number nine. Uh -huh. And there's some documentation that came out of uh, Project Sign in the Cambridge Research Station run by the Air Materiel Command, uh, dated April of 1949, that also fails to mention any balloon launch number nine. So we've built a foundation for this, this Project Mogul balloon on... on uh, uh, the, the, the will, will of the wisps, if you will. There's just there's no solid evidence that there was a balloon launch number nine that would account for the Brazel Ranch. Yet there are people who accept balloon launch number nine as the explanation for at least the debris field that was found by Roswell, uh, found out by Brazel. All right, um, back to the phones uh, on the toll-free line. You're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Where are you, sir? Uh, out of Seattle. Seattle. All right. Okay. My my question is. Uh, I, I saw the movie and read the book, and uh, in the movie, the Townsend character tells him that one of the uh, occupants lived and passed on information. I want to know how much truth or fiction that they've been able to ascertain to that. And um, well, let's just go with that. All right, let's just go with that. Good, uh, Kevin. We have some testimony. Uh, second hand that one survived and we, we put that information in the in the book because we thought it was important for people to to hear that testimony that, that one may have survived the crash we have since learned from another witness an eyewitness um, found by Don Ecker that he believes one survived the crash so we're getting a larger body of evidence that one survived presently or to be grammatically correct at the present we believe that all were killed in, in, in the crash, but there is a growing body of testimony that suggests one may have survived, and we're looking into that. All right, I've got a lot of faxes here. Uh, here's one of them, uh, Kevin. Um, it's a two-part question. Two things bother me about the testimony of Steve McKenzie. He said he was an intelligence officer, a radar operator, and a key person to the crash site. From what I know of the military, people are pigeonholed into specific roles. How could McKenzie do all the, these things? Well, the, that, the, the, the reader is misunderstood, uh, probably because we didn't make it clear. McKenzie was not a radar operator. He was an intelligence officer who had been sent to monitor the operation, or monitor the radars at White Sands. And all he was doing was watching what was going on. He was not a, a radar operator. But when you, when you move into the intelligence field, oftentimes people are put in a lot of different uh, uh, situations to monitor things and prepare reports. But sure. the, the idea that McKinsey was, in fact, a radar operator is something that others have, have questioned us on, and so it's clear from the book that we made a mistake in not clarifying that he was not a radar operator per se. All right, good. McKenzie uh, said the military was monitoring strange objects on radar just prior to the crash, and he was ordered to watch the radar at all times. 
He said that even he had to rig a set of mirrors to watch the radar screen when he went to the bathroom. Seems to me like it would be really hard to see any detail on the radar screen from a distance through mirrors. Again, that's my fault. When, when McKinsey told me the story, what popped into my mind was the system of mirrors that was used in the movie Real Genius when they were trying to get the laser to bounce outside the, the house. Right. What he said was, and, he, and, he, and he's made this clear to me since then many, many times, what he said was there was one mirror they put up because there was a warning light. If something happened in the radar room, that the, 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 the operator or somebody had flipped the switch and there were, a, a, a warning light would go on to show which screen was active and what was going on, and the, the mirror was set up to, so that they could see that warning light in case it came on. All right, so this... that, was some, that was a mistake that I made and shouldn't be uh, blamed uh, on. All right, uh, very good of you to admit it. Uh, this is from John in Portland. And finally, if the crash and cleanup have been going on for uh, two days before the press release, if they wanted to keep it secret, uh, why would they make the whole uh, thing even more visible by issuing a press release that they had captured a flying disc? It seems that, uh, according to the information we have, that, that the information was leaking out. Brazel had been into town. He talked about it to Frank Joyce. Joyce had put it on the radio. There were rumors flying around Roswell at this time, and what they were attempting to do was suppress those rumors. What they did was they set up a straw man. Yeah, we have a flying saucer. Three hours later, they said, oh, we made a mistake. These, these, these clowns in Roswell aren't smart enough to tell the difference between a balloon and a real flying saucer, and it killed the story right there. Mm. At that point, the story was dead. Nobody was questioning anything. Everybody was laughing at the clowns in Roswell. It was a brilliantly conceived uh, uh, operation, I'm amazed that they actually thought of, thought of it, but if you take a look at what happened, it worked brilliantly and would still be working today if Jesse Marcel had not spoken to a number of people about handling pieces of a flying saucer. All right, uh, this is from Jeff uh, in St. Louis. Would the citing information on Roswell be available to anybody under the Freedom of Information Act? In other words, how much would anybody who filed get? Once you mention the word Roswell, you've kind of given it away, what you're looking for, and you're dead in the water. Uh, you have to go at it at, at, in, in a, a sort of a clever way, uh, not suggesting you want Roswell. We have not found anything through Freedom of Information that would provide any documentable proof that Roswell took place, although... Uh, I guess I should qualify that. There was a, uh, a Freedom of Information Act request that went in against the FBI, and the FBI released a whole raft of documents, and hidden in the documents were that handwritten note by G. Edgar Hoover about the uh, disks recovered and the Army not allowing the FBI to see them. So there was a hint there. We still don't know exactly what that means, but what, you, what we've done is, through Freedom of Inf Information, is provide us with the information on Project Moondust, it's provided us with other links between moon dust and UFOs and things like that. So um, the Freedom of Information works to a certain extent, but it doesn't, doesn't give us all the answers we want. You've got to kind of approach it stealthily. Yes, and, and the other thing is to get, get the information, they say, now you have to be as clear as, uh, and, and specific as what you want so they know, what, they, know, they know where to look for the documentation. Sure. And we've, we've requested specific things. For example, the Jay West told us about a map that was at Holloman Air Force Base that supposedly showed two sites on it, the, the debris field and the impact site. And, of course, we put a fire, fire request in at Holloman, uh, to, to get a hold of that map, and they came back and said, we can't find any files. Mm. And if you, if you perceive this answer as being uh, non-responsive, then you can, then you can uh, appeal it to the Air Force. They'll look at it. If they find the same way, then you're forced into court, and it costs you money. All right. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hello. Hi, this is Ted from KVI. Hello, Ted. Um, yeah, I, um, just in relation to what you were talking about a little bit earlier, there was a couple of very interesting calls on the Laura Lee program last night. You might want to call her and verify with, but to relate it, it was a couple of people that uh, had had connections with people in the service. One had been an actual member of the service and mentioned something about the black helicopters, and he said that there's a an area somewhere down there in the southwest that they do specific training in regards to it, and they are unmarked helicopters, and they very frequently go abroad or through domestic places and cordon off various areas and do various exercises. All right. And the second call was in relation to uh, kind of on a couple of different levels, but dealing with the uh, far-fetched, the hollow earth theory or dealing with 
if there is an underground type of civilization or different cities and whatnot connecting like also with Area 51 and some various tunnels and stuff going on. All right. But he related that there was uh, some activity of various groups going down in small units of gr or four group, four people groups, and the government was kind of doing this type of thing. But they were it was very bizarre kind of calls. But all right, all right. Well, uh, there are many of those. Um, Kevin, what do you know about this? Uh, tunnel business. There have been stories for years now about underground tunnels. Anything to it? Well, we, that and the, uh, the, the hidden bases, I guess, is all part of that. Right. Uh, I have seen no evidence that would convince me that this, this takes place. Uh, I'd like to see some better evidence. Um, but And until I do, you know, you have to kind of sit back and say, well, it's interesting. And if you prove that the UFOs, flying saucers, can get here from another planet, and some of this stuff makes more sense because you don't have to leap that one hurdle to get here. But at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, afraid, afraid a bit skeptical on that. All right. From Greg in Seattle, why weren't the archaeologists who were near the crash site uh, presented in the movie? Uh, they didn't uh, reference them in the movie. I think that was probably just it. There was only so much they could do in the movie. Uh -huh. And, and uh, you know, frankly, I would have liked to see them do a lot more in the movie. And everybody I've talked to seems to wish the movie had been longer. All right, uh, the end of the movie, uh, Jesse. You remember the gentleman who met with Jesse uh, Marcel in the empty hangar? At that the, was at the, the Townsend character, Martin Sheen. Yes. Uh huh. Um, is there any indication that really occurred? No, none. That that is like the re reunion that Jesse Marcel was at. That was created to build a framework for the film and and provide information in the film and all right well it is important to know where they took dramatic license oh absolutely all right uh, good let's go back to the phones on the toll-free line you're on the air with Kevin Randall hi hi Art this is Brian up in uh, Tacoma Washington hello Brian hi um, I'm just curious this material they found at Roswell did it have a radar cross-section um, I'm an air traffic controller have been for 10 years and uh, I look at Mount Rainier every every night and uh, I've never seen anything, I, nothing weird out of the ordinary, and I don't know any other controllers that have. Uh, I, you know, I can go the same direction. I was an Army helicopter pilot. I don't know anybody as an Army helicopter pilot who saw anything out of the ordinary. Although, <laughs> to, to be perfectly honest, we did chase a black helicopter in Cambodia once. Uh -huh. But I don't think it has any relevance to the black helicopters we were talking about. <laughs> but... but um, one of the one of the theories that had been postulated was what crashed at Roswell was really a flying wing because the flying wing form has a very small radar cross section, right. and that was the big secret at Roswell. Not that it was a flying wing, but that because it was it it it, it uh, uh, detracted from radar. But I think our stealth technology kind of eliminates part of that that uh, that problem. And the materials at Roswell we describe them as metal, but they may not have had the same reflective capability of of, of uh, real metals, but, but again, McKinsey and others said that they had watched this object for a number of days on radar. So we've got some problems that we simply just don't have information on. Uh, so we have to speculate in various arenas. All right, uh, and this uh, comes from Dan. I like this kind of uh, question from Phoenix. Uh, Art, it is inconceivable to me that as large as the crash site was, that every piece of record, wreckage was recovered. No matter how many people police the area, I'm sure something was missed. Most likely some things were buried and likely still are. How about going out there with bulldozers, digging up the place? I realize nearly 50 years have passed, but I'm sure it would be well worth the, ev uh, the effort if the evidence is found. Well, first of all, we've already sort of done that. Uh, uh, clearly, stuff was missed because Bill Brazel found little bits and pieces of debris for the next couple of years and, and had a cigar box full of them that the military finally came and took away from him after, after he mentioned that he had them. We performed what would be the first uh, scientific expedition to the, the, the debris field in 1989. We sunk more than 200 uh, holes based on an archaeological grid system searching for any kind of material. We dug up the, the yucca plants that looked like they were 40 years old to see if there was anything trapped in the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the root system. We looked at the sinkholes. We looked in the caves. We looked all over. We found nothing. Uh, does it mean there's nothing there? No, you have to go look. We have attempted to do that, and we'd like to get back and do it again. The one thing we have to remember is this is a working ranch. 
uh, we had to dodge the cattle and the sheep that were on the ranch because it's, it's a working ranch. Yeah. And there's only certain times of the year we get access to the property to do so. What is the attitude of the present uh, property owner? Uh, the, the property owner has been very cooperative, but the, the one problem we ran, ran into is... Um, some kid trespassed on his property, not related to this at all, trespassed on the property, was riding his horse, fell off it, broke his arm, and then sued the property owner. Oh. And it cost the property owner $50,000. Oh, of course. You know, this makes no sense to me at all. It's like the lady that uh, scalded herself on the coffee in McDonald's and got $2 million. For God's sakes, lady, it's hot coffee. You should have known that. But but that that sort of thing happens, so that inhibits what we can do. But the property owner has been very cooperative with us as long as we don't interfere with the operations of the ranch. And we've been very careful to, to do that, to not to do that, not to interfere. And we've been very careful to leave nothing behind us when we leave so we're not, we're not uh, leaving garbage and trash around. Sure. All right. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Yes, sir. This is uh, Greg from uh, KEX, Portland, Oregon. Yes, Greg. I was wondering if uh, your guest is familiar with the three books by Charles Striver, uh, Majestic Communion Transformation, and I wonder why I never hear any of the UFOologists. My uh, God, that would be Whitley Strieber. Yeah, Whitley Strieber, that's what it is. Well, first of all, Majestic was a work of fiction, and so we can eliminate that right there. Um, and, and it's clearly a work of fiction, and Strieber makes no bones about the fact of being a work of fiction. The other two books deal with the abduction phenomenon. Um, what Don and I have been doing for the last five years clearly is investigating the case at Roswell and staying away from the abduction phenomenon as much as we possibly can. There are others who are better versed in that, uh, John Mack, uh, Bud Hopkins, for example. Yeah, I had John Mack up on here a couple of weeks ago. There are a lot of people, uh, Kevin, who feel the abduction thing is the best line of research to now follow to try to prove something. Uh, I take it uh, you're more of a nuts and bolts kind of guy. Our feeling is if we can establish Roswell took place, meaning it was an extraterrestrial spacecraft, then the work done by Bud Hopkins and John Mack uh, follows that much easier. They don't have to leap that first her hurdle of proving that the that UFOs are extraterrestrial. We've right. done that for them, and they can get on and do the work that they need to do, and we can find out what the hell is going on. All right, good. Uh, wild card line, uh, make that toll-free line. You're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hi. Well, Art, uh, I'm privileged. Uh, this is Tom in Mesa, Arizona, KFYI. Hi, Tom. And I want to ask Kevin uh, what sort of uh, methods of propulsion he may suspect they use. It's certainly not conventional Newtonian, uh, you know, throw rocks and go the opposite direction. I really have no clues about the propulsion. We have... Um, no evidences for that at all. I do know that Marcel, when he had an opportunity to use a Geiger counter, could find no evidence of radioactivity. I also know that James Van Allen told me that if you move a spacecraft through space at near relativistic speeds, that you are in essence bombarding it with hydrogen atoms and, they, and the craft itself should become radioactive. There's no evidence that that happened. Uh, when we get into the idea of propulsion, we just simply don't know. Uh, so are you suggesting then that any craft that had moved through the kind of space it would have moved through to come here would have at least produced something above or should have produced something above uh, background radiation levels? There should be. It, there should, the, the craft itself should become irradiated as it moves through space at near relativistic speeds. Unless there's something else going on that we don't understand, and I, and I assume that's what's happening because very few cases is there any kind of radioactivity associated with the craft, whether it is the propulsion system or, or the fact it's been bombarded by the hydrogen atoms as it moves through space. All right, this is going to have to be a quick answer. Chris in Everett, Washington, wants to know about something reported in the L.A. Times regarding a UFO fired on by the military, uh, allegedly. Have you heard of that? There's a number of cases where the military has fired on UFOs. I don't know whether it's a recent case or, or, or something. From this the... was one some time ago, supposedly in Los Angeles. Um, so you don't know anything specifically there, there about a, that? There was a case out of Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico where two F-4s tried to intercept a UFO, and they came back and, were, uh, and landed at the base and were, were isolated on the flight line and apparently had all kinds of little tiny holes in them. All right, hold it there. Hold it there, Kevin. We'll sure. be back. This is Dreamland. Kingdom of Nye. We continue with your calls on Dreamland with Art Bell. 
Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wildcard line at area code 702-727-1295. 727-1295 in the 702 area code. Now again, here's Art Bell. Good evening, everybody. Talking about the truth uh, with regard to the UFO crash at Roswell with Kevin Randall, co-author of a book by that same name. We'll get back to him in just a moment. If I gave up at 1-800-400-1999. Do it between 8 in the morning and 8 at night, please, not in time. 1-800-400-1999. And then uh, there is one more item that I'm back on the air again. Hi. Hi. All right. Um, here's yet another fax um, from uh, St. Louis County. I have wondered for some time about the involvement of Secretary James Forrestal in the Roswell crash and investigation. Of course, Mr. Forrestal was the one in the movie who received the men uh, mental message from the one living alien through the glass. I recall that. He saw, according to the movie, that more were coming. Mr. F Forrestal went from sanity to reportedly uncontrollably paranoid uh, behavior um, that somebody was out to get him. In the movie, the 12 men sitting around the table discussed the plans of whether or not to tell the people. Mr. Forrestal seemed to express the feeling that we should all be told the truth. Is that roughly accurate? What we know clearly is in July of 1947, the War Department and the Navy Department were combined into the Department of Defense, and Forrestal, who had been the Secretary of the Navy, became the first Secretary of Defense. He was in a position to know everything in 1947. He would have been told. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know how much, how much uh, else he may have known uh, from, from that point. So, uh, again... If you remember, in the movie, this was Townsend telling Marcel what was going on, and then Townsend said to Marcel, well, then none of it's true. Well, maybe some of it's true. So what we're, what we're getting there is the idea that this disinformation has been fed into the public. Remember the general sitting around there saying, well, we can tell them the real story from less than credible sources. Yes. We can plant stories. So they're showing that, that all of this is going on. So we just don't know exactly what Forrestal's involvement was or how much he knew. But clearly, he was one of the people at the top who should have known. And General Nixon, I think, even identified him as one of the people who knew. All right. Uh, did his mental deterioration, uh, was there a deterioration? Uh, he committed, the story is he committed suicide. Yes. That would suggest there was a mental deterioration, but we don't know what... Uh, we as, 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 as uh, laymen don't know exactly what uh, caused that, that deterioration. All right. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hi. Hi, Art. Where are you, sir? I'm in Salt Lake City. Okay. KCNR. KCNR. Yes, sir. Did you know that the 800 telephone system only gives you so many rings? And it yes, sir. We're well aware of it. That's true of every telephone system, not just the 800 number. Is there any way you can put an answer and hold on your end? Mm, well, yes, but that would make people angry because they'd be on hold for a long time. So we just go ahead and do it this way, sir. Oh, it really, really complicates it. I got a, I got a good line three times. Any, anyway, sir, you are on the air now, so go ahead. I, I understand it. Uh, Mr. Randall. Yes. A couple of questions. One is the radio announcer said that he knew things that he had determined not to talk about. Now, Frank George, yes. In the movie. And also, what connection do you feel this has to the not-so-famous crash site in the, on the plains of San Augusta? Uh, I think, for, for, first of all, Frank Joyce um, has said all along that Mac Brazel told him stuff, and he doesn't want to put words in a dead man's mouth and won't tell us what, what Brazel may have told him in that first interview. So we, we, just, we just don't know. Uh, my personal opinion is there was no crash on the plains of San Augustine. That story came about because of the Barney Barnett testimonies offered from his friends and that they may have understood what he was talking about. Our opinion is that, Mar that, that, that Barney Barnett came in contact with the archaeologist uh, led by Curry Holden. 
Barnett, in his capacity as a soil conservation engineer, would have been dealing with the archaeological and the anthropological communities, and at some point he ran into this story, and it has been inadvertently changed into a story he heard from people into one that he was a participant in. The evidence uh, from the diary, for example, that his wife kept puts him outside of the realm of, of uh, it being plausible that he was directly involved. We don't believe there was an event on the plains of San Augustine. We believe that was a mistake, an uh, inadvertent mistake, not a conscious mistake, made by, by uh, the original investigators. All right. Uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall, top of the evening. Hello. Hello there, sir. Yes. Yes, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from uh, uh, Ellingsburg, Washington. All right. Go right ahead. I'd like to ask him on MD Stanley Crutcher. In 1967 and 1968, or maybe 1966, 1967, in Cut Bank and Sunburst, Montana, did you ever do any research on any of that? Uh, no, I have not. Okay, well then, then it's not worth uh, bringing up to. I'm also a private investigator, been an investigator for about 36 or 37 years, okay? And I was just going to bring up some questions. On some of the things that they had there, on the UFOs, it was personal, uh landing there. All right. Well, uh, since we're not familiar with that particular incident, sir, I'm sorry. Uh, right now we can't follow up on it, but we may have a guest who can shortly. Um, hello there on the uh, wild card line. You're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hello, Art. This is Bill calling from Seattle. Hi, Bill. Hi there. Um, I have two quick questions. Um, first question is I have talked with this subject to a skeptic uncle of mine, and he always asked me, well, how could the entire world government cover this phenomenon up? And my second question is, are people in Roswell still being threatened today? All right, thank you. Uh, part one is we don't know that the entire world governments are covering it up. It may be just our government who is in possession of the information. But it's, it's, it's a good question. Uh, you know, is there some kind of conspiracy among the governments to keep this hushed up? Clearly, there well, I, I think Kevin, his question is more general, not just with respect to Roswell, but uh, the whole UFO phenomenon. If it were real, how how could all of these governments worldwide be covering it up? And, and then the answer is the Belgians, of course, were were just out with uh, the sightings there in the early early part of this decade, talking about it. They may not be in possession of all the data our government is in possession of, and a lot of the governments, the French government, takes a much uh, more serious look at uh, at the UFO phenomenon. By the way, while we're on the subject, there was a, an, an Associated Press uh, report in the last week or two, Kevin, that the Chinese government uh, called for an investigation into the whole UFO phenomenon. Had, had you heard anything no, about no, that? No, I, I had not heard that. All right. Well, I believe that that is accurate, uh, and I'm going to try to find out more. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hi. Hello there. Hello? No, no, are, are you there? Yes, I am. All right. Well, speak up. Where are you? Sorry, I, uh, Kevin Randall. I'm trying to, uh... Turn your radio off, sir. It's off. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was listening to the radio. must be delayed. Uh, my question was, uh, I understand that when Jimmy Carter was president, he was, uh, trying to get some information on UFOs, and they point blank said, sorry, you're not entitled to that information, we're not going to let you have it, and also Barry Goldwater uh, tried to get uh, in uh, uh, some uh, hangar out in uh, Wright Patterson, Ohio, same thing, government said, sorry, you know, we don't care who you are, you're, you're not allowed in here. No, we have, we have to take it at, at different levels. First of all, Barry Goldwater requested the information of uh, Curtis LeMay, uh -huh. as, and, and Barry Goldwater was a major general in the Air Force Reserve, right? And and LeMay, of course, was a four-star general, and, and and told him he wasn't entitled to the information, and LeMay could make that stick. Uh huh. Okay, I was aware of that. Carter, Carter was not told he couldn't have the information. I believe Carter was convinced that he shouldn't talk about the information, and uh, and that was why there was nothing more that came from Car from Carter. But as the president. Uh, you have the power to get anywhere you want in the government. That was my understanding. That's why I was wondering that when you mentioned, well, the government, you know, who exactly are we talking about here that, that's withholding this information if someone as high up as the president is trying to gain access? And I, well, I think the problem, the problem is, for example, the current president, Bill Clinton, probably has no desire to get this information because he's got other problems. 
Carter supposedly wanted to get the information, and it's my understanding that he did get it, and they convinced him it was best that he keep quiet. I don't know what they told him. That's our understanding. Now, he was questioned about that on a radio program in L.A. Uh, when he was out promoting his book after his presidency had ended, and, and that question came up. You were going to release all this information. You didn't do it. Why not? And his answer was supposedly because, I, because the investigation was ongoing, and he didn't want to release the information prematurely. That's my understanding of what he said, but he was he did get access to the information. Kevin, I always like to ask UFO investigators this, and I'm going to ask you. Right. If, uh, if you had the smoking gun um, or laid your hands on the smoking gun and all of a sudden, boom, 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 knock on your door, a couple of guys in suits, look, Mr. Randall, yes, you've uncovered the truth, but look, we have study after study, Mr. Randall, that shows if you release this information with all it implies uh, to the general public, there's going to be panic, there's going to be social disruption, a lot of our institutions are going to fall, and we're asking you, Mr. Randall, as a matter of national security, to keep your mouth shut. What are you going to do? I have, uh, my first question is, prove it, that, that, that's going to, that those, those events are going to happen. And my second question to them is, what happens if one lands tomorrow at the United Nations and you can no longer control the information? Isn't it better for me to provide the people with the answer that, yes, one crashed in Roswell 47 years ago, that, that UFOs do exist, and they sit back and they say, well, it happened 47 years ago. It hasn't affected my life. Why should I panic? But if one lands there tomorrow, they no longer have that cushion. Isn't it better for me to continue on with my investigation and provide that cushion rather than leaving it in the hands of somebody else that may change everything tomorrow so, and may cause a, a disaster for our civilization? Okay, so in other words, you would question the studies that would show that disruption. Uh, let me yeah. then try it one more way, and uh, then, then I'll give up and we'll go on with calls. <laughs> uh, okay, Mr. Randall, you have the smoking gun. Um, and, but we're here to tell you that if you, if you go anywhere with it, if you talk to the media, if you keep going the way you're going, you are going to end up in the desert not to ever be heard from again. Mm, I think you've now convinced me. <laughs> 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 or, or better yet, how about you give me uh, $10 million and I've never heard of the term flying saucer. Oh, Kevin. <laughs> All right. Uh, on the I mean, if you're going to take me out and kill I me, understand. then it, I might as well get some money out of the deal. I understand. On the toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Uh, yeah, there seems to be a contradiction brought out in the evidence here. All right, where, uh, maybe, are, where are you, sir? Maybe I'm just dense, I don't know. Uh, that's all right, where are you? Uh, Fairbanks. Fairbanks, Alaska, all yeah. right. Um, but uh, all the debris, it was broken into small pieces, and the bodies supposedly were appeared to be very fragile. Okay, if it's been showed that these pieces were hard to cut, couldn't be cut, whatever, how come it could have busted into so many small pieces and... You know, if the answer is well, hit with such impact and force, then why wasn't why were the bodies? Um, why weren't they just so much squashed tomatoes? All, uh, all right, all right, we'll tackle that. Well, I believe the answer to that would be there was a debris field, and then supposedly a second site at which the main body of the craft with the bodies was found. Correct? Yes. Yeah, and that may explain it right there. But, frankly, we don't have a good answer for that question. All we can do is report on the testimony that we've been given and look at that. And, and it may be that there was some kind of outer shell that, that was shed by this thing that accounts for the debris field and the bodies themselves were protected in the, in the, in the vehicle or whatever that was found on the impact site. We just don't have a good answer for that. All right, good. Um, on the wild card line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Good evening. Good evening, all right. Dennis calling from Portland. Hi, Dennis. Good evening, Kevin. Good evening. I'd like to use this opportunity. I know you're always, you continually investigate this case. I was wondering if you could update us on any new information or findings since your two books and your lecture here in Portland. Well, I think one of the things we need to point out is Don Ecker from UFO Magazine found uh, another first-hand witness mm -hmm. and, and that tends to corroborate a lot of the material in the book, and that's an, a, 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 a major find. I agree, but what have you found, or Don? Uh, I found another witness named Leo Spear, who was an MP at Roswell in July of 1947. He's in the yearbook. We can document him there. 
Wow. Wh what he did was he was not involved in, in guarding the site, but he remembered his friends who were, and they'd come back in the barracks talking about this flying saucer that they had guarded, and he thought it was just a bunch of BS until he read about it in the newspaper. Huh. And what Leo Spear has done is show the, the military involvement prior to July 8th through, through his testimony. So that, that is a, a, a find that we find uh, significant as well. How's that, caller? Very good. All right. Keep up the great work, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the call. And on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hi. Hi, Art. This is Kim from Olympia. Olympia, Washington, yes. And I have a piece of information for you and a question. All right. The information is on Dateline NBC on Tuesday. The uh, Clementine people were on. Yes. And they've seen ice formation in, in a crater on the moon. They have seen what? Ice formation. What they're calling ice? Yes, sir. A crystalline substance? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They that, that is remarkable. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I've been trying to... That, that is absolutely remarkable, and for all the people who huffed and puffed about Richard Hoagland, uh, you might want to note this report. That'll be coming on this Tuesday? It was on last Tuesday. Last Tuesday, they found out. And, and I confirm that that was on because I saw it as well. Yeah. It, it was fascinating. Well, yeah. well, well. All right, and you had a question? Yes. How long did the alien live for, the one that lived? All right, good question. Our information, and again, it's very speculative is that the one that survived lived uh, for a number of years after the event. A number of years? A number of years after the event, the one that survived. So again, the, uh, the motion picture may have, uh, uh, the demise of the alien may have been a little early. May have been a little bit early, but it, but it, 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 it did, did die within a couple of years of the event. But as I say, that's very speculative information at this point. We do not have good, solid basis for it. All right. Uh, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Kevin Randall. Where are you calling from, please? This is Kel from Los Angeles. Los Angeles, all right. Kevin, I want to ask you about uh, uh, holes in space. Uh, are these interdimensional, or do, or do they just go to other parts of the universe? You're referring to black holes. Yes, I had uh -huh. an encounter with a couple of individuals that... Uh, informed me that uh, they traveled through these holes. All right, thank you. Well, uh, there has been speculation that if you could get near the event horizon of a black hole... You'd, you'd pop out in another another dimension or another part of the universe. I've, I've heard that as well. Um, I simply don't have any good answers for that. Uh -huh. All right, first time caller line. You're on the air with Kevin Randall. Hey, Kevin, how you doing? Just fine, thank you. Uh, I had a couple of questions. One, I find it quite astonishing. Well... Most people aren't aware of what's really going on here, and Kevin has done a lot of marvelous work here, but this is what he is talking about is something that has been documented in multiple cultures for over 3,000 years. And i got a question that he's heard of this particular device, but this has been, uh, I could trace it back to Hebrew, through Greek, and Chaldean, many, 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 many different things of exactly what he's talking about, events just like this happening many thousands of years ago. I mean, even before Christ was born, these events took. I wanted to ask him, has he heard anything on the time resonifier. It's a device, to, a resonifier is something that picks up and locks on the amplitude, like when you're tuning an instrument or something, you hit a certain note and it makes the the the, the key uh, vibrate and it resonifies at a certain frequency. There's supposedly a device that's been created uh, called the time resonifier that, you know, everybody who's skeptical about it says, well, you know, that's 10 light years. Would you drive 10 years just to come over here and see what Earth is about? Uh, according to this, instead of, you know, having warp, one of warp, two of warp. All right, listen, sir, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, sir, you're going to have to hold it, sir. Well, he's not going to hold it. All right. Are, are you familiar with that device, Kevin? No, I'm not. Right. <laughs> Kevin, now uh, give the phone number on how to get your book because we're out of time. Well, the best way to get the book is, of course, the local bookstore, but if you can't, you can call 1 800 462 6420, and they'll be able to get a copy of the book for you. All right, there's only enough time to say thank you, my friend, and we will do it again. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Take care. Kevin Randall, author of The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell. That's going to do it. Remember, if you want a copy of this program or any other Dreamland program or the entire series, call area code 503. 503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-503-
6647966 24 hours a day 5036647966 good night everybody has been Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not that. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland. And uh, back now uh, to Philadelphia we go, and to Linda Howe. Uh, Linda Howe, an investigative journalist. Let's see if I can get this right. Uh, an investigative journalist. I, I, I think uh, for the sake of uh, brevity, we'll hold it to that. Uh, looking into crop circles, animal mutilations, that sort of thing. Right, Linda? That's right. <laughs> and happy Halloween to you and all of our new affiliates and everyone who's out there. Um, remember last week I interviewed Lassen County, California brand inspector J.D. Hemphill about the two cattle mutilations found on Susanville, California ranch October 16th. Yes. And Susanville is in northeastern California, about halfway between Alturas and Reno, Nevada, where we've had so many uh, UFO reports and strange sound reports and all kinds of things for the last two or three years. Well, since my report uh, last Sunday, I have received communications from two different residents who have noticed unusual black helicopter activity uh, after the mutilations, and some as recently as this past Friday. One eyewitness account is from Phil Leroy, a large equipment operator who lives in Red Bluff, California, which is about 100 miles west of Sinville. Three nights after the two mutilated cows were found in Susanville, Mr. Leroy was out walking his dogs around midnight. The dogs suddenly had a peculiar reaction to something that Mr. Leroy could not see. And all of a sudden, both of them, the hair stands up on the back of their neck and they start growling. Mm -hmm. and just barking under their breath. I call it under the breath. You know, they're not barking out loud. Mm -hmm. like, I'm trying to figure out what the heck's going on because I'm, I thought maybe there was some coyotes out here because we've got a coyote pack to run the creek areas. So I'm sitting there. And I can see something over, I don't know, 500, 600 yards from where I'm at. And I'm, it's a dark night. In other words, there's no full moon or anything. It's uh, just the animal light in the area. And I can see something moving up and down a little bit over there. Meaning like a light? No, there was no light. This was just a dark spot moving up and down. A dark spot, meaning it was darker than the night sky? Right. And I go, what? You know, so but my eyes are becoming more accustomed to the being outside. And I can see that it was what looked to be a helicopter. Anyhow, the two, uh, two, three of them all told, two of them split off. One hung over here in the area that I first saw. They flew, the two of them flew off, they, they took off to, the, they split off the pod, or the, uh, the group. Of three. Uh, the group of three, they split off, and they came across the field between my house and another house, which is about six, seven hundred feet between them. Um, there's power lines that run down from us. They just cleared the power lines. Now, this is what is the weird part. They passed over me. They were 250 feet, less than 250 feet away, I would say, or approximately, let's say approximately 250 feet away. Two helicopters large helicopters didn't make a sound other than I kicked up a gust of air and my dogs went nuts what did the dogs do? they just growling um, 
And they, they, when the helicopters got right overhead, they spooked and ran back to the house. Have you ever seen your dogs do that to anything in the air before? No. And your, what was your own gut reaction to this? Something weird. in that technology the enduring question for me is why our government which, which could get all the cattle it needs right. would be interested I, I understand an extraterrestrial connection uh, that there could be that or that they might go down to a farmer's land and snatch up cattle or mutilate them but I just don't understand why our government would that's right and what is interesting to me as a, a journalist and an investigator of the animal mutilation phenomenon over the last uh, 15 years is when you go back into old newspaper records all the way back into the late 60s into the early 70s and on there has been a, an association eyewitness association about dark silent always the term is used silent helicopters in the air above pastures where animals have been found mutilated these dark silent helicopters turn up 
uh, that that has been such a chronic association throughout uh, these uh, almost 40 years now that the worldwide animal mutilation phenomenon has been reported that one sheriff in Colorado told me when I was working on the documentary A Strange Harvest that he and others in law enforcement had come to the conclusion that they were dealing with, he called it creatures not from this planet, and that he speculated that maybe these stark silent helicopters that in some cases dissolved into clouds even, mm. uh, were some kind of camouflage being used by a non-human intelligence. Now, this man is not trying to say that. Uh, he told me he thought that this was, uh, that these acids certainly like helicopters, but he could not find a design anywhere that matched these particular ones. Well, if you'll excuse the expression, maybe these are morphin machines. <laughs> morphin machines. Yeah, well, if they are morphin machines, uh, if there's anybody out there who knows any, uh, any group or agency or uh, industry in this country or others, that can make such morphing helicopters, uh, I would sure appreciate a call to my office uh, tomorrow at area code 215-491-9840, or you can write me at post office box 538 in Huntingdon Valley, Pennsylvania. That's box 538 Hunting done, H U N T I N G, D is in dog, O N, Valley, P A, zip code 19006. Uh, my fax number is area code 215-491-9842, and I would really genuinely like to hear anonymously off the record or anyone on the record who might have any information about this strange helicopter activity uh, in California or any place else and how it might link to the animal mutilations. And for Dreamland listeners interested in uh, the books and documentary productions that I have done on these various kinds of phenomena, uh, I now have a toll-free number, 800 Seven zero seven nine 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 three. Uh, that's eight hundred seven zero seven nine 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 three. All right, now very quickly, Linda, I've got something I want you to hear. Sure. All right. Uh, I believe that I've got it queued up correctly. If not, we'll find out shortly. Um, after Linda Howe's uh, chilling Bigfoot sound, which I have had great deals of fun with. Um, th during this last week, a second uh, Bigfoot scream was submitted to me, and it comes, of course, across the telephone. We're waiting for the uh, tape, uh, as Linda's did, I might add. But I thought this one also quite chilling and a good precursor to what we're doing, and I wanted to get Linda's reaction. So here it is, Bigfoot number two. <laughs> According to the caller, many years ago, he taped it from some sort of documentary uh, on Bigfoot. Uh, but it was, uh, I thought, good. Well, it is um, It's interesting in the sense that it has a uh, kind of an odd sustained quality, but it is very different than that very, very high pitch yes. sound of oh, yes. uh, the one uh, recorded up in Snohomish. Either way, either one of them, uh, I would like to keep quite a bit of distance. Yeah. Well, uh, I have been getting even more uh, extraordinary uh, Bigfoot encounter reports, and there's one that uh, I will try to share on Dreamland in the next couple of weeks that I think will be quite fascinating. Excellent. Linda, we appreciate your report, as always. Thank you. You're a doll, and we'll see you again next week. Okay. Happy Halloween. Uh -huh. Take care. That's, um, that is probably the nation's foremost investigator into crop circles, animal mutilations, that sort of thing. Uh, now, coming up next, 
Dave Esther, Sharon Gill, uh, co-writers of Twilight Visitors. It is very nearly, as you well know, Halloween. And it is the time for ghost stories. Now, as many of you who have listened through the years are aware, my attitude about ghosts is a serious one. Because I do think they exist. And I think it is one avenue of exploration with regard to whether life after death exists. It's why we look into it. In a moment, Dave Esther and Sharon Gill. Now, Dave Esther and Sharon Gill, apparently one of the wire services, one of the major ones, we'll find out here in a second, picked up a story about them, calling them ghost hunters, ghost writers, ghosts, well, I guess just people with a general interest in ghosts. And then ABC News Nightline, normally devoted to uh, hard news, apparently invited them on the program, and they did a sh uh, show there on ghosts. Their book is called Twilight Visitors, and let us see if we can connect with them both a feat. Let's try it. Um, uh, Dave and Sharon, are you there? Yes, we are. Okay, good. Uh, you're located someplace up in Oregon. Uh, St. Helens. St. Helens. Um, what in the world got you two started on ghosts? Uh, when we moved to Seaside, Oregon, on the Pacific Coast, we moved into a house that was haunted. And after being there for a couple of years, we decided that... Dave, I'm going to have to ask you to get good and close to the phone and speak up good and loud. All right. Uh, that'll help a lot. Very good. Okay, good. So you, you moved into a haunted house. I yeah. mean, how do you know your house is haunted? <laughs> the first night we were there, we were unloading the uh, van and moving boxes into the house. And we'd moved in uh, a short rave radio and placed it on top of a file cabinet in the den. Mm -hmm. uh, the radio wasn't plugged in and there was no batteries in it. Uh, later that evening, we get ready to retire. It was close to midnight. And all of a sudden we started hearing music coming from the den. Hmm. Uh, Waltzing Matilda. Huh. And it played like, uh, like 12 or 13 times. And we went in, it was coming from the shortwave radio, but it was still unplugged, and there was no batteries in it. Bad sign. <laughs> Waltzing, well, it's just the beginning. Waltzing Matilda, huh? Yes. Interesting. Um, see, what I've always wondered about, Dave, now maybe you had an interest in ghosts before this, or was this the beginning of the interest? Is it, this was probably really the beginning. Uh, I grew up in a house that was haunted as a child, an old farmhouse that you could hear the somebody walking up and down the stairs. Uh, but you really didn't think much of that. And then over the years, nothing has really happened until we moved to Seaside. And that's when really the lid came off the bucket. Okay. Well, I, I take it it's going to probably worsen from here, waltzing Matilda, even out of a dead radio. <laughs> oh, it gets bad. <laughs> but, you know. Now, what I've always wondered about, since I've got a couple of real-life characters who have gone through this, I want to ask. In Poltergeist, in all of these other movies, um, nearly the worst has got to occur before people pack up and take off. Now, as for me, I guarantee you, uh, ghosts in my house, first sign, maybe I'd put it off to a bit of bad digestion or something. Second sign, I'm out of there. So you guys obviously didn't take off. Now I know you buy a house, you've got an obligation, but still in all, uh, to have ghosts in your house seems to me would be something that would cause you to put up a for sale sign and go somewhere else. Well, not really. If, you know, if the energy that you pick up from the ghosts are positive. You don't feel threatened. Uh, and I think that's probably the key right there. We never felt threatened in our home. Well, that's important. Uh, Not at all. We, we would watch to see what was going to happen next. The noises would occur every night in the basement. We would go down the next day to see what had been moved. What It sounded like the place was falling apart at night. In the morning, there was nothing changed. 
and uh, we never felt intimidated. Uh, it was more like a game to see what would happen next. And these are the kinds of stories that we've encountered over the last two years. Well, again, no offense, but in every movie I've ever seen, the basement is not the source of good things. <laughs> now, that's Hollywood version. <laughs> <laughs> and no disrespect for the stories that Brad Sanger has collected over the years, you know. But the, it appears the ghosts that we've encountered have all been happy ghosts. Uh, well, that, that's pretty much, actually, that's fairly much the case with Brad Steiger. He takes a, the lighter view of things, uh, though w you wouldn't go as far as to say all apparitions, all ghosts are good. No, definitely not. The ones that we have encountered have all been uh, of a positive nature. Uh, so, so positive are that they're like members of people's families. When we go in to investigate something, we have been asked right off if we're there to exercise because they don't want the entity disturbed. Hmm. They want it left alone. That's interesting. I, first of all, um, I don't even understand the concept of a happy ghost. Uh, the, way, the way my idea of the spirit world is structured, uh, generally when ghosts have appeared, um, it has been because of some trauma. Somebody has been murdered, somebody has died prematurely, somebody has died with everlasting uh, love, um, very strong love at a very important moment. In other words, spirit seem to be trapped on earth not for happy reasons. So what then are you dealing with? Well, I think those, the ghosts that you're talking about that are trapped here, uh, they may not be happy in that sense. But they are not uh, uh, angry ghosts. Uh, they are they are lost, confused, uh, have unresolved issues that they're uh, attempting to resolve, and in the process, they enjoy uh, pranks. Uh, poltergeists. Poltergeists. The the footsteps in the hallways, the cupboards that open and closes, the the dishes that move around. You put your keys down, they're gone. You know the dull prank that you would expect of a poltergeist. Spirits with too much time on their hands. Right. I right. Know. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to be content where they are, as are the people they're with. Hmm. Ah, uh, that's very odd. Well, I know what you've done for your book is to collect a grand number of true ghost stories, or said to be true. And I guess the thing to do would be to uh, have you give some of the best. I know, do you, do you actually go and investigate them? Oh, yeah. Oh, you do? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. We, uh, as the ones that are as close to us as, as possible, we do like to go and talk to the people and... Uh, share their experiences and uh, we take our equipment in and uh, see what we can get and uh, the last two uh, houses that we've investigated we have picked up entities on film on film on film now that begins to get my interest um, I have several pictures of ghosts as well we have published them in the newsletter I just talked about a little while ago and they are very good uh, photographs but I have not seen one did you get them on regular film or video or what? I got them on regular uh, one place it was uh, 400 ASA and right. another place it was 200 ASA color film hmm. and they came out very well, very clear well describe what you've got on, boy I'd like to have these photos uh, describe what you see on film the last one that we got are, looks like uh, a tornado the shape of a tornado Hmm. And energy vortex. Yeah. Funnel shape. The curving, and not only that, the funnel, uh, or the energy vortex, actually cast a shadow on the wall. Gee, I wonder if that's when warm spirits and cold spirits come together. <laughs> <laughs> you sure can't see them with a human eye, but uh, it, the film picked it up very clearly. Um, the other one that we got was a mist. And the thing that was unusual about that one is that there was a mirror on the wall, and you can see the figure of a woman in the mirror. 
But in front of the mirror, all you can see is a mist with a pinkish tint. Well, that's really interesting. Uh, do you uh, do you have these photos scanned into a computer format? Yes, uh, I, I scanned them in, and I've been people who've, who've uh, requested an email. I've been sending them copies. I, I would really like a copy. Um, are you members of AOL? Uh, no, but uh, we can we can send to your. The, the the problem with sending, I think, through the internet is it ends up in some sort of weird binary format. Oh, so. When you get to the other end, so maybe after the program we can exchange phone numbers, and I will send you uh, my ghost photograph as well. That would be great. And we could just do a direct transfer. That'd be fine. And, and we can, in fact, we can get some copies made and send them to yard. That'd be good, too. That way you I, can see the actual original. I can actually scan here as well. Okay. Um, all right, good. So you've got photographs, but, again, when you took them, none of this was apparent. What caused you to take the photographs? In other words, you must have felt something or known something was going on. I have to admit that the last place we went to, I definitely felt something behind me. Uh, but it's an it's an arts and crafts store in Scappoose, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And in going up the stairs to investigate where uh, there had been a lot of noise and a lot of um, the owner had felt a lot of of eerie sensations and heard creaking floorboards and various things. Mm. Going up the stairs, I had a very strong feeling something was behind me. So I began shooting pictures. I got to the top of the stairs, turned around, and just started shooting and picked up this, what looks like a tornado. And why, do you have any sense of why something would be visual to a camera and not the human eye? Yes, a lot of the studies, uh, when, you, when you go into some research on that, uh, is apparently on uh, these entities uh, are visible in a different portion of electromagnetic uh, spectrum than what we can see. And that's why some films, which are more receptive to the higher frequencies, it will uh, well, develop into. Because mm -hmm. so many of the things that we, when we're there, I take uh, the electromagnetic readings on a, uh, on a uh, sensor to measure the Gauss, and you know, I get your normal background rate, and it'll be a 0 0.1, 0 0.3. Now, is this a magnetometer? Uh-huh. It's, um, it's very similar to one. Yeah, that's very impressive uh, that you would get those readings. You remember the old Ghostbusters movie? Uh-huh. They were able to um, trap entities. <laughs> um, now, if you're able to measure a magnetic anomaly... You're, you're proving, obviously, something is really going on. Something is really happening. It's a good backup to the photographic evidence. But might it be possible to, in effect, someday, do you think, actually trap an entity? I don't think so at this point. And that's because uh, these entities that I can, I can find, uh, the monitor will jump up to... Uh, 3, 4.0, 5.0 from, from a background like 0 .1, 0.1.2 and it's there for a while and all of a sudden it just vanishes, it's gone. Uh, they, they move very quickly. Huh. And whether it's moved to a different location or whether it just simply, you know, uh, has dissipated out, I don't know. But when it's there, it will remain uh, like this one at the Arts and Crafts store. Probably for 25 minutes, it remained atop a shelf in a box filled with brooms. All right, what kind of control work do you do? If you take the same magnetometer and you put it in a home where there is no reported uh, problem or ghost or anything else, and you run it and graph it for a few days, do you see jumps in magnetic uh, anomaly? No. You don't? No, you get your normal background uh, spikes that you normally get, and almost always the spikes are under 1.0. Uh, so, so, so in other words, by a factor of many hundreds of percent, it takes a jump. It literally does. And the interesting thing is, Art, is that when you get to the center of the anomaly, as you go off to each edge, yes. uh, you maybe only have 12 inches, 15 inches, and it's back down to 0.1. 
So it's a very, very physically small area of magnetic anomaly. Yeah. Sometimes size like, like a size of a basketball or a football. Oh, that's really interesting. And and they're they're not shapes like 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 a human type shape. They're just uh, they're I guess for a better description like a basketball or football in size. But you go all the way around them and you move away 12, 15 inches, it drops right down to essentially zero, the background noise. Wow. And yet when you go right directly in center, it pops right up to, uh, you know, 400, 500% increase. Um, is there anything, I've heard many stories, of course, of, uh, I'll tell you what, we'll hold this for a break. Uh, but what I want to ask when I come back, you two, is about the reported chills or cold even cold to the degree that somebody can see their breath. That kind of cold that goes along with the presence of whatever it is we're talking about here. Back to um, uh, Dave Esther and Sharon Gill in Oregon, subjects um, of hauntings. <laughs> uh, all right, you two, um, what about this temperature thing? Have you measured anything or seen anything there? Absolutely. Uh, you know, if I... You regret for just a minute, Art. Sure. When we go into a place to investigate, now, we're, we're, we're amateurs, okay? <laughs> uh, we learn all the time as we, every time we do an investigation, we learn a little bit more. We take in with us the uh, electromagnetic field meter. We take in a sound level meter for measuring your sub-audio uh, ranges and sure. then the higher end. We also take in a temp, a uh, thermometer that will measure a sort of a digital readout sure. because you do get a temperature drop or an increase in temperature whenever a, an entity uh, is present. Typically what? Or is there a typical? Uh, there isn't really a typical. Uh, I recall one story uh, when we were down at the Liberty Theater in Astoria uh, that has three ghosts that haunts them. And uh, upstairs balcony, in one of the chairs with wooden arms, whenever someone sits in it, those arms get extremely hot. And so there the temperature increases. And yet down in the basement, uh, when you're down there, and we'd go down there to change some infrared film, uh, it, was, it got extremely cold, the point where you felt like you, the chills were coming on. Well, um, let's try this approach. It when you're getting a high mag magnetometer reading, the entity is literally over or next to the machine, I would say, correct? That's correct. Um, at that same point, are you measuring the temperature? And if so, how many degrees in differential have you noted? That I haven't done. We're so busy tracking the, uh, the entity, so Sherry can start taking pictures. Because whenever we get a, a high reading, then she starts snapping uh, sure. frames. And I guess it gets so exciting at that point that we just, we don't get everything done at one time. Of those people that will call you up and say, look, something's going on in my home, or we think there is a haunting, and you go and investigate, how many times do you find something versus, you know, it being a bust? Uh... I'm not certain that we've ever really found a bust. Um, there was uh, the one evening that we went down to Sellers Arts and Crafts, uh, and it was it was real quiet. We didn't think we didn't really pick up anything on the EMF, and uh, I didn't figure I picked up anything on film. Um, so we thought, well, we'll try again when when the activity picks up. Sure. Um, that was the night I got the picture of the entity behind me. Hmm. So... Yeah, I walked up those same stairs with the EMF meter, found absolutely nothing. Uh, it's kind of like they, they can come and go uh, as they want. And I think the one time we, we can find them is when they want us to be found. When they want to be found? When they yeah. want to be found. Do you, do you think they... They enjoy people like uh, Dave and Sharon and, ah, some ghost investigators, let's have some fun here. <laughs> I think I think that sometimes they like attention. They, it's, it's, they're like, like, like you and I. Uh, that's why you like to have attention given to you. But I think also our, we take a, an approach to our investigations of uh, respect and reverence toward um, the entity also because I think if you, if you're going in with with the wrong attitude
attitude that makes a difference. That's interesting. Uh, Brad Steiger did talk about attitude once. Uh, you may have heard him on my show. I bet you did. You yes, sure yeah. did. You remember the you remember the story about uh, uh, the ghost with a bad attitude that lifted uh, Brad and several other people up off the floor and uh, let them drop. Uh huh. Um, that came from uh, a bad attitude on Brad's part. <laughs> he insulted <laughs> the ghost. Um, all right, very good. We're going to talk about the nature of what it is we're facing here when we come back. You two rest. Uh, we've got top of the hour news, and we'll be right back. From an area near Dreamland, this is Dreamland. Department of Transportation and this station. successful home-based computer biz. So successful, in fact, that he was the subject of a cup of Esther and Sharon Gill. Are you two still there? We oh, are. Good. All right. Um, I think one of the most important areas to look at first may be um, what really is a ghost. In other words, I'm a great investigator, and I'm sure you are too, about uh, whether or not we have a life that comes after this one. It is probably one of mankind's biggest questions. And uh, if there are ghosts, and if they are the remnants of or the soul of a departed person, uh, then there, that is very important evidence uh, toward that, uh, you know, proving that afterlife. On the other hand, if these are fallen angels, or some other form of entity that never once was human, it is something else again. Which, in your opinion, is it? From the experience that we've had, Art, on the last two years, uh, the so-called ghosts that we work with or investigated and collected stories on have been, uh, for the most part, uh, the departed souls of, of those that have lived here. Hmm. In fact, they've all been Earth. Uh, they've all born, raised, and then died here on this planet. And when they've died, they've had, for one reason or another, a reason to stay behind. Instead of going on towards the light or through the tunnel or whatever maze it is that they access into, they've stayed behind. And a lot of them that we've encountered from the stories and from our own investigations have been because of, of neither their lost or confused, uh, unresolved issues, uh, are they watching over someone until they feel it's time to go on? Hmm. They're not, uh, you know, they're not the fallen angels you hear about. They're not uh, destructive. Uh, I guess when you work with ghosts, they're a lot like people. You have good ones and you have bad ones. For the most part, do you believe people are good or do you, for the most part, do you believe people are bad? And I guess from that uh, standpoint, it's how you can evaluate ghosts. When we go in, we don't make judgments. They're very, very upfront. We go there simply to observe and to document and to learn. Well, all right. You tend to come down, both of you, on the side that ghosts or poltergeists are generally friendly or good. But um, you say there, there, there are indeed good and bad. Now, so many ghosts seem to be manifestations of some tragedy or early or tragic death. Um, wouldn't these many times be the scarier variety, it seems to me, 
I would think so. Now, now sometimes it's hard to confuse. No, it's not. It's difficult not to confuse uh, maybe a ghost that's, that's tormented with maybe residual energy left behind because of sorrow or pain uh, that may be imprinted into the area, uh, which you feel in the form of depressions or anxieties. Well, how do you delineate? In other words, how do you know whether you're dealing with residual energy or an absolute entity? From our experience, it's, it's, but the only way you can tell is if you have poltergeist events take place, if the pranks are, are being played, or uh, you, you notice uh, ab, uh, unusual events taking place, where an imprint of, uh, of residual energy is just always there. It doesn't go away. And yet, if you have a poltergeist present, uh, Almost always, it's like they go in cycles. There will be a period of time when there's no activity whatsoever, dead as a doornail. And then a little while later, it gets very, very active. And that dies down and, and goes dormant. Well, that's, what's, that's what's happened at uh, the Earth and Craft Store. It has been very quiet for uh, a long period of time. And uh, now the activity is slowly picking up again. And that was why they called us last week to come in. Oh, last week? Yes. Oh, yes. And uh, it was just a couple of weeks ago that we were called to a historic house in Columbia uh, City. And uh, the people there said that the owners of the house had loved the place so much that um, they feel that, that the lady is there because she didn't want to leave. She wants to make sure that the house is cared for. Hmm. And the caretakers have seen this woman at her wood stove in the kitchen in her white apron as she did every day of her life cooking. Oh. Um, and yet people accept this and live with it. Now, if I went into my kitchen and I saw a lady there cooking and I knew my wife was in bed, it would bother me a lot. Um, I mean, really bother you. We can sit here and esoterically talk about these things, but if they actually happen to you, I just don't see how people could keep it together. Uh, they called us to Columbia City because the caretaker had gone upstairs to the bedroom to change the quilt on the, the big feather bed. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, found two imprints on the bed, mm -hmm. as though two people had sat on the edge of the bed. Right. They didn't panic. They called us to come and see what we could find. And then said, we hope you don't think we're nuts, but, and then told us what had been happening there. And they're very comfortable with it. There's no fear there whatsoever. Yeah, but we also had, had a story come to us from Ohio uh, about a lady that had moved, or, and her husband had moved in, uh, moved to Ohio from uh, Seattle for a job transfer, and they built a new house. Uh, and while well, he was away on business, uh, in February of this year, uh, they uh, it, it was freezing outside, very cold, and she was upstairs and she heard this child crying. And so she walked to the edge of the stairs and she seen this, this little 10 or 12 year old girl. And she was dressed in a blue dress and a white apron and white socks and uh, uh, black patent leather shoes, but she had no coat on. And so this lady called down and asked her if she wanted to have a coat thinking it was maybe one of the neighbor's children or something. Sure. And uh, the, the little girl just vanished. Oh. And she, the, the woman who, who, who contacted us said that she, you know, thought maybe she was losing a little bit or maybe just having a hard day. And uh, then a little while later, she was in the bedroom doing some work and she heard this little girl crying again. So she ran back out to the banister, the stairs, and she looked down and there was a little girl. This time she walked down the stairs walked up to the girl and she put her hands out to, to give her a hug but she was crying and her hands went right to her and she vanished instantly uh -huh. uh, and this continued for a while she thought she was she was going crazy I added to this the next time the apparition came uh, there was an old man uh dressed in uh, kind of like the uh the attire of the grapes of, of wrath, uh, with a hammer slung to his side, an old hat he had in his hand. It was like a farm laborer of that of a depression era. And they just kind of stood looking at her. 
and she'd have these visions of them. I call them visions because only she could see them. Uh, once when she was going to a Christmas party, they were in the back seat, and her husband couldn't see them, just her. She started going, undergoing psychiatric treatment because they thinking maybe something was, well, she really was losing it. Well, sure. And she called because she'd gotten a copy of the book. She'd read it, and there were many stories in the book that of very similar nature. And she realized that she hadn't been going crazy, that these were ghosts. All right, let's try this, uh, this attack. You said generally you don't, do not uh, exorcise or attempt to remove these entities, correct? That's correct. Um, in your description of ghosts in the first place, you describe them as confused, misdirected, or on a mission, but not necessarily pleased about being earthbound and not having gone on to the light or whatever comes next. Mm -hmm. um, would not an exorcism be a compassionate thing to do? In other words, when you exorcise a ghost, don't you send it off on the right path? Uh, not if it doesn't want to go. Okay. You know, um, the, the belief systems of ghosts and the belief systems of, of, of we humans are, can be quite a bit different. You know, if someone had lived, uh, let's say they were uh, a Chinese, and they practiced the, uh, the Buddhist or the Hindu belief system, and they died, practicing some type of a Christian exorcism isn't going to make any difference to them because they don't accept that. Huh. Uh, you know, they leave when they want to leave. It's been our experience that a lot of times these, that when they're ready to go, they're, they're ready to go, and just by talking to them, they'll leave. Well, what about the famous old movie, The Exorcist? Uh, based, by the way, I understand, on a true story from St. Louis, or the St. Louis area. And um, there, of course, uh, it became possession. Have you ever seen an entity move into, or have, it, have you investigated, a case of possession? No, we have not. Most of the stories that we've related to you in just the last few minutes are the types of things that we encounter on a daily basis. More the poltergeist kind of deal. Yes. Well, it would imply a consciousness because a lot of the kind of things uh, that you've been talking about seem to be practical joke type things, and that would imply that the entity has a sense of humor. Definitely. Emotions, consciousness. Uh, you know, uh, they, there are times when, when if you offend them, that the pranks become more severe than if you don't. Uh, if you're respectful for them, uh, it seems that they're just the pranks are like what you'd have from a seven or ten year old. Hmm. Just little mischief things, nothing to, uh, damaging of any kind. Just things that are annoying. Uh, Liberty Theater is a real good example of what David was just, uh, expressing. Lib um, Liberty if, Theater? At Liberty Theater in Astoria. Okay. Um, if you go in and talk about Paul, which as the manager really doesn't like to do because she knows that something will happen if you talk about Paul. Uh, ABC News Nightwing was in the theater with us. We did the filming for the show uh, before we left the theater. Um, the lady said, I know something's going to happen. I just don't know what. And sure enough, uh, the next morning they went in and the butter container had exploded to a point where it, the top had flown off, which they never found. But it hit the... Uh, uh, the chrome around the edge of the counter and bent it halfway up. Oh, brother. So it, it was a, a real impact, but uh, there was butter everywhere, and that had never happened before. And yet when NBC came out and did a story the next morning uh, when the uh, when the manager, or the next afternoon when the manager opened up for the evening, the popcorn had already been popped for him. <laughs> There's really no rhyme or reason. Yeah, see, that that's an entity with a sense of humor. Yeah. yeah now, let's talk about this entity that they, as far as I know, his name was Paul. He was a pimp uh, back in the, in the 30s. And he had two ladies of the evening that worked for him, Lily and uh, Mary. And, Mary. and uh, he threw one of them off the balcony when she wanted to get out of the business. And the other lady got her throat slit 
uh, in the uh, in the main theater downstairs. And yet these three still continue to haunt there. Paul has appeared to not only the uh, the manager but some of the customers at time and appears as a six foot man dressed in white, very slim, with a Panama hat, a white tuxedo, mm-hmm. and a devilish smile on his face. And as soon as you look at him, he grins, and he's gone instantly. No. All right, I'll tell you a story in a moment. You two stand by. My guests, Dave Esther, Sharon Gill, the subject, ghosts. Right now, the subject is hard water. It comes, uh, well, you'll see it on glasses when you try to wash them. We're talking about ghosts. And again, it is very important, and I take a very serious approach to this topic because I believe there is something to it as I believe there is something uh, to an afterlife. And this is one method, and I particularly enjoy these two because they're doing actual measurements and finding actual differences in magnetic flux fields and um, they're finding it in photography and all the rest of it. It's a hands-on kind of thing. Um, Dave and Sharon, is that the way you decided to follow this, as a hands-on kind of operation? Yes. Uh, when we got into it, uh, first is now the idea of writing about ghosts and, and uh, folk that's taken place. I kind of got attracted into it. I started collecting the straw. We got curious. Did you guys like this report? If a ghost is real, we tried to eliminate as much as we could that could be explained by, by, for example, if you're on on medication and you've seen something. Right. Or you're sick. You know, something obviously that may be induced because of of health or or medication. But those stories that uh, where the individuals were not on a medication, they were not ill, they were no sane, uh, started to repeat themselves over and over again. So you got developed a point of a common thread started running through all the stories. And that common thread kept saying they're real. All right. Um, you mentioned uh, a pimp and a couple of prostitutes. Here in the state of Nevada, where I live, prostitution is a legal business in many counties. Uh, my county happens to be one of them, my county, Nye County. And um, there are two houses here, which I won't even bother to name, but they have been haunted for many years by a ghost named Harold. And um, why, why do you suppose, either one of you who wants to answer this, that this kind of business, uh, I, hope, I hope that isn't coming toward you. Um, <laughs> that this kind of business seems to draw that kind of entity to it. What, what is it about that business? Any ideas? Uh, maybe it's not so much the business art as it is the energy that they feel there. Uh, it's been our experience that if you have a, a household with a lot of turmoil and distress right. or anger, resentment, right. you're going to draw in a ghost that feeds on that. And the repercussions that you get back are the more violent ones. If you have a family that's, that's I won't say normal, but has positive energy flow coming from it, mm-hmm. where they control their feelings or emotions, uh, they tend to draw in the entities that are that feel on that type of positiveness, and perhaps in those uh, establishments you have there, uh, there's some type of an energy feel that that Harold enjoys being around. He feeds upon. Hmm. Um. When we come back here after the break at the bottom of the hour, I would like to ask. In fact, I will right now. Uh, both of you individually, has there been any? time when you've been investigating something and it has scared the hell out of you no that's that's a, just, just give me a quick yes or no right now absolutely oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> all right no doubt about it all right well then we will come back good i mean that's really good that's healthy and uh i can't imagine working in that field and not being scared so we'll find out what it is that uh, scared them the most and take your calls when we come back from an area near the infamous dreamland this is dreamland Continue with your calls on Greenland with Art Bell. 
Call Art now, toll free at 1-800-618-8255. 1-800-618-TALK. First time callers, area code 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Or the wild card line at area code 702-727-1295. 727-1295. In the 702 area code. Now again, here's our bell. Now once again, here I am. Good uh, evening, everybody. This is Dreamland. Dave, Esther, and Sharon Gill are my guests. They have written a book called Twilight Visitors. It is a compilation of many, many ghost stories. And they are not ghost busters, but ghost, well, buddies would be closer to it, I guess. And we'll get back to them in just one moment. Um, well, no, let's do it now. As a matter of fact, I've got several faxes in already, you two. And uh, so let me hit you with some rapid-fire questions. From Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, somebody wants to know about altered states. You know what a, a psychomantium is, I presume. Yes. Uh, a sensory deprivation chamber. And would this kind of thing, in your opinion, lead to the likelihood of... Uh, being able to make contact with entities, in other words, altered states. That's a good question. Uh, you know, when you get into the state that we're like a shaman would get into uh, to access uh, the higher regions of the mind, uh, I can't answer. I really don't know. That's fair. I mean, I don't know. Okay, that's fair. Um, have you ever recorded any phantom audio from a mic in an empty room? This one actually comes from my engineer up in the network, uh, Brian. In other words, uh, have you ever put a microphone in there? We all know that sometimes voices show up on tapes. Right. I haven't, but I've had uh, reports in from people who have done that. Uh, I haven't asked for copies of the audio yet, but they have said they have captured on, on that. We do take a tape recorder with us. Uh, most of the time, it's too noisy when we're there. In other words, you guys are making noise. Uh, no, normally the family that, or whoever's living there is so excited about the uh, investigation. Uh, they just jabber on and on. I see. Well, that would make sense. All right. Um, now, I asked you prior to the break, what has really, truly scared you? And you might both want to respond or... Individually or together, I don't know. Put it individually. Well, I can honestly say that the uh, most terrifying experience I had was at the Liberty Theater in Astoria, and uh, the manager told us that she would take us on a tour under the stage. Now, this building opened for their first uh, opera in 1925, so it's quite old, and uh, it's like stepping back in time when you go through the front doors it, the uh, the air is different the atmosphere is is totally different like you stepped into another dimension or something uh, and going under the stage uh, the walls are signed by people like Al Capone uh, it was it was quite a, a prominent theater in its time and there were a lot of uh, uh, famous people that that attended various shows, but going under the stage, it was not only dark, it was eerie. The air was heavy. Um, uh, it it was a real strange feeling. A place that the further down you went, uh, the more you didn't feel like you wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. As you go further under the under the stage. Um, there are tunnels that run uh, like a maze under the town. It's um, like a town built on a town because the town has actually burned to the ground a couple of times. But uh, it was a place that made me feel very uncomfortable, and I, I told Dave that I felt like we probably need to go back upstairs because it, it didn't make me feel good at all. Okay, Dave? Uh, mine also occurred in the same... Uh, building, uh, we I had to take the camera down into the what they call the uh, the ice room where they keep the ice machine, mm. and that is the domain that Paul hangs out in. And one of the previous employees had 
had uh, blocked open the door with a five-gallon paint uh, can, a bucket in actuality, and while she was getting the ice, uh, Paul moved that five-gallon bucket and slammed the door shut on her and locked her in. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no lights in that room. It's pitch black. And so that's the room I chose to go into because I had to change uh, uh, the infrared, which, as you know, has to be done in total blackness. And so I'd walked in probably about 15 feet to the table, and then I had the door closed and walked to the table, and I unloaded the infrared that was in there and loaded some more. And as I turned to leave, I literally felt a cold air, a, br a breath of cold air on the back of my neck. My hair at the back of my neck literally stood up, just like you know I'd see in the movies or something. <laughs> and I was thinking, my gosh, this can't be happening. And I, it was everything I could do to keep them turning around because I did not want to know what was behind me. I couldn't see it, but I didn't want to, I just didn't want to know. I walked as fast as I could to the door because it just really, it chilled me to the bones. And I've, you know, I've been to Vietnam. I've been, I've been around. <laughs> That's the first time that I was literally frightened so deeply of something that I, I couldn't see. We had a, when ABC was out, or uh, we had a cinematographer with us who was a correspondent during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And uh, this man did not want to be left alone in any part of the theater. And they walked bravely in, but when we were ready to leave, they were firm believers that something was going on in that building. Well, there are many stories. Um, I, too, thank you very much, was in Vietnam. And there are many stories about not just Vietnam, but uh, most wars uh, regarding hauntings. And again, of course, in wars, you tend to get people uh, killed um, uh, in great moments of stress and uh, of, of various kinds. And those sorts of deaths do lead to hauntings, don't they? Yes, they do. Well, uh, all right, exactly. When we say haunting, now these people like the story you have in the book about uh, the Vietnam vet and his fallen comrades. And when each one, after a firefight, uh, uh, each one, each one of them came back and made they made him promise to fulfill some obligation. And at the time, he didn't realize they were dead, so they looked just like you know you and I did. And he, when he discovered they were dead, he took took him 25 years to fulfill his commitment of his promises to them. Uh, there are, are times when these entities uh, will appear in human form, just like they did in real life. And there are other times where you, you simply don't see them. They're mist or cloud or simply a feeling you, you get, sensation. That uh, It's very confusing, and it, it makes you wonder whether you're dealing with, uh, with sort of a remnant of a soul or remnant of something, a person or you're actually dealing with their soul which is trapped here on earth or maybe a little bit of both the whole area is fascinating and confusing and let's take a few phone calls uh... west of the rockies you're on the air with dave and sharon hello hello hi hi is somebody speaking oh i didn't know <laughs> yes. i thought you were recording no turn your radio off dear yes david turn it off for me please yes david turn it off i just think this program is absolutely fantastic thank you you're welcome. Am I speaking to... Uh, all of us. Where are you? All of us. I'm in Texas at the moment. Texas, all right. Yes. And um, I just came back from Europe. I lived there. I lived, uh, I came back about two days ago, and my uncle died. And um, I'm a journalist, but I don't want to mention that. I don't know if it's on now or not. It's not, is it? I'm just getting screened, am I not? No, we don't screen calls here. You're on the air. Oh, am I on the air? Okay, I didn't know this. Well, well when I say, when I picked up the line, I said, you're on the air. That's oh, an see. important cue on I understand. It. Okay, fine. Anyway, my, um, ever since I was a child, my, uh, um, I had these, these uh, feelings. Um, I could see um, spirits, for example, or people, people on the other side. And uh, when I was a little girl, um, I remember waking up and seeing these people in my room. And, um, of course, I went to my father and told my father, when you're three and a half years old, what father pays attention to a child that's three and a half and is watching a Dallas football game? None. So, and now, this year, after I'm 40 now, so this year, I talked to my next-door neighbor and I asked her, 
because I'd heard that she told she talked about these ghost stories and there were ghosts there and I explained how these people looked like and she told me you couldn't know them because um, you didn't move in at the time when this man died so evidently I saw the man you know that used to live there not in the house but the house next door as a child and now it's 1995 and um, are you still there hello Yes. Oh, okay, fine. It's 1995. It's fine, uh-huh. It's 1995, and, um, of course, I can see the other side. It's very easy, but it's very difficult sometimes, too. It's like a television set. You turn it on and off. You turn the loudness. Sometimes it's too loud. Sometimes it's too less. But my uncle died uh, three days ago. That's why I came back. And in Germany, he came to visit me. And uh, he said to me goodbye, and he talked about my aunt, and then he left. And I had another miracle story. Um, my nephew was also beaten with a baseball bat mm. here in Texas. And um, anyway, the priest came in and said he was not going to live. I mean, the doctor said he wasn't going to live, and the priest said goodbye and so forth. And I prayed, and uh, my message from the angels were, he's going to live, he's going to talk, and he's going to walk. Where the doctor said he's not going to live, he's probably going to die in the next few days, he won't ever never be able to talk or walk. And my message was, yes, he will. So I called my brother and told him my message because they know me. And um, anyway, after some time of saying that he's going to die, he's going to die, he's going to die. Um, two weeks ago, I talked to them again, and uh, they said that uh, he uh, woke out, he, he got out of the coma, and the first thing he said was, I visited my aunt in Germany, and as I was praying for him, I could feel him, and I could, I could basically smell him in Germany. And uh, I, told, I told him, well, John, you know what? You've got to go back to your body. It's not your time go back and I didn't know this but um, I found this out later a friend of his died a week before and these are young kids okay and uh, I said to this boy I said well God bless you may you go to God's hands well anyway like I said I talked to my my um, my sister-in-law and she told me well I just can't believe what happened here and I said what happened oh gosh is he alive what's wrong she said no he woke out of the coma and the first thing he said was I visited Aunt Anna and by the way she was fighting terribly with my with my friend and I said I was fighting terribly with his friend I said no 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 wait a minute I prayed for him she said no but he saw that as an argument and in a way it was true it, it probably looked like an argument because I told his friend to go because he wanted him he wanted my nephew to stay all right listen we've got to run here but thank you very much for the uh, story and and here's what it makes me want to ask you to. Um, you have taken pictures of ghosts or entities. Is it not possible that people like this lady, our, our brain is a fantastically complicated thing, making the best Pentium running right now look silly. We don't understand all about our brain. Is it not possible that some people like this lady are able to see what you can only occasionally catch in photographs. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's there's probably many cases uh, like hers recorded where uh, a person is able to see into the spiritual realm. Uh, their brains, uh, their eyes are seen into a frequency range that, that most of us aren't able to. Exactly. And our, children, our children overall uh, at a young age are able to see into uh, the infrared range where we as adults have have grown so far past that that we've lost the ability um animals cats especially yeah. react um it is true about cats uh, oh, you two yes. hold on just a moment we'll be right back to you i have cats and i can certainly confirm that cats are very sensitive uh to areas and things that we know nothing about can't hear can't feel can't see um, I don't know what that says about cats, but I believe it to be true. Now, I also believe to be true, uh, essentially what that lady said, and they just affirmed, that there are people that can see things that have developed, in effect, an ability that the rest of us, through the noise of everyday living, have essentially simply forgotten about. 
We'll be right back. How many of you two still there? We sure are. are. All right, good. Here we go back to it again. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dave and Sharon. Hi, good morning, Art. I'm glad I finally got through. This is uh, Bob in St. Louis. Yes, hi, Bob. And I have a story from uh, about 15 years ago. Um, my mom had died when I was just before I graduated from high school, and she died on a Saturday. And on Monday morning was her wake, and I usually set my alarm for 7 o'clock at that time, and about 6.59, a voice rang out in my room, and I'm a very sound sleeper, and it really is hard for me to get up. And it said, Bob, wake up. And it was really loud and very distinct, and it was neither a female or... Dear Art, as usual, a really good program. How did your guest get started in this field? Larry in Miami, Florida. Well, Larry, um, as usual... Uh, the answer was in the first part of the program, and it was because of their very own haunted house. At any rate, we're going to try and bear down hard on your calls this hour. Dave and Jaron, are you there? We are. All right. Um, look, I w would like to give you guys an opportunity to, pro uh, uh, to um, promote your book a little bit. Um, if people wish to get Twilight Visitors, how, how many uh, ghost stories are in here? There are 70 ghost stories. 70. And everyone's true. And everyone's true. Um, how would they get the book? They can call 1-800-WEIRD-94. 1-800-WEIRD-94. <laughs> That's a pretty good number. <laughs> we thought so. <laughs> I, I take it that you established it in 1994. Yes. <laughs> 1-800-WEIRD-94. How much is your book? 13.95. Very reasonable indeed. Um, how can you say, you say every one of these is true? They're allegedly true. The stories that have been given to us uh, are alleged to have happened to the individuals. And uh, in talking to the individuals, or, uh, our feelings are that what has happened has happened to them because they get very serious. It, it, it's like the gentleman you called uh, about that voice. Right. It's not something you forget. Oh, no. I know. I, it, to me, it is a very serious subject, and I treat it seriously. A lot of people uh, use this for a good laugh tagline at the end of a newscast or something. Um, this is a very serious subject to me, as a matter of fact. All right, let's go back to the lines. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dave and Sharon. Hello. Hello, Art. Let me turn the radio down. Here Thank you. Go. Do that. Tell us, where, where are you? Show. Yes, sir. Where, where are you, sir? I'm calling from Pennsylvania. All right. Uh, when I was about 13, not quite 14 years old, we had moved into a new neighborhood. And uh, after living there about two weeks, I was walking home. And I was going up a street on my way home. And there was a house to my left, single-story house. And uh, the lights, porch light was on. There were still curtains in the window. And uh, I saw coming down the hill toward me what appeared to be a transparent lady. She had sort of a yellowish green glow to her. Mm. And I remember her in exact detail. The hobble, how she hobbled as she walked, the type of dress she wore, how she wore her hair. And this woman walked around me in a circle three times, kind of hobbled. And I'm turning around, following her. And I'm in amazement. I'm thinking to myself, I'm wondering if this is what a ghost is supposed to be. Well, finally, the lady stops. She stares at me. She turns, hobbles up the hill, goes through the wall into the house. So the next day, I uh, stop at my friend's house, and he's not there. But did, did, wait, wait a minute. Did you say goes through the wall? Went right through the wall. Okay. Now... The thing is, is that my uh, friend's aunt's house was, you know, right across the street from this place. When I told her what I saw, she was iron she was ironing clothes at the time, and she looked at me, and she gasped, and she said, you're just trying to scare me. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, oh, that's right. She said, Maddie died two weeks before you guys moved into the neighborhood. I described in complete detail the woman who had just died. Now, they hadn't settled the estate. And I kind of wondered for a long time why that might have happened, and I think I figured it out. Now, sometime after that, my younger brother fell in with some kids, and they got into trouble, and they broke into that house, and they stole some jewelry and stuff, and they were all caught, and it was all returned. The only thing I can think of is that maybe in wanting to protect her house, maybe she knew somehow or other that that was going to happen, or she feared it. Sure. Maybe she felt that I would tell other people what I had seen, and it would scare children away. 
but of course I never said anything to anybody. Interesting. Um, again, typical, you two? Yes, it is. Yeah. It shows very much a protective, you know, when, a, when an older lady passes on, uh, she still is very concerned about her, her possessions, her home, her things. Uh, until until the result. In other words, uh, in the near afterlife, uh, our concerns are very much like they were here. Yeah, we have there are several stories we get where it's almost like when you die, you don't know you're dead. You know, you're still co going on conducting your business as you would have normally. That would be very confusing. I'm sure because you know, if you watch uh, and read a lot, a lot of stories have been documented where. Uh, someone has died and has communicated with someone, uh, or there's been a, a multi-car accident, and one has come back and the other ones have not, and they they all say the same thing. They don't. They didn't realize they were dead. They hmm. couldn't believe it. Couldn't accept it. Maybe because of the uh, the instant nature of it. I'm sure. You know, as far as passing through the house, you know, if they're an electromagnetic energy field, why not? There's so much we do not understand about energy, you know, pure energy. That there's no way that we can get a handle on so much of this. All right, let me ask either one of you about this. Would you say it is a good idea, doesn't matter, or a terrible idea to build a house on top of a graveyard? A terrible idea. I think you could probably expect about the worst. I know that out here in Oregon, a lot of places are built on uh, uh, Indian burial ground, sacred ground, and uh, we don't know exactly where these places were, but the, the people whose homes are on this hollow ground do experience some very strange phenomena. Well, even worse than that, Noah, we had a, a, uh, a nuclear plant built up here along the Columbia River. Oh, no. By a, by a major international company, and uh, it was built on sacred Indian burial ground. Oh, they hid no. the fact. And besides the fault line, we'll talk about that, but they uh, they excavate the bones and, and artifacts and kept it hid from the public. That uh, nuclear uh, facility is no longer online. It, it was plagued from the day one that it was built with problems, uh, with substandard material. It just had nothing but problems. It only ran for a couple of years before it was finally, you know, I mean, it was always the offline more than it was online. And, you know, I've never really given it much thought to you your question there perhaps by being built on the on the sacred burial grounds there's a lot of restless spirits who really resented what was being done <laughs> i mean you never can tell well it would seem a poor idea to me and again i i'm going back to poltergeist or poltergeist too i can't recall but it was awful i remember the uh you remember that one scene in the swimming pool yeah. I would never have made it out of the swimming pool. My, my heart would have stopped in there. Uh, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dave and Sharon. Hi. Hello, this is Fritz from Phoenix. Hello, Fritz from Phoenix. Well, mine is more like a statement. It's very unfortunate that we, the Western civilization, focus on the other side only on a large scale on Halloween. That's with fun and customs. Ah, uh, but Fritz, you know I do it all the time. Well, the, yes, the Adele show, but I'm talking the major part of our civilization. It is true. Yeah, yeah, no, ghosts, that's a good point, Fritz. But yet ghosts, spirits, and the afterlife, the way I see it, should be and will be in years to come, and I'm talking after the earth changes, that the subject will be handled like a daily weather report, very respectfully, because it's here and we have to deal with it. Maybe they'll change the name from Nightline to Night Spirit. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, he does really make a good point. I consider this to be a very, very serious topic, and I take it seriously. And uh, he, as Fritz points out, the rest of the nation focuses in on, you know, Halloween one time a year, perhaps. And it's then there are... a holiday setting for them. Yeah, yeah. And um, not really uh, so much on the aspect that we cover, the real aspect of um, uh, entities or ghosts or whatever they are, but sort of the dress up and go get ca candy aspect or the let's go look at the fireworks. Uh, well, that'd be 4th of July. But um, I'm getting my holidays mixed up here. But, but the mask and the candy business and all the rest of it, instead of this aspect. Well, you know, there is a, there's a different aspect of it over in the Orient. You know where they where they honor their ancestors, yes. and there are many of the of the eastern 
folks over there, uh, Asians that, you know, believe their ancestors are there with them. Well, I lived uh, on the island of Okinawa, and there is an interesting custom they have, uh, which I got to participate in once, uh, where at a certain time of the year, you go to a cave or a location, and you reverently clean the bones of your dead ancestors. Uh -huh. um, and that makes me ask again about the link between the place of burial and the entities. In other words, try not to build on top of a, uh, a graveyard of some sort. Uh, is it generally true that entities stay close to what was their body? Well, you know, that's hard to tell because when you become a spirit, you know, you're outside of the realm of, of, of space and time we have it. You operate in a different environment. And whether they can they can be next to their bones and instantly they can be, you know, a thousand miles away. Yes. Uh, but we really don't know because there are so many that do come and go as transients uh, and always in motion. Uh, but yet around graveyards there is a lot of activities. Yes. And whether these are just the new ones that have come and haven't quite gained the knowledge they need to continue on, or whether they, because the graveyard is close to where their home and families are, they stay behind. So it's hard to really know which. It really, it's almost like talking about aliens. Yeah. You know, you have the different races uh, you hear about, and, and you know, and some are good, some are bad, some are helpful. And well, uh, Dave, I'm not even sure, and Sharon, that there is a difference between what we're calling aliens and what you're calling ghosts. In some cases, it may not be. There are unseen entities or unseen the twilight visitors who come and go. Some are helpful, uh, and some, depending upon how they're helping you, some will call a guardian angel or a guardian spirit. Well, might it not, though, depend on your perspective as an individual? Let us say you have an experience and you see an entity. Um, some people might come away from that and say, I saw an alien. I saw something not of Earth. And another person might come back and say, well, I saw a ghost, or I saw Aunt Mary, or Absolutely. my grandmother, or whatever. Absolutely. It is all a matter of a person's perspective, because we have stories of a very pers uh, protective entities who have taken care of children, uh, and yet some people would, would label them as guardian angels. And yet you have others, like this, like this energy vortex I was you a picture of? Yes, sir. I mean, my goodness, how can a ghost be like a funnel cloud? I mean, that you can understand a mist-like cloud or something, or fog, because that's been portrayed quite often. But a, 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 a spin, a swirling funnel shape. Now, in the Liberty Theater, we captured on film there uh, a reverse spin vortex where it was, the spin was, was reverse of, of how it normally would be. And, they, and it was a, and like the letter U. It went down, over, and then back up again. Where this one uh, we captured just last week uh, starts from the, from the floor and goes toward the ceiling, kind of bends along the way, but there's also a shadow that's cast from it. When you have a photographic expert look at these, what do they say? Well, the, the, the first, the, the, when they look at it, the, the first reaction is that it's a, a chemical problem or mm -hmm. a developing problem. Yes. Well, then we show them the negative. And you don't have, uh, it's not characteristic of a chemical stain. Okay, it's right in the, uh, the, uh, the film itself. And you can see both the, uh, uh, the vortex, you can see the shadow. Where on a normal chemical stain from developing, uh, it, it's quite apparent if you look at it. All right, you two. Hold on just a moment. We will be right back to you. Dave Esther, Sharon Gill are my guests. They have written Twilight Visitors, a compilation of um, 70 true ghost stories. We'll be right back. If you feel the desire to control your own work hours, your work environment, be your own boss, choose your own work companions, then maybe you need to start your own business. Now, briefly, uh, before the bottom of the hour, back to Dave and Sharon. Okay, you two, you're back on the air again. Okay. Um, I'm glad that you are doing what you're doing. Um, very glad, because there are not enough people documenting this kind of thing. It's one of the reasons we put out the newsletter we do. You know, you talk about them on the radio, and it's great. It's the theater of the mind, and we can, you know, tell people about these things. 
But once you've laid your eyes on a photograph or had an actual experience, it's a whole new realm, isn't it? It really is. And we really enjoy your newsletter, you know, because when you, when you can visually observe an image, it, it, there's no doubt about, about what it is that you're looking at. Well, if there is, there certainly is less doubt. I mean, words are one thing. Photographs, magnetometer readings, there's something else again. And it's a particular area of interest to me because I want to know myself, as you two do, I'm sure, whether this life is it and then it's the worms crawl in and the worms crawl out or whether it doesn't matter and your spirit goes someplace else. Uh, we both firmly believe that <clears throat> life goes on. It goes back to the law of physics. You know, no energy can be destroyed. Well, only transformed, and so, and you know, we in the 70 stories we've collected, that we're we're working on our second book, collecting stories. We probably got about as many stories right now as we have in the first book. Wow! But they're they're more in depth stories. They're uh, we're getting a lot of people contributing stories to us off the internet. Uh, uh, no, send a story through the email. All right, well, we'll get your email address on the air. We're at the half hour mark. This is Dreamland. All right, back now to Dave and Sharon. Are you there? We are. Um, Art, could you ask your guests whether they think it is possible that certain locations on Earth are innately paranormally energized apart from any human influences, past or present? Yes, absolutely. In other words, energy, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, um, energy points? Yeah, grid points, energy points. Now you've got your, your famous ones like Sedona, you know, where is is reputed to be, uh, you know, uh, 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 a healing capital, uh, an energy dispersion point. Uh, there's quite a few of those places uh, that just naturally radiates the energy of a very positive force. You you do like staying stay on the positive side of this, don't you? Oh, absolutely. You can see all kinds of uh, uh, Freddy Krueger movies on TV. Uh, we don't do those kind of stories. We do the kind of stories that you can sit and tell around a campfire and in, enjoy getting scared. Well, um, that's interesting. Uh, I do enjoy. Have you studied at all why human beings enjoy scaring themselves so much? I, I wonder about it. <laughs> I know, but uh, I got a letter, Art. This is from a funeral director back in Pennsylvania. Oh. And he said, uh, in just in part, says, I'm just glad that someone finally took me seriously. I don't know if you have any idea what the burden of disbelief can do to a person's life. He'd seen a, actually he'd heard a ghost. And no one would believe him. And being a funeral director, you, your first impressions would be, why would that be strange? Right. Well, sure. <laughs> At least I, I feel that way. And yet, to him, it was. It, and, and by being able to tell me a story, he actually felt better at it because someone took him seriously. Well, it's cathartic, sure. Um, I would think funeral directors would be particularly plagued or blessed, depending on how you look at it. Well, there's one area in one of the towns that uh, is located next to a funeral home, uh, a neighborhood, and we've gotten three different stories from that neighborhood uh, over three over a different period of time. Uh, from each house, you could throw a stone to the other houses. Right. And it's just above a funeral home. Mm -hmm. And we often wonder whether or not the the entities and, uh, and apparitions that have come to those people have come from the funeral home or just... That's a coincidence. Interesting. Um, is there any difference? This is kind of a wild question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, in the in the hauntings that occur in cases where bodies are buried somewhere versus cremation. I don't think so. That's just my personal opinion. Because whether you burn a body or whether it decays back to the earth, the energy, the essence of what made up that individual uh, is transformed from at death into whatever energy feels that, that exists. So that you cannot destroy the energy, matter. You only transform it to a different form. So it's actually only the body that dies away. And not the essence of the soul or, or, the, or the spirit doesn't die. Well, if the spirit remains sometimes near the body, as in the case of a graveyard, would the spirit remain near the ashes in the case of an urn? 
It could very well, because uh, perhaps it, it, it's a resting place for, for memories. And perhaps that's all they are to the ghosts, are memories of, of who they once were. That may be. Now, we did hear, we did hear a tale about a, uh, an inn in Long Beach, Washington, where there's a lot of ghostly activity, and the owner, the previous owner's urn with his ashes still sits on the bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, that one we have yet to follow up on. All right. Well, I'm sure. What do you do, by the way, on that score? I mean, people read your books, and then I take it they contact you, and they want you to come and investigate. What what kind of criterion do you use in trying to decide, you know, we're going to take a trip to Pittsburgh and, and take a look at this house or whatever? A lot of times we try to line up sightings in a, in a general area that we're, that we're going to go to. A lot of times this story is, is how compelling is it? Uh, in our book, in the last three chapters, you know, we talk about how to do your own ghost hunting, type of film to use, you know, type of equipment you can use, help, hopefully to help others who want to explore the unknown to start out with. Hmm. Uh, and you know, even if you can't buy uh, some type of, of electromagnetic meter, you can start out with a compass. Essentially, the same thing will work for that. In other words, if there is a sudden magnetic flux, the compass is going to uh, be oh, overwhelmed from its normal north pole looks see and it's going to point in a new direction. Yeah, and depending upon how much it points is how strong the field is. Mm -hmm. so and, this, and not bad in the sense also that it would show you the di direction of the magnetic uh, radiation. Yeah, and you, so you actually can hold in, track it down, which is the same thing I do with, with magnetic meter. You have to you know, keep moving around to, to you pick up a field and then home in on it. You do the same thing with a compass. And we talked about the type of films you can use to buy, and which are some are better than others. And the cameras themselves really doesn't make any difference. We've had uh, the, the one lady who... Uh, well, let me stop you on that point. Uh, let's say somebody wants to go ghost hunting. Would they be better with uh, higher ASA film? Or what seems to work better in catching the image? The higher the, the, higher the ASA they can go, the better. Now, we've tried uh, the 3200 ASA black and white. Right. And uh, I believe it was either the 3200 or the 1600 that we captured an image in the Liberty Theater. But Sharon also has captured it on ASA 400. Uh, we used infrared, and we've captured sometimes, we've captured on that. But uh, infrared is real difficult to work with, mm -hmm. and it's real difficult to get processed. All right, let's go back to the phones. I did want to get that cleared up. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dave and Sharon. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Okay, where are you, sir? I, I'm in uh, Willoughby, Ohio. This is Les. Okay. And I wanted to say um, this is really an interesting program. Thank you. I um, have actually two questions for you. Or one question and, and, and one story. Um, I, I would really like to find a ghost. Uh, seriously. I mean, I might be crazy, but I really would like to do that. How do you go about finding some place that's haunted? Uh, with, in our experience, we just started talking to people about our own experiences. And overall, I can honestly say that just about everyone we've talked to have had some type of experience. And we have made contact with people who have activity in their homes at the present time, and when we tell them what we do, they invite us to come into their home and see what we can find. Well, that's because you guys write books about it, and so you get contacts. But what about this fellow? Actually, that was how we got started on our first book, was speaking of our own experiences with other people. And I would say just go out and start asking people, you know, friends and, and neighbors and relatives that you have in the area that you're in, if they've had any type of uh, you know, unusual experiences or paranormal events that have occurred in their home. And uh, a lot of times older buildings will have it. All right, there you are, caller. Yeah. In, in other words, ask friends. All right, well, the only thing that I've ever had that would be quote-unquote a paranormal experience is it's happened to me three times. When my um, brother died, when my two, my grandmother died and my grandfather died. Each time when they died and I was asleep, I woke up immediately at the time that they died. Knowing something know or? They were at the time until I found out, you know, usually uh, half an hour to 45 minutes later, someone would call me from sure. the hospital and say, you know, so-and-so sure. just died, 
you know, half an hour ago, 45 minutes ago. And so I, I really would like to pursue you know, it. Pursue yeah, I, I, I've got you. Uh, and so that's good advice then for anybody. Yes, it is. I just know, keep, uh, when you start it, have an open mind and don't be judgmental. Don't judge what, what you observe because we may not understand uh, why, why they're performing it or why they're doing it. It's like when you go overseas. You can't judge the culture that you visit by your own standards. Boy, isn't that so. You know, and that's one of the first things you have to learn. And, and I think they can sense that. If you're not coming in a, in a judgmental attitude, but an openness to understand, I think it opens the doors for you. I really do. Or, uh, and then you also stressed attitude. In other words, um, be respectful, be reverential, uh, do not insult the entity. Absolutely. The same way, the same way if you walked into, for example, the, the Alamo in, you know, in, in uh, San Antonio. Yes. You know, there's no science that's required, or, but you walk in there, and that's probably one of the most reverential places I've ever been in. You can hear a pin drop inside, and there are, you know, 40, 50 people in there. Mm -hmm. But everybody feels that reverence is there, but they're respecting what had, what had occurred there. All right. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dave and Sharon on Dreamland. Hi. Hi. I'm calling from Seattle, Washington. Yes, ma'am. And Dave and Sharon, I thought I might let you know that I was in the basement of your 12th Avenue home in Seaside just today. Oh. <laughs> Is it <Come> so haunted? <laughs> and I, um, did you know that there were children, actually? It was children haunting the basement? Uh -huh. Yeah. We had children down there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I do apologize if you get a call from the new resident because... We were just going to Seaside, had stayed only three blocks from that, your house, had drove to Cannon Beach, picked up your book, and found it interesting, went back to Seaside just to look at the house, down your, the new residence outside, that do not know um, that it was haunted, and we showed them the book, their jaw dropped, they said, yes, that, <laughs> that is our basement, so they took us downstairs, it's now a child's room. Oh, perfect. Good. Yeah, and, and they have not had any poltergeist activity there whatsoever. Um, but maybe if they haven't heard of it, or maybe it's calmed down, or maybe if there's a child with the children, I don't know if that would make a difference. Or maybe the entities left when uh, Dave and Sharon did. No, they did. actually, they, they, they didn't. Died. And we do have pictures in the book of uh, the people who moved in after us. Uh, they took pictures on Halloween night of their grandchildren dressed up, and they do have a film around them, a mist. We did see those pictures in the book, yes. Did you? <laughs> and I'm sorry in there about having a low child's voice respond back to my question of whether my daughter was down in the basement. Yes. You know, it was just as real, it was a real little girl's voice. We found this all very interesting because we picked up your book, read half of it, turned to our bell tonight and then heard you, but we'd also like to say that we followed some of your stories and we followed them all the way up to Astoria where we did go to the Liberty Theater. And I do have to agree with you and I have one question about the theater. I do, I do feel things, and um, when I went into the theater, I felt three separate entities, and I was very scared. But the theater people were very nice and let us even sit in the seat where Lily was killed. <laughs> I felt great anger in the room for us being there, and I left. Went upstairs and did feel something that I guess was Mary. I felt her about the point in the book that you said she'd be halfway up the ramp, but I had not read that yet in your book, and then when I read it, I realized that that was where you felt it too. We went back um, to take a picture of the bathroom because we did take a picture of the theater. It was with my boyfriend. He asked that we go back. We went back, and I didn't feel her in the bathroom this time, but I did feel her behind me, and I did sort of hear voices. I'm wondering if there ever were voices heard from the uh, entities that are in the Liberty Theater. All right. Uh, there are. Oh, there are. Yeah, they've heard voices. Uh, uh, they no, they uh, they haven't seen. Uh, I believe it, you know, in fact, they've seen all three of them, and they've heard voices at different times. But it's it, it, it's spooky when you go in there. Definitely. You can just feel it. All right. I I know the feeling. I have never. You know, I've seen one UFO. I have never seen a ghost. I have never seen an enti entity of any sort. But I would love to. So I'm in the category of that one man who called. And I am, I suppose, curious enough to follow up uh, if there are any haunted houses out there. 
or anybody who regularly gets a visit from a ghost, I would love to be contacted. In the night. All right. Uh, I want to remind everybody as well, uh, tomorrow night on my regular syndicated program, we do something utterly different. It's called Ghost to Ghost. It, too, is a very, very serious approach to this whole matter of entities and ghosts. We do it every Halloween. Uh, it is not a joke show. It's not a fun show. I'm not going to be putting in a bunch of uh, little sound effects and all the rest of it. Um, we take a very serious, I take, and expect you to take a very serious approach to these matters. They are serious because I believe they are real. So if you're interested, don't forget, tomorrow night, Ghost to Ghost AM. That's about as much humor as you're probably going to find in it. Uh, it is, however, frightening. And for some reason, we human beings really enjoy scaring the hell out of each other. So it's a great opportunity for that. You guys, I want to give you a chance. Uh, the moments are closing. Twilight Visitors uh, is the name of your book. Ghost Tales, 70 of them right now. How do they get the book? One more time. Uh, they will call 1-800-WEIRD-94. <laughs> and we'd also like, uh, if any of the listeners have stories, we'd like, uh, you know, uh, if, they, if they'd like to share them with us, we'd be more than happy to consider them in our next book. Oh, and, uh, and where would they send them? Uh, they can send them uh, to Post Office Box 976, St. Helens, that's H-E-L-E-N-S, Oregon. And the zip is 97051. Wonderful. Or if they're on email, they can email me the story at uh, starwest, as one word, at a1.com. Starwest at a1.com. Right. Well, uh, it has been a pleasure having you both on. And I like the approach you take to the topic. It's a good hands-on, hardware kind of approach, and we will do another show, all right? Thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much, thank, thank you both, and uh, good night from the high desert. Well, there you are. Dave Esther, Sharon Gill, Twilight Visitors. Now, again, I want to say this because it is deadline time right now. If you want our newsletter where you will continually see this kind of thing, Documented. I'm, I'm, absolutely, I'm very intent on that so that you don't have to just believe what I'm telling you. You can see for yourself. Art Bell, After Dark, the newsletter. It's got to be ordered before the sun comes up in the morning. It's not after dark, then, you see. <laughs> the deadline is now 1 800 917 4278. That's 1 800 917 4278. From the high desert near Dreamland, good night. This has been Dreamland, a program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland.